PARTI 1. Vinegar Merchants Ever since the days of the first Cape Tien Kings, the recipe for making vinegar had been a well-kept secret in Old Orleans. Even at the end of the 19th century, experts still believed the gruesome myth that human excreta were used in the process. Thus as reputable a source as Domaki told how some manufacturers had had the bright idea of ordering their workers to relieve themselves into barrels of wine. Within days the liquid had turned into a fine vinegar, without a hint of the dubious catalyst that had set off the F.E. fermentation. Of course, generations of tavern keepers, cooks, vinegar merchants, and mustard makers had done their best to counter a rumor so damaging to their craft and a tradition stretching back into the mists of time. Members of the F.R. 8 or 90 claimed the most illustrious names as their ancestors. Hadn't Hannibal cleared a path through the Alps for his elephants by pouring vinegar over the snow? Didn't a drunken soldier use a sponge dipped in vinegar to moisten Christ's lips on Golgotha, vinegar was as old as wine. For a long time it was the wine of the poor, of beggars, and of the legionaries. For centuries vinegar makers worked in collaboration with coopers and wine growers. The former repaired the vinegar barrels on their own premises, the latter would store the FULL casks in their own cellars. Such arrangements were supervised by the guilds, which protected men against masters. But these ancien regime traditions were swept away by the revolution and the rise of economic liberalism. In R.A. 24 Charles Prosper D. E. Saws, who worked for a firm called Grafier Hazan, took advantage of the rapid industrialization of the vinegar trade to set up a business of his own. Thus at the age of 34 he became his for mayor employer's chief competitor. But two years later, in the interests of efficiency, the two men decided to join Foresis, and to seal the partnership they arranged a marriage between their heirs. Charles Laurent D. E. Saws, still. 4 F-A-T-H-E-R-F-I-G-U-R-E-S. Scarcely more than a boy, was required to wed young Marie-Therese Amy Grafier Van Deus. The two firms became one, with the D. E. Saws family ruling the Joe Int Kingdom. Father and son got on well together. Business F.L. Aurished. The vinegar makers of the Orleans region had chosen early in the 19th CE entry to adopt the Chaptal method, based on Lavoisier's description of the acetification process. And it was this decision, together with the special quality of the white lawyer wines, that won their products universal fame. The celebrated Orleans Technique UE, admired the world over, made use of the Mycoderma Aset J bacterium, which oxidized the alcohol in the wine. A very assumption day from 1821 on, the guild, which now included all the Orleans manufacturers, held the annual vinegar festival. But although the ancient lawyer town, with its Joan of Arc connections and its devotion to the Virgin Mary, liked to show off its attachment to the Catholic religion, that didn't prevent local F.A. Millie's F.R.O.M. being torn apart by political Q.U.R.L.s and when the time came for Charles Prosper to retire, he was F.O.R.C.E.D.T.C. admit that his two sons would never see eye to eye. Charles Laron, that older brother, was a Bonapartist, Jules, the younger, was a Republican. Th. Dissension between them proved disastrous for the family business. And, Despite the Founding Father's many attempts to reconcile the pair, he could nt prevent the dynasty from splitting into two branches. In 1850 Jules Start, a rival firm, leaving his elder brother to run the Dessaus Phil's business on high own. Charles Laurent was delighted by P.R. Ince Louis Napoleon's coup d'état in December 1851 and embraced with gusto the lifestyle of the Second Empire, December 1852 to September 1870. Charles Laurent was a lazy, violent, tempered man who preferred hunting, loose living, and the pleasures of the table to managing the business. After 16 years in charge of it had left him on the brink of ruin, he brought in his first son, Paul D. Esaus, to help run things. The ravages wrought by phylloxera on the wine trade starting oil UST as vine gar making technique UEs were being transformed by the EXP agreements of Louis Pasteur. His famous lecture on acetic F fermentation, showing the oxidizing EFFECT of the mycoderm, 
opened the way to research on the use of rapid heating to destroy the ferments causing the many diseases that inhibit normal acetification. While wine growers were painfully replanting their vineyards and vinegar makers taking advantage of Pasteur's discoveries, a dangerous source of competition burst onto the market in the form of spirit vinegar. A fierce struggle began, in which many factories that still clung to the old wine vinegar tradition went broke. It was at this time, after the premature death of his elder brother, Paul, that Ludovic D. Esaus took over the management of the family firm. Ludovic had a touch of genius, and with this and thirty years of unremit. Vinegar Merchants 5. Ting effort he turned his father's works into a modern factory, a huge expanse of somber stone buildings at number 17 in the Rue Tourneve, where the barrels of precious condiment wine were made and stored. Ludovic, the master, lived on the premises with his family, and the same grim walls enclosed a workforce, laboring night and day, that by 1900 would number 180. To get the better of his competitors, Ludovic had the bright idea of macking his own spirit vinegar, thus managing both to carry on the tradition and to survive in the market. His spirit vinegar was used for pickling gherkins, his wine vinegar for consumption at the dinner table and use in the kitchen. To improve distribution he availed himself of a new form of mass communication, advertising. A label proclaiming that the firm of Dessau's Fills was founded in 1789 established the brand name in every grocery store in France, the creative chronology on the bottles ignored the fact that Charles Prosper, founder of the present firm, was not even born until 1790. But this was just after the establishment of the THIRD Republic, and perhaps Ludovic wanted to remind the public that Dessau's Fills had been born out of the ancient house of Grafier Hazan. Seeing danger looming in the growing trade union movement and the spread of socialist ideas, Ludovic Dessaus decided to take a leaf out of the Progressive's book and adopt a program of preventive reforms. Mechanization was by now so far advanced it took only 10 men, working round the clock, to barrel 40,000 liters of vinegar in 24 hours. Fifteen times as many staff were employed in maintenance, supply and administration. To keep his workers under control and counter the influence of the revolutionary mechanism that had been in the air since the Paris Commune of 1871, Ludovic worked out a system based on paternalism and respect for morality and religion. In 1880, in a set of house rules arranged under 13 headings, he defined the cardinal virtues essential to the proper functioning of the firm. Godliness, cleanliness, and strict attention to duty were the watchwords. Employees were expected to put in 13 hours a day for six days a week, to say their prayers every morning, and to refrain from talking during working hours. Wine, spirits, and tobacco were forbidden. Dress was scrutinized severely, nothing unconventional was allowed, no bright colors, no stockings with holes in point one at the dawn of the 20th century the firm of Dessau's fills was still plunged deep in a dull gray world of monotony, silence, and narrow-mindedness. Marie-Julie Dessaus, Ludovic's older sister, had met Emile Lakin in 1865, when she was 21. He came from Chateau Thierry, where his family had for several generations been in the drapery and grocery trades. Emile liked to travel, and Dessaus Fils had taken him on as a salesman. Hardworking, thrifty, and assertive, Emile soon recognized that by marrying the bosses. 6. F-A-T-H-E-R-F-I-G-U-R-E-S. Daughter he could not only achieve prosperity but also become a member of one of the most highly regarded families in Orleans. No mean prospect F-O-R-A grocer's son. Ludovic approved of the marriage. Now he would be able to bring his three sons Paul, Charles, and Marcel into the business without opposition F-R-O-M his sister, she'd want any children of her own to be brought in too. The wedding took place on January I.S. 1866, and a son, René, was born nine months later, he died at the age of 28. Marie-Julie had three more children, two girls, and a boy Marie, Eugenie, and Alfred. Alfred Charles Marie Lakin, known as Alfred, was born on April 12, 1873, in his parents' home at 17, Rue Port Saint-Jean. 
he was named Alfred after a maternal uncle who had died young, Charles after his maternal grandfather, himself named after the F.O. under of the dynasty, and Marie after the mother of Jesus, also the patron saint of Orleans Vinegar. By the end of the century Ludovic had set up branches in the colonies and become a big name in the F.O.O.D. industry. He sold pickled gherkins, mustard, brandy, and vinegar in the West Indies, he imported rum F.R.O.M. Martinique and coffee from Guadeloupe. Emile Lakin, still traveling F.O.R. the firm, had left Orleans and moved to the center of Paris, where he lived at 95, Boulevard Beaumarchais in a comfortable apartment block built in 1853. At street level, the plaque of a commissioner F.O.R. oath symbolized the respectability of the neighborhood. It was inhabited mostly by lawyers, P.E.O.P.L.E. living on modest private incomes, and traveling salesmen like Emile himself. Further along, at the corner of the Rue Saint-Claude, stood what had been the home of the ill-fated adventurer Cagliostro, alias Giuseppe Balsamo.2 in the 1860s this area, as F.A.R. as the Boulevard du T. Impel, long known as the Boulevard du Crime because of the sensationalist plays performed there, was a center of popular entertainment. Clowns cut capers on portable trace TLE stages, competing FOR attention with dwarfs, living skeletons, performing dogs, and ventriloquists. The novelist Paul de Kock had lived nearby. He was the working girl's idol and swaggered about the boulevard dressed in a blue flannel suit and a velvet skull cap, peering at passers-by through his lorgnette. But after the Franco-Prussian War and the Commune the boulevard had changed. In the name of law and order the victorious middle classes had crushed the suburban proletariat, hoping to destroy their egalitarian dreams. The open-air stages and ventriloquists were banished, and the bourgeoisie were left safe in their calculated comfort, smugly content with their industrious lives and their official art. Emile Lakin, though despotic and difficult, was under his wife's thumb, and she was inflexibly obedient to Catholic dogma. So Alfred was sent as a vinegar merchant seven. Border to the school run by the priests of Notre Dame de Champs. He left their FULL of resentment against his parents FOR denying him the warmth of F.A. Millie Life.3 as soon as he was old enough to work Alfred J.O. in the flourishing firm of Dessaws and soon showed himself a perfect embodiment of its ideals. He was not much interested in culture and cared as much about his own savings as about the financial interests of the business. With his portly figure and his mustache, he looked what he was an ordinary bel époque tradesman living in the shadow of an all powerful father. In about 1898, he met Emily Philippine Marie Baudry. Her F.A. there had been a gold beater but now lived off the income FROM his investments in real estate. The Baudrys lived at 88. Boulevard Beaumarchais in a building J.U.S.T. like the Lakins. Emily had gone to a church school and come under the influence of Cecile Gazier, a childhood F.R.I. end with Jansenist views. Charles Baudry, Emily's F.A. there, was a pleasant if commonplace F.E.L.O., her mother, Marianne Favier, was deeply religious. At the age of 23, Emily too was very austere. Slim, dark-eyed, Always dressed in black, she seemed to be driven by an abstract kind of Christianity in sharp contrast to the simple provincial piety of the Dessau's family. She and Alfred were married on June 23, 1900, in the Church of St. Paul St. Louis. Ten months later, at 2.30 in the afternoon of April 13, she gave birth to her first child. He was named Jacques-Marie Emile. His father and both grandfathers registered the birth at the mairie, town hall, of the 3 d arrondissement. H.E. was baptized A.T. the Church O.F. St. Denis du Sacrament. Emily Baudry Lakin became pregnant again right away and in 1902 produced another son, Raymond, who died two years later of hepatitis. By April 1903 she was expecting another child, and this time it was a girl, Madeleine Marie Emmanuel born at 1.30 a.m. on December 25th. On the morning of the 27th her father registered the birth in the presence of two witnesses, the manageress of a shop on the boulevard Sebastopol and the baby's maternal grandfather. Emily was now 27. 
It was not until 1908 that she had her F.O. Earth child, Mark Marie, he later changed his name to Mark Fran O.I.S., born on December 25th, 10 minute utes after midnight. Emily was exhausted after this last pregnancy, devil up at abdominal pains, and had to have an operation. Mdeter that she couldn't have any more children. When Jacques was born, Emily had engaged a young governess named Pauline who was F.O.N.D. of all three children but soon grew especially attached to little Marco. Although he was himself his mother's favorite, Jacques or Jacquot, as they called him was jealous. At quite an early age he was already willful and domineering, constantly asking F.O.R.F.O.O.D. or money or eight father figures. Presence on the grounds that he was the eldest. But he was always very fatherly toward Marco, as if to make up for Alfred's deficiencies. To all appearance the three children grew up in a home united by religion. But in FACT there were bitter quarrels between the two families living in the same apartment block on the boulevard Beaumarchais. Emily didn't get on with Marie Julie, her mother-in-law, who in her opinion ordered Alfred about too much. As FOR her sisters-in-law, Marie and Eugenie, Emily couldn't stand their narrow-mindedness. 50 Alf R Ed F E L L out with his F A there, who retired and went back to Orleans to live. Alfred took his father's place in the business, and now, instead of traveling around France, he stayed where he was and soon became D.E. Sauz's chief Paris agent. He was fr friendly and tactful and on excellent terms with the customers as well as wise in the ways of Parisian commerce. Point for Jacques' memory of his childhood in that apparently normal and conventional F. Emily was terrifying. Brought up in an atmosphere that combined stifling religiosity with constant domestic squabbles, he too was always quarreling with his despised grandfather, of whom he painted publicly an extremely hostile portrait a year after his own father's death. T he meaning of, my grandfather is my grandfather is this, that the said fritful pe tit bourgeois, the horrible individual thanks to whom I learned at an early age how to pe reform the essential act of cursing God this person is precisely the one officially recorded as the father of my father, since he was married to my father's mother and since my father's birth was the subject of the document in question. S. Lakin couldn't for give Emil for being the sort of father who gave fatherhood a bad name. As Mark Fran OIS has written, Jacques was given the name Emil After his paternal grandfather, who played a more important part than Alfred did in the discovery of the name O.F. Thajather. And again, Whenever Emile punished Jacques by standing him in the corner instead of correcting him in a proper paternal way, his reaction was, well, if that's a father, I say a curse on fathers. Yet his real father, Alfred, was both loving and loved. 6. When Emile went back to Orleans, Alfred too left the boulevard Beaumarchais and moved with his F. Emile to the Rue du Montparnasse. It had been decided that Jacques should go as a dayboy to the College 5 Tanny SLAs, where the Catholic upper middle and middle middle class sent their most promising progeny. The choice shows that, some years after the separation of church and state, the Lake and Dessau's Baudry clan were still steeped in clericalism and hostile to secular and republican values. For a long time Alfred remained on bad terms with his F.A. there and until the First World War he spent his pleasantest leisure moments with his wife's family. He rented a comfortable house in Juyanjusas, on the outskirts of Versailles, which they called the Villa Marco after the younger son. The FAM. Vinegar Merchants 9. Eilie had enjoyable country gatherings there, with Emily's brother Joseph, her sister Marie and her husband, Marcel Langlais, together with the couple's four children, Roger, Anne-Marie, Jean, and Robert. The Langlais youngsters liked to play nine-pin bowls with their uncle Alfred. Jacquot was thrilled when his father bought a smart car. He was already mad about speed and would often take the steering wheel and pretend to be driving or sit proudly in the passenger seat beside Gaston Alfred's chauffeur.7. The college Stanislas's great renaissance had begun after the 1848 revolution, the street barricades and popular riots fri and the ruling classes, for merely so voltaire and, and anti-clerical, into sending their children to church schools. During the years that followed, 
the number of pupils at Stanislas rose to more than a thousand. By the end of the century the Marist fathers who ran the college had added new buildings containing lecture rooms, lab oratories, and a F. Einzing school. Impressive traditions were built up too. An Academy of Science and Liberal Arts was F.O. Undade, members wore a gold-embroidered sash on ceremonial occasions. H. became the custom to hold a banquet for the most successful classes on January 2, 8, the F.E.A.S.T. of St. Charlemagne, patron saint of schools, the brightest pupils had to make a speech to their F.O. roommates on some literary or philosophical subject. But in July 1901 the whole situation was changed by a law making it necessary for the Marists to apply for official permission to teach. Their application was refused. A great fund raising campaign was launched immediately to circumvent this decision. Some old pupils for met a real estate company to buy the buildings, furniture, and corporate name of the college. Stanislas became a privately run Catholic school with a teaching staff of lay. Masters and secular clergy. 8. Mark Sangner, F.O. under of the paper Lesi slash Lawn, The Furrow, and of the short-lived Sileanist Christian Democratic Movement, J.O. and in the effort and was elected chairman of the new Board of Governors. Thus one of Paris's massed conservative religious establishments was saved by a spiritual son of Lamanet who in 1910 was to be condemned by the Vatican F.O.R. trying to introduce the spirit of the Enlightenment into a reactionary and hidebound church. Nine in 1903 Sangnier resigned from the post of chairman of the school board, and the Abbe Potinier became headmaster. Potinier's reign which was to last 17 years, made an unforgettable impression on the pupils who were at Stanislas at the same time as Lakin. Though Potinier had a degree in mathematics and was more at home solving equations than running a school, he devoted all his energies to his young charge S. He called them all by their first names, took as mu ch care of their health as of their studies, and 10 fat her figure res continued to follow their progress after they had left school. As well as providing poorer parents with assistance out of his own pocket, he also changed the school regulations so that needy liberal arts students could help finance their university studies by supervising the college's older pupils. Several of the pre-First World War pupils went on to become F.A. Mouse. Charles de Gaulle was their FROM 1908-1909, preparing for the entrance examination for the St. Cyr Military Academy. Georges Geimer, who was younger than de Gaulle, won a reputation at the college for his pranks. Lo, he went on to become an aviator and war hero before being shot down in 1917. In 1908 Abbe Jean Calvet was put in charge of literary studies in the highest grade at Stanislas. One of his teachers at the seminary in Cahors had been Fernand Dalbus, a moral philosopher who had tried to reconcile the Anglican and Orthodox churches, and Calvert himself sounded like a cross between Bossuet and C.O.N. Fusius. After studying at the Sorbonne under Gustave Lanson and Emile Faguet, he had become a specialist in the French classics. During his time at the college Stanislas the teaching of literature tended to be clerical, rationalistic, and narrow. 17th century authors predominated, with Pascal and Bossuet in first place, F. followed by Racine, Malherbe, and La Fontaine. The 18th century, and by the same token the works of Ernest Renat, were passed over. Modern poetry was represented by Edmund Rustand and Sully Prudhomme, not by Baudelaire, who was considered morbid, nor by Mallarmé, who wasn't even mentioned. The deputy head, the Abbe B. E. Ozard, was always warning any aspiring Rambos in his classes against the temptations of literature, be on your guard against doubt, the neurasthenia of the mind. He told them. I, I in philosophy, Descartes enjoyed pride of place. In fact, throughout his school days in that elderly fortress of Christianity, the young Lakin was exposed to a classical culture almost untouched by Enlightenment values and closed off rom modern thought. Instead, Everything was focused on the Christian Cartesianism reflected in the school motto, French without F.E.A.R., Christian without reproach. The pupils in Lakin's year also included Louis Leprince Ringet, a future academician, Jacques Moraine, a future prefect, 
Paul de Cies, who was to make a career in medicine, and Robert de Saint-Jean, a writer and a close friend of Julian Green. After 1915 the monotony of the Lakin's family life was broken by the war. Alfred was called up and made a sergeant in the commissariat, leaving Emily to take over his work as agent for Dessau's point 12 part of the college Stanislas was converted into a hospital for soldiers wounded at the front. It might have been the sight of these men, with their missing limbs and dazed expressions, that made Jacques want to be a doctor. At that age, though, he seemed chiefly interested in himself and his efforts to make top of the class in every subject. Even the teachers were scared of Lakin, writes Robert de Vinegar Merchants I.I. St. Jean. Always coming first. Fine eyes. Manner half serious, half mocking. Without seeming to do so he kept a distance between himself and the other boys. A.T. Recess, when the rest of us were chasing Red Indians, he never joined in. When someone else for once got a better mark than he did in French composition, he remarked coolly to his rival, how could you lose? You write like Madame de Sevent. 13 He had never cared for children's games, and now that he was in his teens, arrogance was the keynote of his character. Yet in spite of what Robert de Saint-Jean says, Lakin never actually made top of the class, it was always Jacques Moraine who did that, nor won a first prize. He was a very bright pupil, shining especially in religious studies and Latin translation, but in other subjects he had to be satisfied with a few honorable mentions. His grades when he was in his last year ranged FROM 9 to 19 out of 20, FROM AC to an A plus in US terms. His best average was about 15, an A in the United States. T. He comments of his teachers in his reports FOR the academic year 1916 to 1917 show him as rather eccentric, a bit conceited, occasionally tiresome, and in particular unable to organize his time properly and behave like the other boys. He was of TN off sick or playing hooky and suffered FROM a kind of ennui, a mixture of listlessness and will FUL melancholy. 14 T. O. Ward, his younger brother Jacques, was fatherly and protective. He acted as mentor too and used to hear Marco recite his Latin homework. F from about 1915, when he was F O 13 and I was 7, he used to help me with my Latin. I can still see the letters he wrote me, in beautiful script, all about cases and moods 15. It was around that time that Jacques discovered the works of Spinoza. He hung a diagram on the wall of his bedroom that depicted the structure of the ethics with the aid of colored arrows. Point one six in that world of minor tradesmen, this amounted to an act of subversion, a step toward the assertion of his own desires against the wishes of a father he always believed to be set on having his elder son succeed him in the family business. In the school year 1917 to 191, eight Lakin had the good effortun to be taught by Jean Beruze, an exceptional man who later became a frind. While teaching philosophy at the College Stanislas, Beruza was writing a doctoral thesis on the life and works of St. John of the Cross why the writings of Beruza a rationalistic Catholic thinker whose work had elements in common with that of Etienne Gilson, Alexander Coyer, and Henry Corbin, all later influences, direct or indirect, on Lakin belonged to a current of French thought that originated in 1886 with the addition of a religious sciences section, section 5, to the École Pratique de Hautes. Etudes, APHE, a graduate school for advanced research. Eighteen years after the launch of Section 4, devoted to philology and history, Section 5 was set up. 12 FATHERFIGURES. To take the place of the old faculties of theology, which since 1885 no longer existed in the university. For although church and state were now separated, it was necessary to ensure the survival of the subjects F.O. Remetterly taught under the heading of theology. But religions must now be the object of scientific, historical, and comparative study. This new initiative came under attack on the one hand by the Catholics, who refused to separate the study of sacred texts F.R.O.M. questions of faith and divine revelation, and on the other hand by the anti-clerical left, for whom religion was a superstition that had no place in a university. 
18 but the creators of the new section took their stand on a different ground. They were not fighting either for or against Catholicism, they held that religious phenomena should be studied in a critical spirit with the tools of pragmatic science. As a matter of FACT, Coyer wrote in I-931, the section staff included and still includes scholars both Catholic and Protestant, FRE thinkers, practicing Jews, and even some Christian clerics and Jewish rabbis 19. Jean Berius's work fit in with this conception of religious studies. Against a strictly lay and anti-clerical tradition he maintained that it is impossible to understand a Christian mystic without attempting to live with him in the world of grace. 20 But when he was arguing with theologians he declined to accept the dogma of grace as such. Berius's teaching, together with the early discovery of Spinoza, brought about a transition in Lacan's development. Instead of the devout Catholicism PR actist in his family, he encountered a scholarly, aristocratic Catholicism, one that might serve as a cultural substratum or critical instrument in the examination of things religious. Here C. E. Sile Gazier, Emily Baudry's childhood F.R.E.N.D., also played an important role. Lakin admired her, and she introduced him to the writings of her F.A. There, Augustin Gazier, on the history of Jansenism. 2. 1. At the age of 17 Jacques had his first sexual experience, with one of his father's customers, at a wedding at which his brother Marco was an usher. Ever since he was a small child, Marco had always said he wanted to be a priest, though that didn't stop him from failing in love with a cousin and planning to marry her. But in his teens his choice of a monastic life put an end to any prospects of sex and marriage. My mother was the only woman I ever admired unreservedly, he said. She was a true Christian, unlike my father. She had nothing to do with my becoming a priest, but she was very happy about my decision, whereas my F.A. there was against it 22. Jacques, accompanied by Francis Cullen and Robert de Saint-Jean, started going to Adrien Monnier's bookshop, Shakespeare and Co., at 7, Rue de Elodian. Adrien Monnier, with her smooth round cheeks and her F.U.L.L., pleated skirts, organized public readings where her customers could meet. Vinegar Merchants won 3. Writers who were already famous, such as André Gide, Jules Romains, and Paul Claudel. Lakin was also interested in Dadaism and soon discovered the new outlook and early manifestations of surrealism through the review literature. He met André Breton and Philippe Soupault and listened spellbound, at Shakespeare and Co., to the first readings of James Joyce's Ulysses. It was at this period, when he was going through a bad attack of melancholy, that Jacques violently rejected the F.A. Millie and the Christian values he had been brought up in. Point 23 In about 1923, he heard about Freud's theories for the first time, but it was the ideas of Charles Moraz, founder of the right wing group Action Franise and later a collaborator during the Second World War, that really caught his attention. Though not anti Semitic himself, he met Morris several times and went to some meetings of the Action FRNI's point 24 The radicalism and elitism he heard propounded there distanced him even a further from the F.A. Millie background he hated so implacably. Alfred and Emily began to worry about their son's attitude. He despised his origins, dressed like a dandy, and seemed to aspire to be another Rastanac. 2 5 Pne de Jacques met Robert de Saint Jean going past the entrance to the Pier Manso and told him he still hadn't made up his mind about a career. Medicine, perhaps? Or why not politics? Lakin was in FACT thinking seriously about getting a job as secretary to some influential figure. 26 Lakin's loss of faith and rejection of religion were reinforced when he started reading Nietzsche in the original German. In 1925 he wrote a brilliant eulogy of Nietzsche's thought for his brother to deliver at the St. Charlemagne banquet. The text was an open challenge to the Stanislas authorities. It maintained that English philosophy was useless and contrasted it with the great German tradition. When young Mark Marie had finished, Beausart stood up and damned the whole speech in one furious phrase. Nietzsche was crazy. 27. In 1926, while Jacques was scandalizing his family with his taste for FRE thought and the doctrines of the Antichrist, 
Mark Murray made the final decision to become a monk. The call came to him on May 13, as he was reading the rule of Saint Benedict. He wrote down the word Benedictine, and the sight of it acted on him like a revelation. Jacques was furious when he heard of his brother's decision and advised him to wait and go on with his law studies. For a year Mark Murray did so. Then he went to St. Cyr for six months and did his military service as a reserve officer. But in the autumn of 1929 Mark Murray set out for the Abbe de Hautecombe, a monument to a bygone age and an important center of the Benedictine order. The abbey was O N Lake B O Urget, made famous by Lamartine's elegiac love poem L E Lac. Jacques, seeing his brother off at the railroad station, watched in consternation as the train bore away, with 14 fat her figures. Marco, all his own childhood memories. As his younger brother's self-appointed keeper, he had done all he see old to stop him from imprisoning himself like this. And now he blamed himself for not persuading him to be a tax inspector. On September 8, 193 1, Mark Murray took his vows, changing his second name to Franois in honor of Saint Francis of Assisi. Four years later, on May 1, I 935, Jacques was present at his brother's ordination. After that he never went to Hautecombe again. Meanwhile, Alfred and Emily had left the apartment on the Rue du Montparnasse and gone to live out at boulogne sur seine where they had had a house built at 33, Rue Gambetta. On January 20, I 925, Madeleine, their daughter, had married Jacques Hulin, a businessman from the OT her branch of the Lacan F. Emily. The couple were to live for many years in Indochina. Thus, each in his or her own way, all of Alfred's children severed their links with the family, the first through an intellectual break, the second by going to live abroad, and the third by entering the priesthood. At the end of I-928 Madeline fell ill with tuberculosis. She was in a sanatorium, about to have one lung collapsed, when Jacques came to see her. He angrily forbade the operation, saying she would recover naturally. He was right. 28. 2. Faces O and the WARD. At the time when Lakin was embarking on a medical career, interest in Freud was increasing markedly in every area of French thought. But psychoanalysis was being introduced into France by means of two coexisting but conflicting modes. On the one hand there was the medical approach, the pioneers of which set up first, in 1925, the evolution psychiatric, psychiatric development, group and then, in 1926, the Société Psychanalytique de Paris, SPP, Paris Psychoanalytical Society. L. On the other hand there was the intellectual approach, that of the literary and philosophical avant-gardes, whose interpretations of Freud's discoveries varied greatly from one group to another. But neither of the two approaches took the lead, they intersected, they contradicted one another, but they advanced with equal vigor. In the medical field, Freud's ideas were entering a territory divided into three zones, dynamic psychiatry, which had its origins in the philosophy of the Enlightenment but had been refashioned at the beginning of the 20th century by the Zurich School, psychology, as developed by Pierre Janet, Charcot's F. O. Remetter pupil and Freud's great rival, and finally the philosophy of Henry Bergson, whose ideas served as a filter for Freud's point to these three zones were part of a culture dominated by an ideal view of France and things French that assumed its own so-called Latin and would-be universal civilization was superior to a Germanic culture seen as inferior, barbarous, and regionalistic. The French claim to superiority, first formulated by Taine and reinforced by the Germanophobia of the First World War, clashed head-on with Freud's teaching on sex, which seemed to some people to aim not only at pansexualism but also at pangermanism. Point three b y a historical paradox. This doctrine originated in France, for it could be traced back to the meeting of Freud and Charcot at the Salpetriere in 1885, though it was subsequently developed in stages in Vienna. Charcot had ear. One six f a t h e r f i g u r e s. 
Lyer used hypnosis to demonstrate that hysteria was a functional nervous illness UNC connected with the uterus. He eliminated the idea of any sexual etiology, showing that hysteria affected men as well as women. Freud later reintroduced the sexual etiology, though he transferred it from the uterus to the psyche. He subsequently formulated the theory of transference, which allowed him to dispense with hypnosis and in 1896 to invent psychoanalysis. Lastly, in 1905 he revealed the workings of infantile sexuality. It was this that made Freud's opponents suspect him of sexual imperialism and led to the use of the term pansexualism. And so the earliest pioneers of the French psychoanalytic movement based their efforts on a kind of homegrown version of Freud that was closer to Janet's psychology than to Freud's own teaching and driven more by their own ideal of Latinity than by a genuine theory of the unconscious. But such transplants never take completely, and Freud's ideas were not yet properly assimilated, for the time being, people only thought they understood and saw connections in what were really misrepresentations. Psychoanalysis might well bring healing to every kind of society, and the discovery of the unconscious might indeed have universal relevance, that didn't stop every country interpreting Freud in its own particular way. As to the intellectual approach to Freud in France and its ideological answer to the medical one, that was in the hands of certain writers and the literary reviews. From Romain Roland to André Breton and Pierre-Jean Jauvet, from the Surrealists to the Nouvelle Revue Francaise, New French Review, they brought a different view of Freudianism to the Parisian scene. Point four, whereas the physicians were chauvinistic and took a strictly therapeutic view of psychoanalysis, the writers accepted the idea of a wider sexuality, declined to look on Freudianism as a Germanic culture, and maintained that psychology did not belong exclusively to doctors. Writers and artists of all kinds saw dreams as the great adventure of the age, they wanted to use the omnipotence of desire to change mankind, they invented a utopia where the unconscious was free of all restraint, and they admired the courage of the dedicated scientist who had defied bourgeois convention and risk scandal and isolation in order to listen into the most intimate urges of humanity. Jacques Lacan's first presentation of a patient was made to the Société Neurologique on November 4, 1926, under the direction of the great neurologist Theophile Elijwanin, a frind of Edouard Pichon and a member of Action FRNIs. The case was one of fixed gaze caused by hypertonicity, together with extrapyramidal syndrome and pseudobulbar disorders of the spinal cord. It was an ordinary enough story concerning an unfortunate man of 65 who was taken ill while riding his bicycle and hospitalized at Faces on the LMLRD17 The Salpatriera He had a fixed stare and a respiratory tick and the fu row between the nose and the chin was deeper on the left side of the face than on the right. When the patient bent his knees to sit, he remained poised for a moment above the chair before falling down onto the seat. Lakin's Clini CAL comments were lengthy, detailed, strictly technical, and devoid of emotion, an arid bit of ordinary hospital routine. Point five by a curious coincidence the presentation took place on the day the SPP was fo undated. There were ten members, Angelo Hesnard, René Laforgue, Marie Bonaparte, Eugenie Sokolnica, René Allende, Georges Parchemini, Rudolf Lowenstein, Adrian B. Orell, Edouard Pichon, and Henry Codet, they were later joined by Charles Odier and Raymond de Saussure, both from Geneva.6 and so the date when Lacan's name first appeared in the history of French psychoanalysis was the same as that when the first Freudian association was created in France. But the 25-year-old Lakin still had a long way to go before he became a part of that honorable institution, now the longest-lasting and most influential of its kind. It would take him eight years to become a member and four more to be made a training analyst. Meanwhile his career followed a normal course, and he went on FROM neurology to psychiatry. From 1927 to 193 when he studied the clinical treatment of mental encephalic disorders at the H6 Pital St. Anne, one of the top mental hospitals, and then went to the special infirmary of the Prefecture de Police, Paris Police Headquarters, where so-called dangerous individuals were brought in for emergency treatment. There followed two years at the Henry Rouse L. Hospital, 
where the most advanced psychiatric research was carried out and Lakin qualified in forensic medicine. In August 1930 he attended a two-month course at the famous Bergolze Clinic, attached to the University of Zurich, where at the beginning of the century Augusta Farrell, Carl Gustav Jung, and Eugen Bleuler had arrived at a new conception of madness, based not only on a sound nosography but also on the results of listening to patients talking. In this already legendary center of dynamic psychiatry, Lakin worked under Hans Meyer, Bleuler's successor. The following year he went back to St. Anne's as an intern, and in the staff room there he mixed with the men of his own generation. Henry E.Y., Pierre Mail, and Pierre Marais-Chal were his best FREs, but he also knew Henry Frederick Ellenberger. Seven Ellenberger, born in South Africa in 1905 into a family of Protestant Miszionaries, had always wanted to be a historian. But his father made him study medicine and sent him to France, first to Strasbourg and then to Paris, where he met Lakin when they were both interns. I kpt my distance, says Ellenberger. We saw each other in the staff room, where he jo and in the general horseplay, though his jokes were a cut above the usual run. His wit. 1-8-F-A-T-H-E-R-F-I-G-U-R-E-S. Ticisms were sharp and hurtful. He affected a sort of aristocratic arrogance. His barbs always struck home, and he didn't spare even his patience. I remember him saying of someone, H. E.'s very well thought of. By his concierge. But Lakin was very charming in private. As in the intern's canteen he and A.F.E.W. of his F.R.E.s constituted the upper crust of the young medics. Lakin sat at Henry E.Y.'s little table, where everyone used the elegant J.A. Ergon of phenomenology and looked down their noses at Edouard T. Oulaus's old-fashioned organicism. The younger generation dreamed about the October Revolution, proclaimed themselves surrealists, and fancied they were thoroughly modern. Lakin had a precious way of speaking, says Paul Sivadin, and he could be quite sadistic toward his chosen victims. It so happened that Henry E.Y. made me treasurer for some of his projects. Naturally, this meant collecting contributions. The only person I never got a cent out of was Lakin. The patient who helped in the staff room used, for a small fee, to keep us supplied with cigarettes. Lakin often owed him money. Such trifles are evidence of his anal personality. But he was a fine clinician right from the start of his career 9. Although the work of Freud and Brewer had transformed the nosology of psychiatry, the mental asylums of the 30s had still not emerged from the age of incarceration. Patients had to wear uniforms, their mail was opened, and personal belongings were confiscated. W.O. men were registered under their maiden names and thus often robbed of their usual identities. Manic patients might be put in straight jackets, though that was only an ordinary humiliation. Violent cases were sometimes chained by the neck and left to sweat it out as they swooned in baths of hot water. Senile patients were a particularly here trending sight on their beds of seaweed filthy with excreta. For chronics, the choke pier was still in use an iron contraption that could be inserted between the patient's teeth and screwed open to hold the jaws apart forfo receible fe8ing.to discourage anyone who might have courted this torture forfun, hefty doses of castor oil were also poured down the funal. Milder cases worked in the kitchens or the laundry, peeling vegetables in strange fits and starts or pushing heavy trolleys about like slaves. But when they were sent to work in the interns' quarters, they became the young men's see opinions and licensed buff FOONs. T.O. If the bourgeois conformism of Vienna at the end of the 19th century was reflected in Freud and Brewer's studies on hysteria, T1 the working class alienation of the 30s was equally evident in all the cases published by the younger generation of French psychiatrists. Chronic hallucinatory psychosis, Parkinson's disease, mental automatism syndrome, hereditary syphilis, such were the sorts of sufferings the young Lakin witnessed at St. Anne's. Until 1932 he wrote his case histories in collaboration with Faces on the WARD-19. His FELO students O are his teachers, with Adolphe Courtois for biological psychiatry, 
with George's Huey or FOR Infant Neuropsychiatry, and with Jean UVV Alensi for Modern Clinical Method. 12 Lakin's most interesting case in this period was the one he and his FR Eind Maurice Trinal described to the Societe Neurologique on November 2, 1928, a Beja INA war traumatized female patient. 13THE sub JECT was a woman FROM Brittany, a hysteric whose house had been destroyed by a shell in June 1915. Her peculiar gait and appearance, sometimes reminiscent of a dancing dervish, had made her a picturesque feature of the Paris hospital landscape. She had been trapped by one leg in the shattered floorboards when her house collapsed and had suffered superficial injury rise to the scalp, nose, and back. At the Hôpital de Saint-Paul in Bethune the army doctor had told her to stand up straight, and FROM then on she had walked with her body thrust FORUARD, rocking FROM side to side and scuffing her FEET as children do. She later added another step to her bizarre choreography, crossing one FOOT in front of the other as she went along. Hers was the only case of hysteria that Lakin put his name to during his psychiatric training. He remembered it clearly in 1933, when he said that this modest contribution to the problem of hysteria had acted as a transition to his more recent research in psychiatry. 14. So by then he believed his account of a case that presented no neurological sign of organic origin had allowed him to move FROM neurology to psychiatry. This meant he now regarded the case as one of hysteria in the Freudian sense. By 1932 he had come to understand the meaning of Freud's work, so there was an inconsistency between the way he presented the case in 1928 and the way he spoke of it in 1933. Neither of the authors of the 1928 account made any reference to hysteria, the terminology they used was exclusively that of Bobinski. They employed the term pithiatism a neologism foromet from the Greek words for persuasion and curable alluding to Bobinski's demolition of Chark OTS theories, in which he suggested that the word pithiatic might replace the word hysterical. Bobinski thus, as is well known, made possible the beginnings of modern neurology, 1-5 though at the same time he also caused hysteria to be reclassified as a kind of simulation, curable by suggestion. However, FROM 1925 onward Bobinski's terminology had been failing into disuse, neurology was establishing itself as a genuine science and had less need to employ hysteria as a scapegoat. Moreover, Marie Bonaparte and Rudolf Lowenstein's 1928 translation of Freud's CASE of Dora encouraged a truer conception of hysteria. 16 But as Trinnell and Lakin had shown in their account, Pythiatism was still alive and well in 1928 in the vocabulary of psychiatry. The pioneers of French psychoanalysis were no better, in 1925, in an article on Charcot's influence on Freud published in L.E. Pro-G. Residential Medical, Developments in Medicine, to mark the C.E. antenary of Charcot's. 20. F.A.T.H.E.R.F.I.G.U.R.E.S. Birth H.E.N.R.I. Codet and René Lafourg couldn't make up their minds between the three attitudes then dominating the critical approach to history Janet's psychophilosophy, Bobinski's neurology, and Freud's doctrine. One seven the surrealists were readier than the psychologists T.O.F.O.L.O. Charcot, as they showed in 1928 when they paid tribute not to him but to Augustine, his famous patient. W.E. Surrealists wish hereby to celebrate the 50th anniversary of hysteria, the greatest poetic discovery of the late 19th century. And we do so at the very moment when the concept of hysteria appears to have been completely dismantled. W.E. therefore propose a new definition of hysteria as a more or less irreducible mental state characterized by the subversion of the links between the individual and the moral world to which he thinks he for all practical purposes belongs, quite apart from any kind of delusion. Hysteria is not a pathological condition and may be considered in every respect a supreme means of expression 1. 8 But two more years still had to go by before Lakin incorporated the surrealist attitude into his work and then went on to effect a synthesis between psychiatry and Freud's discoveries. Psychiatry Teachers 3. Are three very different teachers of his prentice years left a deep impression 1. On Lakin they were Georges Dumas, Henry Claude, and Gaetan Goshen de Clarembault. 
Georges Dumas, a professor of psychopathology at the Sorbonne, was a friend of Pierre Janet and Charles Blonde, and a doughty opponent of psychoanalysis. He was always making fun of it, mocking what he called its J.A. Argon, not to mention its ideas about sex and its German connections. But philosophy students and psychiatry interns all flocked to St. Anne's to hear his Sunday morning presentations, drawn there irresistibly by the charm of both their content and their FORM. Claude Levi Strauss painted a memorable portrait of him. Dumas would make himself comfortable up on the rostrum, his sturdy, rugged figure surmounted by a head as noble as some great gnarled root silvered and smoothed by immersion in the depths of the sea. One didn't learn all that much from his lectures. He never prepared them, trusting instead to the physical spell he knew he could cast over his audience by the mobility of his mouth, twisted into a perpetually changing smile. And especially by his voice at the same time husky and melodious, a real siren's voice, with strange inflections recalling not only his native Languedoc but also, even more strikingly, certain ancient modes of the music of spoken French. So voice and FACE, though appealing to two different senses, both conjured up the same rustic but incisive style, the style of the F.O. 13th century humanists, the physicians and philosophers whose race he seemed to perpetuate in body and mind. The second hour and sometimes the third two were devoted to the presentation of cases, when the audience was treated to extraordinary performances got up between the wily practitioner and patients trained to this sort of thing by years in hospitals. They knew exactly what was expected of them and would either produce symptoms in response to a signal or offer JUST enough resistance to demonstrate their trainer's skill. The spectators weren't taken in, on the contrary, they eke joyed being dazzled by such a display of virtuosity. 1. 22 FATHERFIGURES Henry Claude, a great rival of George D. U. Moss, whose crude anti-Freudianism he disliked, was the undisputed monarch of St. Anne's. Born in 1865, in 1905 he was made assistant at the Salpetriere to Fulgence Raymond, himself the successor to Charcot. In 1922 the death of Ernest Dupre brought Claude a professorial chair at St. Anne's, where he became the official patron of psychoanalysis as adapted to the Latin spirit. He put René Laforgue in charge of a group consisting of Adrian Borel, Henry Codet, Angelo Hesnard, and Eugenie Sokolnica. And so a dynamic and organicist French school grew up around Claude, a group Henry E.Y. would later inherit. 2. Claude made use of Freudian theory in this new venture, though hoping all the while that it might take on a Latin FO room. Psychoanalysis. He wrote, I.S. not yet suited to exploring the French mind. Some of its investigative methods offend our delicacy when it comes to private emotions, and the more far-fetched examples of its symbolism seem to me to make some of its generalizations, though applicable perhaps to other races, unacceptable in Latin clinical practice. 3. René Laforgue had chosen to work under Claude rather than Dumas, despite Claude's jingoism. But Freud was uncompromising on this subject, and Laforgue's position became untenable. The crunch came in 1927, with the founding of the Revue JRN raised a psych analyze, RFP, later to become the official organ of the SPP, itself affiliated with the International Psychoanalytical Association, IPA, FO undated by Freud in 19 IO and bringing together all the psychoanalytic societies deriving FROM the Freudian movement. Originally Freud was to have been the Revue's distinguished patron, but in order not to offend Professor Claude, the protector of psychoanalysis in France, Laforgue asked Freud to withdraw his name. The third teacher to influence the young Lacan's career was Gaetan Gauchin de Clarembault. He was neither against psychoanalysis, he knew nothing of its FM dings, nor FOR Lottie Nighty, he wasn't interested. But he was undoubtedly the most flamboyant and paradoxical figure in the early part of the saga of Lacan and French psychoanalysis. H.E. was a confirmed misogynist who wouldn't admit women to his courses, and he surrounded himself with admirers from whom he required adoration and obedience. He was jealous of the influence wielded by Henry Claude, whom he dismissed as a mere neurologist. 
there's a fellow who wants to make a name for himself, he would say scornfully, out of two first names and no surname. 4. He was a pupil at the college Stanislas 30 years before Lakin and had studied D-Law before turning to medicine. While serving with the army in Moro CCO he had fallen in love with the Arab style of dress and would describe in detail how skillfully Eastern women draped their robes, sometimes gathering them together and sometimes letting them follow the lines. Psychiatry Teachers 23 Of the Body He spent the First World War making wooden figurines and dressing them in draperies, he kept them for the rest of his life. 5. When he got back to France he was appointed head of the special infirmary, for mental cases, of the Paris Prefecture de Police, where he ruled with panache until his suicide in 1934. A F. Ormalist and esthete who saw madness as a kind of clairvoyance, clairambled, at a time when Claude's group was moving in the opposite direction, built up the impressive theory of mental automatism syndrome. Dynamism abandoned the idea that psychosis could be constitutional, that is, have a basis in heredity. Claire Rambolt, trying to bring coherence into the classification of mental disorders, defined them on the basis of their common element of mental automatism. In his view the origin of the syndrome remained organic, though the resulting disorder seemed to attack the patient suddenly and from outside, as in the case of automatism. In this respect Claire Rambolt's P.O. Sition was structurally not unlike Freud's but he rejected any reform in the matter of treatment. For him psychiatry necessarily involved a regime of incarceration and reprisal. As master of the police infirmary he was always improving his system, disregarding patients' distress and neither blaming nor pitying them, all he wanted was to wring out confessions. Lakin adopted a different attitude toward each of these very different masters. With Henry Claude, the successful but limited bourgeois with considerable powers of patronage and a name that might prove useful, he was just a deferential pupil. He flattered Claude's narcissism by always agreeing with him, while remaining secure in his own mocking superiority. To Georges Dumas he was very respectful, he admired his clinical genius and was always trying to exercise his charm on him. With Claire Rambold he had a conflictual love-hate relationship. Point six in Claire Rambold a passion for texture and draperies and a fascination with the clothed bodies of Arab women went with an intense interest in erotomania. On the basis of his mental automatism syndrome he distinguished between hallucinatory psychoses and passional delusions. Among the latter he placed the illusion of being loved that is called erotomania, of which the chief source is immense sexual vanity. The story was always the same, resembling that of countless ill-fated heroines of romance. The individual concern thinks he or she is loved by the object of his or her chaste desires, usually some F.A. Mouse personage such as an actor, a king, or a member of the academy. Madam X, for example, is convinced that the prince of WLS is making advances to her, following her about, and making appointments with her that he doesn't keep. She resents his behavior, accuses him of infidelity, and goes to England to catch him in the act. When she gets back to Paris she assaults a policeman in the street and is brought to the office of the head of the special infirmary to be dealt with. 24 FATHERFIGURES Claire Rambolt described erotomania as a representation of reality that though insane was logical. Despite his conservatism regarding theory, he agreed with Freud and the Surrealists that madness was close to truth, aria son to unreason, and coherence to delirium. Claire Rambolt's influence was evident in Lakin's first theoretical text, published in July 1, 931 in the C. Main de H. Hopitas de Paris, Paris Hospital's weekly bulletin, J. The title, Structures of Paranoid Psychoses, was suggestive of things to come, and the very individual style clearly F.O. reshot out that of the 19J2 thesis. Lakin began by paying tribute to Emil Kreplin, Paul Sirius, and Joseph Capgras, whose work had made it possible to identify paranoia. 8. But he immediately criticized their legacy by putting F.O. Ruard a notion of struct T.U.R.E. in the phenomenological sense. This could be used to reveal a number of breaks in continuity, between normal psychology and pathology, to begin with, 
and then between the different kinds of delusion. Lakin then distinguished between the clinical and aphorensic points of view and divided paranoid psychoses into three types, those arising from a paranoid constitution, interpretation delusions, and passional delusions. T.O. described the first of these types, he put aphoruard, without criticizing them, the traditional explanations, setting out the FO or themes around which the paranoid constitution is organized, pathological overestimation of the self, suspiciousness, defective judgment, and social maladjustment. To these he added Bovaryism, quoting one work by the philosopher Jules de Gaultier and another by the psychiatrist Jeannie I. Perrin. 9. Bovaryism, derived from the name of the heroine of Fiaubert's F. A. Mao's novel, had made its philosophical debut in 1902 in the work of Jules de Gaultier, a Nietzschean who used it to denote all FORMS of delusion related to the ego and dissatisfaction, FROMFA fantasizing about being someone else to believe in FREE will. Alienists, in their efforts to save criminal lunatics FROM the guillotine, used the term to suggest that the accused were not responsible for their crimes. In 1925 Genii Perrin adopted the word invented by Gaultier and established a link between Bovaryism and paranoia. He put Foruard the idea of a gradual transition from a normal to a morbid state and described the paranoid constitution as an extreme form of pathological Bovaryism. Just as in 1928 he had approached hysteria with the theoretical tools provided by Bobinski, so in 193 one Lakin, describing the structures of paranoia, made use of a conservative doctrine with which a year later he would completely disagree. Thus he wrote of the paranoid patient as O.N.E. of the awkward squad, a schoolboy always in trouble, an autodidact admired by the ignorant, or a pathet I.C. rebel whose desire for pantheistic liberation was merely a symptom of delusion. If he's lucky, he wrote, and F.A.T.E. puts him. Psychiatry Teachers 2.5. In the right place H.E. may become a social or cultural reformer, a great intellectual. Oh the last part of the article contained Lakin's first written reference to the discoveries of Freud. But although he mentioned the theory of stages he immediately went on to defend the sacrosanct doctrine of constitutions. And when he spoke of the technicians of the unconscious, he swiftly went on to show that though they might be able to explain paranoia, they could anti-cure it. At the beginning of the 30s Lakin still hadn't made any real use of Fruidian theory. And at the same time that he was pracing Clarambled FORA theory he would soon demolish, he was also agreeing with Claude and mixing with the Surrealists, who were against putting the mentally ill in asylums and regarded the language of madmen as sublime involuntary poetry. It was an awkward situation. Clarambled, as Lakin knew very well, was a tyrant who expected undivided loyalty. He was also afraid of having his ideas stolen or copied. So when Lakin quoted Clarambled he was careful to add a fo at note, this image is borrowed from the oral teachings of our mentor, Monsieur G. de Clarambled, to whom we owe so much of both our matter and our manner that to avoid the charge of plagiarism we should really acknowledge him as the source of every expression we use. Taken aback by the ambiguity of this fulsome tribute, the head of the special infirmary promptly disowned his pupil. After the article was published he burst into a meeting of the Societe Medico-Psychologique and threw his inscribed copies of Lakin's works in their author's FACE, accusing him of plagiarism. Henry Ellenberger recalls the incident, he called Lakin a plagiarist, and with incredible nerve Lakin returned the compliment and told the elderly psychiatrist it was he who had plagiarized Lakin. It caused a great stir. Lakin had a marvelous flair for publicity. Too while he was praising Clarambolt, Lakin was making his way foruard in psychiatry under the auspices of Claude. It was with him and Pierre Migault that on May 2, 1, 1931, he presented two cases of simultaneous madness to the Societe Medico-Psychologique. According to traditional teaching, there were in such situations one inducing and one induced mania, the latter disappearing when the F.O. matter was removed. But in these particular cases no induction was involved. The patients were two mother and daughter pairs in whom paranoid delusion was the most prominent F.E. 
in Blanche, aged Farouti 4, it took a very peculiar FORM. She sees herself as a FOR headed monster with green eyes. What made her realize this is that her blood is scented. In high temperatures her skin goes hard and turns into metal, then she is covered with pearls and sprouts pieces of jewelry. Her genitals are quite unique, she has a pistol, like a flower. Her brain is FOR times as powerful as other people's brains, and her ovaries are tougher. She's the only woman in 26. FAT her FIGURES. The world who doesn't need to wash. The patient admits to some very strange habits. She makes broth with her menstrual blood, I drink some every day, it's very nourishing. She arrived at the hospital with Ruo her medically sealed bottles, one contained urine and the other stools, and both were wrapped in weirdly embroidered cloths. 1 3. After the cases of simultaneous madness, Lakin turned his attention to anomalies in writing, AND in November 1, 931, with Levy Valenci and Me Galt, he presented another case of female paranoia. 14 This one concerned Marcel, a 24 year old primary school teacher suffering FROM erotomania. She believed she was Joan of Arc and wanted to restore France to its FORM greatness. She thought what she wrote was revolutionary. I am renewing the language, she said. The old forms need shaking up. Her delusion concerned one of her professional superiors, a man who had died the previous year. Claire Rambold had sent Marcel to St. Anne's, she was claiming compensation of 20 million francs from the state for sexual and intellectual deprivation and dissatisfaction. The following is a sample of her inspired writing. Paris, May 14, 193 1. To the President of the Republic, Monsieur P. Daumer, at present on vacationing Il Gingerbread and Minstrel Land, dear M. President of the Assiduous Republic, I should like to know everything so as to give you the butt mouth so of a coward and of a test cannon, but it takes me much too long to guess. From the unkind things done to other people one might guess that my five vowels geese are chiqui and you are the bowler hat of the Virgin Mary and test pardon. But we must reduce everything from the Auvergne word list for unless one washes one's hands in a rock spring one will wear we the dry bed and Madeleine is without tratting the tart of all these new shaved men so as to be the best of her prayers of which is sweet and the cheek bright. I'd like to have said nasty things about the toll merchantess without prejudice to ple nary life and of free of charge one does some detective work. But one has to astonish people to be the accursed rascal off Barbanella and off Bidless one does some toll merchantess. The authors of the presentation didn't try to interpret any of Marcel's writing, they simply analyzed its paranoid structure in terms of semantic, stylistic, and grammatical abnormalities. They were drawing on the surrealist experience rather than the model provided by traditional psychiatry. In their opinion the mental automatism syndrome was not constitutional in origin but the result of a process similar to that which lay behind the poetic creations of Breton, Elliard, Parrot, and Desnos, i.e., it was partly automatic and partly deliberate. ISIF we compare Ikrit's inspires with the text published AFEW months year liar in the C-Maindum Bittaz de Paris, we see that Lakin was citing Simmel. Psychiatry Teachers 27. Taneously with two conflicting tendencies in the psychiatry of the day. On the one hand he was linking the notion of paranoid structure with a constitutionalist view of psychosis, assuming a norm and a need to repress that which departed from it. On the other hand he was subscribing to the idea that madness might be compared to an act of linguistic creation that was half staged elsewhere and half intentional. It was a strange set of contract adicetions, from Clarembault's teaching and his own reading of the French and German classics he derived the idea of structure, though this meant retaining the notion of constitutions, from the dynamic approach he took the study of the language of madness, which really implied abandoning constitutionalism. The presenters of the Marcel case also cited P.F.E. Arsdorf and Gillum T. U. L. E. on schizophrenia, head on aphasia, and H.E.N.R.I. Delacroix on language and thought. 
In the first quarter of the century these authors had studied the links between psychosis and anomalies in written and spoken language. Point 16 in 1913 Krepelin introduced the word schizophagia to denote a schizophrenic state of which the earliest symptom was disordered speech. Hence also the word schizography, which Lakin and his FREs used for a similar situation involving inspired writing. But the most interesting reference is to a work by Delacroix published in 1930, because it is a valuable indication of what the young Lakin was reading at this period. 17 In support of his thinking on aphasia, Delacroix, who taught Sartre philosophy, drew on Ferdinand de Saussure's course de linguistique générale, course in general linguistics, published in Geneva in 1915. 18 So there can no longer be any doubt about it, it was in this now forgotten writer that Lakin first came across Saussure's theory of language, of which he was to make such fr it full use two decades later. Crazy ladies. P-A-R-T-I-I. 4. The story of Marguerite. A.T. This point in his development Lakin came across a crucial article in the first number of Surrealisme au service de la Révolution, Surrealism in the Service of the Revolution, published in July 1930. This paper dash L. Anapuri, The Rotten Donkey, by Salvador Dalil made it possible for Lakin to break with the theory of constitutionalism and move on to a new understanding of language as it related to psychosis. Dali was putting for a novel thesis on paranoia. By now surrealism's first phase was over, and André Breto N.S. second manifesto had proclaimed the necessity of seeking out a point of mind from which man might resolve the contradiction between real life and dream. Experiment in hypnotically induced sleep and automatic writing was a thing of the past, a new field of operations must be found in political action. The old chimera of changing mankind must take concrete FORM, what was needed was a new technique FOR arriving at a knowledge of reality. Too it was at this point that Dolly made surrealism a present of his F.A. Mao's notion of paranoia criticism. IT is through a plainly paranoid process, he wrote, that it has been possible to obtain a double image, i.e., the representation of an object that, without any anatomical or figurative distortion, is at the same time a representation of a completely different object, itself devoid of any deformation or abnormality that might imply some kind of arrangement. 3. According to Dolly, paranoia functioned in the same way as hallucination, that is, as a delusional interpretation of reality. It was a pseudo-hallucinatory phenomenon, producing double images the image of a horse, for exam ple, might simultaneously be the image of a woman and the existence of the double image invalidated the classical psychiatric idea of paranoia as an error of judgment and reason gone mad. In other words, delusion is already an interpretation of reality, and paranoia a creative activity dependent on logic. 3-2 E-R-A-Z-Y-L-A-D-I-E-S At a time when Lakin was reading Freud, Dolly's point of view provided him with just the element he needed to turn his own clinical experience on paranoia into a theory. Point four, he asked to meet the painter, who received him in his hotel room with a bandage on the tip of his nose. Dolly expected his visitor to register some surprise, but he was disappointed. Lakin just sat and listened quietly as Dolly expounded his ideas. Point five, meanwhile, he had translated for the review J. Ranfay's De Psychanalyse, RFP an article by Freud entitled Somi Neurotic Mechanisms in Jealousy, Paranoia, and Homosexuality 6. The theme of this article related to Lakin's search for a new conception of paranoia, and Lakin's version for med part of an SPP project for translating some of Freud's work. Point seven. Although he didn't actually speak the language, Lakin had an excellent theoretical knowledge of German, which he had learned at the college Stanislas. His translation was remarkable, following the syntax of the original very closely and remaining faithful to both its FORM and its content. His version also showed how completely he accepted the terminology then current in the French psychoanalytic movement. Just like his contemporaries, he translated Trebe, Drive, as Instinct, Instinct, Trauer, Mourning, as Tristesse, Sorrow, and Regan, Motion, as tendance, tendency. 
He also undertook to translate for the RFP a chapter of Otto Fenichel's book on schizophrenia. 8. But this never came to anything. The year 193 one was a watershed for Lakin, for it was then that, starting from the basis of paranoia, he embarked on a synthesis of three areas of knowledge, clinical psychiatry, the teachings of Freud, and the second phase of surrealism. His remarkable knowledge of philosophy, and in particular of Spinoza, Jaspers, Nietzsche, Hust, and B. E. Rickson, also contributed to the making of the great work of Lakin's youth, his medical thesis. De la psychose paranoiac dans ses rapports avec la personalite, paranoid psychosis and its relation to personality, appeared in the winter of 1932 and made its author the leader of a school. The story of the encounter between Lakin and the woman he was to call Amy began at 8.00 in the evening on April 1, 1931. That evening Marguerite Pantain, aged 38, took a kitchen knife out of her purse and tried to kill the actress Huguette Dufflos when she arrived at the Theatre St. George's. The intended victim was due to play the lead in Tout Viabien, Everything's Fine, a play by Henry Jeanson that had opened three days earlier. The play, an undistinguished middle-class comedy about a sentimental lady, her poor but carefree lover, and a rich but boring financier, was designed to show that in the France of the 1930s, despite the economic crisis and the rise of the parties of the far right, all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Huguet Dufflos, confronted by her attacker at the stage door, coolly. The story of Marguerite 3-3. Grabbed the blade of the knife and deflected the blow, in the process severing a couple of tendons in the little finger of her right hand. Marguerite was overpowered and taken to the police station. From there she was sent to the special infirmary and then to the women's prison at St. Lazare, where she fell into a delusional state that lasted nearly three weeks. On June 3, 193 one, she was confined in the St. Anne Asylum on the recommendation of Dr. Truel, who diagnosed systematic persecution mania based on interpretation delusion, with megalomaniac tendencies and a substratum of erotomania 9. On the day after the murder attempt, various newspapers told the sad story of Marguerite Pantain, a countrywoman who had come down in the world and worked up her F.E. Ealings by reading novels and trying to get her own fiction published. She's a native of Auvergne, said the journal, stubborn, hard-faced, accentuating her masculine appearance by wearing a starched collar over her sweater. She has a good job in the postal order department of the Louvre Central Post Office, where she told us she earns 18,000 francs a year. She has few visitors apart from a couple of female teachers with whom she plays music and studies for examinations. She was certainly rather strange but didn't seem to think she was being persecuted low. Edouard T. O. Ulaus, asked for his opinion by L. E. Temps, characteristically used the old terminology of hereditary degeneration, in my view this is a clear case of persecution mania, and it probably manifested itself earlier by various irregularities or oddities of behavior that must have been obvious to those around her. It is my opinion that every criminal is to some extent degenerate, his or her particular anomaly reveals itself in outlandish conduct and strange words and actions that attract the attention of relatives and neighbors. I see no reason in this case to depart from what I never cease to maintain, it is in the best interest of such patients to come forward and apprise us of their situations. The prevention of crime is not merely possibly, it is easy. IIA novelist called Pierre Benoit told of the odd circumstances in which he had encountered Marguerite, the would-be murderess used to go regularly to my publisher's office in the hope of seeing me. One day I actually met her. The unfortunate woman is certainly not normal. She claimed she was targeted in several of my novels, the sub-JECTS of which, she repeatedly maintained, were suggested to me by Madame Huguette Dufflos. Perhaps the blows aimed at that charming actress were really intended for me. 1. To Pierre Benoit, a an author belonging to the conformist right, had come into prominence with the publication of Koenig's Mark in 191 he practiced a kind of mass production technique, 
with traditional plots set either against some exotic background or in the backward French provinces. Every 3 4 E R A Z Y L A D 1 E S book dealt with a similar situation, ran to the same number of pages, and had a heroine whose first name began with A. His A. T. Lantide, Atlantis, 1919, brought the famous Platonic myth up to date and set it in the French colonies. The quest for an imaginary wilderness was seen as an illustration of the tragedy of modern man, unable to resist the temptations of the de-evil as represented by W.O. Man in every shape and F.O. Room 13 The book shows a virtuous colonial army officer falling under the influence of Antonia, a satanic oriental figure luring the West to its destruction by enticing lost travelers to her palace in the Hagar. There, in the heart of the Sahara, she casts spells on her guests and turns them into mummies. It was against the author of such works that Marguerite Pantane directed her accusations. As F.O.R. Huguette Dufflos her real name was Hermans Hurt she bore some physical resemblance to the Antonia of B. E. Noit's novel. She was born in Tunis in 1891 and studied at the Paris Conservatoire. At the same time a member of the comedy Franis and a leading actress in the silent C.I.N. Emma, she was a melodramatic figure, haughty, mysterious, vulnerable, and emotional. She was the victim of her own celebrity, always in the news over her sensational lawsuits, one was against the comedy Franis, another against her husband. All the time she was in a state of delusion, Marguerite kept repeating how much she hated the actress. She asked reporters to correct the public's condemnation of herself because it might harm her future career as a writer. 14 She wrote to the manager of her hotel and to the Prince of Wales, complaining about the actresses and authors who were persecuting her. Then, when her delusions left her, she wept and completely reversed her attitude, saying Huguette Dufflos didn't wish her any harm, nor was anyone trying to persecute her. In any CASE, Madame Dufflos didn't bring charges, and everyone else was equally lenient toward the unfortunate postwoman. Jacques Lacan met her FOR the first time on June 1, 8, 1931. He took an immediate interest in the case and issued a two-week certificate written in the grand manner of Claire Ambult, Paranoid Psychosis. Recent delusions culminating in attempted homicide. Obsessions apparently resolved after the attack. Dreamlike state. I interpretations significant, extensive, and concentric and grouped around one overriding idea, threats to her son. Emotional preoccupation, her duty toward the latter. Polymorphic impulses provoked by anxiety, approaches to an author and to her F.U. tour victim. Urgent need to write. Results sent to English royal family. Others of a polemic or bucolic nature. Caffeine dependency. Dietary deviations, etc. 1 5 from that day on and for a whole year, Jacques Lacan and Marguerite Pantain were inseparable. By the time the brilliant psychiatrist had completed his extraordinary study, he had appropriated the woman's fate and made it into a case through which he projected not only his theories on the story of Marguerite 3 5. Madness in women but also his own fantasies and F. Emily obsessions. He filched all Marguerite's writings, her photographs, her whole life history, and he never gave any of it back. This meant a constant distortion of their relationship, a coldness and hostility between them that nothing could remove. Lakin was interested in the woman only in order to illustrate his ideas on paranoia and write a theoretical work that would make him the F.O. under of a new school of Freudian discourse. But she steadfastly refused to fill the role he wanted to F.O.R.C.E. on her. She was an unwilling collaborator and reproached Lakin as long as she lived F.O.R. using her case in support of a psychiatric method that she condemned as repressive. The FULL history of this strange incident can now be told because of various documents and accounts that have been made available to me. 16. A first Marguerite Pantain was born in Moriac, in the department of Cantal, on October 19, 1885. She was the daughter of John Baptiste Pantain and Jean Anna Donadu, who had been married in Chalvinac eight months earlier. Jean had two other daughters after Marguerite, Elise, 
born in September 1, 887 and known as Eugenie or Nene, and Maria, born 11 months later. But in December 1, 890 tragedy struck the young peas and family, one Sunday, Befo remass, five-year-old Marguerite went too near the fire in her best organdy dress and went up in flames before her younger sister Elisa's very eyes. Jean was pregnant again soon afterward and had a stillborn child on August 1, 2, 1891. Eleven more months went by, and on July 4, 1892, a fifth child and second Marguerite was born, the Marguerite Pantain who was to meet Jacques Lacan 39 years later. She was given the same first name as her dead sister. It is no accident, wrote her son, that my mother spent her whole life trying in every way she could to escape the flames of hell. That is what it means to f you'll fill one's fate. In her case a tragic one. 17 After the second Marguerite, Jean Donadou had three sons. Marguerite had a country childhood that F followed the rhythm of the passing seasons and recurring rural tasks and F o stirred in her a love of daydreaming and solitude. Her mother, Jean, whom P. E. Opal regarded as slightly crazy, was hypersensitive in her dealings with the rest of the village community. Her anxieties were easily transformed into suspicions, if the woman next door said she thought a sick animal might die, Jean would conclude that her neighbor meant to poison it. She often felt she was being spied on or persecuted and interpreted everything as a sign of ill will against herself. As her favorite daughter, Marguerite and J.O. yet special privileges, and her sisters grew J.E. a lose dot with her father and brothers she was tough and difficult, resisting WHLT she saw as tyrannical attempts at imposing authority. Elise Pantain, Marguerite's oldest surviving sister, got into the habit of 36 E R A Z Y L A D I E S. Running the house F O R her ailing mother. But in 1901, when she was F O R teen, Elise left the village to go to work in her uncle Guillaume's grocery store in town. In 1906, he married her. Meanwhile, Marguerite, who was exceptionally good at her lessons, was sent away to a school where her parents hoped she might start to train as a teacher. But she missed the country and accused the lay mistresses of neglecting their pupils. What she hankered after was the grandeur of some religious ethic. In 191 0 she went to live with her married sister. By this time she was a tall girl of 18, sturdily built, strong-willed, clever, sensitive, and good-looking. She had left school and given up the idea of teaching in order to take a job in the post office. In town she was soon seduced by the local Don Juan. This affair, wrote Lakin, which displays all the enthusiasm and blindness typical of the innocent, was to determine the course of her affections for three years. 1-8 Although she was transferred to a remote village, Marguerite went on loving her seducer and had thoughts for nothing else. She wrote to him in secret, hiding her feelings from her colleagues. This pausion lasted for three years, after which Marguerite's love turned to hatred and the for Don Juan was demoted to the rank of CAD. Marguerite was then moved to Malone, where she remained until 191.7. Meanwhile she had fallen in love again, this time with a female post office worker, Mademoiselle C. de N. This practice schemer, as Lakin called her, belonged to a noble family that had been reduced to working for its living. Mademoiselle C. de N. had nothing but contempt for her job in the post office and set herself up among her colleagues as an authority on fashion and manners. Marguerite was an easy prey. Mile C. de N. regaled her with stories that might have come straight out of Madame Bovary. It was FROMMLLE C to N that Marguerite first heard about Huguette Dufflos and Sarah Bernhard. The FOMR was supposed to have lived on the same landing as one of the ELE Gant postwoman's aunts, while the latter was said to have met her mother in a convent. Marguerite, listening to all this, came to look down her nose at the humble world surrounding her and dream of a better universe full of platonic ideas, manly strength, and romance. When she decided out of the blue to marry one of her post office colleagues, Mile C. Dan encouraged her in extravagant expense. 
This lengthy period of almost hypnotic suction lasted F.O. or years and came to an end only when the Practic E.D. schemer was moved to another post. But the two women went on writing to one another. René Ancia was the son of a baker in Set, on the south coast of France. Orphaned at twelve, he nonetheless rose rapidly through the ranks of the post office and became an inspector. He liked traveling around by bicycle and studying the geography of communications on the spot. Level-headed. The story of Marguerite 37. Pragmatic, simple, and f-o-n-d of sport, he seemed like a steady and balanced character j-u-s-t the opposite of Marguerite. When she decided the moment had come to marry and that he was to be her husband, her f-a-m-a-l-e made objections, her lethargy, her habitual daydreaming, and her craze for reading rendered her unsuitable for marriage. But the betrothed couple disregarded all warnings, exchanged confessions about their pasts, and were married on October 30, 1917. Despite Marguerite's attempts at housekeeping, the couple was soon at loggerheads. Rene hated anything that wasn't definite and down to earth and couldn't stand seeing his wife spend all her time reading books and learning for languages. She for her part complained that he took no interest in things that concerned her. Each invoked the other's premarital confessions and used them as a basis for retrospective ahia lusi. The wife's sex ual frigidity did nothing to soothe the husband's aggressiveness, and soon the ill-assorted relationship was heading for the rocks. Marguerite's behavior gave cause for alarm, she took to laughing for no apparent reason, moving in fits and starts when she was walking, and compulsively washing her hand s. It was a t about this time that Guillaume Pantain died ofa war wound. Elise, his widow, had had a complete hysterectomy fo or years earlier and could never have any children. So, not knowing what to do with herself, she sought refuge with her sister Marguerite in Malun, where she took over the housekeeping that should have been Marguerite's role vis avis René. Marguerite, ousted from a position she had never managed to occupy as you see successfully herself, grew even more estranged from her husband and lost the power to struggle against her own pathological tendencies. Although she felt humiliated by her sister's intrusion and constant criticism, she let herself be dominated by Elise in just the same way as she had submitted to MLLEC to N. But while part of the time Marguerite admitted the contrast between Elisa's strengths and her own inefficiency, there were also moments when she silently rebelled against her sister's tyranny. The results of this ambiguity were disastrous. In July 1, 921 Marguerite found she was pregnant, but in her case the prospective h happy event only brought on persecution mania, accompanied by fits of melancholy. Her colleague's conversation, wrote Lakin, seemed to be directed against her. They appeared to be criticizing what she did, slandering her, and predicting misfortune. Passers-by in the street whispered about her and looked down their noses. She spotted hostile references to herself in the newspapers. One nine her confusion grew worse as her pregnancy advanced, and nightmares were added to the persecutions of the day. Sometimes she would dream of coffins. Sometimes she would get out of bed and hurl an iron at Renee's head. One day she slashed the tires of a fellow worker's bicycle. 38. C-R-A-Z-Y-L-A-D-I-E-S. In March 1922 she produced a daughter, but the child was stillborn, strangled by its own umbilical cord. She at once blamed the accident on her E.N.E. mice. And because her former colleague, the practice schemer, telephoned to ask how she was, Marguerite immediately held her responsible for what had happened. For many days she withdrew into herself, refusing to speak and abandoning her usual religious observances. When she became pregnant for the second time she fell into another depression, but when the child was born, in July 1923, she grew passionately devoted to it. This time it was a boy, who was named Didier. Just as Marguerite herself had come into the world after a stillborn child, itself conceived in order to replace an earlier Marguerite, so Marguerite's son S.U.C. seed the stillborn sister. That dead sister, he wrote later, the symbol of my parents' first F.A. Illier, 
lingered on FORA long while in all they said and thought. I was the second born, a child to be cared for and watched over all the more intently because it must be saved from its predecessors sad fate. I suffered the consequences of their far that it might happen again. In order to justify my mother and father, I had to survive at all costs. But they looked on my survival as very uncertain. The slightest attack of indigestion, the fa indus draft, was seen as a threat. All this put me in a very peculiar and difficult situation. I was supposed to take the place of a dead girl. Two o for months Marguerite doted exclusively on her son. She refused to let anyone else go near him or fe at him until he was fo 13 months old. Sometimes she would stuff him with FOOD so rich that he threw it up, at other times she would FOR get to give him his bottle. TO protect him FROM contact with the air she wrapped him up in layer on layer of clothing. Looking back as an adult, he compared his infant self to the center of an onion. His mother started quarreling with those around her and interpreting everything they said as threats. One day she accused some motorists of driving too near the perambulator in which she was taking the child for an airing. On another occasion she for got all about him and let him suck the grease off one of its wheels. It was then that Elise, the baby's godmother, decided to make up for her own childlessness by taking charge of Didier herself. From then on Marguerite felt completely alienated from her surroundings. She planned to go to America obtained a passport made out in the name of payrolls, and handed in her notice at the post office. Point two one her idea was to seek her effortun in F.O. Rainlands and become a novelist, and she refused to give up these extravagant notions despite all Elisa's and Renee's effulminations. So they decided to have her put into a clinic in Epinay. From there she issued vigorous protests against her incarceration. I can't help being really amused, she wrote, at the way I'm always a victim, always misunderstood. Mother of God, when I think of all that's happened to me. The story of Marguerite 39. You know the story, almost everyone knows it, people run me down so constantly. And as I know from your books that you dislike injustice, I appeal to you to do something for me 22. During the time she was kept in the clinic Marguerite lost touch with reality and sank deep into megalomania. On admission she was described as delusional, with a background of mental weakness, hallucination and persecution mania, bulletin t after six months, at her FAMILY's request, she was released. She rested for a while, took charge of her son again, and went to see Mile C. D. N., intending thereby to make up for all the harm she had wished her. Of course Marguerite's hostess had no idea she was supposed to have persecuted her for met her colleague. In August 1925 Marguerite left Malone and her family. She had asked to be transferred to Paris in order to track down those she imagined were trying to destroy her son. She soon embarked on a very weird way of life. On the one hand there was the everyday world of her post office activities, in which she more or less adapted to reality. On the other hand she led an imaginary existence made up of dreams and delusions. On the right bank, Marguerite worked in the central post office in the Rue du Louvre, on the left bank she lived in the Hotel de la Nouvelle France in the Rue saint andre de arts As soon as she left her place of work she became an intellectual, taking private lessons, haunting libraries, addicted to coffee. But despite all her efforts she failed one professional examination and in three attempts at the baccalaureate. While she was leading this double life, Marguerite's delusions grew worse. One day, hearing someone mention Huguette Dufios, she remembered a conversation she had once had with Mile C. D. N. in which I had spoken ill of her. Everyone else said she was well-bred and distinguished. But I said she was a whore. That must be why she has a grudge against me 23. Marguerite had come to believe the actress was trying to persecute her, and as the Paris PAPERs were always talking about Huguette Duflos' quarrels with the comedy Frenrise, she became angry about the amount of attention the press paid to the theatrical FR Ader Nighty. She went twice to have a look at her FU tour victim, first at the theater, 
where Madame Dufios was playing the Grand Duchess Aurora in a stage adaptation of Pierre Benoit's novel Koenig's Mark, and then at the movies, where Dufios appeared in the FM version directed by Leon Sperre. The plot told of a murder set in a Gothic palace, complete with brocade hangings, paneling and trompel or corridors. The name of the actress was popularly linked with that of the author. Marguerite believed two more leading figures in the Paris theatre were among her persecutors. Sarah Bernhardt and Colette were both adored and successful women, living in luxury. Both also embodied an ideal that of a freedom painfully won and maintained at some cost to which Marguerite. 40 Arazi Y Lad IES. Herself had always aspired, though she had never achieved any success, either social or intellectual. The great Sarah had died in 1923. In everyday life she, like Zola, had been a passionate defender of Dreyfus, on the stage she had been sublime as the doomed prince in Rostand's El Aglan and as the melancholy revolutionary heroine, Theroyne de Mary Court, in Hervieux's play of that name. Colette, still very much alive and at the height of her career, had published I. E. Bli and Herb, The Unripe Corn, in 1923, using her own name for the first time. At the age of 53 she was causing a great scandal by living with a pearl merchant 16 years her junior. Marguerite's delusions were at the mercy of her reading. She had only to open a newspaper to see references to her own private life. One murky affair in particular, dating from 1923, fostered all her fantasies of murder and revenge. Philippe, grandson of Alphonse Daudet, the author of I. Etre de Montmoulin and Tartarin de Tarascon, and son of Leon Daudet, a right wing journalist, had shot himself in the head after unsuccessfully trying to persuade his anarchist FRNs to assassinate his F.A. there. But Alphonse Daudet refused to believe his grandson had committed suicide and accused the anarchists of murdering him. Marguerite, transposing this imbroglio to apply to herself, believed that the Ogpu the Russian secret police was planning to kill her son, Didier.24 During her first year in Paris she did all she could to bring about a meeting between herself and Pierre Benoit, a member of the French Academy, even going so far as to lie in wait for him at a bookshop he often patronized. Wh and she actually approached him and reproached him for exposing her private life to public view, he took her for. Some brazen and mysterious eccentric. However, stung by her accusations, he took her for a walk in the Bois de Boulogne, where she claimed to have recognized herself in Albert, the heroine of his latest book. Admittedly, Benoit's writings might have been designed to fuel the madness of this unusual reader. Albert told the story of a mother who took her son-in-law as her lover, unaware of the FACT that he had killed his wife. After a stormy ten years, the incestuous mother finds out about the murder and denounces both herself and her daughter's murderer. Marguerite, who saw this somber affair as a reflection of her own fate, told Lakin I was both that mother and that daughter. 25. At this point one is bound to remember the story of Marie Felicit Leff of Brie, which Marie Bonaparte related and commented on in the first issue of the RFP.26 Lakin later referred admiringly to the case. In August 1923 Marie Felicit Lefebvre shot dead her pregnant daughter Renia. The court at Douai found her responsible for her actions and sentenced her to death. Marie Bonaparte bravely intervened in the name of psychoanalysis, maintaining that the crime had been committed in a state of The Story of Marguerite 41 Delusion in which the murderess was unconsciously acting out a death wish previously entertained in relation to her own mother. In Pierre Benoit's story, a husband who murdered his wife slept with his mother-in-law. In the case of Madame Leff of Brie, a mother became a murderer out of hatred for her own mother and to prevent her son from having any offspring. Both narratives dealt with a sinister trio of characters in which the places of mother and daughter were interchangeable, where the daughter was always the victim and the son sometimes a murderous and sometimes a passive husband. Marguerite didn't make any reference to the story of Marie Felicit Lefebvre, though it was a frequent subject of press comment at that period. Her delusions found enough raw material in her reading of Albert, her meeting with B.E. Noit, Colette's flamboyant way of life, and Huguette Duflos's lawsuits.
she referred to Benoit by the hated name of Robespierre and anathematized all J.O. Ernalists, artists, and poets, whom she held responsible for Bolshevism and war, poverty, and corruption. She saw herself as crusading against them all to restore the ideal of brotherhood among nations. She sent poems and anonymous letters to the Prince of Wales, asking for his protection. She warned him, the object of her erotomania, to beware of the plots F.O. meant against him by revolutionaries and printed in italics in the newspaper S, and she covered the walls of her room with press clippings about his life and travels. Her anti-Bolshevism didn't stop her laying siege to a communist newspaper to try to make them publish articles against Colette and expounding Marguerite's own claims and complaints. At the same time she made a complaint at her local police station against Pierre Benoit and the Libre Iri Flammarion. Then, in order to devote herself more completely to her leader Airy career, she stopped spending her leaves with her family. She believed she had a mission and would waylay passers-by in the street to regale them with wild stories. Some of the people she approached were none too scrupulous, and she had more than one narrow escape when she found the encounter was ending up in a hotel room. In August I-930, eight months before the murder attempt, Marguerite wrote two novels one after the other and had them typed. The first, L.E. Detractor, The Detractor, was dedicated to the Prince of W.A.L.S. and told of a rural idol that unfolded in time with the seasons of the year. The author rhapsodized about the virtues of life lived in tune with nature, in the manna of Rousseau and using a regional vocabulary. The country was idealized, the city seen as a source of corruption and decadence. The hero, David, was a young peasant whose mother had died after drinking M. Erky water. He was in love with a girl called Amy. Her portrait was peppered with references to rural lore and terminology, Amy worked like a real country. 42 era Z Y lad I E S. Woman. She could pay filer refurbish old clothes, defro icer iron a mountain of laundry after the harvest, and pick out the best cheese from the glass wicker tray. She never killed a FOWL that was too stringy and knew how to measure out jointees bushels of grain and gather bunches of leaves for animals that went off their fodder in winter. She co old cooked chicken so that it was easy for children to eat and make dolls for them out of beads, cardboard, and different kinds of pastry. She could cook an elegant meal for special occasions, river trout in cream sauce, chicken stuffed with chestnuts, a dish of fish stew 27. But during the summer a stranger and a courtesan came to the village and sowed discord in Amy's family. The woman was P.A. int like an autumn rosebush, with roses too bright for her black and leafless branches she wore shoes not meant to be walked in and was altogether like a museum, a collection of models so outlandish and eccentric that the general effect was grotesque. The sinister couple's baneful influence soon spread throughout the village as a whole, until the place was F.U.L.L. of rumors, plots, and affations. In the autumn, misfortune struck Amy's own family. Her brothers and sisters started to waste away, her mother fell ill, and she herself was the subject of calumny. She took refuge in dreams. She watched enviously as a happy family passed along the main road, a proud husband and a wife with a child smiling up at her as it nursed at her breast. When winter came the sinister strangers went away. The novel ended with Amy's death and her mother's despair. The story embodied significant figures in Marguerite S. Madness, a lovelorn heroine with a name straight out of the novels of Pierre B. E. Noit, a courtesan in whom we recognize the F. E. male celebrity at once admired and despised, a slanderer who hatches plots, and a F. A. Mille destroyed by a malevolent couple. The second novel, S. A. U. F. Vautry Respect, with all respect, was also dedicated to the Prince of Wales. It told the same story as the L.E. Detractor, but in reverse. This time the heroine, instead of staying in the country to become the victim of invaders from the city, took up her cloak and dagger and rode off to conquer Paris and the French Academy. First she observed with the horror and dismay of an innocent the various spectacles presented by a cor rupt civilization. Then she came up against the great buccaneer, her chief persecutor, also known as T. He hard-assed incorruptible, who was in charge of the guillotine. 
He didn't drink, and he didn't have women, but he cravenly killed thousands of them. Blood flowed from the place du trone to the BA still, and the carnage didn't stop until Bonaparte trained his guns on Paris 28. After traversing the dark alleys of this urban inferno, full of communists and decapitators, the heroine attacked the republic itself, together with writers and street performers, whom she accused of wanting to kill. The Story of Marguerite 43 Her in Effigy Against all these she took up the defense of monarchy, criticizing religion and explaining miracles as the result of suggestion. Miracles are not found among all Christians, she wrote. But it is difficult to make you understand an obvious fact already accepted by the medical profession. You probably approach your particular idol with so much emotion it makes you forget your sufferings and endows you with fresh strength. No doubt you have at some time been cured of a headache by a frene telling you an amusing story, similarly, when the emotion involved is in proportion to a much loftier kind of feeling, you are in the presence of a miracle 29. At the end of the narrative the country lass goes back home to her streams and meadows and the bosom of an idyllic family. On September 13, 1930, Marguerite left a manuscript at the office of the Libra Iri Flammarion. She had signed it with her maiden name. Two months later the editorial committee turned the book down. When Marguerite heard the news she demanded to see the general secretary, but he was busy and asked the literary editor to talk to her instead. When he did so, Marguerite brandished the letter of rejection and wanted to know the name of the person responsible. When the literary editor declined to tell her, she fell upon and nearly strangled him, yelling, you're a pack of academics and murderers, 3 -oh. She was thrown out but couldn't accept the FACT that all her hopes had been fr frustrated. During the long period of wandering that led up to the murderous attack in April 1931, she felt a violent longing for revenge rising within her. She asked her landlord to lend her a revolver and, when he refused, asked for a stick with which to fr item them, the publishers. One last time she sought the protection of the Prince of W.A.L.S., sending him both her novels and letters signed with her own name. Every day she went out to Malone to make sure her son wasn't being attacked. In January she told her sister she was going to get a divorce. She accused her husband of beating both herself and the child. In March she bought a hunting knife from a shop in the place Coquilier. On April 17, a private secretary at Buckingham Palace sent back her letters and novels with a formal note. She received it in her cell in the women's prison. It read, The private secretary is returning the typed manuscripts which Madame A has been good enough to send, as it is contrary to their majesty's rule to accept presents from those with whom they are not personally acquainted. 31. 5. In praise of Paranoia A.T. the Hopital St. Anne Lakin spent a year doing all he could to build up a case of self-punishment paranoia, though this was closer to his own theoretical preoccupations than to Marguerite Pantin's true situation. Marguerite, whose attempt at murder had failed, did present real signs of paranoia, and she was undoubtedly suffering simultaneously from persecution mania, megalomania, and mystical delusion but there is nothing to show that her paranoia was as structured and organized as Lakin maintains. Even so he managed to hand down to posterity a case history that came to contain more truth than just the FATE of Marguerite herself, a woman whose real name was swallowed up in the anonymity of a psychiatric ward and whose individual identity was long to remain in oblivion. In his dealings with her, Lakin moved freely from clinical psychiatry to sociological research, and FROM psychological investigation to medical examination, without trying to listen to any truths other than those that confirmed his own hypotheses. He concealed the patient's real identity under the name of Amy, a character in L.E. Detractor, one of the novels Marguerite had tried in vain to publish. He said she worked FOR the railways, and he used initials when referring to people and places in her life. He also modified certain events in her story to such an extent that it is still difficult even now to distinguish between intentional distortions and genuine mistakes. He asked his frene Guillaume de Tard, son of a well-known sociologist, 
to do a graphological analysis of the patient's handwriting. Detard's report mentioned indications of artistic leanings, culture, infantilism, anxiety, and an exaggerated tendency to insist on one's rights. But not for a moment did it mention psychosis. Lakin put forward five f eighters to be taken into account in defining paranoia, personality, psychogenic f eighters, process, discordance, and parallelism. Though he didn't actually cite George's Pulitzer, he made use of his work. In praise of paranoia 4-5. On concrete psychology, in particular la critique de fondement est de fa psychologie, critique of the foundations of psychology, published in 1928.2 but it was from Ramon Fernandez that Lakin borrowed the term personality 3. Which he held to be influenced by three things, biographical development, meaning the way subjects reacted to their own experience, self-concept, meaning the way they brought images of themselves into their consciousness, and tension sifsodal relations, meaning their impressions of how they affected other people. Point four with this definition Lakin introduced, as Freud had done before him, a characteristic idea that was to recur throughout his intellectual career. In I9J2 he saw the subject as simply the sum of conscious and unconscious representations brought into play dialectically in relationship with other people and with society in general, in other words he was presenting the subject in terms of psychiatric phenomenology. As FOR personality, it had a special organization that acted as a corrective to the phenomenological aspect. Lakin called this organization psychogeny, referring to Henry E. Wise's critical work on mental automatism. Lakin deliberately used the term psychogeny rather than psychogenesis because it was f u rather away from constitutionalism. m. It didn't involve any organogenesis or imply any static f functioning, and it did incorporate the idea of dynamism. Th reconditions were necessary to make a symptom psychogenic, the causal event had to be determined in terms of the history of the subject, the symptom itself had to reflect a state in the psychical history of the subject, and the treatment had to depend on a modification of the subject's life situation. Without rejating organic causality altogether, Lakin emphasized that it fell -l outside the sphere of psychogeny. He was thus simultaneously challenging three other hypotheses the theory, put F. O. Ruard by Sirios and Capgras, according to which there was a core or kernel of conviction in Insan Ity. Claram Bault's theory on the syndrome of mental automatism, and Ernest Dupre's theory on the F.O. or cardinal signs of paranoid construction. According to Lakin, the etiology of paranoia and of psychosis in general was related to the concrete history of the sub-JECT's relations with the world, even when symptoms of organic origin were also involved. This approach derived from the work of Eugene Minkowski, whom Lakin quoted with admiration. Minkowski, AFO under member of the Evolution Psychiatric, EP, Psychiatric Evolution, Group, had introduced the phenomenological ideas of Edmund Husserl and Ludwig Benzwanger into post-war French psychiatry. Point five as early as 1923, when dealing with a case of melancholia, Minkowski had invoked a comprehensive theory of mental illness centered on the existential history of the sub-JECT in his relation with time, space, and other people and making use of a notion about change in these relationships that conceived of structure as dynamic rather than static. 46 era ZY LAD IES But Lakin invoked this terminology only to re-JECT it at once in F.A. Vore of that of Carl Jaspers, from whom he borrowed the notion of process. The French translation of general psychopathology had caused a great stir when it appeared in 1928. Paul Nizan and Jean-Paul Sartre, both students at the time at the École Normale Supérieure, ENS, in the Rue d'Ulm, had helped in the preparation of the French text. Point six in this major work, first published in Berlin in 1913, J. Asper showed how psychiatric thought could be organized on the basis of clinical differentiation between psychoses. To this end he made a distinction between practices of meaning and sciences l causation. The former belonged to the realm of mere comprehension, verstehen, the latter to that of the explicable, irreclerum. In the case of comprehension, each state depends on the preceding state, 
a lover reacts by becoming jealous if he is deceived, a student is miserable when he fails his examination and happy if he passes. But in the case of the explicable there is an element of incomprehensibility. And in order to understand it one must resort to a logic different from that of reaction to FACT. The voices heard by someone suffering from hallucinations, the persecutions imagined by a paranoid person, belong to the realm of the explicable because of a causal concatenation. Hence the idea of process, which implies a change in the life of the psyche and falls outside the comprehensional relation when it gives a rational account of the non-meaning characteristic of delusio n. It is easy to imagine how helpful Lacan found such a notion I n constructing a science of personality. The idea allowed him to assign more importance to a formal logic of causality than to a mere comprehension of meaning. But, as Fran O. I. S. Legill has observed, Lakin was putting F. O. Ruard a biased application of Jaspers's work.7 Having already absorbed the main principles of Freud's discoveries, Lakin didn't need to see the comprehensibly and the explicable as distinct, he knew they were hand in glove with one another. That is why he worked out the theory of the three causes, which, while not strictly Freudian, was still very different from Jaspers. At all events, it contradicted the idea of dichotomy. I shall come back to this later. It remains to be determined why Lakin was so zealous in invoking other men's works and claiming to base his own arguments on them, when in real it why he was departing from their teachings, leaving behind mere skeletons. The fact is that Lakin treated Jaspers just as he treated most of the authors by whom he was influenced. Every conceptual borrowing, every reference to an idea, Every glance at a theory served only to make him distance himself and act simultaneously as destroyer of old values, heir to a long and venerable tradition, and solitary pioneer of new knowledge. As elusive as a phoenix, he was forever playing off classicism against modernism, subversion against ancestor worship. Then he would transform himself into an oppo. In praise of Paranoia 47. Nant of his own theories. And all this was conveyed by means of a Baroque style in which a dialectic between presence and absence alternated with a logic of space and motion. Lakin's F.A. signation with Marguerite was also like a game of hide and seek. He came of a long line of drapers, vinegar merchants, and grocery salesmen, but he had refused to go into trade, dreaming instead of intellectual power and glory. With him the will to succeed was the most important signifier in a Bovary-like desire f-o-r-a change of identity. Marguerite was in a way his double, less well-off and closer to the soil than he was, but descended f-r-o-m the same broad mass of the French people, la France profonde. She too aspired to fame and intellectual success. And so, though in 193 one Lakin had been denouncing males who were paranoid and consigning them to the hell of insanity, a year later he was performing a turnabout because of a lonely self-educated woman whose fate might have been his if instead of pursuing a career in medicine he had lapsed into wandering and delusion. It was probably necessary that Lakin's paranoid patient be a woman for him to be able to see, in the mirror she held out to him, a reverse image of his own family universe, a normal enough universe, but one in which the extravagances of madness might exist for years disguised as ordinary love. Lakin was thinking of his brother's sequestered life as well as Amy's criminal passion when he wrote the following lines. Modern society leaves the individual in a cruel state of moral isolation, one s chaly painful in regard to occupations so indeterminate and ambiguous that they themselves may be a source of permanent internal conflict. Others besides myself have emphasized the extent to which the ranks of paranoia are swelled by those unjustly denigrated as inferior or limited schoolmasters and schoolmistresses, governesses, women employed in minor intellectual activities, self-educated people of all kinds. That's why it seems to me this type of subject should greatly benefit from being incorporated, according to his individual abilities, into some kind of religious community. Here. In addition to other advantages, he would experience a disciplined satisfaction of his own self-punishing tendencies. If this ideal solution is not available, any community would serve the purpose so long as to some extent it fulfilled the same conditions, the army, for instance, 
any militant political or social grouping, or some association devoted to good works, philosophy, or moral uplift. It is well known, moreover, that such kinds of social outgoing afford people with repressed homosexual tendencies a satisfaction that is all the greater because it is sublimated and so less likely to lead to any conscious revelation. Point eight. Lakin's exposition of Amy's case served both as an illustration to the first part of his thesis and as the hub around which his arguments revolved. In dealing with it, he was leaving the realm of psychiatry for that of psychoanalysis. Henceforward he would borrow clinical concepts from Freud and his disciples while looking to philosophy for the theoretical infrastructure of his work. He demonstrated first of all how the unconscious mean. 48 era ZY LAD IES. Ing of the paranoid theme was to be seen in a detire ado mechanism in which the elder sister stood for the mother, and then how the onset of Marguerite's paranoia coincided with the loss of her first child, he also showed that the patient's erotomania was linked to an element of homosexuality. On the one hand Marguerite was attracted by famous women because they represented her ego ideal, on the other hand she fell in love with the Prince of Wales both to confirm her rejection of homosexual relationships and to obscure the drives that impelled her toward her own sex. By striking at the actress she was striking at her own ideal, but, wrote Lakin, t he object she strikes has a purely symbolic value, and the act brings her no relief. Nonetheless, by the blow that rendered her guilty in the eyes of the law, Amy has also struck at herself, and this brings her the satisfaction of fulfilled desire, and the delusion, having become superfluous, disappears. It seems to me that the nature of the cure reveals the nature of the disease 9. If Amy struck herself and thus brought about her own punishment, it was because she was transforming a paranoid demand for satisfaction into a self-punishment paranoia. And Lakin regarded this mechanism as a genuine prototype, so much so that he wanted to add a new entity to the already copious nosology of psychiatry 1. 0. Applying this approach to Marguerite's case, Lakin took up again the theory of the three causes. In his view, the efficient cause of Amy's psychosis resided in the moral conflict with her sister. This determined the structure and permanence of the symptom and manifested itself in a fixation of the personality at the sibling complex stage. Added to this were the occasional or immediate cause, which brought about a change in the organization of the subject, and the specific cause, which was the concrete and reactive tendency. In Amy's case, the latter was a drive toward self-punishment. With this theory of three causes, Lakin rejected any idea that psychosis might have a Singele origin. On the contrary, he reinforced the notion of multiple determination. 1 1 While an illness has no single cause, it has no single essence either, since its nature is shown by the nature of its cure. In other words, madness arises out of a life, and thus out of a materialist nexus and a materialist nexus whose materialism is a historical materialism, at that. Thus Lakin accorded special importance to the history of the personality, in this context, paranoia emerged as a reorganization of the personality, a transformation of the ego, a hiatus between a prior situation and the onset of madness. As for the self-punishment paranoia, one of its distinctive F.E. achievers was that it was curable. And if this particular form of psychosis could be cured, why not revive the great idea that madness itself could be both cured and prevented? This was a notion put forward just before the French Revolution by Philippe Pinel. In praise of Paranoia 49. But abandoned by his successors as asylums multiplied and belief grew in the organic origins of mental illness. But Lakin did not move in this direction. He was hostile to the encycloptists and the spirit of the Enlightenment and never advocated the virtues of moral treatment. He thought madness was inscribed in the heart of man like a web made up of many threads or causes, but he didn't believe it contained a vestige of reason that might always manage to gain some ground over F.O.L.L.Y. He approached the continent of madness F.R.O.M. the direction of the Freudian revolution and the primacy of the unconscious. And just as the Freudian revolution had solved the vexed question of the relation between fr Edom and alienation man is free, but he is not master in his own house so Lakin rejected en masse the philosophical prejudices that, as he saw it, 
dominated the history of medicine. He dismissed with equal vehemence both vitalism, which posited a vital principle connecting the body and the soul, and mechanism, which reduced life to a mere interplay between moving ephoruses. For the true FO under of psychiatric observation, Lakin looked back beyond Pinal, Esculapius, Galen, and especially Esquirol, whom he regarded as the wicked stepfather of psychiatry, to Hippocrates. 1. 2. To inflict on all psychologists and organicists the unkindest cut of all, he didn't hesitate to leap across 23 centuries and proclaim himself the direct and legitimate heir to the god of medicine preferably the Greek version of the divinity. But being obliged to descend from the heights of Olympus into the ordinary world below, he recommended that treatment be adapted to the nature of the illness. He thereby wisely abandoned the repressive attitude he had adopted when he was still a disciple of Clarambold and instead sang the praises of psychoanalytic therapy, prophylaxis, and tolerance. In short, in spite of himself he was joining the main current of Enlightenment alienism and dynamic psychiatry, represented in France by the school of Claude and the F.O. unders of the E.P. and the S.P.P. But Lakin took up his position on a different epistemological terrain. Before him, the first generation of French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts had introduced the teachings of Freud into a psychiatry based on a recasting of the heredity and degeneration theory, it was by absorbing the new into the old that the status quo was modified. Now, for the first time in the history of the French movement, Lacan inverted the process and produced a novel confrontation between dynamism and Freudianism, a close encounter of the second kind. 1-3 Not only did he refuse to incorporate psychoanalysis into psychiatry, he also showed the absolute necessity of putting the Freudian unconscious first in any nosography-derived from psychiatry. Furthermore, he didn't hesitate to value German philosophical and psychiatric thinking above its French counterparts. He thus became the 50 Erezy Y Lad IES spokesperson for those of his contemporaries who believed that the Chauvinism of their elders, together with their insistence on a mythical Latin and classical background, needed to be replaced by a genuinely scientific approach. Lakin's anti chauvinism, combined with his stress on the primary importance of the Freudian unconscious, brought him close to the position of the surrealists vis a vis Freud's doctrines. Lakin was thus the first of the second generation of French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts to effect a synthesis between the two main paths by which Freud's thought had penetrated France. And yet even while he was inaugurating the reversal that was to turn him into a founding father, Lakin was using a Freudian terminology that conformed to the prevailing orthodoxy, the therapeutic problem regarding psychosis, he wrote seems to me to make a psychoanalysis of the ego more necessary than a psychology of the unconscious, in other words, it is likely to find technical solutions in a better study of the subject's resistances and a new analysis of their manipulation. We do not blame a technology that is still in its infancy for not having found these solutions before, we have no right to do so, given our own profound inability to suggest any other controlled psychotherapy 14. If Lakin accorded such primary importance to resistances and the analysis of the ego, as against the exploration of the unconscious, it was because at this stage he still shared an idea of Freudianism based on one particular reading of the theory of the unconscious. Two interpretations were possible after 1920, one aimed at reviving the idea that unconscious determination exercised supreme power over the subject, the ID being stronger than the ego, while the other ascribed the most important influence to the ego. But during the period between the two world wars the second interpretation came to prevail within the 1PA because it favored the so-called standard techniques thought necessary in the training of psychoanalysts. 1-5 And it was through this second interpretation that Lakin discovered psychoanalytic practice, if not Freud's teaching itself so there was a disparity between the theoretical advance Lakin was making in knowledge of psychiatry and the terminology he was using to think it through. It was as if at this period Lakin couldn't match his Freudian revision of the field of psychiatry with an adequate reading of Freud's work on the unconscious. His entering into analysis with Lowenstein in June 1932 probably had something to do with this discrepancy. Be that as it may, 
Lakin was very uneasy about his inability to give Amy the full Freudian treatment, I should like to note, in conclusion, he wrote, that if one did not subject my patient to psychoanalysis, the omission, which was not made voluntarily on my part, circumscribes both the scope and the value of my work. 16. Lakin had begun to take an interest in Marguerite in. In praise of Paranoia 5i. June 1931, a year before he began his own analysis. The fact that he felt it necessary to mention the omission and to stress that he was not responsible for it shows how he situated his thesis in the evolution of his own development, it is still a work of psychiatry as well as being already a psychoanalytic text. We know now, thanks to the afterword Didier and C.A. wrote F.O.R. Jean Aloysius' book on the story of Marguerite, that it was she who declined to be analyzed by Lakin. W. Hen he examined her in the course of a series of interviews, writes and C.A.U., Lakin was not yet trained as a psychoanalyst and made no attempt at psychotherapy, a kind of treatment that in any case she would have refused, she often told my wife and myself that she found Lakin too attractive and too much of a clown to be trusted. 17. 6. Reading G. Spinoza. Oh and the first page of his thesis, Lakin made a point of quoting Proposition 57 from Book 3 of Spinoza's Ethics, Quillibet unius cujusque individuic fectus of age effectua alterius tantum discrepat, quantum essentia unius of essentia alterius deferred. At the end of the thesis he returned to this quotation, giving his own translation and comments. It's as if, writes Robert Misrahi, the whole of Lakin's thesis were placed under the aegis of Spinoza, and as if the theory that Lakin was putting F. O. Ruard was inspired by the same spirit as the work of Spinoza himself. And Lakin did in fact present Spinoza's philosophy as the only one capable of accounting FORA science of personal ITY, which is why he invoked the idea of parallelism, mentioned in Book 2 of the Ethics, the order and sequence of ideas is the same as the order and sequence of things. And so, whether we conceive of nature as a manifestation of space, or of th ought, or of anything else, we shall discover in it a single order or, in other words, a single concatenation of causes, i.e., the same things following on FROM one another. Was Lakin remembering the diagrams and colored arrows he pinned up on the walls of his bedroom in the apartment on the boulevard Beaumarchais? In 1932 Spinoza's idea helped him to fight another conception of parallelism, one which had prevailed in France since Hippolyte Taine, 1823-1893, published his researches on the mind, De I Intelligence, 1870,2 volumes, and throughout the long saga of the heredity and degeneracy school. To explain the union of soul and body, Spinoza advanced the idea that parallelism can only really exist if there is not merely a correspondence between bodies and somatic processes but also a union between the mental and the physical, in a relationship similar to that of translation. This true parallelism had nothing to do with the notion of psychophysical parallelism prevailing in the field of psychiatry that posited a relationship of determination between physical phenomena and psychic facts. This latter parallelism led to a conception of Reading Spinoza 53 Personality in terms of either mental automatism, hereditarism, constitutionalism, or dualism, phenomenology. In Lakin's view, personality was not parallel to neurotaxic processes, nor even just to the individual somatic processes as a whole, but to a total made up of the individual and his or her own environment. This concept of parallelism must moreover be recognized as the only one worthy of the name, if we remember that this was its original FORM and that it was first given expression in the teachings of Spinoza too. So, with regard to Proposition 7 in Book 2 of the Ethics, Lakin thought of personality as the attribute of a unique substance, the existence of an individual seen in terms of a social existence made up of a complex web of different kinds of behavior. A mental phenomenon was JUST 1F8 or among others. 3. So Lakin's Spinoza derived idea in 1932 might be described negatively as neither phenomenological, nor ontological, nor constitutionalist. This idea opened the way to FORMS of monism, materialism, and historical anthropology that would be greeted with all the more enthusiasm by the younger generation of psychiatrists, 
together with the surrealists and the communists, because it saw paranoia and madness in general no longer as a phenomenon of deficiency, arising out of some anomaly, but just as a difference or discordance in comparison with normal personality. Point for the term discordance, introduced into France by the great alienist. Philippe Hasselin, denoted a disharmony between symptoms that seemed independent of one another until they were brought together in a recognized case of dementia. In this category Haslin included hebephrenia, paranoid dementia, and discordant verbal dementia. Point five. The word discordant translated the notions of splitting and dissociation that were to be found at that time in German terminology, in Bleuler on the one hand and in Freud on the other. It was this notion that lay behind the invention of the word schizophrenia in 1911. Schizian, in Greek, means to split, rupture, or break, in German, dissociation is translated as spaltung. Late 19th century research had already addressed the problem posed by the coexistence within the psyche of two groups of phenomena, or two personalities, living together but ignorant of one another, hence the ideas of dual consciousness, split personality, and a sense of strangeness. On this basis, Psychoanalytic and psychiatric concepts were constructed in parallel, sometimes giving rise to great confusion. In Bleuler's view, Spaltung was a disturbance in the associations governing the flow of thought, hence the term schizophrenia to denote the first appearance of the disturbance. The primary symptom was a direct expression of the morbid process itself, while the secondary symptom was the sick mind's reaction to the disorder. Zerspaltung denoted not merely a disturbance but a real disintegration of the personality. Both in Bleuler's terminology and in the French ideas of dissociation or discordance, psychosis originated in a deficit or lack. 54 Era Zy Lad IES Freud's position was quite different. He put F. O. Ruard the term Xpaltung, splitting of the ego, to designate an intrapsychic division by which the subject was separated from part of his or her own representations. This discarded the ideas of deficit and duality and put in their place a topographical theory of the mind. From 1920 on, the concept changed under the impact of a second topography. Ixpaltung was to be found not only in psychosis but also in neurosis and perversion. It reflected the coexistence of two positions of the ego one that takes account of reality and another producing a new reality just as true as the first. Six Lakin provided a key to his interpretation of Spinoza when, in a coda, he made his own translation of Proposition 5-7 of Book 3 of the Ethics, which he had used as an epigraph to his thesis. Where Spinoza had written Discrepat, Lakin introduced the notion of discordance, any affection in any individual exhibits as much discordance with an affection in another individual as the essence of the one individual differs from the essence of the other seven Lakin was here departing from Charles Apun's 1906 translation of the passage in question, still current in 193 too though it was revised in 1934 after Karl Gebhard produced a new edition of the Latin text. Spinoza himself had used two words discrepat, depart, and D-I-F-F-E-R-T, differ, where Apun used only one. Hence Apun's translation, which may be translated into English as any affection in each individual differs from another as much as the essence of one affection differs from the essence of another aid. Lakin corrected Apun in order to bring out more clearly a distinction made by Spinoza in the original. But he didn't choose the word discordance by chance. What he was really doing was borrowing the word from psyche modifying its meaning, and then reintroducing it into a context where the idea of madness had been recast in terms of parallelism, what I mean by this is that there is a discordance between the determining conflicts, the intentional symptoms, and the impulse reactions of a psychosis on the one hand and on the other hand the comprehensional relations defining the development, the conceptual structures, and the social tensions. Of a normal personality a discord ants the proportions of which are determined by the history of the subject's affections. 9 In other words, both the affections known as pathology cal and the affections known as normal are part of one same essence that defines their discordance. There isn't a pathos for some of them and a norm for the others. And discordance, as well as marking the contrast between a psychotic individual and a normal personality, can also be found throughout a subject 
defining the relationship between his or her ordinary personality and a psychotic incident. Lacan was thus taking over the notion of discordance from Spinoza and approximating it to Freud's concept of expaltung. Apun, in his French version of the ethics, had shrunk from using the word suffect to translate the Latin cfectus because there was no such word in reading Spinoza 5.5. French. Nor did H.E. wish to use a an equivalent O.F. the German age eject. So he translated affectus by affection. In 1932 it didn't occur to Lacan to correct a pun, though he might well have f followed Freud and made use of the term suffect, which by then had already been introduced into psychoanalytic terminology to denote either an emotional effect or the subjective expression of a quantity of pulsional energy. So here again we see that Lacan hadn't yet mastered the conceptual vocabulary of psychoanalysis, even though he had already perceived the essence of Freud's discoveries themselves. It would take him 20 years to bring his theoretical revision of Freudianism as a whole and his reinterpretation of Freud's concepts into line with one another. It should be noted in passing that it was not until 1988 that the philosopher B. E. Renard Petrot produced a French translation of the ethics that took into account both Freud's effect and Lacan's discord. This gives a new version of Proposition 57 of Book 3, any affect of each individual exhibits as much discordance with the affect of another as the essence of the one diff fers from the essence of the other ten. The way Lacan used Spinoza's philosophy is a valuable pointer to his general approach to other people's writings. In the case of the ethics he produces as a commentary that, instead of merely following the concepts contained in the original, translates them, i.e., gives them a new meaning. Lacan had already shown a preference for a system that assimilated other elements rather than distancing itself from them. Instead of basing himself on or deciphering a model, he gave it a meaning of his own and treated that meaning as the only one possible. His view was that every text contains a truth waiting for a single interpretation. In adopting this attitude he was challenging any method of approaching the history of science that was based on a merely critical approach, as well as any historical interpretation of texts. He didn't believe a body of work could develop over time into the sum of all its possible interpretations. On the contrary, he thought any interpretation or explanation of a text that didn't correspond to its presumed truth should be dismissed as aberration or error. When confronted with a text he assumed the position of a layer down of the law, the authorized translator of truth itself found the mode of knowledge he used in his textual commentary simulated the mode of knowledge typical of paranoia. So it's not surprising that, in the FULL flush of surrealism, he contrived to rehabilitate paranoia as a discordant equivalent of so-called normal personality. In his 1931 study of schizophrenia, Lakin had dealt with XPE Rences relating to the Immaculate Conception, though he still made use of the CLASIC notion of automatism. But in the same year his encounter with Dolly began to have its effect. It soon led him to reject automatism and place the FULL anthropological significance of madness at the center of the human mind. Thus every so often the thesis on paranoia that he completed in the 56 era ZY LAD 1 ES. Autumn of 1932 reveals a tendency to appropriate the positions of the surrealists. But he didn't breathe a word in avowal of this major influence. He was careful not to quote the relevant sources, never even mentioned any of the great surrealist texts that lay behind his own, and made no reference to Dolly, Breton, or Elliard. He was anxious about his career and didn't want to offend either his masters in psychiatry, who rejected the literary avant-garde, or the supporters of orthodox Freudianism, of whom he was still a disciple. But he had guessed wrong, the first people to do him honor were those whose importance to himself he had disguised, and the first people to decry him were those he had tried to please. As an intern at the H6 Pidal St. Anne, Lakin lived in a modest furnished apartment, ugly and dark, on the ground floor of a block in the Rue de la Pampa, a stone's throw from the Bois de Boulogne. At this period he was the lover of Marie-Therese Bergeret, an austere widow fifteen years his senior. With her he discovered Plato and went on several study trips. In 1928 he took her to see the tombs of the Saudi dynasty in Morocco and scrupulously noted down the complicated genealogies. 
This was the first sign of a strong hankering for the East that would later take him to Egypt and Japan. 1-1. Sometime around 1929 Lakin Fell in love with Olicia Senkiewicz, the second wife of his friend Pierre Drew La Rochelle, who had just left her for the brilliant Vitorio Campo. Olicia, born in 1904, was the daughter of a Catholic banker of Polish origins. Point twelve. Her grandmother had married Hetzel, the famous publisher of Jules Verne's illustrated novels, her godmother had been the wife of Alexander Dumas the Younger, author of The Lady If the Camellias. Olicia and her two sisters had been brought up in a sensitive and elegant environment, where she divided her time between the family apartment in the fashionable Plain Marceau in Paris, the Chateau de Dumas in Marla just outside the capital, and a house at Bellevue, near Mouton, in Hierite from Hetzel. Drew had been smitten by Olicia's mischievous wit and androgynous appearance, she aroused strong homosexual feelings in him. Point 13 She herself, shattered by an unhappy love affair, had forsworn all physical relations with men until the day she succumbed to the charm of Drew, the great seducer. For several months Drew was very happy in his second marriage. Olicia helped him, listened to him for hours on end, and typed his manuscripts. Point 14 He felt so guilty when the marriage broke up that he was delighted to learn that his fr eend Lakin was courting Olicia. Lakin wrote him long, obscure letters setting out the reasons for his passion. Right from the beginning of the affair, which lasted until the autumn of 1933, Lakin shrouded himself in a typical double lippy atmosphere of secrets and clandestinity. Though OFFI Chaley he was living in the Rue de la Pampa, he went on putting his parents. Reading Spinoza 57. Boulogne sur Seine address on his visiting cards. But most of the time he slept in the hospital, where Olicia used to join him. At the same time he still carried on a relationship with Marie Therese that only his brother really knew about. Lakin soon swept Olicia up into a wild passion that took them from Paris to Madrid, from Corsica to the coast of Normandy. Though he hadn't yet learned to drive, he already adored cars and loved making impromptu trips with his young friend, motoring at top speed around France. Together they visited the Isle Auxiliary Moyne in Brittany and Mont Saint Michel between Brittany and Normandy, then they took a plane to AJ Oxio and toured Corsica. In June 1932 Lakin asked Olicia to type his thesis. He got into the habit of hurrying up the stairs several times a week to the charming attic in the Rue Garancière into which she had moved in February, bringing her the latest batch of pages he'd written out rapidly in his own dreary bachelor apartment. He finished the manuscript on October 7, Olicia completed the typescript, and Lakin handed it over to L.E. Fran O.I.S., a publisher who specialized in medical books. Marie Therese Bergeret made a large contribution to the cost of printing the thesis, which was dedicated to MTB. To this symbolic figure in his own private romantic serial, Lakin also addressed a line in Greek, without whose help I would not have back home what I am. It was on a November afternoon in the Faculty of Medicine that Lakin defended his thesis and obtained his medical doctorate. The examination, which lasted an hour, ran its course without incident. Lakin faced a jury directed by Henry Claude, behind the candidate sat an audience of about 80 spectators, including both Olicia and Marie Therese. They'd never met, and neither knew the other was there. Both, however, were familiar with Lakin's frens from Saint Anne, who had come to see how their comrade, who represented the avant-garde of the new psychiatry, would acquit himself. They had often seen Olicia come round to the intern's common room in the evening, they called her Cold W. Atur, an allusion to a play by Drew La Rochelle, produced by Louis Jouvet, with Pierre Renoir and Valentine Tessie in the CAST. Lakin's frens called Marie Therese T. He Princess. She never slept at the hospital but would sometimes send in a bot TLE of milk to help her protege through a difficult morning. The examination proceeded amid whispering and anxiety, like the performance of a play where not only were women dressed as men and servants disguised as their masters but even the members of the audience seemed not to recognize one another. I.S. the only participant missing was Marguerite Pantane. Lakin remembered the occasion with distaste. 
In a letter to Olicia Ritten 10 in August 1, 933 he was already complaining about the precious years he had been forced to waste studying medicine. After the war, at a conference. 58 ERAZYLADIES. At Bonneville, he hit out retrospectively at a member of the jury whom he accused of trying to put him down. Later still, when the thesis was out of print and unobtainable, he was reluctant to have it reissued. This growing attitude of rejection is understandable when one realizes how different Lakin's subsequent development was from what had been suggested in his thesis. Not only did he fail to produce any science of personality, but he never added any Lacanian type of self-punishment to the nosology of psychiatry, either. Lakin's career was not to be in a psychiatry based on psychoanalysis. And so far did he come to forget that his thesis was his first venture into the field of Freudianism that he dated at 1936. 16. At the time, it was ignored by the first generation of French psychoanalysis, not a single review appeared in the RFP. Even Edouard Pichon made no reference to it. Lakin was F. Urias. But he was so sure his entry into the world of psychoanalysis had been a success that he sent a copy of his thesis to Freud himself, showing that he sought recognition from the master no matter how reticent his French disciples might be. But Lakin was in for a dreadful disappointment. From Vienna, in January 1, 933, came the laconic reply, Thank you for sending your thesis. The great man hadn't even deigned to open the manuscript that the young stranger had commended to him, no doubt with great ardor. As Lakin's cover letter had been headed with his official address in Boulogne sur Seine, followed by his real one in the Rue de la Pampa, Freud not unnaturally solved the problem by putting both addresses on his answering postcard. 17. The world of psychiatry was the first to react, in the person of Lakin's loyal comrade Henry E. Y who even before the thesis was published wrote a generous article in El Encephal, the Insphalen, i.e., the brain, it is with some hesitation, he wrote, t had I undertake to examine a work whose inner history, and the effort that went into its creation, are known to me through a friendship based on a shared vision of the problems of psychiatry, though not necessarily of their solutions. But friendship will not make my analysis any less impartial. On the contrary, my knowledge of the author helps me to a better understanding of a thesis long meditated and allows me to bring out the vividness and solidity of an argument cast in a form so abstract and difficult, because so condensed and complex, that it might otherwise deter some readers 18. But in 1933 four well-known literary figures helped to establish Lakin as the leader of a F.U. Tour French school of psychoanalysis capable of breaking away from the chauvinistic and conservative ideals of the older generation. He was thus thrust onto the political stage of the intellectual far left, a mixture of orthodox communists, dissidents, and surrealists, all in conflict among T. Hems elves over their varying commitment to Marxism. And so this ardent admirer of Mora's and of the novels of Leon Bloy, a man hitherto reading Spinoza 59, uninterested in political engagement, FOUND himself being regarded as the champion of a materialistic theory of mental illness. The first comment came from Paul Nizen, in an issue of El Humanite, the communist newspaper, published on February 10, 1933, this is a thesis presented for a medical doctorate, he wrote, and as such may seem rather unsuitable for comment here. But it is right to draw attention to a book that, against the mainstreams of official science and despite the precautions imposed on the author of an academic thesis, reflects the definite and concise influence of dialectical materialism. Dr. Lakin has not yet clarified all his theoretical positions, but he does react against the various idealisms currently corrupting all research in psychology and psychiatry. Materialism will triumph over the ignorance of the learned professors and emerge as the true method of scientific progress. 19 In May 1933 it was René Creville's turn to praise Lakin's thesis. He did so in an article in Surrealisme au service de la Révolution. Creville, who was more involved than Nizen in the battle against official psychoanalysis, was torn between his membership in the Communist Party, his own homosexuality, 
and his fr ship FOR both Breton and Aragon, who were now enemies. But he also wanted to get his own back on traditional treatment. He had been analyzed by René Allende, of whom he had just published a vitriolic portrait in L.E. Clavicin de Diderot, D. I. Drott's harpsichord, comparing him to the oafish pair Yubu in Jerry's satirical F.A.R.C.E. Yubu R.O.I. 1896, and describing him as a pretty Ephilo with a beard and a very good opinion of himself. Creeble, regarding the old school of psychoanalysis as corrupt and steeped in Borgioist idealism, Salakin as the spokesperson of a new spirit, his materialism, Creeble thought, made it possible to link together the individual and social aspects of every human being. For Creeble, materialism and concrete analysis were synonymous but he was mainly interested in the sad fate of Amy, about whom he wrote less coldly and clinically than Lakin himself. Kreevil saw her as a rebel homosexual, a hysterical embodiment of the fe male proletariat, Amy doesn't loiter about or compromise. She makes straight for a wonderful convulsive state that is both appalled and appalling. But her impulses collide with a horribly uncomprehending mess. Her need for moral and intellectual sympathy has been thwarted at every turn. So she concluded she had to go to the men. After paying this handsome tribute to his own F.E. male double, Kreevel went on to assert that Freud had made the mistake of rejecting communism, the USSR, and Marxist analysis, and this was why he had failed to revolutionize the world, he is tired and clings to his mementos. We can for give him for that. But where is the young psychoanalyst who is going to take over? 20. In June 193 3, having already been hailed as the leader of a school that combined Freudianism and Marxism and as the harbinger of the coming. 60 CRAZYLADIES. Revolution, Lakin was also saluted by Salvador Dali. In the first number of L.E. Minot or, after going over some already familiar ideas, Dolly went on to praise Lakin's thesis, because of it we can for the first time arrive at a complete and homogeneous idea of the sub-JECT, quite free of the mechanistic mire in which present-day psychiatry is stuck. 2-1. This view was shared by Jean. Bernie, who wrote a well-researched article in L.A. Critique Sociale, Social Criticism, setting Lakin's work in the context of the history of psychiatry. Bernie was a writer, journalist, and sports lover belonging to the same intellectual generation as Breton and Aragon. He, like them, had gone through the horrors of the first WORLD war and then set about confronting bourgeois society with a radical challenge. Together with Boris Severin, the first FO under of the French Communist Party, he had come out in support of Trotsky at the 13th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party in 1924. TWO years later he met Colette Peinot, a woman so passionately commit to the cause of the revolution that although she had tuberculosis she went to live on a call cause, or collective FARM, among the poorest of poor peasants. From her passion FOR Bolshevism she emerged a sick woman, FROM her love FOR Bernie she escaped through a suicide attempt, she tried to shoot herself, but the bullet just missed her heart. She had a stormy affair with Boris Pilniak in Leningrad. In Berlin she lived with Edward Trotner, master of scatology, sadist, and wife batterer. In 1932 she met Boris Severin, and together they started L.A. Critique Sociale, the first important communist review to position itself to the left of communism, though without following any particular affation of the opposition. Colette Peinot and Boris Severin gathered around them a group of writers and F.O. members of the French Communist Party that included Raymond Cano, Jacques Baron, Michel Leris, and Jean Peel. Georges Baudelaire, who had just ended his experiment with the review documents, joined the group in 1931 and decided to attend Georges Dumas' presentations of patients at the Hospital Saint Anne. It was against this background, where Marx and Freud were studied simultaneously, that Jean Bernie joined the team of L.A. Critique Socha I.E. He was a close friend of Drew La Rochelle, and it was through Olicia Senkiewicz that he met Lakin, at the time that the latter was publishing his thesis. Point 22 Unlike Nizen, Dolly, and Kreevel, 
Bernie had some criticisms to offer. 23. Although he saw Lakin as a FU tour master and agreed with most of his conclusions, he criticized him for the obscurity of his style, for not giving sufficient thought to Amy's infantile sexuality, and for paying much too little attentio and to therapy. Bernie was expressing a leftist attitude to psychoanalysis and psychiatry, both of which he accused of neglecting the social dimension of psychosis and not properly denouncing the pathogenic effect on the individual of bourgeois society. 24. 7. T H E P A P in Sisters. T he way the story of Amy was received and commented on in French intellectual circles was to have some influence on the young Lakin's future development. Until his thesis was published, his main philosophical authority had been a FORM of phenomenology derived from Husser and Jaspers. His own interpretation of Spinoza helped him construct his theory of personality. But from 1932 on he could look to a new philosophical horizon, the more so because the avant-garde had welcomed his thesis in the joint name of surrealism and communism, both of which, despite their diff efferences, supported a materialist philosophy they claimed to have derived from the works of Hegel, Marx, and Freud. Pointing to the extreme poverty of French philosophy as it was then, plunged deep in Bergsonian spiritualism, academic neo-Kantianism, or a Cartesianism diverted from its original inspiration, the materialist avant-garde liked to contrast this deplorable state of affairs with the splendor of German thought. They saw this as both Hegelian and Marxist but also enriched by the new gospel of certain great contemporaries, Husserl, of course, but also Nietzsche and Heidegger, who had just, in 1926, published his F.A. Mao Senuendizite, Being and Time. Lakin, having thus been dubbed a materialist, accepted the mirror held up to him by the avant-garde. He abandoned his Spinozan theory of personally while retaining Spinoza as his authority for a few other operations, renounced phenomenology as interpreted by psychiatry, and convert to a different Husser and a Hegelian Marxist materialism. But it would take him for years to come to grips, through the teaching of Koeve and Kohr, with Hegel's phenomenology of mind and Heidegger's philosophy. Lakin's turning toward the new horizon could be seen in his first article FORLE Minot Or, which dealt with the problem of style and the psychiatric conception of paranoid FORRNS of experience. Although, as far as content was. 62 ERAZYLADIES. Concerned, the article advanced the same points of view as Lakin had expressed in the Amy case, he was now using a different terminology. In addition to a straight refutation of what its author considered a mistaken psychiatric tradition, the article showed a rebelliousness reflected in the use of a Marxist vocabulary, for the first time Lakin spoke of theoretical revolution, bourgeois civilization, ideological superstructure, needs, and anthropology. In short, he had listened to the message transmitted by Nizan, Creevel, Dolly, and Bernie. It was against this background that early in 1933 Lakin became interested in the F.A. Mao's crime of the Papine sisters, which staggered public, press, and intelligentsia alike, not only because of its social significance but also because it was so strange and puzzling. On February 2, in the town of L.E. Mans in northwest France, Christine and Lee Papine, two maidservants of poor peasant stock, brought up in the local orphanage of the Good Shepherd, savagely murdered their employers, Madame Lancelin, and her daughter, Genevieve. A power F.A. Illier had prevented Christine from finishing the ironing, Madame Lancelin, who had been out, came home and scolded her, whereupon Christine attacked both her employers and called on her younger sister to J.O. in her in the carnage. They gouged their victims' eyes out and used kitchen utensils to hack up the bod i.e.s., scattering blood and brains everywhere. Then they bolted the FRONT door, went upstairs, and huddled together in their bed to await the arrival of the police. They had taken off their blood-stained clothes and put on dressing gowns. The crime was all the more shocking because the two young women had seemed to be model servants, well treated by their employers and content with their lot. But beneath the appearances of normality lurk some disturbing facts. 
The girl's father had been his elder daughter's lover, their grandfather had died an epileptic, one of their cousins had gone mad, and an uncle had hanged himself in his own barn. And some time before the murder, the maids had complained to the local authorities of being persecuted. Three psychiatrists called as expert witnesses examined the two young women, who had confessed to the killings. The experts pronounced them of sound mind and body and thus responsible for their actions. They were both charged with unpremeditated murder, for which one F.A. said a death sentence and the other life imprisonment. After five months in prison, Christine suffered from F.A. inting spells and hallucinations. She would try to gouge out her own eyes, spread her arms as though on a cross, and indulge in sexual exhibitionism. Sometimes she announced that in some F.U. to her life she would be her sister's husband, at other times she said she saw her in a dream, hanging from a tree with her legs cut off. She resented being put in. The Papine Sisters 63. Solitary confinement and having to wear a straight jacket. When asked why she had stripped Mile Lancelin's clothes off, she said, I was looking for something that would have made me stronger. Despite all this, one of the psychiatrists said she was malingering and should stand trial. But Ben J. A. Minute Logger, another expert, came to the aid of the defense and, though he was NT allowed to examine the sisters, diagnosed them as mentally abnormal and suffering from hysterical epilepsy, sexual perversion, and persecution mama. On September 29, 1933, in the criminal court of the Department of the Sarth, a number of conflicting opinions confronted one another. According to the prosecution, the Papine sisters were bloodthirsty monsters devoid of all human fe healing. For others, they were sacrificial victims on the altar of bourgeois cruelty. The surrealist writers Paul Elliard and Benjamin Parrott invoked La Tremont's demonic chants de Maldoror, first published in 1868. Sartre denounced the hypocrisy of respectable society. The lawyer representing the Lancelin F. A. Milly argued that the Papine sister were responsible for their actions and tried to persuade the court that the killings were semi-premeditated. A woman lawyer, Germaine Breyer, cited Lager's diagnosis and maintained that the sisters were insane. As in other cases of this kind, the supporters of dynamic psychiatry were ranged against those who argued on grounds of heredity or constitution or said that the sisters were malingering. In the midst of the battle, the maids admitted they had had no grudge against their victims. This pointed to the hidden meaning of an act that they themselves didn't understand. Christine knelt down to receive the death sentence, soon afterward commuted to life imprisonment. A year later, again suffering from fits of delusion, she was sent to the mental hospital in Rennes, where she died three years later of Vasanic cachexis, in a kind of paranoid self-punishment, she virtually starved herself to death for her own crimes. Lee went back to live with her mother after serving several years of her prison sentence. Point two. So here was a crime that fit in perf ectly with the theory Lakin had put fo Ruard in 1932. It involved fe male sexuality, delirium due, apparently unmotivated murder, social tension, paranoia, and self punishment. For this reason, Lakin while paying tribute to Benjamin Lager's courage, began by dismissing the diagnosis of hysterical epilepsy. Then he set out to show that only paranoia could explain the mystery of the sisters' act. The episode of insanity why seemed to arise out of a seemingly everyday incident, a power F.A. Illier. But this incident might well have had an unconscious significance for the Papine sisters. Lakin suggested it stood for the silence that had long existed between the mistresses and the maids, no current could flow between the employers and their servants because they didn't speak to one another. Thus the crime triggered by the power failure was a violent acting out of Anon. 64 ERAZYLADIES Did, something unspoken, of whose meaning the chief actors in the drama were unaware. If Amy had attacked the actress who, According to Lakin, represented Amy's own ego ideal, the Papine sisters had murdered the Lancelin women for similar reasons. The real motive for the crime was not class hatred but the paranoid structure through which the murderer struck at the ideal of the master within herself. 
Lakin's analysis was the same for the unsuccessful murder attempted by Marguerite and for the successful murder carried out by the Papine sisters, his diagnosis in both cases was paranoia and self-punishment. But he was well aware that the two cases were different. The case of the maids involved neither bovaryism nor erotomania, nor was it a matter of a woman who was unknown attacking another who was well known, it concerned an act of brutal slaughter that took place between ordinary women, who had known one another for years, in the intimacy of an ordinary home. The L.E. man's crime could only end in out-and-out -out massacre, in a total annihilation of being. That was what made it so astonishing. It seemed to reflect the social reality of class hatred, but in FACT it reflected another reality, that of paranoid alienation. While the story of Marguerite Pantin might have come straight out of the great tradition of the French 19th century novel, that of the Papine sisters seemed to hark back to Greek tragedy, while at the same time it illustrated the ferocity of a world torn by rising social, racial, and national hatreds. Amy was a Flaubert char actor ending her life in a melodrama by Paul Benoit. Christine was a hero INE of the House of Atros who had strayed into the fields and woods of northern France and thence been catapulted into the modern world of class struggle and the craving to exterminate one's Filo men. The difference between the two stories was reflected in Lakin's way of writing about them. As a background to the L.E. Mann's murders he sketched out a vast theater of cruelty going back to time immemorial, the time of myth, legend, and the unconscious. But another reason for the change of style was Lakin's introduction of a new philosophical dimension. Before the Amy case he had never studied the works of Hegel. Hegel's name was not mentioned in the 1932 thesis, in which the phenomenological element was derived from psychiatry and not from any first-hand reading of Hegel, Husserl, or Heidegger. But after October or November of 1933, when Alexander Kojiv's seminar began, Lakin, though he wasn't yet actually attending the class, began to discover genuine Hegelian phenomenology, either through Coyer's articles or through other sources. And the effect of this can be seen in Lakin's article on the Papine sisters, where the crime was interpreted in terms of a master-slave dialectic typical of the struggle between minds or consciousnesses. Madness itself was defined in terms of the idea of sea anscience. The Papine sisters 6-5 in Chatney, mind or consciousness bound, ASIN Prometheus bound mental alienation had become alienated consciousness 3. So, between the two crimes, that of Marguerite and that of Christine, Lakin had moved FROMA Spinozan monism according to which he saw personality as a totality including both the normal and the pathological to a Hegelian monism that led him to abandon the idea of personality in favor of the notion of self-consciousness. But Lakin's encounter with Hegelian philosophy didn't really produce its FULL effects until 1936 that is, until after he had begun his analysis with Lowenstein and started attending Kojiv's seminar. MAN Estate. PARTIII. Private Life AND Public Life. 8. R. Orty years after his thesis was published, Lakin said it was the Amy case that had led him to psychoanalysis and that in it he was applying Freudianism without realizing it. We know now the truth was more complex than that. Lakin's view of his past was not without the FRLT in here and in all human testimony. When he was writing up the story of Marguerite he was not really applying the principles of Freud's teaching without realizing it. On the contrary, by that time he already had a sound knowledge of Freudian theory and was using it quite consciously. If when he was on the brink of old age, it seemed to him that he hadn't consciously been a Freudian F. A. Rudy years before, it was because he couldn't see how his own idea of what was or was not Freudian had changed over the years. The FACT that Lakin's Freudianism was different in the 30s FROM what it had become by the 70s doesn't mean he wasn't consciously Freudian in 1932. There can be no doubt about it, he became a Freudian AT the same period as when he first met Marguerite, and by the time he wrote up Amy's case he had already in a general way assimilated the theories of psychoanalysis. So in the period from 1972 to 1975 Lakin was mistaken about the date when he had really accepted Freudianism as a coherent and organized whole. 
On the other hand he was right to say his work on the Amy case had led him toward the experience of psychoanalysis. In June 1, 932 he started his sessions with Rudolf Lowenstein, and, as I have noted, the analysis began J.U.S.T. as he was finishing his interviews with Marguerite, prior to embarking on the final draft of his manuscript. It is easy to understand his regret at not having made use of Freudian techniques of treatment in the Amy case. Being in analysis himself when he was finishing his thesis, he could see with hindsight that if he had had that XPE rents earlier it would have enhanced his understanding of his sub JECT. In this respect, the hypothesis I put FORD in my history of psychoanalysis in FR ants that Amy was FOR Lakin what? 70 MANSESTATE. Wilhelm Flyus and Anna O together were FOR Freud is still valid despite any new assessment one might make today of Lakin's Traini and G analysis as it took place in the context of the SPP2 with Marguerite, Lakin tried out a key ND of primal analysis in the course of which he became a FREUDian bot H theoretically, through his interpretat ion of the texts, and clinically, by listening in on a case of psychosis. For this reason he would always have a SPE chail FE Ealing not O N L Y F O R the woman whose case made it possible F O R him to reintroduce into France, and at the same time put a new spin on, Freud's teachings but also F O R F E male paranoia in G E N L. The Marguerite experience led Lakin to undertake a training analysis with a man who to put it mildly would never be his master in the sense that Freud was both analyst and master to his chief disciples. Lakin would always think of Lowenstein as at best a disappointing teacher in the characteristic style of the IPA in the 30s. Rudolf Lowenstein, born in Lodz in central Poland in 1898, when Poland was still part of the Russian Empire, was a perfect representative of A.F.A. Mao's type, the wandering Jewish psychoanalyst forever seeking a pro miss ed land and F forever being hounded from east to west by anti-Semitism and POGROMS. Having been F.O.R.C.E.D. to flee his native land, Lakin's F.U. tour analyst then had to retrain as a doctor no F.E.W.E.R. then three times, first in Zurich, where he made the acquaintance of the new psychiatry, then in Berlin, where he worked under Hans Sachs in the most advanced coterie of modern Freudianism, and finally in Paris, where he settled in 1925 with the material help of René Laforg and the support of Marie Bonaparte, who became his mistress and arranged F.O.R. his naturalization papers to go through UG quickly. Before long this brilliant doctor, with his humor and charm, had attained a position of eminence in the SPP, training therapists of both the first and second generations. Point three, Although neither Lowenstein nor Lakin ever revealed anything about what happened during the analysis, we know now that it was stormy. When Lakin first started going to 127, Avenue de Versailles he had a very good opinion of himself, a flair for mixing with the cream of the Paris intelligentsia, and a brilliant academic record. Moreover, he knew he was more gifted than not only his contemporaries but also his mentors in the field of psychiatry. As for the pioneer s of the French psychoanalytic movement, he loftily ignored them except when they could be useful to him in his career. With the exception of Edouard Pichon, whose influence he warmly acknowledged, he had little sympathy for his elders, who admittedly were no great I know that ors. And so, when Lahu saw this magnificent charmer walk in, with his head held on one side, his protruding ears, his inimitable smile, and de acceptably nonchalant air, he had misgivings, Lakin was no ordinary Annalie Sand. Private Life and Public Life E7I he was a creative genius in his own right, and he hadn't come to Freudianism by way of official psychoanalysis. S. O. Mion like this was unlikely to submit easily to rules and constraints, even if they were necessary for the realization of his ambitions. Lakin was by temperament a fre man, and his kind of fre brooked no restriction and accepted no censure. It was as if such independence, won by previous generations sheer hard work through a century of industrial change and upheaval, had, in this last scion of the rising middle classes, become second nature. Lakin would acknowledge no outside authority whatsoever over his person or the man-aging of his desires. 
not having had to bow to Afather's command, unable to resist his own slightest whim, by 1932 he was driven by a will to power that a thorough and fr itful reading of Zarathustra, backed up by his passion for Spinoza, could only make more fierce especially in combination with a supreme disdain for common or garden stupidity. Lakin, then, had arrived at man's estate after suffering only the typical kinds of bourgeois tribulation, the pains of perpetual dissatisfaction, of impatience driven to the limit, of not yet being master of the universe. Imaginary suffering, in short, accompanied by the more ordinary neuroses. He had never known real privation, hunger, poverty, lack of fr edom, persecution. T.O.O. Young to have had to waste his best years under fire at Verdun, he had watched the war from the gardens of the college Stanislas, his only whiff of its epic madness brought to him in glimpses of shattered limbs and eyes awaiting death. He had never been choked by the stench of blood on a battlefield, he had never had to fight against real oppression. Pampered from the cradle by generations of comfortable merchants, he had inherited only the hardships of family constraints, and they had made him anything but a hero. But this lack of heroism came with a defiant refusal to conform in any way. Lakin was a kind of anti-hero, not at all cut out for a normal life, destined to eccentricity and incapable of knuckling under to the countless commonplace rules of behavior hence his excessive interest in the discourse of madness, as the only key to understanding a crazy world. All this was very different from Rudolf Lowenstein, whose whole existence had been bound up with exile, hatred, and humiliation. Unlike Lakin, he had learned all there was to know about oppression, in the full sense of the word, first as a Jew in an empire where discriminatory restrictions on education and professional activity still applied and then as an emigrant without a homeland. Condemned to wander from country to count try learning new languages as he went, he knew the price of freedom and felt no need to cheapen the word or squander what it stood for. At every stage of his long J.O. Ernie he had had to take a realistic view of the dangers lying ahead, to be encountered with no companion but a battered passport. When he settled in France he thought he had reached a safe haven at last. 72 Mansestate He saw it as a place of hope, France, the homeland of the rights of man, the cradle of an egalitarian republic, reigning over Europe by virtue of her sumptuous elegance and proud intelligence. What did the other France matter, the France of Moras and Rivarol, of anti-Semitism and patriotic leagues? Lowenstein did not deign to notice it. And yet, fifteen years later, it was that same France which would make him an exile once again, seeking liberty in the United States, the land of the FRE. But could he have guessed this other France existed when in 1925 he was welcomed to Paris by a trio consisting of a Republican princess, a native of Alsace raised in the culture of Germany, and a grammarian of genius who was both pro Dreyfus and a member of Action FRNIs. So, lapped in the kindness of his FRNs Marie Bonaparte, Rene Lafourgue, and Edouard Pichon, Lowenstein, for better or worse, became a French citizen. Why then did dissension and rivalry arise between him and Lakin in the first year of the analysis? Despite all the differences between them they had one thing in common, they were both materialists. Both had accepted the sweeping Freudian doctrine on universalism, the death of God, and a proper critical attitude to religious illusion. An honorable peace could have been reached between the cradle Christian, estranged from his vinegar-making kin by his public flouting of their values, and the assimilated Jew, admirer of the revolutionary Abbe Gregoire. But it was not. Lakin hadn't hesitated in his choice of an analyst. Not only was Lowenstein, after seven years in France, the best training analyst in the SPP and the most typical representative of the alluring Freudian world Lakin so longed to join, he also shared Lakin's materialism. And when the time came F or Lakin to go on to a control analysis, he would turn to another analyst of the same bent, the SWISS Protestant, Charles Odier, trained in Berlin by Karl Abraham and Franz Alexander, two eminent figures in the Freudian saga. And so Lakin, a Catholic from the Ain and the Loire, the heart of ancient France, 
was initiated into analytic practice by a Jew living in permanent exile and a Protestant whose ancestors had fled France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Perhaps it was a necessary step on the way to the final break with the bigotry of the Boulevard Beaumarchais. At the same time, by going to two practitioners who belonged to the pure Orthodox line, Lacan became indirectly, across a generation, the pupil of three of Freud's most illustrious disciples, Hans Sachs, his analysts Anna Lyst, of Viennese origin and the great organizer of standardization in the 1PA, Carl Abraham, the first analyst of his control analyst, a specialist in psychosis and the FO under of the Psychoanalytic Society in B.E. Rolin, and Franz Alexander, his controller's second analyst who was himself analyzed by Sachs and who was to pioneer a technique for reducing the length of treatments. Private Life and Public Life 73 Oddly enough, Lakin never told anyone he had undergone a control analysis, and even his son-in-law and close relatives knew nothing about it until it was revealed to me in June 1982 by Germaine Guex. She was certain that Lakin had been in analysis at one time with O.D. Ear, whose mistress she was at that period, having seen him come often to the house over several months and always at the same time. But was this in 1935 or 1937? She couldn't remember the exact dates when I talked to her. Point four, but everything now seems to show that Lakin went to OD or not FOR true analysis he was going to Lowenstein FOR that but FOR supervision or control a process made more or less compulsory for candidate analysts in 1934, when a French institute was set up similar to those already functioning in societies belonging to the IPA. The FACT that later Lakin never saw fit to mention having undergone a control analysis doesn't mean he didn't do so. He probably thought it was enough that he had had one analysis for his contemporaries to know his own position as a leader was different from Freud's, he, Lakin, had been analyzed, and not on just any old couch, on a regular, orthodox one. But he knew well enough that one day, when he was dead and gone, some inquisitive historian, either through deduction or as a result of evidence from a surviving witness, would come across this buried scrap of truth. Memory always gets there in the end. There was a yawning gap, then, between the two men who met in the apartment in the Avenue de Versailles several times a week for six years, from June 1932 to December 1, 938. Lakin saw freedom as the long, untrammeled exercise of desire. For Lowenstein, for Edom was a right that had to be fo ugheit for, a victory that had to be won over intolerance. He knew the value of freedom because he had had to go without it, and he was not prepared to sacrifice it to the dictates of desire. It was better to use it sparingly, within limits set by rules that apply to all. And F.O.R. Lowenstein, a migrant who every time he moved on lost all that he thought he had gained, the rules were those established by the IPA F.O.R. the free practice of psychoanalysis. They drew their authority F.R.O.M. their supranational character and F.R.O.M. the fact that they applied, from 1925 onward, to every society that belonged to the IPA. Between the two wars the Freudian Empire consisted largely of Jews from Central Europe, it was a sort of nation in itself, in which unity and equality were maintained through the observation of generally agreed upon rules and traditions. The rules might frequently be broken, but they still acted as a moral frm work allowing the psychoanalytic community to exist, held together by a social bond and resting on an ethical F.O. foundation. Lowenstein, a pure technician of the great IPA F.R. 8 or 90, observed the common F.A. 74 M.A.N.S.E.S.T.A.T.E. But without giving up his own passions. By analyzing his lover, the princess, whose son he had already treated, he was breaking the very rules he was supposed to embody. In this he was like Lakin, his most dangerous rival. But unlike Lakin he really believed that obedience to the rules helped the FREE practice of Freudian psychoanalysis as it moved toward the promised land of the IPA. Even though he now identified with France and many of its republican values, he was sure the SPP must do all it could to become part of the great standardizing movement of the IPA. 
This sort of thing didn't interest Lakin. For him, travel and international relations were simply means of satisfying his enormous curiosity, and he saw no need whatsoever for obeying any rules. For him, the IPA was neither home nor promised land but just an institution that conferred Freudian legitimacy on its members. And without that legitimacy, no career was possible in the French psychoanalytic movement. One can get some idea of what Lowenstein's analysis of Lakin was like from a reading of the F.O. Remeter's two Ma J.O.R. texts on analytic practice. The first of these was a report presented to the Third Conference of French-speaking psychoanalysts, held in Paris on June 28, 1928, and the second is a paper read to the SPP in 1930, entitled Tact in Psychoanalytical T. H. Sneak. As in these texts, L.O.E. Wenstein gave a fu and mental account of general psychoanalytic guidelines, emphasizing the importance of the unconscious. Then he stated the individual rules underlying analytic practice, the therapist must rely on his memory rather than on notes, he should analyze resistances rather than try to find repressed material, the patient should not read books about psychoanalysis while undergoing treatment. Lastly came advice about the length and number of sessions and how to deal with delays. Transference was seen in terms of positive and negative poles. Treatment came to an end when the positive transference could be interpreted and the patient thus freed from the analysts hold over him. As for the moral rules, Lowenstein stressed that analysis should take place independently of any fr endly relationship there might be between the two people concerned. It was this calculated, rational, standardized technique that he used in his analysis of Lakin, and I have already noted elsewhere how he would lose patience with Lakin's continual fluctuations between on the one hand a frenzied desire to act and know and on the other a maddening deliberation when it came to working out and elaborating ideas. Point six Lowenstein referred only once in writing to the problem Lakin's analysis represented for him, and his comment then was negative. But he often expressed his opinion orally to the people around him, the man was unanimous allizable. And Lakin was unanalyzable in those CO conditions. Personal and theoretic CAL differences stood in the way of transference, and Lowenstein. Private life and public life 7S. Wasn't flexible enough to adapt his methods to suit such a patient. How could he have been? Lakin once told Catherine Millot what he thought of H's analysis. In his opinion, LOU and Stay N was not INTE ligent enough to analyze him. Cruel but true. It was in his own seminar, said Lakin, that he felt he was really analyzed, he never recognized the fun domental role Marguerite had played in this respect. To illustrate the situation between him and Lowenstein, Lakin told Catherine Millot of an incident that occurred at the time. One day he was driven ng his little car through a tunnel when a truck came at him head on from the opposite direction. He decided to keep going and the truck gave way. He told Lowenstein what had happened, hoping to make him see the truth about their transferential relationship. But he got no answer. And the mortal struggle, for which Lakin was acquiring a taste at Kojiv's seminars, ended in open conflict. Not only was the analyst and admitted to M.E. membership of TESPP against the advice of his analyst, though with the support of Pishan, but Lakin also escaped from the analysis as soon as he could, despite having promised to go on. And ultimately he became for France what Lowenstein never was, an intellectual leader. Point seven. All the time he was in analysis, Lakin went on with his theoretical work, outside the sphere of official psychoanalysis. True, he took part in the SBP's internal discussions and mixed socially with his colleagues, but he was acquiring knowledge neglected at that period by the Freudian community itself. So he remained a marginal figure, whose development was followed with a mistrustful eye and the oft-expressed opinion that he was no ordinary psychoanalyst. Having constructed his thesis on the basis of Spinoza, phenomenology, surrealism, and dynamic psychiatry, he would go on to extend his philosophical examination of Freud still further. This led him to formulate his first theories about desire, the status of the subject, and the role of the imaginary order. But strangely enough, 
between the end of 1932 and the middle of 1936 I. E. During the first FO or years of his analysis Lakin produced no important texts. It was as if this FALO period was the SYMP tom of a great transformation, a transition from psychiatry and the disc of area of Freud himself to an interpretation of Freudianism that would develop into a whole philosophical system. And those empty years were also a kind of latency period in which Lakin's eventful private life was helping to FORGE his personality. At the end of August 1933 Lakin left Olicia in Paris and went off with Marie-Therese for two weeks vacation. They went by train from saint jean de Luz to Madrid, via Salamanca, Burgos, and Valladolid. Lakin wrote passionate letters to his mistress back in France. He read a lot. His old Vorosius Cur Iosity had revived after all the lousy years spent in the ridiculous. 76 MANSESTATE. Clinical rat race. He told Olicia she was perhaps a better FRN to him than he deserved. For friend he wrote Ami, the masculine FORM of the word.8 After referring to his beloved in the masculine gender, Lakin told her in another letter what a wonderful time he was having. He said he felt like getting up to the most Q exotic antics. He declared his hostility to Christianity and in the same breath said he'd like to go to see his patron saint, Saint James of Compostela. He described the charms of the Spanish railroads and an excursion to the monastery of S.A. and Domingo de Silos. I and Valadolid H.E. went into raptures over a piece of polychrome sculpture, I.T. was strident, here trending, soul searing. Finally, in Madrid, he went to the Prado and Found that the paintings of V.E. Lasks no longer touched him as they used to do. On the other hand he was moved to tears by Goya's intelligence, and his palate reminded Lakin of the artists who had once made him hear the call of Venice. After this lyrical flight Lakin turned to the past and gave F.R.E. reign to his F.E. Ealing's F.O.R. Olicia. He still promised happiness to come, mingling expressions of affection with the language of passion burning kisses, moments of ecstasy, breathless desire. He asked her to wait f for him, to be beautiful f for him, to f or give his constant hesitations and eva zions. They would have a winter f u l l of warmth and happiness. Point nine. When he got back to Paris he returned to the analyst's couch, and Elishin was replaced by depression. He was in a dilemma. He didn't want to leave Marie Therese, and he loved Olicia best when they were apart. He couldn't bring himself to be either off with the old love or on with the new. At the beginning of October he went to Prangins to attend a meeting of the Swiss Psychiatric Society and discuss the problem of hallucinations. It was on this occasion that he first met Carl Gustav Jung, who had come to talk about his experiences among African tribes. Lakin, together with Henry E. Y., reasserted the theory that explained hallucinations in terms of psychogenesis, they are produced he said, neither by automatism nor by constitution but by a disturbance of the patient's sense of the wholeness of his or her personality. 2. On October 24, just before a session with Lowenstein, Lakin wrote Alicia a letter that contrasted strangely with those he had sent her in August. The lovers were on the verge of a breakup, and Lakin didn't try to disguise his melancholy mood. He complained that he always missed out on happiness, blamed himself for his attitude in the past, and trusted, without much hope of success, that he could make up for lost time. Over lunch at the Auberts Alsacienne in the Avenue de Vr Sales, he remembered a bad patch he had gone through the previous year and how upset he had been. He told Olicia how unhappy he was and suggested she too might be due for a wild passion, a chance to let herself go. As ever, he wanted to make up for wasted time. One but dreams and longings didn't mend matters between the lovers. Private Life and Public Life 77 Just as he was trying to exorcise his misery, Lakin was awakened fro it by a new love. Marie-Louise Blondin Malou for short was nearly 27. Lakin had known her for a long time, she was the sister of an old frn and f elo in turn, Sylvain Blondin. Sylvain, born on July 24, 191, 
came from a respectable Republican family belonging to one of the higher strata of the French bourgeoisie. His roots lay in Charente on the mother's side and in Lorraine on the father's. After a brilliant school career at the Lycée Carnot, Sylvain had decided to become a doctor, like his father. When he see Amy S.E.C. and in the intern's final examination in 1924, he decided to make A.C. a rear in surgery. He started off in the clinic at the Hotel View and stayed there until 1935, when he passed another examination to become a surgeon in the general hospital service. Sylvain Blondin was extremely attractive, tall, slim, and lively. He affected bow ties and hid his fair wavy hair under a hat tilted back at an elegant angle. A keen sea elector, he spent his first paychecks on pictures by modern artists such as Brock, Ledger, and Picasso. He performed operations with his left hand, wrote with his right, and could draw with both. He always refused to learn to drive and preferred to travel around by taxi or in a ch offer drive and limousine. 12. Lakin got on famously with him, and their relationship, based on mutual F.A. signation, was a factor when Jacques F.E.L.L. in love with Malou. She was devoted to her brother and ready to find all the qualities she admired in him in his F.R.E.N.D. talent, beauty, originality, and intelligence. She herself, narcissistic and unyielding, with a self-image that was grandiose but volatile, managed to detect distinction behind the mask of eccentricity. And so she chose Lakin from all the rest. She saw in him a man who measured up to her ideal of superiority, and she set out to conquer him. Sylvain, who had no sympathy for Freudian theory and thought it was in psychiatry that his fr-end would carve out a brilliant career, was delighted to see the sister he was so fond of in love with the fr-end he looked on as his own double. Malu was strikingly beautiful, with a very slim body and narrow hips. She lacked the masculine charm with which Alicia had so bewitched Drew, hers was a more fragile, feminine type, hinting at a melancholy languor or something between Greta Garbo and Virginia Woolf. She could just have gone on being her mother's daughter or her adored brother's sister. She might just have lived up to the ideal handed down to her, and become an enlightened bourgeois wife virtuously standing behind an ordinary decent husband, preferably a doctor, one who would be a collector in his spare time or a patron of the arts, with a comfortable apartment in a handsome stone building in the F.A. Bourg St. Germain. But she chose not to follow the prescribed pattern. Even when she was still quite young she stood out from. 78-M-A-N-S-E-S-T-A-T-E. Her background, she had a gift for painting, a flair for style that showed in her knack for dressing up and making her own clothes, and an original sense of humor that made her see the funny side of everything. Her frens were astonished by her knowledge of traditional French songs. All these elements of a real artistic temperament prevented her from ever dwindling into an ordinary wife. But her natural nonconformity stopped short of genuine intellectual independence, and she clung to the conventional ideal of mariage still accepted by most women of her generation. She was modern in her tastes and aspirations but F.E. teared to the old order by her conception of love and the family. This was the woman whom Lakin F.E.L.L.F.O.R. in the autumn of 1933, when he was still hoping to win Alicia back. And to possess the sister of the friend he admired as his own alter ego, he was ready to do anything. He knew that a woman such as Malu, with no experience of the physical side of love, was not the type one asks to be one's mistress. The question of marriage there F.O.R.E. came up almost at once. At the end of 1933 Lakin let himself in F.O.R. a regular marriage with all the trimmings, blessed by the Roman Catholic Church. Had he F.O.R. gotten that only a few months earlier he had been writing to his mistress from Spain about his strong anti-Christian convictions. Be that as it may, Marie-Louise Blondin and Jacques Lacan were legally married at the City Hall of the 17th Arrondissement in Paris on January 29, 1934, in the presence of some distinguished witnesses. On Lacan's side there was Professor Henry Claude, there at his pupil's request to stand surety in the name of Orthodox French psychiatry for a man whose name would soon supplant his own. 
On Malu's side there was Henry Ducas, surgeon to the Chamber of Deputies and an old F.A. Mali friend of the Blondins. Ducas had been there when Malu's birth was registered in the same city hall on November 16, 1906. Ducas came to the wedding as a sign of his F.A. Thurly affection F.O.R. the bride. Claude's presence was a social and professional F.A. bore to the groom. But if the humanist spirit of surgery and psychiatry presided over the civil ceremony, the religious ceremony was designed to meet the requirements of the Lacan F.A. Mali. Lacan himself was F.A. sinated by the rituals of the church and wished to keep up Catholic appearances. And he didn't want to disappoint his mother, who would never have accepted the idea of her son being married without the blessing of the church. So Lakin asked Dom Lor, the abbot of Hotkum, where his brother Mark Fran Ois was a monk, to perform the ceremony at the church of Saint Fran Ois de Sales. Jacques and Malu went on the traditional Italian honeymoon, traveling as far south as Sicily. It was the first time Lakin had seen Rome, and he was enchanted with it. As soon as he got there he started throwing his weight around. I am Dr. Lakin, he said to the astonished hotel porter, who had Private Life and Public Life 79. Never heard of him. He went to see Bernini's studies in ecstasy, the Baroque sculpture of the F.O. Untains gave him so much pleasure he had qualms of conscience, on February 10, right in the middle of his honeymoon, he felt guilty at having abandoned Alicia and sent her a telegram, worried about you, dear. Wire General Delivery Rome. Jacques. It is unlikely that Malu had recognized how far Jacques was from believing in her own ideal of love and fidelity. And he, impatient as always to capture the object of his desire, probably hadn't understood that a woman like her would never consent to share him. The apparently happy couple was headed for disaster. Lakin, polygamous by nature but wanting and needing a conjugal life, was as incapable of leaving a woman as he was of being faith ful to her. So, determined not to pretend to be other than he was, he began to lead his own life according to the same dialectic between the true and the impossible that he was later to expound so famously in his work. As for Malu, she saw too late that the man she revered could never fulfill her ASPI rations. She held on to her ideal but paid for her persistence with despair. For the time being, however, Lakin seemed to have made a success of his transition to man's estate. The newlyweds moved into a well-appointed apartment on the Boulevard Males Herbs, a stone's throw from where Henry Claude lived. Malu's elegance, dress sense, and lifestyle had a visible effect on Lakin. His clothes were now more fashionable, even recherche, and he got used to living in ordered and comfortable surroundings. There was never an outright break between him and Alicia, and no final word was spoken. They just stopped seeing each other. Alicia had been abandoned once again, but although the romance with Lakin had been real enough, she never loved him with the passion she had feltfor drew. She considered Jacques a remarkable thinker, and she admired his intelligence, spirit, and charm, but Drew remained the object of her obsession. She thought of him all the time, cultivating her sense of loss in order to go on enjoying the painful pleasure of disappointment. She chose to be unhappy loving a man who didn't want her rather than happy with one who intended to love her but was always putting it off. Lakin was well aware that his mistress would always be bound to another man. And as he himself had kept waiting a woman he was sure of in order to pursue another who might elude him, he could understand Alicia acting in such a way as to invite abandonment. The bohemian flavor of their secret meeting s, arranged at short notice, sometimes prevented but all the more exciting when they did take place, had lent their affair an atmosphere of sophisticated comedy, like something out of Murray Vox. And as time went by both Lakin and Alicia came to look back on it as bathed in the aura of excitement and ardor with which memory always surrounds a young love lost beyond recall. They met F.O. Ruti three years later over dinner F.O.R. 2 at the restaurant La Petite Cour. A-D-M-A-N-S-E-S-T-A-T-E. But much as they might have liked to recapture time past, they had nothing to say to one another. Their affair had L.E.F.T.A. trace, however, 
in the memory of Victoria Ocampo. She happened to be briefly in Paris at about this time and asked some FREs to arrange for her to meet Lakin. When they expressed surprise what possible interest could she have in the great man of Freudianism, her answer was the priceless phrase era el amantito de la mujer de Drew, he used to be Drew's wife's boyfriend. 1-3. In May 1st 934 Lakin took the competitive examination held to select chief doctors for mental hospitals. He nearly got himself rejected for the arrogant way he showed off his knowledge of phenomenology at the oral examination. A tiresome young man, reported the examiners. 1-4 he ranked 11th out of 13 successful candidates, having put on a stunning per F.O. romance in the test called the examination of a patient, which involved a 20-minute presentation of a case without prior knowledge of the patient or his or her file. But Lakin wriggled out of taking the hospital post allotted to him. He was already practicing privately as an analyst and would acquire official status on November 20 of the same year, when he became a member of the SPP. 1-5 But his F.A. failure to take up a hospital career didn't he mean he was losing interest in madness. Far from it. He would always return to it, and never F.O. got the link between his interpretation of Freud and the clinical study of psychosis, nor that between the latter and its basis in paranoia. It was in a care on the place Blanche that Lakin first saw the man who F.O.R. several years would be his first and only long-term Annalise and apart F.R.O.M. hospital patients. George Isberny belonged to a Jewish family that originally came from Russia. One six he was studying history but also took an interest in modern painting, avant-garde movements and new ideas in general. He had first seen Lakin in the Café Blanche, sitting at the same table as André Breton, but came across him again in the winter of 1933 at Georges Dumas's lectures at the Sorbonne, where Bernie was then studying FORA qualification in psychology. Lakin wanted to get a degree in philosophy, but Bernie, who was thinking of going in FOR psychiatry, FELT the need FORA Freudian analysis. He went to Allende FORA FEW sessions but didn't think he was very bright and decided to go to Lakin instead. The analysis went on until 1939. After that they met again in Marseilles, where, in the confusion following the FALL of France, both were involved in enterprises I shall deal with in due course. The first sessions of the analysis took place in the Rue de la Pampa and followed the standard pattern. Then they moved to the Boulevard Males Herbs. There were three sessions a week, each lasting an hour. Every two or three weeks Lakin would suggest making a sort of synthesis. He would speak at length to explain what had been happening and to help the private life and public life 8i. Patient make progress. In this first analysis there were already F.E. Atures typical of Lakin's F.U. Tour style, his habit of merging with the patient, of not analyzing the transference, of exchanging B.O.O.K.'s, Object S., and IDEAS with the Annalise Sand, and of keeping FR Eanship and the professional relationship strictly separate. During the years of gestation that lay between the publication of Lakin's thesis and his harnessing of the great philosophical current of his age to his own purposes, he spent a good deal of time with other members of the SPP. In his dealings with men of the first generation of French psychoanalysis, he emerged as a theoretician to be reckoned with. His longest-running debate was with Lowenstein, Paul Schiff, Charles Odier, and Edouard Pichon. Relations between him and Marie Bonaparte were extremely frigid on both sides. She was the official representative of the powerful listening ear in Vienna, and reigned like a queen over the SPP. It was not surprising there should be a resounding silence between her and the architect of a new version of Freud. She didn't seem to have recognized yet the importance of this stranger in her universe. Her private J. O. Ernal, never published, though it relates in detail all the day-to-day -day problems of the psychoanalytic movement, never once mentions Lakin's name. Not that Lakin's contributions to the discussions held at this period were particularly interesting. They showed he attended SPP meetings regularly, but until 1935 he simply repeated what he had already said about paranoia. But in 1936 he began to be interested in the state du Maroyer, or mirror stage. 
drawing on Henry W. A. Hahn, Alexander K. O. J. E. V. E., and Alexander Kor, he devised a theory of the subject that, while making use of the Freudian revolution, gave it a new twist. The development of his thought can be traced in answers he gave in 1937 and 1938 to questions from Marie Bonaparte, Lowenstein, and Daniel Lagache about the divided body, narcissism, and the death drive. The traces are clearer still in the paper of October 2, 5, 1939, entitled De l'impulsion au complex, from impulse to complex, in which Lakin summed up his theories in response to Odier's complaint that his previous speech on the subject had been too 10 and gy it should be noted that at this point Lakin's analysis with Lowenstein represented a serious problem for the members of the SPP. There had been no difficulty in 1934 about accepting Lakin as a member, but after the setting up of the Institut de Psychanalyse, IP, Institute of Psychoanalysis, and the drawing up of strict rules about admission to the status of training Anna LYST, the situation started to deteriorate. It grew still worse in 1936, when Lakin started producing theories that seemed incomprehensible to the current psychoanalytic establishment. So, because they couldn't understand, let alone accept, his intellectual innovations, their JE did him for not obeying the rules. A two M A N S E S T A T E. Not only had Lakin's analysis with Lowenstein been going on longer than was usual at the time, but it looked set to last indefinitely, prolonged by reciprocal gestures of blackmail and defiance. Lowenstein thought Lakin should continue the analysis as part of his training, while Lakin carried on with it just as a means of acquiring the title of training analyst in the SPP. Pichon would have to step in to put an end to the drama. I.S. 9. Fascist M. The end if the V.I.N.S.E.P.I.C. T. If T. Heil the SPP was going through these little private tragedies, history V.V. itself was catching up with the psychoanalytic movement as a whole. I.N. March 1, 938, with the arrival of the Nazis in Vienna, the departure of Freud and the last of his companions could not be far off. But the old man, who had recently undergone an operation to have part of his JAW removed and had already been harassed several times by the Gestapo, lost neither his composure nor his sense of humor. Since moving to Vienna in early childhood he had always lived in the city where his chief discoveries were made, and he wanted to remain at his post until the last possible moment. While, with the help of Max Scher, William Bullitt, and Marie Bonaparte, Jones was making arrangements for the master to leave Vienna, he was also trying for the second time to carry out a plan he had already employed in Germany itself a few years earlier. Jones had adopted the policy of Arianization advocated from 1933 onward by Matthias Heinrich Göring, a convinced Nazi, rabid anti-Semite, and for meter pupil of Emil Kripelin, and a corollary of this policy was a move to create a psych other AP movement containing no Jews and banishing the use of Freudian terminology. Among the members of the Deutsche Psychoanalytische Gesellschaft, DPG, German Psychoanalytic Society, were two men who distinguished themselves in the execution of this project. Felix Bohm and Karl Muller Brunschweig were neither ideologists nor Nazis. They were JUSTJE Alus of the eminent Jewish colleagues who had pioneered Freudianism in Germany. And when the National Socialists came to power, they saw their chance to f further their own careers. Aware of their inferior ITY to their Jewish mentors, they were prepared to act as lackeys to the infamous authorities. Many Jewish members of the DPG went into exile abroad, by 1935 only 9 of 47 remained. Boehm and Miller Braunschweig argued that by F arrest alling the orders of the Nazis and 84 Manseste expelling the last remaining Jewish members of the DPG, while pretending that they were resigning voluntarily, they were depriving the government of a pretext for banning psychoanalysis altogether. This RASQ operation, which Jones went along with, led to the FORCED resignation of the DPG's last remaining Jewish members. One single non-Jew refused to acquiesce in the shameful procedure, Bernard Kamm chose to leave of his own accord out of solidarity with those who were FORCED to go. 
Goring was able to f fulfill his dream of creating an institute of psych other AP that brought together Freudians, Jungians, and independents. Freud disapproved of all this, and when Bohm went to Vienna to try to sell him the rescue theory, he stood up angrily and left he the room. But although Freud disapproved of these ignoble maneuverings, he had long ago relinquished control of IPA affairs, and let Jones support the PROJECT. And this was interpreted as tacit approval. One Jones was to continue along the road of compromise. On March 1, 3, 1938, Freud and his FRNs met I in Vienna to wind up their society, which had moved into new premises only two years before. Anna was in the chair, and everyone, in that dark hour, was thinking of the great occasion in May 1936 when Thomas Mann gave his famous lecture on the FU tour of psychoanalysis. Sigmund Freud, he had said. That mighty SPIRIT in whose honor we have GAT here together, FO under of psychoanalysis as a general method of research and as a therapeutic T ECNIC UE, trod the steep path alone and independently, as physician and natural scientist, without knowing that reinforcement and encouragement lay to his hand in literature. He did not know Nietzsche, scattered throughout whose pages one finds premonitory flashes of truly Freudian insight, he did not know Novalis, whose romantic biologic F.A. entities so often approach astonishingly close to analytic conceptions, he did not know Kierkegaard, whom he must have F.O.U.N.D. profound J. sympathetic and encouraging F.O.R. the Christian zeal which urged him to psychological extremes, and, F.M.L.I. he did not know Skopenhauer, the melancholy Y. symphonist of a philosophy of the instinct, groping F.O.R. change and redemption. By his unaided effort, Without knowledge of any previous intuitive achievement, he had methodically to follow out the line of his own researches, the driving force of his activity was probably increased by this very FREDM FROM special advantage. 2. Dissolving the society, Anna asked Richard Sturba what his plans were. As the only non-Jewish member of the group he could have taken charge, as Jones wished him to, of an operation designed to rescue Viennese psychoanalysis but he refused, and this was Freud's comment, when Titus destroyed the Teempel in Jerusalem, Rabbi Hokanan ben Sakai asked permission to set up a school at Yanni For the study of the Tora. We shall do the same. Our history and our traditions have accustomed us all to persecution. T. Earning to Sturba he added, all of us but one three. Fascism 85. On June 3, 1938, Freud left Vienna on the Orient Express, never to return. He left behind his F.O.R. sisters, Rosa, Mitzi, Dolphy, and Paula. All were to disappear into the darkness of the final solution, at the Riesienstadt or Treblinka. At the Nuremberg trials, a witness recalled seeing one of them being received by the camps over Sternban F.U. Hreyer, a middle aged woman approached Kurt Franz, showed him her AU Swiss identity card, and said she was Sigmund Freud's sister. She asked to be given a simple office job. Franz looked carefully at the AU Swiss and said there seemed to be some mistake. He led her over to the railroad timetable and told her there was a train back to Vienna in two hours' time. She should leave her papers and valuables with him and go and take a shower. She went through the door into the shower room and never came back for. At 9.45 on the morning of June 5, 1938, Marie Bonaparte and William Bullitt were at the Gare de l'Est to meet Freud for a 12-hour stopover in Paris. Late that afternoon he met some French psychoanalysts in the salons of the Princess's mansion in the Rue Adolphe Yvonne. Lakin was not present. He said later that he had chosen to stay away because he didn't want to kowtow, fair de graces, to Marie.5 the truth was probably different, for in FACT the gathering at Marie Bonaparte's was a private occasion, and Lakin wasn't invited. In, any case, he had nothing to gain at that date from a meeting with the sage from Vienna. In August, when all Europe was living in dread of war, the IPA Congress took place in sweltering hot weather in a room in the Avenue Dina. Jones, opening the proceedings, paid tribute to France. Using French for this part of his address, Jones declared, France may be considered to have provided the FRM work FOR modern psychology. 
It was French psychologists, impelled by a typically French intuition, who first discovered the importance for psychology in general of the results of clinical and therapeutic observation. This prepared the ground for the major discovery, that of the normal unconscious, though the discovery itself was made elsewhere. To use a fa remaining metaphor, by the end of the last century the soil of France had been overcultivated for a hundred years and was completely exhausted. The signs of infertility were becoming clear, a fa low period was needed. For for days French and fo rain psychoanalysts held forth on various subjects. Lowenstein, Pichon, Allende, Lagache, Sophie Morgenstern, and Marie Bonaparte followed each other onto the platform. One man Jacques Lacan was conspicuous by his absence. In his closing speech, Jones summarized the situation, and his own presidential activities, in the countries where Freudian societies had been established. Speaking of Germany, he announced the success of his rescue policy. Without mentioning Goring, the Nazification process, the FORCED Jewish resignations, or the exodus of the flower of the psychoanalytic intelligentsia, he expressed satisfaction at the 86 MANSESTATE. Considerable autonomy that the German Psychoanalytic Society, though it continued to live a somewhat delicate existence, ENJO yet in its new FORM as a separate department of the new German Institute FOR Psychological Research and Psychotherapy, FO on date in May 1936, M. Any candidates have been trained, said Jones, now speaking in English, and the total membership list increased. Turning to the Austrian question, he deplored the unhappy FATE of the Vienna Society, how unlikely did it seem when I participated in its first meetings more than 32 years ago that it should be my lot to have to recommend the practical dissolution of this, the mother of all psychoanalytic societies, on March 20 of this year. The president of the Vienna SOCD, Professor Freud, accepted the recommendation that the goodwill and duties of the society be transferred to the German Psychoanalytic Society, but of the final outcome of this procedure we are still in doubt 6. When this depressing speech was over, those attending the Congress adjective O earn D to St. Cloud for a reception held in the gardens of the Princess's magnificent residence. The Viennese exiles, on their way to the United States, gave one last thought before the apocalypse to this fairy tale Europe whose splendors they would never see again. The great Yvette Gilbert, whom Freud greatly admired, sang Dites Moi Kje Sui Belle, Tell Me I Am Beautiful, and at the age of 80 held everyone spellbound by her voice and her charm. Point seven Lakin was probably there, but only as one of the crowd. The signing of the Munich Agreement, a presage of France's collapse, had an important influence on the way Lakin, with the aid of the grammarian Edouard Pichon, escaped from his interminable analysis. Pichon, knowing he had lost his battle f o h psychoanalysis and anxious in those somber days not to see the SPP dominated entirely by its orthodox elements, decided to modify the list of candidates for the title of training analyst, for Heinz Hartmann, who had come to Paris as a refugee when the Nazis occupied Vienna, he exchanged Lakin. So it took strong arm tactics by a MEM Burr of Action FRNIs to make Lakin's reluctant colleagues grant him his rightful place among them. He applied FOR the status of training analyst in the SPP on November 1, 5, 1938, and on December 20 it was granted. By this move, made shortly before his death, Pichon was not only indicating a possible heir to the French tradition FOR which he had FO Ughight so hard, he was also writing a wrong. After Lakin's six years on Lowenstein's couch there was no reason why he should be he refused membership. Lowenstein's bitter sense of humiliation at the way the analysis ended is still evident in the rancorous letter he wrote to Marie Bonaparte on February 22, 1953, What you tell me about Lakin is distressing. He has always represented a source of conflict for me, on one hand there is intellectual worth. Fastsum 87. Which I value highly, though I disagree violently with him. Nevertheless, 
The misfortune is that much as we agreed that he would continue his analysis after his election to the society, he did not do so. One does not cheat on such an important point with impunity, this between us. I certainly hope that his hastily analyzed, that is to say incompletely analyzed, trainees will not be admitted. 8 In another letter, dated September 1, 2, 1967, and addressed to Jean Meal, Lowenstein let drop a few more details about Lakin's election and his own views about his Annalise Sand. Ellican was elected in 1937 to 1938, and I played a decisive part at that time in overcoming colleagues' objections. And about the 1953 schism he added. When it became clear that the training Lakin gave was unacceptable, he said he would mend his ways and obey the standard rules. But he immediately put up FOR membership an unusually large number of candidates analyzed by himself. So again he was FORCED to admit that the training he had provided was unorthodox, because he had economized on time. As regards Lakin's ideas, my view is that he shows penetrating imagination in pursuit of the signifier but has no interest in the signified dot with this defect, no scientific discourse, aspiring to be a branch of knowledge, can claim to be complete. And so when I read his work I can't help thinking, words, words, words. And yet I love and admire Mallarmé.910. The Philosophy School. A L X A N D R E K O U R A N D others. At the time Lakin was writing F O R the Minot, or he was exasperated with his medical studies, but still interested in the philosophical topics of his day. This brought him into contact with Pierre Verret, a communist student slightly younger than himself, who was looking F O R some private coaching to help make ends meet. Lakin who wanted to get a certificate in logic and general philosophy from the Sorbonne, asked Verit to instruct him in the broad outlines of the sub-JECT, and F.O.R.F.O. or -O -O months from September 1933 to January 1934, when he met Georges B. Irnier he had his professor come to the Rue de la Pampa twice a week from 7, 30 in the evening till midnight. Sometimes they would have a pleasant meal together, prepared in advance by the housekeeper. They weren't ordinary lessons, organized SYS thematically to cover a definite program, writes Verit. I instead he would bombard me with questions out of the blue and requests FORF you their information that often flummoxed me, novice that I was. He was interested in everything, and he was the one who really conducted the lesson. If I may venture the comparison, it was more like a platonic dialogue in which answers to questions produced more questions, with me as a pretty poor Socrates. The doctor never deducted anything from my FES to cover the excellent dinner that sometimes accompanied our verbal JOS cell. Meanwhile, through his relations with Jean Bernier and the Surrealists, as well as by the publication of his thesis, Lakin Found himself in the midst of the debate about communism that was then exercising the French intelligentsia. So although he never sought any political commitment for himself, he did follow the battle over Freud and Marxism that raged in 1933 among the communists, the surrealists, and the FRNs of Boris Severin. One day at a lecture delivered at the Mutualite building in the Latin Quarter where PUBLIC meetings are held the speaker, a young philosopher called Jean Otterd, was fiercely challenged by Georges Politzer, and the two men. The Philosophy School 89. Came to blows. Lakin wasn't present but he read Otterd's paper and thought he would like to meet him. He said to Verit, if I can get to the meeting of the AEAR Association de Crivens et de Artistes Revolutionaries, Association of Revolutionary Writers and Artists, I'd like to have a drink with you and Otterd, before dinner perhaps. I'll let you know tomorrow if I can make it too. Otterd's text was original at the time. Instead of siding either with the anti-Freudians or with the Freudo-Marxists, he argued that psychoanalysis, being more materialistic than Marxism, could tone down the latter's idealism. 
He also pointed out that the Marxism of the Russian communists was different from the communism preached in Paris.3 but all this was marginal to the real subject of Lakin's preoccupations during the long gestation period between the publication of his article on the Papine sisters and the working out of his theories on the illusions of the ego. And it was his contacts with Alexander Kor, H-E-N-R-Y Corbin, Alexander K-O-J-E-V-E, and George Isbodely that introduced him to modern philosophy and set him reading Husserl, Nietzsche, Hegel, and Heidegger. Without this widening of his fr ontiers, as well as his encounter with the surrealists, Lakin might have been imprisoned forever within the confines of psychiatry and an academic understanding of Freud. Alexander Koyer was born in Taganrog in Russia in 1892, the son of an importer of colonial goods. Young as he still was, he took part in the political activities that followed the 1905 revolution and ended up in prison. Nevertheless by the age of 17 he was at the University of Göttingen, studying under Husserl and Hilbert. From there he went to Paris, where he attended B.E. Rugson's and Brunswick's lectures at the Sorbonne. He returned to Russia and took part in the February Revolution but opposed the October 1. In 1919, after fighting on the Russian front in the First World War, he left Russia for France, this time for good. In 1914 Coyer had written a paper entitled The Idea of God in the Philosophy of Saint Anselm. His supervisor at the time was Fran R. O. I. S. Picovet, a fre thinker and specialist in medieval philosophy who passed on to his pupil his own passion for Neoplatonism for and a secular approach to the history of religious philosophy. This didn't stop Coyer from attending Etienne Gilson's lectures in 192 I, though Gilson's position was quite different from that of Picovet. Gilson, a Christian philosopher and an immensely prolific author, had completely transformed the study of medieval philosophy with his new method of interpreting texts. Students came to hear and watch him, first at the Sorbonne and then at the fifth section of the EPHE, École Pratique de Hautes Etudes. G. Ilson would read out the Latin texts, writes Corbin, give his own translation of them, and then bring out all their 90 manseste underlying as well as their overt meaning in a masterly and penetrating commentary s. This method made it possible to place an author or a work in a historical context where philosophy and religion could coexist. So, in contradistinction to the secular tradition represented by Emile Breuer, Gilson converted a whole generation of researchers to the idea that sacred texts could supply material for genuine philosophical thought. As I have noted, Jean Beruze, who taught Lakin philosophy at the college Stanislas, used Gilsonian methods in his lessons. Coyer entitled his degree thesis The Idea of God and the Proofs of His Existence in the UI Orcs of Descartes, and after Picovet's death he was appointed a temporary lecturer in the fifth section of the EPHE. In 1929 he received his doctorate in philosophy for his thesis on Jacob Boma, and two years later he became director of studies in the fifth section and professor of the history of religious ideas in modern Europe. So began the teaching career of a man of great magnanimity, whose less than perfect delivery was outweighed by his distinguished personality and outstanding intelligence. He became one of the greatest historians of science in this century. Following on directly from Paul Tannery, he rejected the idea that the history of science could be treated in isolation, as well as the notion that human knowledge was gradually but inevitably progressing toward first a key to the understanding of reality and ultimately to that understanding itself in place of this approach, based on a selective chronology of the evolution of ideas, Coyer proposed a philosophical history of science that, instead of restricting itself to a chain of connections between scientific exploits, would include in its consideration of any period all that era's ideas and beliefs. He wanted the history of science to include the study of how science understands, at any given time, what is contemporary with it and what preceded it. When I began my researches, he wrote in 195 1, I was spurred on by the belief that all human thought, especially in its highest FORMS, FORMETA connected whole. It seemed to me one couldn't keep philosophical and religious thought in separate compartments, philosophy is always involved with religion in one way or another, 
using it either as a springboard or as a target 6. Coyer's ideas on the history of science were splendidly exemplified in his studies on Galileo, begun around 1935. 7. He showed how the scientific renaissance that led to the destruction of the medieval idea of the universe arose largely out of a philosophical argument between Platonism and Aristotelianism concerning the role played by mathematics in man's understanding of the world around him. For the Platonists, who included Galileo, mathematics ruled the universe. For the Aristotelians, who represented traditional scholasticism, mathematics dealt merely in abstractions, and physics was the science of the real. The science of Galileo rejected all finalist explanations of the universe. The Philosophy School 91 And brought the idea of a hierarchically ordered cosmos a step closer to destruction. The notion of an infinite and autonomous universe undermined traditional proofs of the existence of God, banished man from his place at the center of creation, and forced him to seek for God within himself. Medieval man had lived in a space where the truth was given in the FORM of revealed religion. But the man of the new Galilean order, whom Descartes bade philosophize as if no one had ever philosophized before, FOUND himself in a space where thought reigned supreme and thought was lodged in him. The closed, finite, hierarchical world of the Middle Ages was being replaced by a limitless universe in which man stood alone, save FOR his reason, his uncertainty, and his dismay. 8. The philosophical parallel to this scientific isolation is to be FOUND in Descartes' cogito, subjected to the opposing poles of truth and freedom. The individual is FRE, he has nothing to lean on outside himself, and he has to confront a truth to which no pre-existing authority has set any bounds. Point nine such meditations on the birth of modern science and the status of the cogito had originated in the great philosophical shake-up brought about by Husserl, coins as F. Rometer teacher. Knowledge of Husserl's theories had been gaining ground in France since the 1920s, and especially since February 1929, when Husserl delivered his F. A. Mao's lectures, Cartesian Meditations, to the Société Frenise de Philosophie, French Philosophical Society. Starting from the cogito, Husserl's phenomenology asserted that nothing could be known for certain except my existence as a thinking being. At the cogito stage, being must be reduced to the I who is thinking, i.e. to the being of the e.g. A. Hence the notion of phenomenological reduction, which posits the primacy of the e.g. O and of thought and goes beyond ordinary experience to see existence as consciousness of the world. If the existence of the world presupposes that of the e.g. O, phenomenological reduction makes my existence consciousness of the world. The ego then becomes transcendental, and consciousness becomes intentional, since it is directed at something. As for ontology, that is an egeology in which, if my idea of an object is real, then the object itself is also real. Thus the ego acquires a sense of the other or of the alter ego, through a series of experiences that define transcendental intersubjectivity as the reality out of which each individual ego emerges. In 1935, in the crisis of European stances and transcendental phenomenology, in German, crisis, Husserl showed how the quest for intersubjectivity could save the human sciences from in humanity. In other words, by saving the ego from scientific formalism, transcendental phenomenology was preserving the possibility of a science of man in which the ego could be seen as life itself. So, in the face of the rising tide of barbarism and dictatorship that was threatening the peace of the West. Husserl's phenomenology appealed to the philosophical consciousness that Europe had inherited from antiquity. 92 man sest at e. And that found an echo in men and women who wanted to be free to govern their own lives. There are only two escapes from the crisis of European existence, the downfall of Europe in its estrangement from its own rational sense of life, its fall into hostility toward the spirit and into barbarity, or the rebirth of Europe from the spirit of philosophy through a heroism of Arya Sun that overcomes naturalism once and for all. Europe's greatest danger is weariness. 10. Between the wars Husserl's works fascinated the French intelligentsia, and this showed itself in various ways. 
read in conjunction with Heidegger, and particularly in the light of his being and time, published in 1927, who Searle's writings made it possible to situate the tragic side of existence and the flaws in being within the individual, thus striking a decisive blow at the popularity of Bergsonian optimism about the possibilities of the ego. The resulting critique of the idea of progress led sometimes to a rejection of democratic values in favor of a return to the original roots of being and sometimes to a notion of nothingness, or void, a tragic symbol of the finiteness and mortal end of a human existence devoid of all transcendency. But who Searle's philosophy did offer modern reason to escape roots. One lay in refocusing Western spirituality on a philosophy of experience and the individual, in France this path would be followed by Jean-Paul Sartre and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The other solution was to construct a philosophy based on knowledge and rationality, as did Alexander Coyne, Jean Cavaillols, and Georges Canguillem. Lacan would follow a middle course between the two that involved both a new exploration of the subject I.E., of individual experience and an attempt to define a form of human rationality based on a deeper knowledge of the Freudian unconscious. 11. Coyne S. views on the evolution of science were in tune with the work of the historians who in 1929, led by Marc Bloch and Lucien Febvre, had started the review Annals d'Histoire Economique et Sociale, Annals of Economic and Social History. As early as 1903, in the Revue de Synthèse, Synthesis, founded by Henry Burr, Fran O.I.S. Simiand had challenged the positivist methods of Ernest Lavis and Charles Sainobos and advocated the destruction of the three graven images of orthodox history, first, the idol of politics, which required events affecting society as a whole to be reduced to the conscious decisions and deeds of the princes of this world, next, the idol of individuality, which limited the story of all mankind to just the lives of the famous, and last, the idol of chronology, which favored a linear narrative made up of strings of facts supported by sacrosanct documents. It was no coincidence that Annals, which would give birth to a new school of history, was founded not only in the same year as the Wall Street crash but also at the time that the Husserl revolution was preparing a philosophical rethinking of the question of human existence. At the heart of both. The Philosophy School 93 the historical and the philosophical movements lay deep doubt about the idea of progress as inherited from 18th century philosophy. Not only had any descriptive history based merely on stirring battles and idealized heroes been rendered obsolete by the recent horrors of Verdun, but these new perceptions of the complexity of real and living history ruled out restricted or simplified theories purporting to explain past phenomena. So instead of a Manichaean representation of events, Bloch and Febvre and their friends aimed at creating a vast multiple history that would include the study of lifestyles, habitats, attitudes, feelings, collective subjectivities, and social groups. All these would combine in an epic narrative that could bring a whole era back to life in the reader's imagination. The pioneers of this new history were encouraged in their task by researches in three other fields, the teachings of V. Idel de la Black, who had freed geography from its obsession with administrative divisions and changed it into a largely visual science studied in the field, the work of Emile Durkheim, who had transformed sociology from mere fact collecting into a study of structural patterns and developments in economic history. The A. N. Nails revolution tended in the direction of a temporal and spatial deconstruction of the subject not without analogy in Husserl's philosophy and Einstein's theory of relativity. In this new type of history, man, immersed in the infinite duration of the long term, was master of his fate no more. T.O.R.N. between a social and a geographical time dimension no longer limited to his own personal experience, he was nonetheless denied any place in a universal nature, since nature was now relative, varying from one culture and one period to another. The cultural relativism of the analysts, together with their condemnation of narrative history with a patriotic or nationalistic stance, challenged the high-handed assumptions that made Western civilization see its history in terms of progress, a progress based on the colonization of minor ITY cultures. The new historians didn't reject the heritage of Enlightenment philosophy, but they did apply it to different ends. Their object was not so much to reassess reactionary, primitive, barbaric, 
or prejudice-ridden forms of social organization as to find a new way of thinking about difference and identity, sameness and otherness, reason and unreason, science and religion, error and truth, the occult and the rational. And the demand for relativism, and for an end to the idea that one civilization is superior to another, made possible a new universalism, able to create a living encyclopedia of human societies by incorporating into history the work of other sciences psychology, sociology and ethnology now also expanding rapidly. Twelve Coyer's lectures on Renaissance Hermetism and Paracelsus were a factor in bringing together Febvre's and Coyer's influences. In 1931 a group of 94 men sest8 French historians of science was formed, and a year later Abel Roy founded the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science, with offices in the Rue du Four and Coyer on the Management Committee. And so a link was forged between the analysts and the new scientific historians that would make it possible to trace the evolution of human thought by studying it in creative action. Febvre's attitude to the possibility of a history of philosophy can best be seen in a review he wrote in 1937 of a book by Georges Friedman on the current crisis concerning the idea of progress. It struck me that it would be useful to compare the history of philosophy as written by philosophers with the way we historians proper deal with ideas when the occasion arises. And having done so I was dismayed at how often historians proper are content just to describe new concepts as though they were generated spontaneously, without any reference to their different economic, political and social backgrounds, as if they were produced by disembodied minds living unreal lives in the sphere of pure ideas. 13. Instead of showing lone eccentrics spinning atemporal systems of thought out of their own entrails, Febvre's history of ideas would deal in real people inventing new thoughts, whether consciously or unconsciously, by means of the outlage mental, intellectual apparatus, of their age. The idea of mentality, or mental outlook, revived in the work of Lucien Levy Brull, had first been used to compare the prelogical thought systems of children and primitive peoples with the more abstract functioning of the modern, Western mind. But in the 1930s the notion acquired a structural tinge through the use of the phrase outlage mental. W.H. Ether in Mark Bloch's Symbolic Representations, Lucien Febvre's Psychic Universe, or Alexander Coyer's Conceptual Structure, the aim was always to define a model of what was thinkable at any given period, using the categories of perception, conceptualization and expression then available for the organization of individual and collective thought. 14. All this reflected a French approach to the structural analysis of human societies that could be seen in Lacan as early as 1938 and that a new intellectual generation would take up again 20 years later in the light of Saussurian linguistics. In 1925, when I was 20, writes Jean-Paul Sartre, there was no chair of Marxism at the university, and communist students took good care not to use any ideas from Marxism, or even to mention it, in their essays. Otherwise they would have failed all their exams. So great was the horror of anything dialectical that W.E.D. never even heard of Hegel. 15. Sartre was describing the state of mind of a generation about to enter the 19,305 and caught up in a total contradiction between what they were being taught at. The Philosophy School 95. The university and what they were discovering for themselves as they began to read first Husserl and then Heidegger. After 1870 Kantian philosophy became more or less the official ideology for teachers under the Third Republic, and they added to it their own brand of Cartesianism to provide secular education with a set of ethical standards to go with its rational theory of knowledge. This, together with Bergson's life FORCE, seemed capable of solving all the moral problems facing modern man and all the antinomies of the individual in his or her relation to the world. So Hegel's philosophy came to be rejected or ignored because of its idealism and its hostility to mathematics, not to mention its alleged atheism, immorality, and fatalism. It was accused of dwelling on the nothingness of being, the nothingness of becoming, and, on top of all the rest, the certainty of the nothingness of death. It was perceived as a pathological, even an obscurantist doctrine. To crown all, there was the classic charge of pan-Germanism. 
Hegel's Protestantism was deemed incompatible with the categories of L. Aden thought, and his philosophy of law was read as an apologia for the Prussian state. But now all those who were discovering the greatness of Husser and awakening to the new light shed by Heidegger felt a need to go back to the origins of the modern science of consciousness and to the works of its F.O. under, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Ever since Victor Cousin's attempt to adapt Hegelianism to the politics of the Bourbon Restoration stripping it, in the process, of negativity and dot absolute rationality, two of its F.U. endomental ideas Hegel's thought had made its way in France clandestinely or through unofficial channels. Unorthodox academics like Lucien Hare lectured on it, self-taught enthusiasts like Proudhon studied it, poets like Mallarmé and Breton reflected it in their work. But things suddenly took a radical new turn when Jean Wall, Alexander Coeur, Eric Weil, and Alexander Kojiv initiated the three-decade generation of the three H.S., Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger. Sixteen. Coeur again played a leading part. He tackled Hegel for the first time in the academic year of 1926-1927, in the course of a seminar on German speculative mysticism. He showed that the unhappy consciousness, i.e., the consciousness that was liberated but a prey to doubt and anguish, was only a substitute for the consciousness of sin, a negative stage in the evolution of the mind from which religion had disappeared. He called this theory optimistic personalism 17. In the years that F. Olod, Coyer went on to teach the philosophies of John Amos Cumnius, John Huss, and Nicholas of C.U.S.A. Alexander Kojiv, who settled in Paris in 1926, began to be a regular attendant at Coyer's seminar, F. Olod by Henry Corbin, who was specializing in Oriental studies and had become a close F.R. end of Jean Beruze, and by Georges Baudelaire. Bertoli had recently joined Boris 50 of Aaron as a contributor to Critique Sociale and 96 Man S. Estate. Embarked on a polemic with Jean Bernie about Kraft being psychopathia sexualis. 18. The centenary of Hegel's death in 1931 gave rise to an important revival and updating of his thought. The Surrealists, especially André Breton, had already related it to the teachings of Freud. 19 on the other hand Bertoli, in the early numbers of the review documents, had been hostile and taxed Hegel with panayogism. For him the true revolt of man didn't mean overcoming paltry abstract contradictions in order to attain another life, it consisted in bursting out altogether from the constraints of reason and philosophy. So he was critical not only of Hegelianism but also of the Marxist and Surrealist readings of it. Bertoli himself was engaged in reviving Gnostic theology, with its love of darkness and its cult of a base matter that had no room for reason or ideals. Point two oh, at this point his anti-Hegelianism was based on an anti-Christian stance that would ultimately lead to an apologia for Nietzsche. But after 1930 his earlier attitude to Hegel changed, as a result of the influence of Jean Wall, of Bertoli's own reading of Husserl's Cartesian Meditations and Heidegger's article What is Metaphysics? and of a discus zion between Bertoli and Raymond Cano triggered off by an essay by Nikolai, Hartmann. 2-1 on August 6, 1930, Henry Corbin, JUST back FROM Berlin, noted tersely. Red H. E. Eidger 22. Corbin, the first person to introduce Iranian Islamic philosophy into France, was also the first French translator of Heidegger's being and T.I.M.E his version of what is metaphysics. Appeared in 1931 in the review Bifer, with an excellent introduction on Heidegger by Coyer. He is the first person in the post-war period with the courage to bring the philosophy of heaven down to earth and speak to us about ourselves, to speak as a philosopher about very ordinary, very simple things, about life and death, about being, and nothingness. He has posed again, with unique freshness and force, the eternal problem faced by any true philosophy, the problem of the self and of being. What am I, and what does being mean? Monsieur Heidegger and this above all is what makes him so valuable and important has undertaken an Enermaus demolition job. The analyses in being and time are a kind of destructive but liberating catharsis. They take man in his natural state, being in the world. 
they are about his perception of things, about things themselves, about language, thought, becoming, time. They let us see the work of one, the impersonal subject. And they guide us toward the ultimate pyre of nothingness, where all false values, all conventions, and all lies vanish, and man stands alone in the tragic grandeur of his lonely existence, in truth and unto death. 23. This program of destruction and annihilation went against every kind of theology, even the negative kinds. For as Coyer pointed out, Heidegger's nothingness was neither God nor the Absolute, it was just a void that lent a tragic dimension to the grandeur of man's finiteness. There was a reference to this tragic dimension in an article by Bertoli. The Philosophy School 97. Called a critique of the basis of Hegelian dialectic 24. But the article links Bertoli's change of attitude more closely to a Marx-inspired interpretation that gave Hegel's philosophy an anthropological slant, showing it as providing a kind of family tree of the human condition. This led Bertoli to a FASC nation, later FOUND in Kojiv, with the struggle between master and slave and with the defense of a proletariat doomed to a negative existence. Bertoli intended this anthropological gloss to enrich Hegelian dialectic with the findings of Freud's psychoanalysis and Durkheim's sociology. T. O. Mark the Hegel Centenary, Coyer produced three important articles on his works and added a new lecture to his 1932-1933 seminar on the history of religious ideas in modern Europe. The first article was a historical survey of Hegelian studies in France. The second pointed out a paradox, the difficulty many people had in reading Hegel arose from the FACT that he used a living language made up of ordinary words instead of the artificial though familiar jargon of academic philosophy. The third article was a lengthy meditation on the lecture Hegel gave during the Jena period, 1802-1807, between the writing of Fragment of a System, 1801, and Phenomenology of Mind, 1807, Point 25 Coyer said that the period of the Jena lectures was a crucial stage in the evolution of Hegel's system of thought, a dialectic phase during which he realized that it was necessary to explain the world, rather than reform it, and F. formulated the theory that this realization was the dialectical force behind the quest of the mind. From this there emerged the idea of overturning all traditional notions about human understanding and creating a system in which anxiety would lie at the core of being, a dialectical ontology of being and non-being, of a mobile infinity and emotionless eternity, of annihilation and generation. But if anxiety is at the core of being, that is because the dialectic is defined in terms of human time, it is in us, it is in our life, that the present of the mind exists, a present always projected into the future and triumphing over the past. But dialectical time, though it has no end, is built upon the future. Hence, says Coyer, the contradiction in Hegel's system, if human time fails to arrive at some form of completion, no philosophy of history is possible. Yet completion would rule out the primacy of the future and of the motive force behind the dialectic of history. If there is to be a Hegelian history, it must be possible for history to have an end. Hegel may have believed this. He may even have believed it was not only a necessary condition of the system the Isles of Athena come out only at night but also that this necessary condition had already been realized, that history had actually ended, and that this was why he might be or had been able to complete his system 26. So Coyer concluded his 1933 course on Hegel with the hypothesis of an end to history, a view of Hegel's thought as a realization, in Jena, that the old. 98 man sest 8. World had collapsed and that philosophy must be e reborn as t he all of Minerva. The idea caught on dot that year's seminar had been attended by the old friends Corbin, Kojiv, Bertoli, and Kino. The discussions were lively and continued afterward in useful exchanges at the Café de Harcourt on the corner of the Place de la Sorbonne and the Boulevard Saint Michel. Who will give us back our de Harcourt? wrote Corbin later. I went back there after the war and found it had been turned into a religious bookshop. And now it's a men's outfitters. 
yet it was at the de Harcourt that part of the French philosophy of the period was worked out, with the revival of Hegelian stud IES looming large. Among the people who gathered around Coyer there were Alexander Kojeev, Raymond Cano, myself, and philosophers like Fritz Heinemann, also many of our Jewish colleagues who had chosen exile and whose harrowing stories told us what was going on in Germany. Things got pretty heated sometimes. Kojeev and Heinemann interpreted the phenomenology of mind in completely opposite ways. Comparisons were often made between Husserl's PHE nomenology and that of Heidegger.27. It was in this climate of philosophical revival that Corbin and Coyer founded Recherches Philosophiques, Philosophical Studies. The review first appeared in 1933, and there were six issues from then to 1937. Henry Charles Puch was the leading figure in this venture, with the charming Alfred Spahier acting as secretary until his premature death in 1934. Spahier was born in Jassy in Romania in 1883 and in 1914 enlisted as a volunteer in the French army. Six years later he came top in the aggregation examination in Philoso Phy. Now a senior lecturer at Kahn and an enthusiastic admirer of Freud, Spahier attracted to the review all the psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who were interested in phenomenology people like Eugene Minkowski, Edouard Pichon, and Henry E. Y. Jacques Lacan attended meetings of the group FROM the 1933-1934 session onward, after he had started attending Kojeev's seminar. Contributors to the review included Georges Baudelaire, Georges Dumazil, Emmanuel Lavinas, Pierre Klosowski, Roger K. Lewis, and Jean-Paul Sartre, whose Transcendence de Ego, Esquisse d'une Description Phenomenologie appeared in its pages in 1936. 28. At a session of his 1960-1961 seminar devoted to Plato's Symposium, Lakin described one of his meetings with Kojiv. Although by that time Kojeev was France's leading representative at international trade negotiations, he spent such time as he could spare on his three-volume history of pagan philosophy. He had completed the first volume two years earlier and was working on the second when Lakin came to see him about it. Kojeev spoke of his discoveries concerning Plato but told Lakin he hadn't read the symposium for a long time and had nothing to say about it. But he did point out, in general, that Plato's talent lay as much in the way he concealed as in the Philosophy School 99. The way he revealed his thought. Kojeev linked this to his own approach to philosophy, according to which a text is only the history of its interpretation. And he added enigmatically, you can never interpret the symposium properly if you don't know why Aristophanes had hiccups. Lakin, reporting this to his audience, reminded them, not for the first time, that it was Kojeev who had introduced him to Hegel. Then he commented dutifully on Aristophanes' hiccups. 29 Kojeev was an extraordinary man, and Lakin was only one of many who were captivated by his teachings. He was a very fluent lecturer and spoke perfect French and German, though with an accent that was half Slav and half Burgundian. At every session of his seminar he used to read out AFEW lines from THE Phenomenology if Mind and then give a marvelous translation that brought out all the meaning and expressed it in absolutely modern terms. He could be flippant and amusing as well as narcissistic and mysterious. His irreverent tone, the assurance with which he seemed to go to the heart of things, and his great rhetorical skill all combined to hold his here ERS spellbound. George Isbodily was shattered, overwhelmed, rooted to the spot. Kano was staggered. 3 O born Alexander Kojevnikov in Moscow in 1902, Kojev was the nephew of Vasily Kandinsky, his paternal grandfather had married the painter's mother. His father, Vladimir, Vasily's half-brother, died in action in Manchuria in 1905, during the Russo-Japanese WAR that ended with the rout of the Tsar's army. His mother returned to Moscow and got married again, to her late husband's best friend and comrade in arms, who was an excellent stepfather to the young Alexander. The boy had a privileged upbringing amid the cosmopolitan, cultured, liberal bourgeoisie, living in the smart Arbat district of Moscow and distinguishing himself as a pupil at the Medvinikov Lyceum. In January 1917, 
AFEW months before the revolution, Kojiv recorded in his P. Philosophical Journal his thoughts on the Battle of the Arjunusi Islands 31. This was a famous episode in the Peloponnesian War between Sparta, a land power, and Athens, a maritime one. The battle took place in 406 BC, and the Athenian generals won. But as they were sailing home they met with a dreadful storm and had to jettison the bodies of the dead warriors that, in accordance with Greek law, they were taking home to be buried. The ships were now light enough to weather the storm, but when they reached Athens the generals were tried and executed for sacrilege because they had denied burial to heroes killed in battle. As a result, the democracy Felln was replaced, until 403 BC, by the tyranny of the Thirty. Only Socrates spoke out against the sentencing of the generals, pointing out that they had had to choose between saving the fleet by sacrificing the corpses or sinking with them on board and losing the fleet, in either case. 100 Manseste. They would have had to leave the dead unburied and so would be guilty of sacrilege. They were bound to commit a crime but at least they had chosen one evil instead of two. Kojiv agreed with Socrates' conclusion but opposed the execution of the generals for a different reason, he absolved the generals of guilt because they had acted as they did not out of a desire to commit a crime but for the common good point three two battles, crime, and death were not merely subjects for philosophical reflection in young Kojiv's life. They were important signifiers, landmarks in his own experience. In July 1917, 12 years after his father's death in battle, Kojiv saw his stepfather murdered in the F.A. Malise country home by a gang of looter s. A year later he himself was imprisoned in Moscow by the Bolshevik government because he and his schoolmates had been dabbling in the black market. In his cell he realized that something essential to the history of mankind was happening, and he became a communist. But because of his bourgeois origins he wasn't allowed to go on with his stud i.e.s., so despite the F.A.C.T. that it meant leaving his beloved mother behind, he went off to Poland with his F.R. Eind George's W.I.T.T., providently carrying a handful of jewelry in his pocket. One night in 1920, working late in the library in Warsaw, he had a revelation similar to the one Nietzsche had in Sils Maria. As Kojiv was meditating on Eastern and Western culture, he had a vision of Buddha and Descartes confronting one another like the irony of the cogito like non-existence challenging the ontology of the ego. This was Kojiv's first experience of negativity. I think, therefore I am not, was his conclusion. 33 Moving on to Germany and to Heidelberg University, he prefered Jaspers's lectures to those of Husserl, studied Sanskrit Tibetan, and Chinese, and tried with OUT success to read Hegel. I read the phenomenology of mind right through F.O.R. times, but though I slogged away as hard as I could I didn't understand a word 34. By 1926 he was living in Paris, where he made F.R.E.N.s with his F.E.L.O. countryman Alexander Coyer in rather comical circumstances. Kojiv was the lover of Cecile Schautach, the whiffy e of Coyer's younger brother, and Coyer's wife sent her husband round to scold him. But Coyer went home all smiles and told his wife, Cecile's done the right thing that chap's much better looking than my brother L35 Kojiv, an enthusiastic frequenter of coin, s lectures joined in the Reedy's covery of Hegel, going to the F.A. Mao's Café de Harcourt with Corbin and Baudelaire and mixing with the Recherches Philosophiques group. In 1933, when Coyer discovered he had to be away at the end of the year, he suggested that his F.R. Eind Kojiv take over his E.P.H.E. lectures on Hegel's religious philosophy. The Ministry of Education agreed, and Kojiv spent the summer of 1933 rereading the phenomenology Sif Mind. This preparation resulted in the The Philosophy School 101 Famous seminar, which was to take place at 5.30 every Monday afternoon for six years. Afterward, some of the audience of the 2KS would adjourn to the Café de Harcourt for further discussions. From the 1934 to 1935 session to that of 1936 to 1937, Lakin was listed as regularly present at the seminar.36 Although Kojiv had neither Coyer's philosophical genius nor his skill as a theorist, 
he possessed a wonderful talent for transforming philosophy into a vivid human epic. He could change an abstract concept into an allegorical figure as colorful as any character in Gogol or Dostoevsky and related to everyday reality. As the lecturer put himself in the place of Socrates or an Athenian general, Hegel's ideas came across as completely relevant to contemporary events. For when Kojiv spoke of the mind, self-awareness, absolute knowledge, recognition, desire, satisfaction, the unhappy consciousness, or the master-slave dialectic, he was really talking about events that had marked his own and his audience's youth, events they now examined as men on those Monday afternoons and late into the evening. Coyer's Socratic commentary on the phenomenology of mind was a kind of serial story reflecting the anxieties of a generation shattered by the rise of the dictators, haunted by the prospect of war, and tempted by the new nihilism, whether in the form of Nietzschean worship of the Superman or of Heidegger's being for death, a negation of all human progress. Coyer had shown how Hegel's use of ordinary language broke with AC Ademic tradition and had put forward his own hypothesis that the end of history was necessary to make Hegelian philosophy possible. Kojiv's commentary followed Coyer on both counts. Twice in October 1806 and in May 1807 Hegel spoke with awe of Napoleon's exploits. I saw the emperor, heart, and soul of the world, ride out of the city on reconnaissance. My book was finished at last during the night before the Battle of Jena. As he pondered these two remarks, Kojiv had a revelation about the underlying significance of Hegel's attitude, his book had been written in circumstances that amounted to the end of history. I read the phenomenology of mind again, and when I got to chapter 6 I realized it i.e., the end of history was Napoleon. I started giving my lectures without preparing them. I just read and commented, and everything Hegel said seemed crystal clear. It's all to do with the end of history. It's very funny. Hegel said it himself. But when I explain that Hegel said it himself, said that history is over, no one will accept it, no one can stomach it. To tell the truth, I thought at first it was nonsense myself, but then I thought about it some more and saw it was brilliant 37. In December 1937 Kojiv supplemented this idea in a lecture he gave at the College de Sociologie, College of Sociology. That was the day Kojiv informed us that Hegel had seen right but was off by a century the man of 102 man sest at e. The end of history was not Napoleon but Stalin. But Kojiv changed his mind again after the Second World War, he had given the correct date for the end of history, it was 1806.38 Hegel had shown that consciousness moves to become mind, but for that to happen consciousness must cease to be concerned with certainty about itself and let the mind function as a truth without a subject. Kojiv, influenced by both Marx and Heidegger, offered an anthropological interpretation of the movement in question. He saw historical man as a void creating subject, exercising his negativity in struggle and labor and driven by a desire that by its very nature could never be satisfied, that's where Kojiv was so clever, says Pierre Macari. He showed us the child that Heidegger might have had by Marx, and passed it off as Hegel 39. This reading of Hegel, involving the end of history and an allegorical version of the master-slave relationship which Lakin was to reformulate led to the idea that it might be possible to do away with man himself. Having defined him in terms of dissatisfaction and negativity, Kojiv dismissed both these categories and turned man into either a sage or an idle layabout. This was how history really ended, man returned to the nothingness of his animal nature and accepted the world order just as it was, princes and tyrants and all. In this context, no revolution was possible, and the philosopher intellectual, the sage, had to choose between two attitudes, either he became an anonymous servant of the state which is what Kojiv himself did or like a noble romantic soul he went on dreaming of revolution that already lay in the past. George Utley denied there was any such dilemma and rebuked Kojiv for condemning intellectuals to pointless negativity. Against the animal passivity of the sage he urged holy terror and Nietzschean madness, which together could once more subvert the social order. 
This was the idea behind the College de Sociologie.40 I have spoken before of Kojeev's influence on Lakin's development, asked Chaley in his escape from the negative transference situation with Lowenstein.41 Kojeev's teaching left a permanent mark on Lakin's reading of Hegel. It also provided an enduring model for Lakin's own method of teaching. He too would reign over a whole intellectual generation by means of oral teaching, seminars that in his case were centered on the works of Freud. He too would have an amanuensis to record what he said, and he too would occupy a paradoxical position, at once marginal and essential, in French academic life. But Kojeev's teaching also encouraged the nihilism Lakin had gone in for during his adolescent admiration for Moras. In this respect Lakin would prove both more conventional and more of a terrorist than Kojeev's sage. The latter always believed in the possibility of man as a hero, even if only in the philosophy school R03. The service of the existing state of things. But while Belle Epoque nihilism had provided the young Lakin with an escape from the gaping void of a mily life, and though he carried its ideas to extremes, it never inspired him with any real desire to change the social order or even to offer it any raises tense when the occasion arose. It was this complex of attitudes that produced Lakin's determined assertion of the omnipotence of the ego as against that of God, the community, or the state, even though he went on to dismantle the ego's very structure. The same complexities also led to Lakin's cultivation of pessimism, ennui, decadence, and hatred of any kind of heroism, an attitude arising out of a lucid appraisal of the decline, not to say degradation, of the role of fatherhood in the West. From the same source sprang Lakin's desire to modernize human subjectivity so that it might rival even the sweeping advances of science. Nor was it any accident that, in the field of literature, Lakin's admiration for Morris had a parallel in his liking for the works of Leon Bloy, arch prophet of verbal violence and Promethean excess, who attacked the ideals of fr Edom and revolution and preached instead a fa natical Catholicism imported from the wilder shores of exegesis. Bloy was a kind of mirror image of Lakin, condensing all his ambivalences. The new French interpreter of Freudianism was constantly solicited by a hyperactive ego that confronted him now with his own negativity, now with the illusion of having at last attained satisfaction. Not surprisingly, Lakin's love of excess, which included a need to identify with a paranoid mode of cognition a link, here, with Bloy's interest in fe male dementia also entailed a visceral, almost fetishist fo and miss for money, rare books, and works of art. This approach to philosophy via its opposites in alienation and fetishism was Lakin's version of idle negativity. Followed, as in his case, in a spirit of mockery, it might seem dangerously close to imposture. But it also provided a frm work for a genuine system of thought. The time Lakin spent with philosophers and at Kojeev's seminar first showed its effects in a 1935 contribution to Rekherch E.S. Philosophiques, a review of Eugene Minkowski's book L.E. Temps v. Co., Etudes Phenomenologics et Psychologics, Live Time, Phenomenological and Psychological Studies. 42. W.H. I'll paying tribute to the author, a master of phenomenological psychiatry whose work had played an important part in his own training, Lakin tore into contemporary psychiatry as a whole. Most of the material presented to the official learned societies, he said, offers, to one long obliged by his profession to seek information from this dismal source, nothing but a picture of utter intellectual stagnation. The futility of the content is obvious from the terminology. This is derived entirely from an academic psychology still hopelessly stuck at Victor Cousin, its scholastic abstractions have never been broken down through the techniques of association. Hence all the ver. 104 man's est8. Beage about images, sensations, hallucinations, about judgment, interpretation, intelligence, and the rest, and, last but not least, about affectivity, a catchword that came in very useful for a while to help advanced psychiatry avoid a number of issues. 43. Lakin then went on to show how right Minkowski was to call attention to the usefulness of Claire Rambold's researches. 
This allowed Lakin to acknowledge his own debt to Clarambolt and stake a claim to being himself the real reformer of contemporary psychiatry. He reminded his readers how he had introduced the new notion of paranoid cognition into the field. Finally, in a complete turnabout, he pointed out the limits of the psychiatric conception of phenomenology and proposed instead a new reading of the real phenomenology, that of Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger, which had revolutionized the history of philosophy. Lakin was thus rejecting the version of phenomenology that had been useful to him up till 1932 and replacing it with a version derived from his direct contacts with the French school of historians of science and religion. This was the first time he mentioned Heidegger evidence that he had come to him via Kojeev's commentaries on the phenomenology of mind. I allude here to a notion fr frequently encountered in the philosophy of Monsieur Heidegger. What little we have so far been able to take in of this philosophy, filtered to us as it is through the sieve of abstruse language and international censorship, has given us an appetite that here is left unsatisfied. In a note on page 16, Monsieur Minkowski says H.E. was unaware of Heidegger's ideas until after his own had taken final shape. Given his dual culture, he stresses that his early works were written in German, it is a pity he has not undertaken to introduce into French philosophy the vast development that has taken place in recent years in its German counterpart. 44. So, even though his worth had been recognized in psychiatric circles, Lakin was distancing himself from them and entering a new intellectual milieu, one that was already supplying the ideas he needed for the work of reconstruction that was to follow his years of silence. A letter he wrote to Henry E. Y. on May 4, 1935, shows that his relations with his best frind in psychiatry were already less relaxed than they had been. My dear F. Elo, he wrote, of course I'd be delighted to see our old but still living Concord show signs of flourishing again. It's more than time for the four of us to resume our get-togethers. 45. On July 20, 1936, as Lakin was preparing his paper on the mirror stage for his first contribution to an IPA Congress, in Marenbat at the beginning of August, Kojiv was writing a strange note in Russian, probably intended for his friend Kor. It ran, Hegel and Freud, attempt at a comparative interpretation. I the genesis of self-awareness. The beginning is urgent as it is to be written for you in collaboration with Dr. Lakin and published in The Philosophy School 105. Recherches Philosophiques. Only part of the introduction is written, six paragraphs, which make a comparison between Hegel and Descartes. Unfinished. There's a sort of summary 15 plus 1 pages. STR at 20 slash 7 slash 36. 46 The handwritten note was never sent to Coyer and remained among Kojeev's papers. Today, thanks to the documents discovered by Dominique Offret, Kojeev's biographer, it is possible to understand what it means. That year, Kojeev and Lakin decided to J.O. in F.O.R.S.'s in a study to be entitled Hegel and Freud, attempt at a comparative interpretation. It was to be divided into three parts, I, Genesis of Self-Awareness, 2, The Origin of Madness, and, 3, The Essence of the Family. A chapter on prospects was to be added. The article was probably meant to appear in the Revue Recherches Philosophiques under the auspices of Coeur, who would either just look the text over or else add his own point of view. Whatever the case, the project never took off. All that got consigned to paper was Kojeev's attempt at the first part, an unfinished introduction COV airing 15 handwritten pages 6 paragraphs plus a page of notes in which Kojeev compared Descartes' cogito with Hegel's self-awareness and showed that philosophy is nothing but the desire to philosophize. It is in Hegel, Kojeev wrote, that the first I think of Descartes becomes the I want. FROM which will finally come the I want to philosophize that in satisfying itself will reveal the true nature of the original want. And my intention is simply to show the gist of the introduction to philosophy proper that is what Hegel's phenomenology of mind really is. And I think that G is is particularly clear in his replacing of Descartes I think by I want. But we must not forget that in Descartes' philosophical system the ego is not reduced to thought, i.e., 
to an adequate revelation of being through consciousness. The ego is also will, and will is the source of error, that is, it is the fact of the ego as will that brings about the imperfection needed for philosophy to be transformed into philosophizing and thus plays a role similar to that of the ego as desire in Hegel's system. So in order to compare the two systems we need first and foremost to compare these two similar but different concepts of the ego. 4-7. At the same time as Kojib was noting the cha ngefrom a philosophy of I think to a philosophy of I want, he was introducing a split between the je, I, side of thought and desire, and tihimoi, me, or ego, source of error. Part of Lakin's task in the joint production would certainly have been to complete the project by placing Freud in context in the same way as Kojiv had placed Descartes and Hegel. The other two sections of the essay, on the origin of madness and the essence of the F.A. Mali, would presumably have been dealt with in a similar way, by comparisons made in relation to Freud and Hegel. But Lakin wrote nothing, and Kojiv didn't continue, though in the 15 manuscript pages of his introduction to Genesis of Self-Awareness. 106 Man Sest 8 There are three major concepts that would be used by Lakin in 1938, the I as sub-ject of desire, desire as revelation of the truth of being, and the ego as the site of de-illusion and the sour ce of error. These three concepts would be f-o-u-n-d, mingled with the themes concerning the origin of madness and the essence of the family, in all the texts about the sub-ject that Lakin published between 1936 and 1949, in Odeli du Principe de Realite, Beyond the Reality Principle, and in Les Complexes F.A. Milios, Family Complexes, in Propos sur la Causalite Psychic, Remarks on Psychical Causality, as well as in the second version of Estate du Maroyer, The Mirror Stage. So it is not without interest that the second great theoretical renovation carried out by Lakin, which led him from his already Freudian reading of psychiatry to a philosophical reading of Freud, originated in the plan for a two-handed collaboration, a partnership in which the mentor in Hegel to a whole generation brought the ideas of his pupil within the sphere of a vast phenomenological whole, centered on such Hegelian Freudian questions as desire, the cogito, self-awareness madness, the F.A. Mali, and the illusions of the ego. 48. One can hardly overemphasize the F.A.C.T. that the transferential relationship that led Lakin to become both an analyst and an intellectual authority occurred beside rather than on the couch in the Avenue de Versailles. In other words, it arose from the negativeness of that analysis and in a completely different space, a space giving rise to a new dialectic of self-awareness that would be quite incompatible with the positivist norms of official Freudian institutions. 11. Marenbad. I.T. was with such studies behind him that Lakin set off for his first IPA Congress, J.U.S.T. at the time when Ernest Jones, the president of the association, was completing the sellout of psychoanalysis in Germany by agreeing that Goring's Institute should swallow up the DPG. Freud, too ill to come to the Congress, stayed behind in Vienna, Marenbad was chosen as the venue so that Anna wouldn't be too far away in case of an emergency. But the institutional heart of Freudian legitimacy, to which Lakin was bringing his paper on the mirror stage, was rent with fierce disputes, the bone of contention was child psychoanalysis, the adversaries were the supporters of Melanie Klein and those of Anna Freud. The Kleonian group, backed by Jones, held that child psychoanalysis should be a special domain using special techniques, such as play, modeling, drawing, and cutting out, the Anna Freud group wanted to keep child analysis within the field of pedagogy and under the control of parents, on the model of Sigmund Freud's own methods with little Hans. So, in a setting of theoretical debate, the Freudian community engaged in internal family battles reminiscent of Shakespearean tragedy. Between the two world wars the IPA congresses resembled the auditorium of some ancient theatre, where the princes of the Freudian Empire gave vent to their passions before an audience made up of the affiliated societies. Edward Glover, after Jones the most powerful man in the British Psychoanalytical Society, BPS, proved a particularly foritable figure in the Anna Freud-Melanie Klein conflict, 
which was to lead to the F.A. Mao's C. controversial discussions in London during the war. Edward Glover was born in 1888 into a strict Presbyterian F.A. Mali. He was analyzed by Carl Abraham and became a member of the BPS on his return from Germany. His brother James was already involved with the society as a teacher and scientific secretary. In 1926, when James died, Edward asked Jones to let him take over his brother's functions. Permission was given, and 108 MANSESTATE. Edward went on to become chairman of the scientific committee, in 193 4 HE Rose TO the distinguished PO Sition OF Secretary TO the IPAS Training Committee. His caustic personality and great attractiveness to women couldn't conceal the FACT that his life was overshadowed by a great tragedy, in 1926 his daughter was born with Down syndrome. He would never acknowledge her abnormality and took her with him everywhere, on his travels and to the IPA congresses, where she was present during the interwar years at the arguments over the psychoanalytic treatment of children. 2. When Melanie Klein published her book on the analysis of children, Glover was quick to point out the importance of her ideas. I have no hesitation in saying, he wrote of her work, that it constitutes a landmark in analytic literature worthy to rank with some of Freud's own classical contributions. 3. He was right. Melanie Klein was the first person within the Freudian movement to consider the question of child analysis. Before that, Freud, Hermine von Hug Helmuth, and Anna Freud hadn't believed it was possible to reach children directly in this way. 4. They either went back to a patient's childhood via the analysis of the adult, as Freud did with the wolf man, or they approached a child through its parents. Taboos about the alleged innocence of childhood were so strong that despite Freud's discoveries about infantile sexuality it was thought that analyzing young children without using their parents as intermediaries would worsen their condition and lead to further deterioration in their personalities. This attitude was reinforced by the belief that children were not conscious of their disorders and that their attachment to their parents would make transference impossible. 5. Melanie Klein's masterstroke consisted of ignoring the taboos and breaking through all the theoretical and practical barriers that had previously prevented the establishment of a child psychoanalysis modeled on the treatment of adults. Like all the great innovators, she had tested her discoveries and inventions on her own F.A. Millie, analyzing her two sons and her daughter when they were small. 6. In this she was simply following Freud who had been Anna's analyst when at the age of 25 she decided to embark on a career as practitioner and teacher. Klein's work may have been a corollary of Freud's, but it is easy to see why she was forced to analyze her own children. It was the only way of acquiring experience, as no one else had yet dared to do such a thing. Freud was the first to discover the repressed child in the adult, but it was Melanie Klein who discovered the infant who had already been repressed in the child. And while she was at it she suggested not only a theory but also a FRM work within which specifically child-oriented analysis could be carried out. As Hannah Siegel writes, she provided the child with an appropriate psychoanalytic setting, that is, the child had his or her sessions at strictly defined times 50 minutes five times a week. The Marenbad 109. Room was specially adapted for the child. It would contain only simple and sturdy furniture, a small table and chair for the child, a chair for the analyst, a small couch. The floor and the walls would be washable. Each child would have its own box of toys, used only for the treatment. The toys were carefully chosen. There were little houses, little men and women, preferably in two sizes, farm and wild animals, bricks, balls, maybe marbles, also play material such as scissors, string, pencils, paper, plasticine. B.E. sides that, the room would have water, since in some phases of the analyses of many children water plays a very important role. Point seven. The first point of departure for Klein's innovations was the great revision of Freudianism that took place in the 1920s with the introduction of a new dual system of drives or instincts, 
of life and death, and of a second topography, id, ego and superego instead of unconscious, preconscious, and conscious. Klein drew next on her own analysis with Ferenczi, which directed her attention toward children very early on, and on the teaching of Abraham, her second analyst, whose work on the psychoses, particularly melancholia, located their origin in early infancy. Klein's adoption of the idea of a death drive and of a topography in which the unconscious played a preponderant role, together with the study of the origins of adult psychosis, paved the way for the examination of psychosis in young children. Thus it was that in 1935 Melanie Klein's work took a new direction. And having started out from psychosis to study the importance of the first years of life in a child's psychological development, she pushed on even further in the search for origins and, using the changes that had come about in Freud's own thought, described the very first OBJECT relations as they occurred in infancy. Her aim was to show how the mechanisms of psychosis exist in every human being at different phases of his or her development. At the beginning of an individual's life, according to Klein, the duality of drives or instincts brings about a split in the OBJECTS to which the subJECT relates, some being seen as good and some as bad. Whether it is a part OBJECT, as in the case of the breast, the excreta, or the penis, or a whole OBJECT, when it is concerned with a person, the OBJECT is always an image o the image of a real OBJECT that the subJECT absorbs by introjection into his or her ego and endows with the status of a fantasy. 8. In the first fo or months of life the infant's relation with its mother is mediated by the breast, experienced as a destructive object. Melanie Klein called this point in human development the paranoid position, not stage. It is followed for about eight months by a so-called depressive position, during which the split narrows. After this, the child is able to represent the mother to itself as a whole OBJECT. Anxiety, instead of being experienced as a kind of persecution, takes the FORM of a fantasized dread of destroying and losing the mother. According to this theory the pathological differed from the NOR. 110MANSESTATE Mal only as to organization. If the paranoid position was not gone through normally, it recurred in the subject's childhood and either continued into or recurred again in adulthood, when it gave rise to states of melancholy. Thus during the interwar period Melanie Klein had begun constructing a theory about the structure of the subject and its imaginary order that answered the questions all her contemporaries were asking themselves. They were of course the same questions as those preoccupying Lakin and the whole second generation of French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts. Like Klein, but following different routes, Lakin had queried the theory of constitutions, which created an artificial barrier between the normal and the pathological. Like her, by choosing to work in the field of psychosis he had placed the history of madness within the sphere of the history of the human subject in general. Like her, he was trying to solve the riddle of man's imaginary condition by exploring the earliest elements of object relationships. And, like her, he approached Freudian theory as an established body of work in need of a new impetus. But whereas Klein carried out her FORM within the Freudian system and with the conceptual tools F ridged by Freud himself, Lakin drew continuously on other fields, psychiatry, surrealism, philosophy. Without these constant outside references he would probably not have reinterpreted Freud in the way he did from 1936 on, for the Freud to whom he had first had access was an academic Freud, the Freud of French Freudianism, a Freud sometimes of Pichon and sometimes of Lowenstein, but always the Freud of the ego, of resistances and defense mechanisms, the Freud of Anna Freud and of the future American trend of ego psychology. 9. It was because in 1932 Lakin was still reliant on this version of Freud that his thesis favored a treatment of psychosis based on an analysis of the ego centered on resistances. It was for the same reason that he didn't react until 1937 to the progress made by Klein. Only after 1936, when he had arrived at his SECOND reading of Freud, 
could he take her work on board and see that, by paths different from but parallel to his own, she was asking the same questions as he about the status of the sub-JECT, the structure of object relations, the early role of the Oedipus bond, the paranoid position of human knowledge, the site of the imaginary order, and so on. In this connection Lakin's borrowing of the psychologist Henry W. Ullian's notion of a mirror stage was crucial. 1-0. Its importance may be measured by his attempts to play down Wallen's name and present himself as the sole originator of the term. An account of his different definitions of it reads like a serial story. He spoke passionately of it on about a dozen occasions, and when he published his Eretz, writings, in 1966 he emphasized again that the term had always been the PIVOT on which the development of his thought system turned. I didn't wait until now to think about the FA entities. Marenbat I. 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 Leading to an apprehension of the ego, and if I put F.O. Ruard the mirror stage in 1936, at a time when I was still not a training analyst in the SPP and was having only the first of my many experiences of an IPA Congress, I think I deserved some credit. He added a note, it was on July 3rd 1, 1936, at the Marenbad Congress, that this first pivot of my contribution to psychoanalytic theory made its appearance. An ironic allusion to this incident may be FOUND on pages 184 to 185 of the present volume, with a reference to the volume of the Encyclopédie Franfaise that officially authenticates the date of the introduction of these theories, 1938. TEFACT is, I neglected to hand in my text FOR inclusion in the proceedings of the Congress. LL before I piece together the stormy history OF that text, which was FOR gotten, lost, merged with another, then in 1940 entirely recast FOR another IPA Congress, I had best give a first definition of the notion of the mirror stage as it appears in Lakin's terminology between 1936 and 1938. Kojeev's seminar had led Lakin to examine the genesis of the ego I and the light of a philosophical approach to self-awareness. Then, like Melanie Klein, he interpreted Freud's second topography in a way that ran counter to any ego psychology. TWO options were available after Freud's 1920 revision of his theories. One was to see the ego as the product of a gradual differentiation of the ID, acting as a representative of reality and responsible FOR controlling the drives, ego psychology, the other rejected any idea of making the ego autonomous and instead looked to find its genesis in identification. The first alternative meant trying to extract the ego from the ID and maki ng it the instrument of the individual's adaptation to external reality, while the second option moved the ego closer to the ID and sought to show it structuring itself in stages by means of imagos borrowed from the other. Melanie Klein chose the second alternative, and so did Lakin when he took over and completely transformed me D.W. Allen's notion of the mirror stage. Wallen subscribed to the Darwinian idea that the individual turned into a subject through the succeeding stages of a natural dialectic. In the context of this transformation, during which the child has to resolve its conflicts, the so-called mirror ordeal is a rite of passage that takes place between the ages of six and eight months. It allows the infant to recognize itself and to unify its ego in space. The experience thus represents a transition from the specular to the imaginary and then from the imaginary to the symbolic. 1-2. Lakin transforms this experience into a stage, I. E. A position I and the Kleonian sense, without any reference to a natural dialectic, p psychological maturing or progress in knowledge, that allows the subject to unify its funcations. This being so, the mirror stage no longer bears any resemblance to either a mirror or a stage, in the developmental sense, or indeed to any concrete experience. It becomes a psychological, even an ontological operation, by which a human being comes to exist as such by identifying with his sem. 1i2 man sestate. Bleable his likeness, fellow, or neighbor when as an infant he sees his own image in a mirror. And so the mirror stage in the Lacanian sense is a matrix fo reshadowing the evolution of the ego as imaginary. 
Lakin gave his own best definition of the mirror stage in I-937, commenting on a lecture by Marie Bonaparte, he also included it a year later in his own text on F.A. Mali complexes. I refer, he writes, to the narcissistic representation I attempted to describe at the International Congress when I spoke of the mirror stage. That representation explains the oneness of a human body, but why must this oneness be established? Precisely because man is painfully aware of the threat of FR augmentation, FEAR of which installs itself in the first six months of biological prematuration. 13. While Lakin was working on the first theory of the imaginary, and planning, with KOJEVE, a systematic comparison between Freud and Hegel, discord within the BPS was becoming more and more heated. Edward Glover, who had spoken highly of Klein's ideas, considered nonetheless that their validity depended on their usefulness in the analysis of adult psychotics. His reservation was made with a purpose, to preserve psychosis as the domain of medically qualified analysts and to prevent the inroads that Klein, who had no medical training, might make into the society via her pupils. But quite apart from this rivalry there was still the foo and domental question, what specific contribution does psychoanalysis make to the treatment of psychosis? As we have seen, Lakin had been asking this question ever since he studied the Amy case. 14. Controversy soon turned into combat when Amy Lita Schmidberg, Melanie Klein's daughter, arrived in London in 1932, when her mother's ideas were beginning to gain acceptance. Melita, after undergoing analysis with Ella Sharp, started on a second analysis with Glover and with his help launched a general offensive against her mother's teachings. When Melita was elected a member of the BPS in October 1, 1933, she was awarded the Klein Eichel Essay Prize for the essay she had submitted in support of her Candida tour, on the analysis through play of a three-year-old girl. For a time Melita was quite popular with her colleagues, but the virulence with which she expressed her views began to embarrass them, the more so because she made all kinds of shocking allegations about her mother, sometimes accusing her of stealing her daughter's patients, sometimes hinting that she had analyzed children who were less than three years old, which would have been considered outrageous. Meanwhile the quarrel between the Vienna school, dominated by Anna Freud, and the English school, which had gone over to Klein, had taken a particularly lively turn. When William Gillespie returned from Vienna in I-932, after his analysis with Edward Hishman, he was struck by the extent to which the various groups ostracized one another. He had never heard his. Marin bad one. 1-3. One, Viennese colleagues mention Klein's work, now the Bible of the London Analysts. Ernest Jones, wishing to placate Freud, who sided with his daughter, tried to distract Anna from her battle with her rival by inducing her to make a scapegoat of Klein's daughter. In this way he hoped to preserve the unity of the British society by getting rid of an adversary who had become a problem, to keep the IPA united around Freud, and to avoid a direct confrontation between Vienna and London. But Anna declined to go along with Jones's plan, which in any case was soon thwarted by the rise of Nazism in Germany. In 1934 the Viennese started to leave Austria, some of them with the intention of settling in England. So, after the Anschluss and the outbreak of war, the battle became an internal concern of the British Psychoanalytical Society. I.S. at the Marenbad Congress, the Symposium O and the Therapeutic Effects of Psychoanalysis gave rise to a mighty confrontation involving all the different Fations. While the supporters of Anna Freud mounted a systematic attack on the Kleinians, Glover, backed by Melita Schmidberg, publicly dissociated himself from the views of Melanie Kleien, though at first the Viennese couldn't understand the ins and outs of the F.A. Melie F.E. Uding and went on thinking of Glover as a Kleinian. Such was the atmosphere in which at 3.40 p.m. on August 3, 1936, at the second scientific session of the Congress, Lakin rose to speak. T.E.N. minutes later Jones cut him short in the middle of a sentence. I read a paper on this subject at the Marenbad Conference in 1936, Lakin wrote later. At least, I did so until exactly 10 minutes into my text, 
when on the very stroke I was interrupted by Jones, who as president of the London Psychoanalytic Society, was chairing the proceedings. I assume he qualified for the position by virtue of the F.A.C.T. that I never met one of his English colleagues who had a good word to say for him. However, the Viennese group, gathered there like a flock of birds about to migrate, did receive my paper quite warmly. I didn't send it in for inclusion in the proceedings of the Congress, but its essentials are summed up in a few lines in my article on the F.A. Millie published in 193.8 in the V. Mentail, Life of the Mind, Volume of the Ensic L. Opmi FRNIs. 1 6. The day after the incident with Jones, Lakin left FOR Berlin, though Ernst Chris, one of the FO unders of American ego psychology, had said to him, That sort of thing isn't done. 1 7. We now know the contents of the FA Mao's lost lecture. Lakin had read the gist of it to the SPP before he went to Marenbad and FULL and painstaking notes taken on that occasion by Franoise Dolto confirm that Lakin used the same terms in the article on the F.A. Mali as he had done in his paper. This was divided into a number of sections, the subject and the I, the body, the expressiveness of the human FORM, the libido, the body image, the image of the double and the specular image, the libido of weaning, the death instinct. 114MANSESTATE the destruction of the vital OBJECT, narcissism, and its link with the FUNDAME and tal symbolism of human knowledge, the OBJECT rediscovered in the Oedipus complex, twins, see Appendix F. The discussion among Lowenstein, Odier, Parchemini, Paul Schiff, Lagache, and Marie Bonaparte was about interpreting the second topography-hy and the idea of adaptation. Lakin was already stoutly asserting the central tenet of his F.U. tour system, man does not adapt himself to reality, he adapts reality to himself. The ego creates a new adaptation to reality, and we try to maintain cohesion with this double. 1. 8. It is easy to understand the rage and humiliation Lakin must have felt when Jones cut him short. Thirty years later, when he published The Irrits, he was still angry enough to record the exact time, date, and place where someone had dared to interrupt him. After being ignored by Freud when he sent him his thesis, he now found himself being snubbed during his first appearance at an IPA Congress. To the great disciples of the Freudian era, fighting their Shakespearean battles at Marenbad, this young Frenchman was a mere nobody. No one yet knew who he was, no one had read a line of what he had written, and no one realized that a section of the Paris Intelligentsia regarded him as a F.U. tour master of French psychoanalysis. The new direction Lakin had taken with his mirror stage was in keeping with the Kleinian revolution, but no one, neither the Kleinians nor the Anafreudians, were in a position to see this. And Lakin himself, knowing little about the IPASFA Mali squabbles, was not best placed to grasp the implications of his own theoretical tendencies. That much is plain from his per fectly genuine belief that the Vienna group gave him a favorable reception. If he really did think that, and there is no reason to doubt it, there must have been a complete misunderstanding all round. His views were radically opposed to theirs, and the fr Indly reception, if there was one, must have been due either to a certain amount of personal sympathy or to some verbal exchanges on the common ground of familiarity with Freudian and other texts. Lakin had read them, the Viennese contingent would have admired his erudition, and he might have got the impression that it was his own views that were going down so well. We know now that Anna Freud didn't share her compatriots' approval, if such it was. Always on the lookout for deviations from the pure Freudianism of which she considered herself the legitimate representative, she noted that day the behavior, bearing, and style of the young French psychiatrist who already had such a good opinion of himself. She didn't like the man and began to be suspicious of high views. 1 9. With his anti parliamentary and nihilist leanings and despite his encounter with surrealism, Lakin never showed the slightest interest in fighting for any. Marenbad I-15. Revolutionary ideal of freedom. He was never a communist, 
he never put his name to any political pamphlet, he never seemed to believe in the idea of human freedom. Yet the spirit of Rambo's J. E. S. Dun Otra, I is another, ran right through his earliest writings, and the philosophical renaissance of the 1930s was an essential preliminary to his reading of Freud. But his relationship to modernity in both literature and thought was a strange one, it seemed to affect only his work, touching his way of life and personal opinions scarcely at all. His behavior and views were those of a member of the middle class who was at once conventional and eccentric, careful with his money but capable of throwing himself body and soul into his passions. But though Lakin was apolitical, this didn't mean he took no interest in political matters. On the contrary, a corollary of his avoidance of personal commitment was an open fascination with the most extreme FORMS of power in action, the hypnotic power of dictators, the transferential power of teachers, the manipulative power of tyrants, the wild power of madness when madness itself was in power. In short, the man who himself aspired to be a leader enjoyed observing, and commenting on, how the masses were enslaved by their masters and how willingly they accepted their subjection. And so when Lakin left Marenbad he went on to Berlin to attend the exit Olympic Games, of sinister memory. Having spoken a few days earlier of the anguish of the ego when threatened by the FR augmentation of the body, he was so preoccupied with the mirror stage theory that he applied its terminology to the world of the gladiators now parading past him. Later he made a rather obscure analysis of a schism, which he hated and saw as a threat. According to him the Nazi organization was a source of anguish to the masses it claimed to rule. And Lakin saw the cause of that anguish in Hitler's democratization of the hierarchical structure of the German army. I shall return to the sub-JECT later. 2 the principal outcome of Lakin's visit to Marenbad and his side trip to Berlin was his article Odella du Principe de Realite, Beyond the Reality Principle, a resume of all the themes arising out of his reading of Wallon and of Freud's second topography, and out of the teaching of K.O.J.E.V. This text is a link between the uncompleted plans made in July for a comparison between Freud and Hegel, and the long article on F.A. Milly complexes into which he would insert the first published version of L.E. State du Maroyer. Lakin wrote Beyond the Reality Principle at Noirmoutier, where he was spending the vacation with Malu, now five months pregnant. At the age of 35, about to become a F.A. there for the first time, he was greeting the triumphal advent of a second generation of psychoanalysts and commending to them a non-psychological approach to Freud. It was a doctrinal call to arms. On the beach where he liked to go swimming he might have noticed another mass phenomenon just as significant as the Olympic June. 116 Ma N.S.E.S.T.A.T.E. Keatings, factory workers E.N.J. Oying their first holidays with pay. But he did no such thing. Here is the curious portrait Guillaume de Tard drew of him in his diary in June 1936, all this time Lakin is living on the plane of eternity. As an intellectual, and therefore in a lofty position, open to ideas of every kind, supremely and indisputably impartial, a master of language, by nature incapable of banality or prejudice, he looks down on ordinary events from a great height. Human beings, outmoded, doomed, defending their class interests against inexorable reality, clearly seem to him mere puppets. They present a pitiful spectacle, like the last scene of a tragedy, half-touching, half-comic. He reigns majestically over their anguished twenty-one. In the history of the international psychoanalytic movement it is customary to ref er to the circle of disciples gathered in Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century as the first generation. This well-known group of pioneers Adler, Jung Jones, Ferenczi, Rank, Abraham, Sachs, and Eitingon was succeeded by another generation that began to form in 1918, consisting of both those in direct contact with Freud and the people they analyzed. Already at a distance from the spirit of adventure that had inspired their elders, this second generation supplied most of the leading members of the IPA in the 1930s. Although the F.O. on Daying F.A. there was still alive, the IPA had moved away from him, its real center was neither a man nor a city but an organization. 
and the importance of that organization was enhanced when, during the Nazi regime, it came to represent Freudianism's true home and a symbol of resistance against barbarism. Later came a third generation, taught by members of the second generation in exile, and with them came the great controversies over the interpretation of F. R. Ud's works. I and the international context, Lakin belongs to that third generation by virtue of his training, his distance F. R. O. M. Freud himself, and his re-examination of a doctrine that he came on when it was no longer sub-J.E.C.T. to revision by its F.O. under. But if we look only at the French history of psychoanalysis, the chronology of the generations is rather different. Freudian theory took off in France 15 years later than anywhere else in Europe. In this more circumscribed context, the first generation of French psychoanalysts, to which the 12 F.O. unders of the SPP belonged, were men and women whose careers or outlooks placed them in the second generation of international Freudianism. And this was the explanation of some of the problems they had with the IPA. In the French chronology, Lacan was, as we have seen, a member of the second generation. But that was connected with what, in the international chronology, was the third generation. And he knew it. When he got back from Marenbad, humiliated and disappointed, he produced a text in which F or the first time he linked the interests of NEC. Marenbad. J17. Essary Freudian revolution with those of a hypothetical second generation belonging to the 1930s. The new psychology admits not only psychoanalysis, the fact that we encounter it constantly at the growing point of other disciplines, beginning FROM other starting points, demonstrates its pioneering value in general. So it is FROM what might be called a general angle that psychoanalysis is approached by what I shall call, perhaps rather arbitrarily, the second analytic generation. And I try to define this angle of incidence in order to indicate the angle of reflection. Like all revolutions, the Freudian revolution takes its meaning FROM its circumstances, i.e., FROM the psychology of its time. And that psychology can only be appraised through a study of the documents in which it has expressed itself. Point 22. Was Lacan trying to present himself as the leader of the second French generation of psychoanalysts or as one of the brilliant second wave of international Freudians he had met at Marenbad? Both, P.R. Obably, hence his equivocal way of expressing himself. In any case, he wanted his rethinking of Freud's teaching to be seen as symmetrical with Freud's own revision in 1920. Lacan's call for something beyond the reality principle looked very like a corollary to Freud's beyond the pleasure principle. If the structuring of the ego is not an adaptation to reality, that is because mental identification leads to knowledge. Hence Lacan's idea of calling the three elements that make up Freud's second topography posts imaginaires de la pe arsenalite, imaginary stations of the personality, and then distinguishing a f o earth, the j e, or i, the site where the s u b j e c t can recognize itself. To this Lacan's earliest f o formulation of his theory of the imaginary, in which, as in Melanie Klein, the genesis of the ego is thought of as a series of operations based on identification with imagos was soon added the idea of a symbolic identification, defined as yet only in a manner still vague, hesitant, and obscure. So by the autumn of 1936 the disastrous encounter in Marenbad had proved to be quite productive. Lakin had set down the prolegomena of a theory of the sub-JECT that could be grafted onto Freud on the basis of KOJEVE's reading of Hegel. Lakin announced a two-part sequel to his Beyond the Reality principle that would never get written, one part was to have been about the reality of the image, the other about the FORMS of knowledge. Instead, at Wallen's request, he produced the article on F.A. Milly complexes. But meanwhile his meeting with Georges Bertoli was to lend a more Nietzschean dimension to the new work plan. Family Histories P.A.R.T.I.V. 1 2. G. E. O. R. G. E. S. Bodily and Co. G. E. Orges Bodily was one of those interwar authors who, like Michel Leary's, Raymond Cano, Rene Creville, Antonin Artaud, and a few others, were influenced ed by the theoretical adventure of Freudianism and also had experience of the analyst's couch, 
but whose interest in the theory was independent of their views on the treatment. To sympathize with the Freudian revolution was for them an intellectual act, whereas to go to an analyst merely meant one wanted to have one's malady dealt with as directly as possible. This attitude explains why someone like Michel Leary's could, in his novel writing technique, make the most respectful use of Freud's teaching, while at the same time regarding Freudian treatment as no more than a kind of medication. n. Maybe, he wrote in August 1934, we can't expect much of psychoanalysis, but we can always take it, J-U-S-T as one takes an aspirin. L-I have already had occasion to comment on Baudelaire's analysis with Adrian Borel, a psychiatrist with a liking for the good things of this world who was a fo undying member of the SPP. A wine and FOOD connoisseur, Borel, like Allende, enjoyed having artists and other creative people as his patients too it was on the advice of Dr. Dawes, a medical fr who had collaborated with Baudelaire on La Critique Sociale and who was concerned about Baudelaire's sex ual obsessions, that Baudelaire first met Borel and decided to go to him for analysis. Several of Baudelaire's fr thought he was sick, he was a gambler, an alcoholic, and a frequenter of BROT hells. According to Leary's, he had even risked his life playing Russian roulette. Point three at their first encounter, Borel gave B.A. Taya a photograph by Louis Carpe Auxiliary, taken in April 1, 1905, and reproduced in George Dumas's famous trait de psychologie, treatise on psychology. It showed a Chinese man who had murdered a prince being cut into a hundred pieces. Dumas, who was present at the scene recorded by Carpos, had observed that the victims. 122 FAMILYHISTORIES. Reactions resembled those of mystics in a state of ecstasy. But he also pointed out that this was because the man had been given a number of opium in JE sessions to prolong the process of execution. It was indeed a terrifying sight, with his disheveled ED hair and an awesomely mild expression despite his mutilated body, the man was strangely reminiscent of one of Bernini's virgins radiantly transfigured by a divine visitation. The sight of this photograph was a turning P.O. int in Baudelaire's Livy, what burst upon me. Was the fact that these two complete contrasts were identical divine ecstasy and extreme horror for. Borel encouraged Baudelaire to write, without trying to end the state of intellectual violence from which he claimed to be suffering.5 Even so, the analysis gave Baudelaire a sense of liberation that made it possible for him to write L'Histoire de l'Oi, the story of the eye, and the text was discussed at every session and sometimes revised too. Baudelaire told Madeleine Chapsal. I was only able to write my first book after being analyzed yes, on emergency ing from analysis. I think I can truly say it was only because I was liberated in this way that I was able to write at six. After a treatment in which the work of transference had encouraged literary creativeness, B. A. Tayo felt better physically too. He remained on fr Indly terms with Borel, as long as his F. O. Meta analyst lived he sent him the first numbered copy of each of his books. It was as a result of the analysis that Baudelaire met Sylvia Makels, his F. U. Tour wife. The actual encounter probably took place in Raymond Cano's studio in the Square des Nautes Near the Porte de Versailles, where a number of writers used to meet. But the person really responsible for the meeting was Bianca, Sylvia's elder sister, who was married to Theodore Frankel, the F. Arth Musketeer of French Surrealism. When I first met Frankel, wrote Aragon, H. E. had just come back from Russia where he had been an assistant medical officer in the French Expeditionary Corps. He talked like Pierre Yubu. And he always remained the same as he was the N, with that sudden deep laugh that put everything and everyone in their place 7. Henry Makels, Bianca, and Sylvia's F. Aether, was a Jew of Bulgarian extract T.O.N., a merchant and traveling salesman. But he was also something of a bohem.Ian, interested in culture and the arts and not much of a success at business. He was often broke, and his wife, Natalie Johan, was beset with money problems all her life. She was fr Indley, pleasant, and generous, and very anxious for her fo or daughters Bianca, Rose, Simone, 
and Sylvia to attain the social stability she herself had never and J.O. Yed.8 Her son, Charles Makels, was like his F. Aether. Bianca was good-looking and clever and became a medical student at a time when women weren't generally expected to go in F.O.R. intellectual careers. It was at the medical faculty that she met Breton, Aragon, and Geo, E.S. Bertoli and Co. 123. Frankel. Frank 1 was the only one of the three to become a doctor. He was a prey to melancholia and in 1916, when serving at the FRONT on the outskirts of Verdun, had described his own condition in clinical terms that were astonishingly precise. In the circularity of my moods, he wrote, Depraisian predominates. And the manic depressive psychosis is only an exaggerated FORM of a constant phenomenon. I often observe extremes of melancholia that are just dreary self-depreciation. Manic excitement takes the FORM of pride. Mental degeneration affects nine-tenths of the human race me among the rest. Now I understand though without changing my opinion the meaning of Nordau's book 9. In 1922 Bianca married Theodore and gave up her studies to become an actress. She became a member of Charles Dullin's atelier, or workshop theatre, and acted, under the name of Lucien Morand, in Pirandello's Cozy, S.E. Six Pair, translated into French as Chacun S.A. Verité. Low in 193 one Bianca died in tragic circumstances. While out F.O.R.A. walk one day near Carquet ran on the Côte d'Azur, she F.E.L.L. off a cliff and was killed. Frankel was in Paris at the time and had to travel down to identify the body. 1-1 Natalie Johan, Bianca's mother, never recovered FROM the shock, especially as people around her hinted at the possibility of suicide. She came to believe that Frankel himself had pushed Bianca off the cliff, in a fit of madness. But Natalie maintained that Bianca wasn't killed, she had merely lost her memory and would one day remember what had happened and return to her family and FRNs. 1-2 Sylvia, born on November I. 1908, had gone to the same school as her sisters in the Avenue de Villers. The Kahn sisters went there too. Sylvia had always wanted to be an actress, but her dream didn't come true until after she was married. When Bianca married Frankel, Sylvia went to live with them, she got on very well with her elder sister and tried to model herself on her. But Frankel fell in love with Sylvia and made several passes at her. So the F.A. Milly decided to marry her off to George's Bertoli. She liked Bertoli and agreed, and the wedding ceremony took place in the town hall at Corbevoy, just outside Paris, on March 20, 1928. One three Bertoli's F.R.E.s hoped, without much conviction, that marriage to a respectable woman of stable character and with a stimulating personality might help him if not to give up then at least to moderate his dissolute ways but it was not to be. All the evidence seems to show, wrote Michel Surya, that he didn't really share his life but went on going to nightclubs and brothels, taking part in, if he didn't actually organize, orgies. With his wife or without her. He made all or almost all the women he lived with into his accomplices. So it's not unlikely that he did the same with the woman who as far as we know was the first of the series one. For three months after S.H.E. was married, Sylvia, still dreaming of going on. I-24 F.A.M.I.L.Y.H.I.S.T.O.R.I.E.S. The stage, went to the Théâtre du Vieux Colombier to see the first public showing of Jean Renoir's silent film La Petite Marc Handelumets, based on Hans Andersen's story The Little Match Girl. 1-5 Renoir had made the film I N Chaplin-esque style and with a great display of technical virtuosity, using panchromatic stock, dramatic lighting, and plenty of special effects. The main part was played by his own wife, Catherine Hessling, who had also been his F.A. There's last model. Sylvia was bowled over by the character of the heroine, which she could have played very movingly herself, and had no hesitation about accosting Renoir as he came out of the theater and telling him she wanted to act in films. You'll have to wait, he said. One six she waited. I end the first two years of her marriage she moved house three times, the Baudelis had apartments first in the Avenue de Seger, 
then in the Rue VA Yuvin argues, then further out in Boulogne sur Seine and at Isies Moulinos. According to Boudelli, Sylvia was a silent witness when in 1930, while she was pregnant, he paid his famous tribute to the corpse of his mother, Marie Antoinette T. O. Ernadre. In his writings, Boudelli records the scene in three different ways once in a single sentence that claimed to be absolutely accurate, once in fictional FORM, without any admission that the act in question actually took place, and lastly in a brief, very simple handwritten account entitled Le Cadavre Maternal, The Mother's Corpse. The first version reads, I jerked myself off naked, at night, in the presence of my mother's dead body. The second. She died in the course of the day. I slept at her place with Edith. Your wife. My wife. I lay in the dark beside Edith, who was sleeping. I crept out into the passage in my bare feet, shivering. I trembled with far and excitement in the presence of the corpse, I was carried away with excitement. I was in a trance. I took off my pajama. moss. I. You know what I mean. 17. Boudelli must have derived the content of this thrice-recounted homage from the extensive catalogue of perversions compiled by Kraft Ebing. But the deed itself must be seen as part of Boudelli's autobiographical account of episodes arising out of his parents' madness, which he'd witnessed at close quarters since he was a child. His F.A. The Aristide Boudelli, syphilitic, paralyzed and blind, was confined to a wheelchair, he peed where he sat and shat in his pants. In or around 19 I.I., in a fit of madness, he accused his doctor of screwing his wife. Thereupon his wife herself nearly went out of her mind, and after making a dreadful scene with Aristide, at which their son was present, she went off to hang herself in the attic. The suicide attempt failed, thou gh in 1915 Bodily's mother had another bout of insanity, she had. George's Bodily and Co. 125 Left he Aristide I in August of that year, at the time of the German advance, and couldn't bear the thought of going back to him. She did so, nonetheless. When we knew he was dying, wrote Bodily, my mother agreed to go back with me. But he died a few days before we got there, asking for his children. All we found in the room was a closed coffin. 18. The spectacle of the closed coffin, hiding the dead F.A. their F.R.O.M. his son's sight, is paralleled by the episode of the mother's corpse, exposed to the obscene act of the narrator who pays tribute to her in the presence of his wife, Edith, who is pregnant. On the one hand there is the disappearance of the body of a F.A. their who was blind when he begot his son, on the other the appearance of the body of a mother to a son abandoned just when he was C.O.N.F. ranting the ordeal off of their hood. My. F.A. there having begot me blind, literally blind, writes the narrator, I can't tear out my own eyes, like Oedipus. But, like Oedipus, I have guessed the riddle, no one more so. 19. Lawrence Bodily, only child of the marriage between Georges and Sylvia, was born on June R.O., 1930. At that time Georges Bodily, together with Michel Leary's, Carl Einstein, and Georges Henry Riviere, was writing F.O.R. the review documents. In it Bodily F.O. Ughite against surrealism and crossed swords with his great rival, André Breton, proclaiming the need to take the expression of bestiality to still F.U. their extreme so as to show all revolt to be merely the negation of revolt. In other words, Bodily countered surrealism with an aggressive anti-idealism capable of producing what he called the impossible. Y.O.U. had to blaspheme, destroy, break all rules until you encountered that which is beyond all bounds. 2. Oh meanwhile, Sylvia's dream of being an actress was coming true. At about this time she met Jacques Prevert in a cafe in the Rue Fontaine where she had gone to ask André Breton to sign a book for her. She spoke to Prevert as she left, and they walked around together until the early hours of the next morning. They were dazzled with each other. 2-1. Sylvia soon became a member of the F.A. Mouse gang that, after Prevert's break with surrealism, became the October Group. 22. 
The two Prevert brothers and their merry band were keen admirers of the classic American cinema and the great comic stars of the silent movies. Like other FANS they almost lived in that dream world, and they spent hours discussing Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Max Sennett. Jacques Prevert was a wonderful storyteller who could torpedo the meanings of words with what seemed like chance juxtapositions but were really part of a mocking logical game. Pierre, his brother, was modest, shy, and charming, like a character out of a Midsummer Night T.S. Dream. 23 through J.B. Brunius, Jacques Prevert met Jean-Pierre Dreyfus, later Jean-Paul L. E. Chanois, and Pierre Bacheff, the actor in Bunuel's film on 126 FAMILYHISTORIES. Chien and Lu, 1928. They worked together on a scenario, but the pro-JECT came to an end with Bacheff's suicide. Then came the meeting with Raymond Bussier's FROM the Federation FOR Working Class Theatre, who with Leon Musinac had FO on day the October group. The Prevert Broth ERS became the leaders of the group, together with Louis Bonin, the director, known as Lou Chimikoff, and Marcel D. U. Hamel. They were later joined by Jean Dast, Maurice Paquette, and Joseph Kozma. The Octoberists saw themselves as fellow travelers of the flamboyant kind of communism displayed by the first generation of the Bolshevik intelligentsia. And despite the advent of Stalinism they still felt an ardent loyalty toward the USSR, home of the first proletarian revolution. And it was as heirs to this revolution that they were trying to revive popular theater. They took as their models Brecht and Piscator, Agitprop, and the proletarian theater. The brand of poetic realism invented by the October group, led by the Prevert brothers, used verbal humor to show the absurdity of bourgeois conformism and was to triumph in the French cinema of Jean Renoir, Marcel Carne, and Jacques Fader. In 1933 they presented La Baudelie de Fontenoy, The Battle of Fontenoy, in Moscow and Leningrad and won first prize in the International Olympics of Workers Theatre. 24 at the heart of the group was Sylvia Baudelie, now, at the age of 20 f.o.r., a beautiful actress. Her dead white complexion, slight lisp, and childlike slimness lent her a special charm. Her trim yet ambiguous figure seemed partly the work of a secessionist painter, partly that of an impressionist, with colors by Klimt and curves by Seurat. Her willfulness was matched only by her good humor. But her black eyes held a suppressed sadness, a gleam of thwarted rebellion, reflecting the position of women in the 30s. Renoir might well have been thinking of this when he cast her as the F.E. male lead in Unparty de Campaign, a trip to the country, Sylvia Baudely seemed to him to speak with the voice of Maupassant's unlucky Henriette du 4.25 meanwhile she had left Georges Baudely. He didn't describe their love affair in detail in his books, but he did tell the story of their breakup in L.E. Blue du Del, The Bayou of the Sky, in which he called the narrator's wife Edith. I behaved like a coward, says the narrator, T. Oward everyone I loved. My wife was devoted to me, and went crazy be because of me while I was deceiving her 26. The narrator also quotes from a shattering letter Edith wrote him in which she relates a dream. We were both somewhere with a few frens, says Edith, and someone said if you went out you'd be more dared. A man came to kill yo you. To do so he had to switch on a flashlight that he had in his hand. I was walking beside you, and the man, who was trying to show me he was going to kill you, switched on the flashlight. And it fired a bullet that went right through me. Dot you went into the bedroom with the girl. Then the man said the time had come. He switched on the... George's Bodily and Co. 127. Flashlight and it fired a second bullet. It was meant F-O-R-U, but I F-E-L-T it hit ting me and knew I was finished. I put my hand to my throat, it came away warm and sticky with blood. 27. This account of Edith's dream is all the more interesting because it anticipated reality. In 1939, 11 years after Georges and Sylvia were married, Theodore Frankel, who was still in love with her, waited for Baudelaire outside the Bibliothèque Nationale, National Library, armed with a gun. 
H-E-F-U-L-L-Y intended T.O. kill his rival, even though Sylvia, the object of his passion, had left Georgia several years before. Fortunately the episode ended in roars of laughter. 28. Lawrence was scarcely F.O. or years old when her parents separated. But although she often told those around her how much she suffered as a result of the breakup, it wasn't until 1984 that she wrote an autobiographical account of it. Like the woman in Baudelaire's L.E. Blue Doodell, she recounted a dream, one she had managed to interpret in 1963 in the course of her analysis with Conrad Stein. In the dream she had seen a wren trying to escape from a weasel that had torn out the bird's tail F.E. Athers, leaving a stain of blood in their place. The wren looked back and flapped its wings helplessly. It was odd, I suppose, said the dreamer, that I should have represented my F.A. there as a wren. But F.O.R. me he never counted F.O.R. much. He left when I was F.O.R. years old. I used to see him occasionally, but I didn't have any F.E. feelings toward him. His death, a year before, had left me cold. 29 The blood stain referred to a painful memory that Lawrence Conje you read up, making the same use of metaphor as Bertoli had in his Histo Ire de Loy. She recalled how, as a little girl, she had pulled out an eyelash by mistake when playing with her mother's eyebrow tweezers. Looking in the mirror, she had seen her eye suddenly stained with blood. By a series of associations she deduced from her dream the way the Bertoli Makel's F.A. Millie was organized. The men let the women wear the trousers in order to keep the field of thought F.O.R. themselves. In my F.A. Millie, she said, T. Hot was reserved exclusively F.O.R. the men. That was their privilege, the attribute of the male, and if anyone else usurped it the result would be chaos. So there was no chance F.O.R. a woman to get a look in. Not F.O.R. me, anyhow. And that's why I've always taken great care never to do any thinking. 3 oh, but though the Makel sisters weren't allowed to think themselves, they all married intellectuals. Sylvia and Bianca, alike in beauty, talent, and artistic temperament, were also both strongly committed to the far left. Rose and Simone, the other two sisters, were different. Rose was always an excellent housewife and remarkable cook. She exercised a great influence over Andre Masson when she married him in 1934, at the time he still wasn't earning enough to live on from his painting. He had just emerged from a tumultuous love affair with Paul Vézelay, also a painter, who suffered from violent nervous attacks made worse by drinking. Masson, himself an alco. 128 FAMILYHISTORIES. Holic and prone to depression, couldn't cope with a woman who was a creative artist in her own right and refused to settle down into quiet married life. Why, but with Rose, he found quiet and equilibrium and was able to work in peace. Simone tended to be middle class and conservative. Just before the war, she married Jean Peel, a civil servant and economist who later helped Bertoli start the Review Critique. So after Bianca's death, Sylvia was the only member of the F.A. Millie to carry the standard of revolt. When she was earning a living as an actress she gave her sisters, parents and brother constant moral and financial support. For her, political commitment went with a spirit of devotion capable even of sacrifice, and in this respect Bertoli was right when in his writings he depicted her as a victim. But Sylvia Bertoli had hosts of FREs and was loved not only for her beauty and charm but also for her warmth and magnanimity. Other clans J.O. in the Bertoli Maki's tribe, Michel Leary's and the Conweiler F.A. Millie on the one hand, Raymond Cano and the Con F.A. Millie on the other. Leary's concealed the real origins of his wife L.O.S. Godin, whom he married in 1926. She was known as Zet and had a background similar to that of Aragon. She was born in 1902, the daughter of Lucy Godin, whose parents brought her up as their own child, pretending that Lucy was her sister. She found out the truth when she was 18. Her real mother had already been married for a year to the F.A. Mao's art dealer Daniel Henry Conweiler, who had launched most of the Cubist painters and owned a huge collection of Picassos. After she married Leary's, Zet worked in her so-called brother-in-law's gallery, 
taking care not to reveal her true history. Only members of the clan itself knew the secret. Meanwhile, Raymond Cano had married Janine Kahn, whose sister Simone was Andre Breton's first wife. The Kahn sisters and the Makel sisters had known one another since going to school together in the Avenue de Villers. 32. Budley availed himself of the privilege of thought in the same style as the narrator in L.E. Blue Du Seal, half killing himself with drink, lack of sleep, and sex. I get pleasure now, he wrote, out of being an OBJECT of horror and disgust to the only being I'm close to I. E. Edith Sylvia. 33. Even after he and his wife parted he remained on terms of very close friendship with her, though he now lived with Colette Painot, whom he called Lore. Unlike Sylvia, Lore accepted Budley's excesses in a spirit of sacrifice, as if they were showing her the way to her own deed age. She too underwent analysis with Adrian Borel, before dying of tuberculosis in 193 9. All who came near her, wrote Learys, K. Now, how steadfastly she valued what is noble, how fiercely she rebelled against the standards to which most people subscribe. 34. After her death, Budley P. published her writings and himself produced a biography in which he recorded her sexual practices with cruel. G.O.R.G.E.S. Budley and Co. 129. Accuracy. As F.O.R. Severin, with whom, as we have seen, she fo on date la critique sociale in 193 1, he regarded her as mentally sick and tried to save her from herself, he never fo gave his rival for having taken her away from him and said Budley was sexually unhinged. In 1934 Budley had told Olicia Senkiewicz, his fr and confidant, of his sufferings, thanking her for her help. Perhaps, when it's too late, she Colette slash Lore will become sincere and open again, as she was in the years when I first knew her. Even though she left me, I'd still have liked her to be loyal to our common past, to the ideas we shared, and to the indescribable tenderness there was between us. Anyone who encourages her to reject all moral values does Colette herself a grave disservice. 35. Alicia had seen the relationship between Colette Painot and Severin breaking up just as her own affair with Lakin was deteriorating. Sylvia's screen career was helped on by Pierre Braunberger, who was madly in love with her. And it was with the actors belonging to the October group that she got her first part in a Renoir film, L.E. Crime de M. Lang, Monsieur Lang's Crime, made in collaboration with Prevert. L.E. Crime de M. Lang, a masterpiece inspired by the theater of life and the idea of communal effort, paid glowing tribute to the actors of the October group, who gave their best in it. Sylvia played the part of a girl who worked in a printing press and FELL victim to the wicked seductions of Jules Sperry. Prompted by Braunberger, Renoir thought seriously about finding Sylvia an important part. He agreed with René Claire that there ought to be a special age of the cinema JUST as there had once been a special age FOR Commedia dell'arte. And he believed it ought to relate to the second half of the 19th century. W.E. should throw off realism, he said, and make all our movies with costumes belonging to the special age of the film the opposite of cinema verite. 36. And F.O.R. Renoir the special age of the film was the period depicted in his father's pictures, the period of Dijon Sir Elherb, picnics in the country, boating parties, and open-air cafés by the river. From Maupassant's short story, Un Parti de Campagne, A Trip to the Country, he took the characters, the settings, the locations, and the tragic final scene. One fine summer morning Monsieur Dufour, who keeps a hardware store in Paris, decides to take his wife, his daughter Henriette, and his assistant Anatole to have lunch in the country at Pierre Polain's Inn on the banks of the Seine. After the meal, M. Dufour goes fishing, accompanied by the dim Anatole. Meanwhile Henriette and her mother flirt with two vacation ERS who are boating on the river. And so the girl has her first sexual experience, in a sudden furious burst of resistance she turned onto her back to avoid him, but he threw the whole of his body on top of her. It took some time for his lips to find hers. Then, carried away by a wave of desire, she 
F-A-M-I-L-Y-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-E-S. Returned his kiss and clasped him to her bosom, all her resistance vanishing as if crushed by an overwhelming weight. 37. Years go by, and one Sunday Henriette goes back to the same part of the river with Anatole, now her husband. There she meets her F.O. Remetta seducer in the very place where they had once made love. I think about it every evening, she tells him, B.E. for returning to her present dreary existence. The love scene on the island, wrote Andre Bazin, is at once one of the finest and one of the most terrible moments in world cinema. And it owes its electrifying power to the here trending emotional realism with which Sylvia Baudelaire endows AFEW gestures and a 100K. 38. George Isbaudelaire made a brief appearance in the film, dressed as a seminarian. His fleeting presence in this tragic hymn to love was particularly significant because his wife was playing the part of a heroine at once resigned to a life of servitude and rebelling against it. Sylvia's first big part ought to have led to a career in motion pictures, but circumstances were against it. Unparty de Campaign, produced by Braunberger and lasting 50 minutes, was shot on the banks of the Loing, where the landscape still resembled that along the banks of the Seine in 1880. But Rain held up the proceedings, and Renoir had to make changes in the script. After a fierce quarrel with Sylvia, he finished the film without shooting all the scenes originally planned. As a result it had to wait until 1946 FOR its first public showing, and the film that should have made Sylvia a star in 1936 remained unknown FOR 10 years. In the same year the October group folded FOR lack of money, and the good companions dispersed and went their separate ways. But Sylvia was still great FRENs with Prevert and was given a small part in Jenny, Marcel Karn's first film, FOR which Prevert wrote the script. The following year she was included in the team that made Jacques Fader's Legends du Voyage, Traveling People, starring Françoise Rosé. But then the war put an end to all Sylvia's hopes, not only because Peyton's anti-Jewish laws F.O. bade her to go on acting but also because she was too politically committed to want to work under such a regime. By 1946, when she could at last be seen in Renoir's movie, it was too late. Sylvia was now 38 and Lakin's companion, she had chosen another Liffey. And it was with some wistfulness that she shared with Le Cayas du Cinema her memories of the making of the film, Renoir was a great conductor, she said. He would take his time helping an actor to identify with his part, but if the actor kept getting it wrong he would fly into a rage. Our acting wasn't always good when we worked with him, but it was always true. 39. Just as Lakin and Kojeve were preparing to embark together on a comparison between Freud and Hegel, Bodily was launching the first number of George's Bodily and Co. 13i. The Review Act, Full, Acephalus, i.e., Headless. The cover reproduced a strange drawing by Andre Masson of a headless man with all his viscera showing and a skull in place of his sex organs. After a short-lived experiment in the FORM of A.J.O. Ernal called Contraattaque, Counterattack, in which Baudelaire, reconciled with Breton, had supported the Popular Front in its fight against the rise of fascism, he was now rejecting the idle negativity to which K.O.J.E.V.E. said intellectuals were doomed. History was finished, French society was on its deathbed, and war seemed imminent. As F.O.R. the moral crisis, it was so ominous and all-pervading that Baudelaire wanted to counter it with acephalite, headlessness. He proposed abandoning the enlightenment of the civilized world in favor of the ecstatic power of worlds that had disappeared. This rebellion against an unquestioning F.A. is in progress, which would never be able to arouse mankind to a spiritual reawakening, echoed in some respects the attitude of the symbolists in the 1880s. As early as 1891, in his novel La Basse, literally, over there, which Baudelaire greatly admired, Joris Karl Huysmans had portrayed a mythical dimension, beyond subjectivity, that drew the narrator toward an initiatory journey resembling the ideological experience that Baudelaire himself was heading for in the late 1930s. So the message conveyed by Masson's decapitate man was the need to offer up the head, the seat of human thought, 
as a sacrifice to a radical critique of Western reason. This being so, the Revue Acephal was only the visible aspect of a secret society of the same name. It was a very strange club indeed, its members preached the and on knowledge of Gnosis, as against all FORMS of rational logic, and even practiced ritual crimes as evidence of their total descent from a world hurtling toward disaster. George Isbodely and Roger K. Lois were the leading lights of this s acred conspiracy, Michel Leary's, still attached to the virtues of the rational and scientific mind, was more critical. The initiates promised to FOUND a new religion inspired by Zarathustra and to remain silent about the society's activities. But there was no question of any plot against the state or any act of terrorism, these conspirators were the H arrows of a nihilist rebellion that derived both its FORM and its content from ethnology. Budeli, who had been a great reader of Freud ever since he came across his group Psychology and the Analysis of the EGO, also took on board the theory of the death instinct, the cause of a great upheaval in the psychoanalytic movement. For Budeli, the physical death of Masson's headless man represented the death of anyone claiming to see his destiny as based on reason, we are fiercely religious, he wrote, and insofar as our very existence is itself a condemnation of all that is recognized now, we are bound to be just as fiercely intransigent. What we are embarking on is war. 40. The Marquis de Sada and Nietzsche were the two emblematic figures at 132 FAMILYHISTORIES. The head of this sacrificial crusade, together with Kierkegaard, Don Juan, and Dionysus. Klossowski laid the group's cards on the table in an article called The Monster, which appeared in the first issue of the review. Sadas Char Actors, he wrote, H. Aveng renounced the immortality of the soul, apply by way of compensation to be admitted to total monstrosity. 41. This monstrosity, the negation of the self, proclaimed the absolute power of dream over consciousness, of dispossession over self, possession, of impossibility over possibility. Sada's version of man was the prototype of modern man without God, he had to escape from his prison just as the acephal had to escape from his head and the individual from his reason, if he was to destroy the real presence of and then njoy the objects of his desire. This apologia for a monster born out of a confrontation between the Freudian WUNSCH, wish or desire, and Hegel's and Kojeev's begeared, appetite. 42. Was followed in January 1937, in the second number of Acephal, by a tribute to Nietzsche entitled Nietzsche and the Fascists, in which Klossowski gave an account of the current state of Nietzschean studies. 43. At the end of the 19th century the works of Nietzsche had begun to be known and translated in various French literary reviews. Jules de Gaultier, as I have mentioned, linked Nietzsche's doctrine to Bovaryism on the grounds of its nihilism and anti-rationalism. But at the same time it ci articulated less directly in the writings of André Gide and Paul V. Aylory. Moraz, for his part, admired Nietzsche's works for their criticism of Bismarck and their anti-socialist stance. 44. Breton was by no means so enthusiastic, though he did recognize how radical was Nietzsche's offensive against all the values of W.E. Stern reason. 45. This was the same Nietzsche that Lakin had praised in the mid-1920s, minus the devotion to the ideas in Zarathustra and in particular to the Superman theory. France's attitude to Nietzsche's philosophy had been transformed after the war by Charles Endler's monumental study of the philosopher's life and works, together with his sources. Endler destroyed the Wagnerian straight Jayat in which Nietzsche had hitherto been confined and revealed him as a European thinker, cosmopolitan and even universal. And so Nietzschean thinking became part of the history of philosophy, though according to an interpretation of that history colored by H. E. Julianism and the French approach to sociology. Endler, a Germanist and socialist, admired the Germany of Goethe and Beethoven, and although he finished his book Just before the First Battle of the Marne in 1918, he held back its publication until 1920. 46. 
but in 1935 it was not this enlightened version of Nietzsche who was being idolized in Germany. After a series of similar misapplications going back a Rudy years, Elizabeth Forster, Nietzsche's sister, made use of the ambiguity inevitably present in any great body of work to present Nietzsche's. George's Italy and Co. 133. Philosophy as F.A. Vorable to Nazism and F.A. Schism. Convinced that Hitler was an embodiment of her brother's dreamed of Superman, Elizabeth Forster was a F.A. natical supporter of the Fuhrer and with great pomp and ceremony deposited a copy of Zarathustra, together with Mein Kampf and Rosenberg's myth of the T.W. in the century, in the Tannenberg Monument celebrating the victory of Germany over Russia in the first WORLDWAR. I am certain, she wrote, Fritz would be delighted to see Hitler taking on with such peerless courage the FULL and entire responsibility FOR his people. 47. Bertoli attacked this outrageous misapplication of Nietzsche's thought in the second issue of Acephal, in January 1937. He reminded Nazis and fascists alike that Nietzsche had fiercely criticized the anti-Semitism of his sister and her husband and had never adopted any doctrine whatsoever concerning soil, race, or F.A. their land. He had constructed a body of philosophical works that called on modern man to face up to the consequences of the death of God and throw off all F.O.R.M.S. of servitude. A genuine Nietzschean superman was inspired by a will to power, he was a man with a new culture and a new metaphysics, both derived from an act of creation arising out of an act of destruction. Bertoli pointed out that, setting aside the swindle perpetrated by Elizabeth Forster, Nietzsche's work was open to two possible interpretations. One, referred to as the rightest reading and inspired by German neopaganism, led straight to the annexation of Nietzsche's theory of the Superman by propagandists of Aryan superiority. On the other hand a so-called left-wing interpretation regarded this same Superman theory as ushering in a creative revolution through which man could fre himself from the m asses, outstrip the self, and achieve existential freedom. In Acephal, Bertoli opted for the latter reading, and Klossowski praised Karl Jaspers' study, published in German in 1936, which interpreted Nietzsche in the light of Kierkegaard, showing that both had broken once and for all with the philosophy of objet of rationality. 48. The way Bertoli defended a left-wing reading of Nietzsche was similar to the way the Recherches Philosophiques, Philosophical Research, group adopted Hegelian thinking via their reading of Heidegger. In both cases the problem was how to approach human freedom and the historical commitment of the individual in a godless world that everyone felt to be threat end with destruction through the advent of modern dictatorships. Against this background Bertoli's Nietzschean revolt appeared as a kind of holy terror, a last way of subverting the social order before history came to an end. And it was no accident that the last two issues of Acephal were again devoted to Nietzsche. They contained portraits of Dionysus and Kierkegaard's Don Juan, together with a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the philosopher's going mad a celebration reminiscent of the Surrealists' 1928 celebration of the 50th anniversary of Hysteria. 134FAMILYHISTORIES Bertoli shared the Surrealists' idea that madness, far from being an illness, was an integral part of the human personality. His conception of the Freudian unconscious, however, was different from that of Breton. Breton, after approaching the teachings of Vienna via dreams and Janet's automatism, examined the signs of madness in search of a from of writing, a language, an aesthetic, he saw the unconscious as a dimension that was beyond consciousness and hence able to communicate with real life in such a way as to bring about a revolutionary change in humanity. B. A. Taya's approach was quite different. Having been attracted to Freud through mass psychology and the phenomena of collective identity, he saw madness as an extreme experience leading to the void and acephaly, and the unconscious as a non-knowledge within consciousness that revealed the conflict inside the individual and the attraction he feels for abjection, orger, and all that is vile, an instinct without any origin in biology. 49 Bertoli, after being one of the first French Nietzscheans, was then influenced by Kojeev's interpretation of Hegel, after which his belief in Nietzsche was reinforced by a large dose of nihilism. 
but, having studied the history of religion under Coyer and been influenced by Marcel Moss and Durkheim, Baudelaire also believed there was a philosophical doctrine to be found in mysticism and the sacred. This probably explains why he was fascinated by F.A. schism just as Breton was fascinated by occultism. Baudelaire maintained that the weapons brought into being by F.A. schism should be used to turn popular F.A. nativism and F.E. river against F.A. schism itself. Since democracy had shown itself unable to defend the world's conscience, anti-democratic methods must be pressed into service, a Nazi can be madly in love with the Reich, he said. And we too are capable of F.A. natical devotion. But what we love, although we're French, is not the French community but the community of mankind. We appeal to the universal conscience that is linked to moral freedom. 50 however, just as Breton never actually gave the occult any real theoretical approval, 5 one so Baudelaire never supported real-life F.A. schism in any way. When the Contrata Key group broke up in the spring of 1936, F.A. schism was the bone of contention. Baudelaire had signed a pamphlet written by Jean Daughtry that contained the following passage, We are against scraps of paper, against the slavish lucubrations of the chancelleries. We think declarations drawn up around green baize tables are only binding on ordinary people against their will. Anyhow, though we're not taken in by it, we prefer the anti-diplomatic brutality of Hyder, it's not so certainly F.A. tall to peace as the slobbering F.R.N.'s eyes of diplomats and politicians 52. The surrealists thereupon labeled Baudelaire's F.R.N.'s Souverainian superficists, the adjectivative deriving F.R.O.M. the F.A.C.T. that the Contrata Key group grew out of the old Democratic Communist Club. 53 but quite apart from Georges Baudelaire and Co. 135. Polemics There was a genuine philosophical quarrel with Breton here. If Baudelaire wanted to turn the weapons of fascism back on fascism itself and if he anathematized parliamentary democracy which in any case had abased itself before Hitler it was because he drew his political philosophy from a so-called heterological or scatological view of human society. In pathological anatomy the term heterologiical is used to denote morbid tissues composed differently from the normal tissues around them. But Baudelaire used the word heterology to mean a science of the unassimilable, of the irrecoverable, of order and remains. He wanted to oppose the kind of philosophy that reduces everything to what is thinkable. Above all, he wrote, he t urology opposes every homogeneous representation of the world i.e., every philosophical system. It aims at a complete inversion of the philosophical process that, having f or merely been an instrument of annexation, now enters the service of excretion and introduces a call for the violent satisfactions implicit in social existence 54. The heterology that Baudelaire placed at the center of his thinking, accusing surrealism of still being too attached to the ideal of bourgeois emancipation, advocated not mere personal rebellion but the awakening within each individual of a doomed element inherent in both man and society. And so Baudelaire, together with Roger Cale Lewis and Michel Leary's, started the College of Sociology, which was F.O. on date in March 1937 and remained active until the war. The College of Sociology was nothing like an ordinary college, and its F.O. unders were not sociologists. They came from various backgrounds and set up their strange and short-lived moral community with the object of first understanding and then explaining the obscure springs of social and human phenomena in the field of myth and the sacred. The college thus officialized the secret activities of Acephal and supplied them with a theoretical content. Many other writers and philosophers beside Baudelaire and his FRNs were invited to give lectures, among them Kojeve, Paul Hahn, Jean Wall, and Jules Monarat. The meetings took place in a room behind a bookstore in the Rue Galassac, and the audience included people such as Jules Benda, Drew La Rochelle, and Walter B. E. N. J. Ammon, rubbing shoulders with refugees from the Frankfurt School living in exile in Paris until they emigrated to America. In a brief but vivid aside, Dennis Hollier describes the strange atmosphere that prevailed in the two years preceding the collapse of French society, the background was extremely somber during the years when Daladier was trying to crush the popular front, against which everyone had some grudge or other, and while Hitler, on his side of the Rhine, 
was pursuing a resistible rise that was already making him fel short of living space. Robert Aaron has called this the end of the post-war i.e. the post-World War I P.E. riad, Raymond Cano's name for it was the Sunday of life, Jean-Paul Sartre's The Suspended Sentence. 55. 136 FAMILYHISTOR1ES While the influence of Kojeev's and Goyer's teachings is quite explicit in the work of Lakin, his borrowings from Bodily are never apparent. The two men had been friends since 1934, when they both took part in the revival of Hegelian philosophy in France, and so were partners in the same intellectual adventure, inspired by the same ideas and concepts, members of the same family. But around 1932 and 1933 Lakin was still very close to the Surrealists, in particular to Creevel and Dolly. His doctoral dissertation was greeted by them as an event, and he contributed to mine at Orr. Moreover, his attitude to Hegel was different from Budelis, and for him the most significant thing that happened between 1933 and 1936 was the discovery not of Heidegger but of Nietzsche. Lastly, Lakin's Freud bore no resemblance to B. A. Tayas. Nonetheless, while Lakin the writer stood aside from B. A. Tayas' universe, he remained present as a distant but curious and fascinated spectator. The earliest meetings of the Contraatiki group were held in his apartment in the Boulevard Males Herbs, as were the gatherings that gave rise to the College of Sociology. His silent presence at the secret activities of Acephal is attested by all the contemporary witnesses. So Lakin was with Budali and his family all the time during the period when he was undergoing analysis and passing from bachelorhood to marriage and thence to fatherhood. But Lakin's long friendship with Budali is rather puzzling. It included many intellectual exchanges, and we know Budali encouraged Lakin to publish and make himself known. But we also know that Lakin's work left Budali cold. He never referred to it in his own writings, and they contain no evidence that he was ever influenced by it. One almost wonders if he really read it, there is no proof that he did so. At all events, it left no trace on his work. Lakin on the other hand was influenced by his friendship with Budali, whether or not he made a close study of his work. And through taking part in all the activities organized by Budali, he was able to make some funda mental additions to his own researches. Not only did Budali's reading of Nietzsche supply Lakin with a new interpretation of the philosophy that had influenced him throughout his adolescence, but Budali also initiated him into a new understanding of Sada, whose writings would later lead him to a formulate a non-Freudian theory of pleasure. Moreover, Lakin borrowed Budali's ideas on the impossible and heterology, deriving from them a concept of the real scene first as Arisiju and then as impossible. The constant though implicit presence of Budali in Lakin's evolving work and the total absence of Lakin's writings in the work of Budali, together with the long, subterranean friendship between the two men themselves, who despite their family links were so unlike one another, are all evidence of a George's Battle slash E and Co. 137. Long drawn out transaction where what was at stake was basically a woman, Sylvia Budali. We left Jacques Lacan in 1936, on the beach at Noirmoutier, an island in the Vendée, wrestling with an article announcing and describing the advent of a second generation of psychoanalysis. A few months later, on January 8, 1937, Malou gave birth to a lovely little girl, called Caroline after her mother Nal grandmother. Lacan added a second name, Image. Following a tradition by which all the Blondin family had a nickname or a diminutive. Marie Louise was Malou, Caroline Rousseau Baboon, in French, the FME 9 FOR Baboon, Sylvain was Petit Pierre Lapin, Mr. Bunny, and so on. Point 56 But the word image also referred to the importance Lakin attached to the mirror stage theory. Caroline was conceived while he was writing his lecture for the Marenbad Conference. The experience of fatherhood made Lakin happy for about 18 months. But coming after three years of married life it lessened none of the problems arising out of the misunderstanding on which the marriage was originally based. The man Malu had chosen, 
idealizing him utterly and certain he would f a their clever children 57 failed to live up to her expectations. Not only was he a womanizer and a libertine, moody, and impossible to satisfy, but he was also possessed by the idea that he was a genius who would produce great works and by an immense desire to be recognized and f a mouse. All he thought about was himself and his work. His hunger forfa me and knowledge made him insatiably curious, assailing with question after question anyone whose learning he might hope to absorb. He looked at people so intently they often took him for some sort of diabolical being, possessed himself and trying to possess them. Yet there was nothing diabolical about him. The fascination he exercised on others came from the extreme swiftness with which his mind worked combined with the extreme slowness of his bodily movements. Always deep in thought, he was at once tyrannical and attractive, inquisitorial and anxious, a show-off and a man haunted by the truth, and all these things militate against the conjugal fidelity to which Malu would have liked him to adhere. As he mixed with the intelligentsia of the avant-garde and pursued ever more abstruse philosophical researches, he was confronted with a new universe and new ways of thinking that helped him with his reinterpretation of Freud. He had felt horribly abandoned by his brother's departure to Hotkum and by his parents' failure to understand his own intellectual development, and he couldn't bear to have to abandon people who loved him. And just as he hadn't been able to break with Marie Therese or Alicia, so now he couldn't make a definite choice between Malu and Sylvia, and left he it to Malu to decide they should part. 138 F A M I L Y H I S T O R 1 E S. He had met Sylvia F O R the first time in the second half of February 1st 934, after H E got back F R O M his honeymoon and she was in the last F E W weeks O F her life with Budley. At the time she seemed set F O R a successful career as an actress. Sylvia and Budley went to dinner in the B O Boulevard Males Herbs. She didn't take to Lakin at all and thought he and Malu made a terribly Borgios and conventional couple. When they met again two years later at Budali's place, Lakin set his cap at Sylvia and said the only reason he had come was to see her. She slipped away. Then, around November 19, 38, they met by chance in the Café de Flor and Fayel in love, after that they were always together. At the time Lakin had another lover. 58 and was in the process of breaking off his analysis with Lowenstein. So the liaison with Sylvia began 21 months after Caroline was born, and just as Malu found out she was pregnant with Thibaut. Ciaroline was everyone's favorite, said Thibaut. My mother's, my father's, and my uncle Sylvain's. She lived for two years with my parents while they still got on together, before my father's affair with Sylvia. That was what gave her a strong character. She got her self-confidence and assurance from the two years of happiness she had as a child. 59. By falling in love with Sylvia, Lakin was moving away from a world that was no longer quite his own, the world of the great medical bourgeoisie of Paris, whose members revered wealth and success and prided themselves on being the elite of the whole country. That world had once been necessary to Lakin, through his contact with it he had been raised up from his original background. For his roots lay in the typical French petite bourgeoisie, Catholic, close to the land, provincial, and austere, devoted to Joan of Arc rather than to the elegant cosmopolitan culture beloved of the Blondin fam Eilly. By choosing to mix henceforward with the avant-garde intelligentsia, Lakin was leaving a right bank lifestyle f or one that was less conformist, less rigid, and more bohemian. But in spite of everything Malu went on thinking their marriage could still be made to work. And although she didn't accept Lakin's infidelities and wished him to be quite different from what he was, she went on saying how clever he was and referring to him as a genius. 6 oh how could she do otherwise? She had only fallen for him because he was a model of the elite to which she was sure she herself belonged, so diligently did she and her brother cultivate the aesthetic values belonging to the cult of self-love. While Mallow U.S. pride concealed a puritanism and moral rectitude that made her haughty and unyielding, Sylvia's bohemianism reflected a cheerful temperament that made her, apparently at least, 
more likely to put up with the escapades of a man whose life she had chosen to share because she loved him. But her PR of Zion as an actress never prevented her from expressing her opinions fr ankly. Her opposition to the established order, too. Injustice and inequality, was always loud and clear. And through her marriage to Budali and later love affairs, she had acquired an experience of sex such as Malu never even dreamed existed. So, as Lakin Felt recognized and at home in Sylvia's circle, in 1939 she became his special companion. Different as the two women were, Malu and Sylvia did have something in common, they both destroyed many letters that La Cien wrote to them, in which he talked about his ideas and his opinions on people and things. 61. Lakin and Sylvia were frequent visitors to Charles and Marie Lord de Noal's salon, which had become the center of artistic and fashionable life in Paris during the 30s. I and their private mansion in the Place d'Etats Unis, wrote Boris Cocno, T. Hay often entertained a host of FRNs, mixing members of the aristocracy and world celebrities with budding artists of revolutionary tendencies. And among all these, Balthus, dashing and Byronic, stood apart FROM the general hubbub, looking on in silence at the MOT lay spectacle. But FROM his impish look and ironic smile one could guess what he was thinking. 62 In July 1, 939 Lakin met Andre Masson and, through Conweiler, bought a painting FROM him, Lefi. D. Arian, Ariadne's Thread. 63. He subsequently bought many others, including portraits of himself and Sylvia. Like Sylvain Blondin, Lakin was a great collector of master paintings, Picasso, Masson, B. Althus, Zawauki were his F.A. Voritz. He also collected books and primitive art. 1 3. Between Lucy and Febber A and D at O U A R D Pico N. W E already know the circumstances I in which Lakin came T O collaborate in the great task on which Lucy and Febber embarked in 1932, at the suggestion of Anatole de Mancier, the French Minister of Education. 1. Wallen, who was a close fr end of Febber, had been made responsible for volume 8 of the Encyclopédie Française, French Encyclopédia, which he entitled The Life of the Mind. Wallen wrote many of the articles himself but also made use of other contributors, including two of the best representatives of the second generation of French psychoanalysis, Daniel Lagache and Jacques Lacan. Among the contributors were such figures as Pierre Janet, Charles Blondel, Georges Dumas, Eugene Minkowski, and Paul Schiff. Thanks to a memorandum entitled Notes for Use in Compiling the History of the F, written by Lucy and Febber himself but unknown until now, it is at last possible to explain how Lakin came to write the famous text on the family that appeared in 1938 INW Ullian's volume of the Encyclopedia. 2. Lakin's essay was so complex that Febber took the trouble to add nine PARA graphs of notes explaining to FU tour historians the extraordinary nature of the author's thinking on the Oedipus theory. Wallen had asked Lakin for two articles, pointing out to his colleagues that although Lakin was difficult to deal with, he was the only person who could do the job properly. Lakin sent the first article in quite quickly, but it took Madame Febber three months to gouge the second out of him page by page. In September 1936 the manuscript was handed over to the Encyclopédie to be typed. It was then that Rose Chelly first saw it. She was a novelist who had specialized in literature at the École Normale Supérieure at Sèvres, just outside Paris, and had become one of Febber's most valued colleagues. But, between Le Den Febber and Edouard Pichon 141, try as she might she couldn't make out the meaning of some of Lakin's more obscure passages, especially those dealing with the Oedipus complex. So she made numerous corrections throughout the text to render it more comprehensible. She then handed over the corrected manuscript to Lucy and Febber, who passed it on to Wallen, asking him to give it back to Lakin for him to indicate whether the translator had made any mistakes in her attempt at translation. Lakin was also asked to elucidate the meaning of doubtful passages. Dr. Lakin, says Lucy and Febber, 
D.I.D. a considerable amount of work on his text and tried very earnestly to clarify it. But he made the mistake of giving his text back to the F without informing either me or the editor concerned. He gave it to Madame Pishri, a chatterbox who instead of declining it and referring M. Lakin to myself or the editor concerned, took it upon herself to rush all over the office telling everybody all about it from Nanette to the concierge's cat and the concierge herself, not F. O. getting the head of administration, who stoked up the scandal F. U. Rather. And so on. 3. When Febber saw the text as corrected by Lakin he realized that the author's modifications had made it much more readable. But three pages about the Oedipus complex were still unintelligible. Lakin himself couldn't find a way of improving them, and Febber observed, Dr. Lakin's style isn't bad it's an extremely personal system using words in special senses, such that the only solution is either to rewrite the whole thing once one has understood it or else to ask the author to take it back yet again for revision. While Febber himself set to work on the final version of the article, rumors circulated more furiously than ever in the corridors of the Encyclopedia's headquarters in the Rue du Four. Everyone made fun of the impe naturability of Lakin's style. The scandal reached its height when someone showed Anatole de Mancier the original instead of the corrected version. Mancier was of course unaware that the text in front of him had already been changed several times, first rewritten by Rose C. E. Lai, then revised by Febber, then modified by Lakin, then rewritten yet again by Rose, then read again by Febber, and so on. So Mancier, thinking the article in front of him was supposed to be ready to go to the printer, flew into a rage and roared, get it translated into normal language. For Febber had fun castigating the stupidity of Nanette and the rest in their attempt to make editors and authors out to be idle and useless. He saw himself as Jacrissa when he championed the truth and wrote Mencia to tell him what had been going on. Point five Febber's memo is an interesting piece of immediate history. It shows on the one hand how as early as 1937 Lakin was valued appropriately by the most brilliant minds of his age and on the other hand the problems presented even then by his style of writing. It was obscure and illegible, he couldn't observe deadlines, he seemed to shrink from the idea of publica. I-42 F-A-M-I-L-Y-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-E-S. Shin. It is worth noting that Lakin's impenetrability dates from 1936, when under the influence of Kojiv and Goyer he started to put Freud in a philosophical context. Compared to his Beyond the Reality Principle and his text on the F.A. Mali, Lakin's doctoral thesis seems a model of lucidity. It is as if it was his early, as yet exploratory, contacts with philosophy that made him incomprehensible. But Febber's memo also shows that Lakin was ready to accept criticism of his style, he wanted to be understood and was quite willing to revise his text if the changes were suggested by intelligent people to whom he could really talk. Lucy and Febber's own comments on Lakin's article on the F.A. Mali made its points with great clarity. In the midst of the storm unleashed by Nanette, the concierge, and her cat, he recognized the talent of a man whose difficult style might well make F.O.L.s and ignore Amuse's laugh, Febber stood up to them and took care to leave posterity tangible evidence of his righteous wrath. As it finally stood, Lakin's article on the F.A. Mali was at once remarkably clear and extremely obscure. It was clear because of the many alterations made by Rose Chelly, Lucien Febber, and Lakin himself. But it was still obscure, because it was transitional. On the one hand Lakin was setting down the results of his recasting of earlier concepts hence the synthetic and formal nature of the text but on the other hand he was treating new ideas that he found difficult to express lucidly. His theoretical system was still far from being completely worked out. Hence the apparent haziness and lack of form in parts of what was a very extraordinary piece of work. First there were the subheadings that Febber and W. Alien insisted on and Lakin accepted, probably after discussing and selecting them with his two editors' help. This pair played an important part in organizing Lakin's text, supplying a theoretical line from which it is possible to derive some of the concepts and ideas that were later to serve as a from work for the whole of Lakin's thinking. They included, in no particular order, the image of the mother's breast, 
the weaning complex, the appetite for death, general nostalgia, mental identification, the mirror stage, the castration complex, the archaic superego, the decline of the paternal imago, delusional forms of knowledge, self-punishment neurosis, and the prevalence of the male principle. These terms were borrowed from various fields of knowledge, mingling together traces from all the disciplines that had contributed to the young Lakin's thinking. As for the text itself, as far as psychoanalysis was concerned it was a masterly synthesis that combined the vocabulary of psychiatry, Claude, Minkowski, Clarembolt, already present in Lakin's 1932 thesis, with the terminology of the French school of psychoanalysis, Pichon, Lafourg, etc. To this was added, for the first time, a very assured reading of Melanie Klein's article Early Stages of the Oedipus Can Flow. ICT 6. As to philosophy, it was the Between Lucy and Feber and Edouard Pichon 143. Teaching of Wallen and K. Ojave combined that enabled Lakin to arrive at an interpretation of Freud that was non biological and phenomenological, tacking as its central point the differentiation among the ego the I, and the other and leading to a theory of the imaginary that had more in common with Klein than with Freud. As for Lakin's sociological analysis of the individual within the F.A. Mali, that offered an astonishing potpourri of ideas about the sacred, anti-bourgeois nihilism, and a sense that W. Eastern civilization was deteriorating, all themes arising out of Lakin's association with the College of Sociology Y. All this was supplemented by interpretations of the works of Marcel Moss and J. A. Cobb von Juxkill. 7. From Juxkill, a German biologist, Lakin's main borrowing was the general concept of Umwelt, or environment, the world as experienced by all the animal kingdom. Juxkill had revolutionized the study of anthropology why at the beginning of the century by constructing a theory of behavior showing that the environment of any animal, including human beings, must be seen as the internalizing of that environment in the relevant species lived experience. Whence the idea that an individual's link with his environment should no longer be defined as a contract between a free individual and a society but rather as a relationship of dependence between an environment and an individual, the individual himself being determined by specific actions arising from a particular way of internalizing elements from the environment. What Lakin borrowed from Yuxkill in 1932 allowed him in 1938 to M.O. to a new view of the way a mental phenomenon was organized, it was no longer a simple psychical FACT but an imago, a group of unconscious representations, the mental FORM of a more general process. The word imago, derived from Jungian terminology Y, served not only to bring into the unconscious the two poles representing the model of the family father and mother slash patriarchy and matriarchy, but also to explain the organization of the F.A. Mali in the light of Yuxkill's innovations, an individual cannot be human except insofar as he belongs to an organic social entity. To this was added the Aristotelian principle of a human essence defined by the proper ions in which at least three elements man, woman, and slave are combined. In a very P. E. Rutenen study published in 1987, Bertrand Ogilvy explains that Lakin unites what is usually contrasted. He sees F.A. Mali organization in the organicist and naturalistic terms of the philosophers of the counter-revolution while at the same time appealing to a secular conception of society derived from the philosophy of the E-Enlightenment. Very true. And Ogilvy goes on to show that Lakin went back, through Mora's, to an attitude inherited from the positivus M of Kant, according to which society is made up of families rather than individuals. It was also through more as that. 144 Famil y Histor IES. Lakin rediscovered Aristotle as a theorist on the social identity of the individual. Ogilvy remarks on the astonishing combination of a collective perception of the dimension of the individual that, taken together with a biological view, leads to a scientific anthropology, FRED of the ideological limits of nationalism. Lakin never cites Moras, however, his debt to him seems to consist in being deaf to psychological individualism rather than in H.A.B.ing actually adopted any of his arguments. 
but in this way, unwittingly, Lacan was joining the French tradition that goes back through Comte to Bonald and his theory of the Euter man who exists only in the context of his social relationships. Eight. Then there was the long section on the family that displayed a mixture of darkness and light characteristic of Lacan's style, an extremely personal system using words in special senses, as Lucien Febvre observed. But that shifting of the meaning underneath the words was a translation of thought, and as such it was as purely French as the style of Mora's, Lacan's model, yet at the same time as iconoclastic and cosmopolitan as the Enlightenment ideal that was another constant source of inspiration to him. This was the great paradox of Lacan's development. Instead of being like that of Freud himself it resembled Thomas Mann's description of him, explorer of the depths of the soul and psychologist of instinct, one of the line of 19th and 20th century writers who opposed rationalism, intellectualism, and classicism, in short, the F.A. in the mind that belonged to the 18th and even to a certain extent to the 19th century. These writers stressed the nocturnal side of the nature of the soul, they saw this as the really decisive and creative F.A. of life, they cultivated it and threw scientific light on it. 9. Lakin, a true son of Leon Bloy and René Descartes, was also heir to the line of those who explored darkness and light, in his view, the F.A. Mali was at the same time the traditional crucible of a social organism and an anthropological subject that must be rigorously examined and analyzed according to scientific criteria. The first part of the study opposed complex to instinct and defined the three structures that contribute to the development of the individual. The word complex, borrowed by Freud from the Zurich School, denoted a group of representations that were to a greater or lesser degree unconscious. Lakin used it in a Freudian sense, to describe a structure in which the cultural FAC tour predominated over fixed instinct and to argue that the consciousness of the SUBJECT intervened in representation. But whereas, in a complex, a representation was virtually conscious for the subject, in the imago it became essentially unconscious. The complex, of WHICH the imago was a constituent part, was the concrete factor that made it possible to understand the structure of the family, somewhere between the cultural phenomenon that determines it and the imaginary. Between Lucy and Febvre and Edouard Pichon 145. Links that organize it. Thus a hierarchy consisting of three levels was the model for all interpretations of individual development. In it were to be FOUND the weaning complex, the intrusion C complex, and the Oedipus complex. Three phases, in the Kalinian sense, which foreshadowed what after the war would be the Lacanian topography of the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic, the weaning complex, Lakin wrote, fixes the nursing relationship in the psyche in the parasitic mode imposed by the needs felt by a human being in his or her earliest days, it represents the primordial form of the imago of the mother. Hence it is the basis of the most archaic and sta blief links linking the individual to the family L0. Thus weaning left a trace in the psyche of the biological relationship that it interrupted, at the same time as it gave its expression to an older imago, that which separated the child from the womb at birth, f overseeing on it a prematurity specific to the human race, from which arose a disquiet that no maternal ca o old cure. It was this prematurity that distinguished man from animals. Refusal to be weaned was the basis of the positive aspect of the complex, re-establish ng in the FORM of an imago oj the mother breast the interrupted nursing relationship. The existence of this imago dominated the whole of human life, a kind of appeal to universal nostalgia. It explained woman's permanent sense of motherhood. But when this imago was not sublimated so as to allow social relationships, it became lethal. For then the complex, instead of corresponding to the vital functions, reflected their congenital inadequacy. From this arose an appetite for death that could take the FORM of nonviolent suicide, such as anorexia, drug addiction, by mouth, or gastric neurosis. In abandoning himself to death the sub-JECT seeks to find the imago of the mother again. LL the intrusion complex fixed, by means of mental identification, the subject's dyadic relationship with his FELO creatures. Whether in the domestic drama of sibling rivalry, 
when order of birth placed each individual in a dynastic position of possessor or usurper, or in the mirror stage, when each individual restored his own lost unity, the same narcissistic structure of the ego was built up with the imago of the double as its central element. When the subject recognized the other in the form of a confidential link, he achieved socialization. But when he went back to the maternal of JECT he was clinging to a mode of destroying the other that tended toward paranoia. Finally, the Oedipus Omplex introduced a triangulation that made it possible to define the specific form of the human family. Lakin stressed that Freud had been the first to show the importance of sexuality with regard to the family, basing his theory on a dissymmetry between the sexes. But H.A. being done T.S., Lakin then proposed a psychological revision of the Oedipus Q.U. Eastern, to be arrived at by linking his own researches with those of Melanie Klein, with which he had J.U.S.T. become acquainted. 146 Famil Y. His Tour I.E.S. So far as sociological relativity was C. Oncerned, L. Lacan's revision was expressed in Bergsonian terms. In Les Deux Sources de la Morale de la Religion, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion, published in 1932. Bergson had contrasted a morality of obligation with a morality of aspiration. The first was seen as a kind of enclosure, by which the human group closed in on itself in the interests of cohesion, while the second was defined as a kind of opening, by which the group universalized itself through exemplary figures such as heroes and saints. Lakin, taking this bipolarization as a point of departure, saw the prohibition of the mother as the concrete form of primordial obligation or closed morality. This was contrasted with the open form, which Lakin related to the paternalist authority of the father. It was this, he thought, that explained the prophetism of the Jews, which is to be understood, he wrote. In terms of the elite situation of the Jewish people, chosen to be the upholder of patriarchy in the midst of other groups that went in for matriarchal religions, and in terms of that people's convulsive struggle to maintain the patriarchal ideal despite the irresistible attraction exercised by those other cultures. Thus throughout the history of the patriarchal nations we see a dialectical movement in society between the demands of the individual and the universalization of ideals, Evidence of this is to be found in the legal forms perpetuating the mission that ancient Rome performed both as a power and as consciousness, which was embodied in the already revolutionary extension of the privileges of a patriarchy to a vast proletariat and to all the other nations. Point 12. This deter by way of Bergson drew Lakin into a lengthy excursion on modern man and morals in marriage, which ended in a pessimistic view of the FU tour of Western society, marked by the decline of the paternal imago. After maintaining that the rise of the families of eminent men was due not to heredity but to selective transmission of the ego ideal FROMFA there to son, Lakin sprang to the defense of the values of the traditional family, which he considered more subversive than the educational utopias of totalitarian SYS Thames. According to Lakin, only the modern, middle class, patriarchal family could ensure social liberty. He was here proclaiming the power of long-term history as against that of revolutionary upheaval, which seemed to him futile and doomed to F.A. Illier. This led him to ascribe more liberating power to an ancient institution that he had suffered from and loathed than to any violent attempts at reformation. Having started out from more as he now came to Freud, recalling, like Tocqueville, how much, unlikely as it might seem, tradition might F.A. for progress. But this Freudianization of the F.A. Malikation INVOLVED a set of even more fundamental choices, of universalism against culturalism, of the socialized against the tribal F.A. Mali. In other words, of culture as a civilizing F.O.R.C.E. versus the worship of roots, of science versus magic, of cosmopolitanism versus chauvinism, and so on. The 19th. Between Lucy and Febber and Edouard Pichon 147. Century ideologists who subjected the paternalist family to the most subversive criticism, he wrote, were not those least affected by it. I am not one of those who lament an alleged weakening of a militise. Is it not significant that the more the F.A. Mali has incorporated the highest cultural progress, 
the more it has tended to be reduced to its biological pattern. 1-3. Then Lakin pays a resounding tribute to Freud, the product of Jewish patriarchy, who dared to invent the Oedipus complex at the very moment when, amid the industrialization of W. Eastern societies and as a result of economic concentration, the paternal imago was beginning to decline. This decline, itself the result of a psychological crisis, was related to the birth of psychoanalysis, which was seen as the recognition of a socially inevitable decline in pater nal authority. And with this observation the first encyclopedia article ended. In the second and less innovative of his two articles, Lakin gave an exhaustive account of pathological complexes, including the results of his own work on psychosis and a Freudian P.O. interview on neurosis. Then, in a kind of echo of his first article, he described the mother's confiscation of F.A. Mali authority as domestic tyranny. He saw this usurpation as S.Y.M.P. tomatic of an inevitable social progress through which, by a psychological inversion, the predominance of the male principle asserted itself. According to Lakin, this principle, unfortunately F.O.R. fathers and F.O.R. men in general, was now vested in mothers and in women in general. The violence of his mockery of the marriage bond and of the role of mothers in F.A. Mali life no doubt derived from his uneasiness about his own F.A. Ild marriage and from childhood memories of his parents' marital difficulties. But his attitude to the family was not merely a reflection of his own experience. It was first and foremost the result of a theoretical study, reminiscent of Nietzsche, of the crisis of modernity that at the turn of the century had hit not only intellectual circles in Vienna, where it brought FORTH the researches of Freud, but also European society as a whole. The crisis was seen as a rising FROM a new polarization of the categories of masculine and feminine, reflecting the FELing that Western society was being feminized and paternal authority was in decline. 14 And because of his relations with KOJEVE, Bertoli, and the College of Sociology, Lakin approached the question of the Phi and Siecla crisis in a spirit colored by a sense that the end of history itself was at hand. Edouard Pichon soon reacted to Lakin's argument, at first privately in a letter to Henry E. Y. and then publicly in an article in the RFP entitled The Family as Seen by M. Lakin. 15. Pichon's letter to E. Y., dated July 21, 1938, was couched in ambiguously mixed terms. On the one hand I have just read with attention the text Lakin has written for the encyclopedia, a difficult one, like everything he writes. On the other I recall your say. 148 F.A. Mill Y. His Tour I.E.S. And you were preparing a paper on the moral value of psychoanalysis. I'd like to give you a brief idea, without for now claiming to provide a formal account, of the fellow's rather silly amorality. He talks about the failure of moral conceptions. And at one point he makes a fierce attack on my theory of ablativity selfless giving, though without actually mentioning me, either from fear of my name or out of utter disdain. In either case, it's very discourteous. This attitude of being beyond good and evil strikes me as patently absurd, from the social point of view, any kind of society needs standards, or in other words some moral code, WH whatever our fine supermen may say, and from the point of view of individual psychology, the existence of guilt feelings is such an established fact that Lakin himself calls it a constrained characteristic of the human race. Well, then, 16. In his reply to Lakin in the RFP, Pico N., who died soon afterward, inveighed against him as if bequeathing a written testimony to his own anti Nietzschean views on ethics and the family. He began by giving Lakin a grammar lesson, accusing him of employing J. A. Ragon, inventing neologisms, and misusing ordinary words. In this Pichon agreed with Feber, though he didn't draw the same conclusions. W. H. It had really infuriated Pichon was the way Lakin, without explicit acknowledgement, appropriated ideas and concepts previously used by his elders, including Codet, Laforg, and Pichon himself. Pichon also resented Lakin's sarcastic attacks on authors he didn't even deign to mention. But the main thrust of Pichon's diatribe concerned the difference between culture and civilization. 
Pishan agreed with Lakin that the family was a product of tradition rather than heredity. And, like a true disciple of Mora's, he was not displeased to find that his pupil's arguments included some of his own. But the two men disagreed entirely on the subject of culture. Lakin rejected out of hand any claim that French civilization was better than all others. In so doing he was dismissing Morris's teaching, based on a belief in the universal superiority of France's eternal, monarchical, rational civilization over all other cultures, and in P.A. particular over German culture, seen as individual inwardness shrouded in Teutonic mists. It was against this background that Pichon accused Lakin of being Hegelian and a Marxist i.e. a G. Ehrman and of misusing the word culture. The French language, wrote Pichon, has long made a distinction between the collective phenomenon civilization and the personal phenomenon culture. Monsieur Lakin F. O. gets this distinction, he keeps saying culture instead of civilization, a practice that in a number of passages has a very adverse effect on his clarity. One might have hoped that the gross blunders made in France during the four years i.e. the 1914-1918 war about German Kultur would at least have taught most of us to discriminate between culture and civilization. To adulterate this notion is a disservice to both the genuine culture and the true civilization of our country 17. In 1938 Lakin's universalism was that of modern anthropology, the anthropology of Febvre, Freud, and later of Levi Strauss. Lakin maintained. Between Lucy and Feber and Edouard Pichon 149. The universal existence of human reason and human culture in the FACE of nature, whatever internal differences might exist between their various forms. But Pichon's universalism, derived from Moras, was inegalitarian, based on an absolute belief in the superiority and potential universality of so-called French civilization. Hence his declaration that French civilization, so lively and so rich, has kept its precious humanism despite all a tt emps to destroy it, such as the Reformation, the bloodthirsty masquerade of 178. Minus 1799, and the democracy that sprang from the movement of the 4th of S.E.P. Timber. Monsieur Lakin, without renouncing any of his originality, is on our side as regards this fundamental Frenchness. However steeped he may be in Hegelianism and Marxism, he does not strike me as being in the least infected by the H. Humanitarian virus, he is not foolish enough to be just any man's friend, though we feel he is the friend of every man. The fact is that the psychoanalyst is an optimate or patrician, at once because of his ethnic and family background and because of his medical training in Paris. Come now, lay can go on stoutly blazing your own trail, but kindly leave enough little pebbles behind for us to be able to catch up with you. Too many people, having lost all contact with you, imagine you've lost your way. Once. But Jacques-Marie Lakin, as Pichon called him throughout his article, would never return to the FOLD of a Frenchness he had abandoned long ago. VVCZR and Peace. PARTV. 14. Marseilles, Vichy, Paris. Oh and the page of her diary dated September 23, 1939, Marie Bonaparte wrote simply, 2.45 p.m., Death of Freud L. The circumstances of Freud's death, just after war had been declared, have often been described, and I have already had occasion to show how the French press dealt with the event. 2. Here I shall merely recall a few lines from the newspaper El Ovra, which beneath a pretense of objectivity revealed all the chauvinistic hatred, at once anti-Semitic and anti-cosmopolitan, that the French write FELTFOR Freud's discoveries, after the Anschluss, in March 1938, said Elovra, the distinguished scientist, who was Jewish, could not fail to figure on the list of personalities proscribed by the Nazis. A certain amount of time went by before he was able to leave Vienna, where he had lived for more than 50 years, and F.O.L.O. Einstein on the road to exile. As is well known, Britain welcomed him with open arms three. Whereas in Germany some psychoanalysts had, under Jones's influence, 
adopted a policy of collaboration with the Nazis, in France the situation was different. WAR broke out at a time when the psychoanalytic scene was already changing because of the arrival of the second generation of French practitioners, the generation of Lacan, Nacht, Lagache, and Frank, was Dalto. Codet, who had been ill, died in December 1939, F. followed in January 1940 by Edouard Pichon. Borel was already likely to resign, and Hesnard, who was loyal to Marshal Paytan, continued his career in the French Navy. Starting as Chief Medical Officer FOR the Navy in Algeria, he next became Medical Director of the 4th Maritime Region and in 1943 was appointed Inspector General of Naval Medical Services in A. Africa. It was in the FO Redified Camp at Bizerta that he wrote his famous philo-Semitic text on the Jewishness of Freud IV. René Allende, who served in the army first in the deparutment of La Manche and then in Brittany, eventually went to live in Montpellier in the 154 WARANDPEACE unoccupied zone, where he met with a tragicomic adventure, the medical authorities thought his name sounded Jewish, so he had to prove that he was a pure Aryan. In 1941 he went to Switzerland, where he met Jung and Baudouin at the ceremonies held for the rehabilitation of Paracelsus. Just before the rounding up of Jews in the Velodrome de Hiver in July 1942, he died in Paris, having written an account of his fatal illness in his journal De Unmedicine Malade, De Uri of an Ailing Doctor. 5. Whereas the nationalistic elements of the SPP were decimated in the early years of the war, the internationalist group was FORCED to break up, and most of them went into exile. Charles Odea returned to Switzerland, Raymond de Saussure, Heinz Hartmann, and René Spitz arranged to be transferred to the Psychoanalytic Society in Neuilly ORK, and in 1942, after spending many months in Marseilles, Rudolf Lowenstein II finally left FOR the United States. As FOR Marie Bonaparte, after closing down the Institut de Psychanalyse and removing the archives, she took refuge first in her house in Brittany, where she had Lowenstein to stay, and then in her place at St. Cloud, which had meanwhile been looted by the Nazis. She then decided to go to her villa in St. Tropez, where she was J.O.ed again by Lowenstein. But, unable to practice professionally, she too went into exile, arriving in Athens in February 1941. From there she embarked with the Greek royal F.A. Mili F.O.R. Alexandria and after that went on to South Africa, where she spread the Freudian word and planned to return to France after the siege of Stalingrad. She was in London in the autumn of 1944 and back in Paris by February 1945, F.E. airing the SPP would again be rent by internal quarrels but determined to play a leading role once more. 6. The two women pioneers of child psychoanalysis in France both met with tragic fates, the victims of melancholy and anti-Semitism. Eugenie Socani C.K.A., isolated not only as a woman and an analyst without medical qualifications but also as a F.O. Rainer and a Jew, gassed herself in 1934. Sophie Morgan Stern, already afflicted by the death of her daughter Lore, killed herself on June 14. 1940 the day the German army entered Paris. Among that first generation of French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, two men stood out from the rest because of their diametrically opposite attitudes to the war. Paul Schiff was the only representative of his generation to become an active member of the resistance. René Lafourgue was the only one, apart from Matthias Goring, to be a CO collaborator. Though his efforts ended in complete F.A. Illier, the very FACT of abstaining FROM all public activity, including writing, amounted to an act of passive opposition to Nazism. In this respect, Marie Bonaparte's attitude was exemplary. Unlike Jones, she made no attempt to rescue psychoanalysis. By going into exile and springing at once to the aid of the Jews, she forestalled any attempt to form an Aryan version of the Marseilles. Vichy, Paris 155. Psychoanalytic Society. As she had gone and the EP group under Henry E.Y. was also unavailable, 
there could be no negotiations between the occupying authorities and the leaders of the SPP, all in exile, dead, or absent. In other words, in June 1940 the situation of French psychoanalysis did not lend itself to the creation of a Nazified therapeutic society like the one in Berlin. Hence the failure of René Laforgue's attempt at collaboration, he couldn't persuade Goring to Aryanize a group that no longer really existed. WH Isle the first generation was absent from the Parisian scene, the second generation had not yet acquired enough power within the SPP to make it AFORCE to be reckoned with. Its members were in the same state of abeyance. As their older colleagues, each individual had his own FATE to cope with as best he could. Daniel Lagache, a professor at the University of Strasbourg who had taken refuge in Clermont-Ferrand, helped Jews and members of the resistance, while Sasha Nacht was an active member of the resistance network FROM November 1942 to September 1944. 8. John Luba, who had already F.O. Ugheit in WORLD War I, served in the Paris Civil Defense, not so much out of opposition to the Nazis as because of his deep hatred F.O.R. the Huns, as he always called them. A letter Luba wrote to Jones on December 31, 1944 gave a good description of the situation of the handful of Parisian psychoanalysts of both Gen Erat Ions who chose to carry on with their professional activities during the war, like the ordinary French people who neither favored collaboration with the enemy nor F.O. Ugheit in the resistance. The only ones left in Paris at the beginning of the occupation, he wrote, were Madame Dolto, formerly Mile Merit, and myself. Parchemini and Schlumberger, then Lakin, came back later, after they were demobilized. Parchemini, Schlumberger, and I did some very good work. I mention Lakin just for the record, since he didn't seem to do much at Saint and I only saw him there once or twice. Our own work consisted mainly of treatments and training analyses. Several interns and directors of clinics asked us to analyze them. There was no question of publishing anything during the occupation. We were barely toll erat. At one point, even, we nearly came to grief because of Laforg's inept activities, in the end, his clumsy dealings with the Huns made him dangerous. I may add that Madame Dolto did some excellent work with children at the Hopital Trousseau. Madame Codet went on performing analyses. Point nine. An ordinary and yet nonconformist Frenchman, such was Jacques Lacan throughout the whole of the occupation. H.E.F.E.L.T., says Georges Berny, that he had a superior mind and belonged to the intellectual elite. So he saw to it that the events that history forced him to confront should have no effect on his way of life. Lo admittedly, in September 1939 he was mainly preoccupied by his affair with Sylvia Butley, his marriage problems, and the 156 WAR and PEACE health of his month old son. As a result, all the hostility he felt toward the family as an institution, together with the deep pessimism it aroused in him, combined to color his verdict on the collapse of France. In August 1939, Malou had given birth to a son, who was named Thibaut. S.H.E. knew Jacques had been unfaithful to her F.O.R. some time but seemed unaware that the F.A. Mao's coup de foudre that smote Sylvia and Jacques at the Café de Flore had occurred at J.U.S.T. when she F.O.U.N.D. she was pregnant. The two lovers had been inseparable ever since, but Jacques did not tell Malou how serious the affair was. He went on F. fulfilling his various obligations as if nothing had happened. The bot, who was born with pyloric stenosis, had to have a serious operation. In a letter dated October 4, 1939, Lakin told Sylvain Blondel about his worries, the baby's vomiting, the weight loss, and then the remarkably successful operation. He described how the danger hanging over his son made him F. forget all other perils and marveled at the infant's will to live. He c-a-l-l-e-d him t-h-e-h-e-r-o. He also praised Tihi Baboon, Malu's mother, though he was highly critical of his own F.A. Mali, especially his P.A.R.N.S., with the best of intentions they had tried to exercise their Christian influence over the infant's F.A.T.E. by suggesting he be given extreme unction. Lakin then spoke of the collapse of French society and the need to change in order to survive. 
people had all been torn away from a way of life with which they see Alden T. Holy go along but which had nevertheless allowed everyone to preserve the best of himself. Conflicts left unresolved within, he went on, get resolved externally. But now everything he valued was temporarily exposed to the elements. Some aspects of our lives might be empty or false, he said, speaking in the first person plural, but such aspects were dear to us and it was painful to have to change them. Finally, he said he was doing little therapy but a lot of medicine, and his letter ended with a touching anecdote about his daughter Caroline. She had said to her grandmother, M. Why sleep won't come? I am waiting for someone. The phrase delighted her f a t h e r 11. He had been directed to serve as an assistant doctor in the Neuropsy CHI Utrecht Department of the Military Hospital at the Val de Grace, but at the same time he went on dividing his life between his two partners. By March 1940, Malu was pregnant again. She had spent a few days in the country with Jacques, hoping to revive a relationship that was heading for disaster. On May 29, when French troops were embarking at Dunkirk, Laken, FULL of anxiety, wrote another letter to his brother in law. Malu had JUST gone to Rohan to stay in the family house with her FR e n d r e n e Massonaud. Lakin was worried about what might happen to her, to Caroline, to the Tibetan, and to the expected baby. What can I say? I entrust them to you if need be. Please remember this if things get dangerous. He described his routine at the hospital. Where he saw between 15 and 20 patients. Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 157. A day. From the professional point of view, he felt in better shape than ever, and his output surprised even himself. He felt at home and believed he was well thought of. Then came another diatribe against the French political SYS TEM, the self constituted elites. And the mandarins of the hospital hierarchy, those supercilious morons. 1 2. At the end of spring 1940, he was posted, again as assistant physician, to the hospital run by the Franciscans in Pau. It was about this time that Malu began to see what was really happening. Lakin had been gradually drifting away from her, and now it was with Sylvia that he was meeting new frens and sharing the pleasures of a new way of life. Sylvain II had been called up, and in April he was appointed head of a surgical ambulance unit in Lucay. On June 14th, he was ordered to Macon, three days later, he was withdrawn to Gerardmer, and on June 20th, he arrived in Saint Die. When the German army entered the town, he remained with his patients, and at the end of August, he was sent home. 1 3. Meanwhile, Georges b u d e l y had taken D. E. n e s Rollin to Drogi C, a small village in the Cantal. Near m o r y a k b u d e l y had met Denise Roland in the autumn of 1939, when she was living in a handsome apartment at 3, Rue de Lille. More than any other woman I know, she was silence personified, says Lawrence b u d e l y To put it metaphorically, she recorded what other PEOPLE said. And it was amazing what reverberations they set up in her. 14 b u d e l y then went back to Paris but rejoined Denise after June 2. It's an exodus, he wrote, a n d a horrible toss up between good and bad luck. So FARIVE been lucky, and I'm especially aware of it because only an hour ago I thought I was going to have to take to the road on FOOT. 15 Sylvia and Lawrence, followed by Rose and Andre Masson, soon turned up in Drew GC. On June 24th, in Pau, Lakin asked to be allowed to go to o r l i c for REA sons that, With your permission, may only be given verbally. 1 6. His reasons were that he wanted to go to see Sylvia in Drew GC. His request was granted. Not long afterward, he was demobilized. In the autumn of 1940, everyday life began again in a France now divided into two zones. In early September, Sylvia and her mother went to Vichy, where she met Jean Renoir. He was there to collect the documents n a s i s a r i for emigrating to the United States. The only thing to do is get the hell out, he said. There's nothing to be done here. It's going to be terrible. 
A whole CEO entry up for grabs a house in exchange for a handful of beans 17. A month later, Vichy passed the laws against the Jews. Sylvia fled with her mother to the south of France, first to Marseilles and then to Cagnes-sur-Mer, where she rented a house. As a doctor, Lakin could get sufficient gasoline and enough travel PE remits to cross the demarcation line once every two weeks, and for two years he was able to race back and forth between Paris and Marseilles in his 5 CV Citroën. For getting around in the ISAWARNDPEACE South he bought a bicycle, which he later kept as a memento of the dark days of the war. 18 His decision not to be affected by the course of history did not prevent him from having a very lucid view of politics. Hating as he did anything that resembled fascism, Nazism, or anti-Semitism, he had no illusions about Marshal Paytan's intentions regarding the Jews. That was why, when he found out that Sylvia and her mother had been naive enough to register themselves with the French authorities as Jewish, he rushed to the police station in Cagnes to retrieve the documents in question. Too impatient to wait for them to be handed back, he climbed on a stool, grabbed the file from a shelf, and then, as soon as he got outside, tore to shreds all the papers in it. Point 19 Though he was never a Pitanist, he had little sympathy for the resistance, either. He hated oppression but was scornful of heroism. Two contradictory accounts show his tendency to say different things to different people about this period of his life. With some he denigrated his own attitude, making it out to be uncompromisingly pragmatic, with others he claimed to have thought of J.O. inning the resistance. Catherine Millot remembers him calling certain of its intellectual members irresponsible and saying he himself had had no hesitation about going to the Hotel Muris and FR aternizing with the German officers to get a permit to go and see Sylvia in the unoccupied zone. 2-0 With Daniel Bordigoni he spoke of key TEA different attitude. He was shattered by the OCQ patient, Bordigoni reports Lakens having told him one day, and couldn't make up his mind whether to withdraw and devote himself to study or to J.O. in the underground movement. He was chiefly worried about not being properly recognized in France and contemplated becoming a philosopher. It was Fran Oisto Squells's letter to him about his thesis that put him back on the path of psychoanalysis too. 1. T. Squells had first learned of the Amy case when Lakin's thesis was published, but he started studying it in January 1940 at the St. Alban Hospital, where, in a context of militant antifascism, institutional psychotherapy began. Perhaps you are aware, wrote Esquels, T. Hat many members of the psychic world who were at St. Alban went away with homemade copies of the thesis in question, which was out of print and unobtainable in the bookshops. 22. There is truth in both versions, however. Lakin was undoubtedly shattered by the FALL of France, but he was undoubtedly much more concerned about recognition for his work and for himself than about J.O. inning in the struggle. His hostility toward the occupying power took the FORM, first and FORMist, of aesthetic rebellion, together with an individualistic instinct for survival and for outsmarting the system. Above all he looked out for himself and his nearest and dearest, displaying great ingenuity in the process. But his Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 159 Thesis, still his major work at that time, continued to be interpreted as an act of resistance to psychiatric oppression. And in its own way, through Saint Alban, it helped to encourage the fight against the Nazis. It was in the autumn of 1940 that Lakin and his F.O. Remetter Annalie Sand, Georges Berny, met again in Marseilles. The two men became very good friends and were inseparable for almost two years. To show their dislike of Paytanism, they got into the habit of going several evenings a week to sit on the terrace of the Cintra, a F.A. Mouse bar on the Canebière that at the time acted as a rendezvous for a number of exiled intellectuals. Their Lakin and Bernie displayed a fierce Anglomania, we felt very deeply that England was the world's last hope, and as a result English literature and English thought were the only ones that existed for us 23. Lakin, who had been so greatly influenced by German culture and philosophy, 
had begun to study the English language with René Villarin, a senior official at the Quai d'Orsay, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Though he couldn't actually speak English well, Lakin was an avid reader, and he acquired a copy of For Whom the Bell Tolls FROM one of the last American ships moored in the harbor. As they sat outside the Sintra, he and B. Irenier started translating some of the poems oft. S. Eliot. One evening they decided they must see the King James Version of the Bible, not easy to find in those circumstances. In an attempt to get hold of a copy, Lakin did the rounds of all the Protestant churches in Marseilles. The two enthusiasts had chosen the King James or authorized version of the Bible advisedly. Published in 16U, it retained many of the cadences of the Old Testament's H.E. Brew original. As Julian Green has said F.E.U. English-speaking people, when they read their Bible, remember that they are reading a translation. They love it as sincerely as the Jews love the H.E. Brew text. The translation is an original text in itself. The book has been rewritten rather than translated, and the King James Bible reproduces the spirit of the Hebrew text itself 24. So here was Lakin reading the story of the people of Moses in the language of Shakespeare and in the company of a F. O. Remeter Annalie Sand who was both Jewish and as much of an atheist as Lakin himself. Lakin's Anglophilia included even the wearing of British officers' overcoats, made over by a Thai lore. And it was with a similar aesthetic passion that he openly indulged in every available pleasure, as if to set at naught the general shortages. We used to have black market dinners, says B. Irenier, in a provincial literary restaurant run by a pitanist. Whenever we ran out of cigarettes Lakin would vanish for half an hour or so and come back with for packs of Craven A, two red and two green. He really knew his way around. For instance, one day he noticed Guerlain had some unsold stocks of baby soap, and he managed to supply himself from them throughout the war. As a doctor he had many privileges, and he always made good use of them 25. 160 WAR and PEACE. It was in this same restaurant that Lakin met Gaston Defer, later socialist mayor of Marseilles and government minister, who put B. Irenier up FOR some time. The two FREs also saw Roland Malraux, who was trying to help his brother escape FROM a camp near Sens, where he was being held prisoner. He asked the two FREs FOR help in the FORM of money and civil e and clothing, Lakin didn't give him anything. But a little while later André Malraux got to the Côte d'Azur, where D. Aravi Bussy put her villa at his disposal. Just off the main coast road leading FROM Point Rouge to Lake Ouds there lived an already legendary lady who resembled an eccentric character out of a children's story. Lily, born in 1891, was the daughter of Baron Double de Saint Lambert and in 1918 had married Count Jean Pastun, by whom she had three children, D-O-L-L-Y, Nadia, and Pierre. The Pastors had gone into industry and owned Noily Pratt, the firm that made the aperitif of that name, which had large premises on the Rue Paradis. When she separated FROM her husband, Lily Paster had kept his beautiful house at Mont Redon, and there, FROM 1940 on, she most generously sheltered many painters, musicians, actors, and other artists obliged to emigrate or go into hiding. She was a music lover, a patron of the arts, and a nonconformist and she drove about in her red motor car distributing largess. As well as helping the poor she aided those in spiritual distress, she was sympathetic to every kind of unhappiness. B.E. cause of her the campaign paster, as the Montredon estate was known, became a kind of center for much of the exiled elite of Europe. Among those who came there, some briefly, some for lengthy stays, were Boris Kokno, Jugulov's lover and a habitué of Marie Lord de Noël Salon, Francis Poulenc, Clara Haskell, Lanza del Viesto, Samson Fran OIS, and Yura Guller, a woman pianist of Romanian origin. Point 26 It was out of these encounters that the festival of Ix and Provence was born. The Countess herself played a major part in its FO undaying. As soon as war broke out, her daughter Nadia had J.O. in the surgical ambulance service in Verdun where she met her F.R. Edmond de Charles Rue, 
whose family had traditional links with the pastors. Dolly had a more tragic fate. She was already suffering from melancholia when she married the handsome Prince Murat. He left at once to J.O. in the resistance and was killed in 1944. Dolly never got over this loss and suffered severe depression despite the fact that she had started an analysis with Lakin and been treated with drugs by Jean DeLay. Lakin began to visit the campaign paster in the autumn of 1940, though at first H.E. met with reserve there and was regarded as enigmatic, uncom f erudible, and even diabolica I-27. But Lakin became especially fr endly with Yura Guller and often went to see Andre and Rose Masson, who were Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 1601. Given a house of their own on the Montredon estate when they arrived in Marseilles at the end of 1940. Bernie spent a merry new Year's Eve with them on December 31st. Sylvia was three months pregnant but had not been inactive since arriving on the Mediterranean coast. Together with other FOR mare habitues of the Care de Flore now emigrated to the southern zone, she worked to support her family by the manufacture and sale of preserved fruit, made from scraps of the dates and figs that were still being shipped over FROM Africa. The people concerned FOR met a small company, which was allowed to sell its blackish OBJECTS throughout the region and even in Paris. They were said to taste vaguely like the real thing. Point 28 Toward the end of the summer, Malu had go NE to see Lakin and asked him to break off his affair with Sylvia. Not receiving any positive answer, she gave him a year to make up his mind to come back to her. Point 29 On her way home, she met Rene Lafort getting off the train FROM Paris at the Saint Charles station in Marseilles. He was on his way to his house, Lechevert's, at La Roque Brussene near T. O. Yolan. When he saw how upset she was, he realized she and Lakin had parted and invited her to spend a F. E. W. days at his place in the country. She accepted his invitation. Point 30 When Lakin F. O. U. N. D. out, in October, that Sylvia was expecting a child, he did not hesitate to pass on the good news to Malu. He was delighted at the thought of becoming a F.A. there again and wanted to share his happiness with his lawful wife, regardless of the fact that she herself was eight months pregnant and soon to give birth. She had already been very distressed by his affair with Sylvia, which she had tried in vain to bring to an end. Th's latest crew LTFROM the man she still loved was too much for her, and she sank beneath the humiliation. Lakin then said an amazing thing to her. J. E. V. I. E. Rondre O. Centucli, I'll make it up to you a hundredfold. Sylvain advised Malu to divorce Lakin as soon as possible. On November 26, in a depressed mood that only revealed a state of melancholia she had so far managed to suppress, she gave birth to a daughter, who was named Sibyl. 31. It is probable that Lakin felt something for Malu's sufferings, but as Georges Berni so aptly remarks, he was wonderfully cool in his dealings with women 32. So he went on shuttling to an FRO between Paris and Marseilles, though he was thinking of moving house, it wasn't possible to go on living on the Boulevard Males Herbs. Earlier on, at the beginning of the war and in the middle of the crisis with Malu, he had stayed for a month with Andre Weiss, whose wife, Colette, was a FRIND of the Blondins and whose sister, Jenny Weiss Raudinesco, was to become one of the pioneers of child psychoanalysis in France. Lakin's stay at 130, Rue Faubourg Saint Honor left an unforgettable memory. Andre Weiss's children were brought up. Asterisk tra l slatter note, Weiss Raudinesco married Pierre Aubry in 953, she was the author's mother. 162 War and PCE According to very strict principles and not allowed to speak at the table when guests were present. But Lakin used to break this ridiculous rule and speak to them directly. It made us FEL we mattered. Says Franoise Coe, to have a grown up take an interest in us. He made a great impression on us three. Three it was Georges Baudelaire who solved the practical problem arising FROM the Lakin separation. At the beginning of 1941, he told Lakin an apartment was about to become FREE at 5, Rue de Lille near the flat he himself shared with Denise Rowland. Lakin bought the place immediately and lived there for the rest of his life. 
Malu was granted her divorce on December IS, 194 I. Jacques hadn't bothered to present himself for the conciliation provided for by the law. 34 In the eyes of the Blondin family he had simply disappeared 35. In the course of his trips to Marseilles, he visited not only the campaign past done, but also the network created by Jean Ballard around the review Les Cayas du Sud, the Southern Notebooks, the Cayas, F.O. undated by Marcel Pignol in 1914, had by 1925, under Jean Ballard, become an avant-garde publication specializing in the work of the Surrealists. In 193-3 it opened its columns to German writers fleeing Nazism. Klaus Mann wrote F.O.R. it, as did Ernst Toller and above all Walter Benjamin, together with Pierre Klossowski, brother of the painter Balthus. After 1940 Jean Ballard did all he possibly could to keep the Kayas going. The writing of every issue amounted to a daily struggle against the occupying power, and it was this battle that gave rise to the first use of the expression poet engage, committed poet, point three six and so, in Marseilles, between the campaign past done and the Ballard network, Lakin went on leading a social and intellectual life that was a continuation of his pre-war existence in Paris. He was also able to meet some of the Surrealists who during the winter of 1940-1941 stayed in the Villa Bel Air under the auspices of the Emergency Rescue Committee. These included André B. R. Eaton, Hans B. Eilmer Victor Bronner and René Char. André Masson also went there regularly. In March 1941 Georges B. Irnier thought seriously of emigrating to England. But in order to do so he needed two visas, one for himself and one for his wife. Remembering that he knew an official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs he decided to go to Vichy, where the man now worked. Lakin offered to take him there in his Citroën. They drove to Vichy a first time at an alarming rate and then went again to collect the visas. When they tried to book a room at the Hotel du Mexique they were told to come back after dinner. They were then told to wait in the FOU. On the stroke of midnight Jacques de Oriot himself suddenly appeared at the top of the stairs, flanked by his bodyguards and followed by Henri du Moulin de Labartide, head of Pétain's civilian cabinet. And Lakin and Bernie spent the night. Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 163. There, amid clouds of cigarette smoke, in the room where the marshal's men had held their meeting. 37 Bernie stayed on in Marseilles until the end of the year. Then he went to the United States, leaving their FOR England, where he worked on war propaganda FOR the Psychological Warfare Board. He stayed in England until September 1944 and then returned to Paris, where in 1955 he started the Revue Loi. Just as Bernie was getting his exit visas, Rose and André Masson were leaving France for the United States. André Breton had gone there a week earlier. As soon as the Massons got to Nui ORK they started doing all they could to bring Sylvia and Lawrence to America. They were still hoping for their arrival on December 2, 1, 1941. But in vain, Sylvia had decided to stay in France. 38 On July 3 of that year, during the darkest days of the occupation, she gave birth to a daughter named Judith Sophie, registered at the city hall in Antibes under the name of Boudelie. For although Sylvia had been amicably separated from Boudelie in 1934, she had remained legally married to him, while he at the time was officially the partner of Colette Peinot. After Colette died in 1938, Boudelie lived with Denise Rowland. But if his marriage to Sylvia no longer had any social meaning, it was still legally valid. Lakin, for his part, was still the lawful husband of a woman with whom he no longer really lived but from whom, unlike Budley, he had never been offi chaley separated. Attached as he was to a traditional family ideal that he violently rejected though he had written an apologia on it for the encyclopedia Lakin continued with Malu in a relationship based on ambiguity and things left unspoken. He had never clearly decided on any separation, and he did not initiate the break. Sylvia, for her part, couldn't apply for any kind of legal separation while she knew she was carrying Lakin's child. 
if she had asked for a divorce during the winter of 1940 to 1941, she would have lost the protection that at the time still derived from being married to a non-Jew. Whence the complicated situation that arose in July 1941, the newborn child was biologically Lakin's daughter but could not possibly bear her father's name. He was still married to Malu and under French law was not allowed to recognize a child born to any other woman. So it was Georges Baudelaire who gave his name to Lakin and Sylvia's child. There was an absurd discrepancy between the legal order, which made a child bear the name of a man who was not her father, and everyday reality, in which she was the daughter of a man whose name she could not bear. There can be no doubt that one of the origins of Lakin's theory of the name of the father, a key element in his teaching, lay in this imbroglio, lived through in the midst of war and destruction. 164 War A N D P E A C E. Lakin still went on crossing France C E F R O M north to south after B. E. Renier's departure to the United States. When the big deportations began in the spring of 1942, Simone Kahn's parents were denounced to the Gestapo by their concierge. When Cano asked Lakin to help find a place where they could hide, he got them into a clinic INVER sales. The price was exorbitant, but when Simone protested, Lakin replied sharply, they're a couple of bourgeois they can pay. 39 By the beginning of 1943 the situation was getting more and more dangerous for the Jews who had taken refuge in what was for merely the southern zone, now occupied by the German army. George Isbudeli, who was living in Veselay, suggested to Jacques and Sylvia that they, together with Lawrence and Judith, should J.O. in him in a house he had rented for them in the cathedral square. In the end, only his daughter, Lawrence, went. But when Baudelaire and Denise Roland parted after he met Diana Kotchubi, he suggested Lakin should rent the apartment at 3, Rue de Lille, and this made it possible for Sylvia to go and live there with Lawrence Judith and Natalie Makels.40 and so Lakin returned to the left bank of the Seine, where H.E. had spent his youth as a pupil at the college Stanislas. By making the district F a board by the literary intelligentsia the setting of his new Livy with Sylvia, Lakin was breaking with Parisian psychoanalytic tradition. Most of the pioneers of the movement had got into the habit of S.E. telling in the elegant 16th arrondissement, and at the beginning of his career Lakin had done the same. Analysts received their patients in luxurious apartments modeled on those of the medical bourgeoisie and large enough to contain on the one hand both a consulting and a waiting room and on the other enough PRI VAT space to accommodate a family and servants. The decorations often included collections of valuable OBJECTS, paintings, rare books, oriental carpets, Dresden china, and Chinese ceramics. A passion for collecting was the only one of the middle-class habits and tastes that Lakin retained. H.E. often visited antique dealers, and he bought many pictures from painters who were Sylvia's frens, Picasso, Balthus, and of course Masson. Though Lakin didn't have André Breton's expert for works of art, he did have a great thirst for possession. 4. 1. Meanwhile the Blondins were dealt a crushing blow by the death of Sylvain's brother-in-law, Jacques de Ecour, whose real name was D. A. Neil de Cordemanche. A communist and writer with a degree in German, he co-founded with Jean Paul Hahn the journal Les Lettres Faranaises, French literature. De Cour was arrested at the same time as Georges Solomon and Georges Pollitzer, and on May 30, 1942, after being savagely tortured, he was shot by the Nazis. Aragon described him as a young man with fine features, a pale complexion, and thin, mocking lips, who but for the powdered hair was just like an 18th century pastel portrait by La Tour. Yetwe. Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 165. No, he reacted to all the traps setby the judges, all the physical sufferings inflicted on him by asking if they hadn't nearly finished, because he was guilty of all he was accused of. But that wasn't what the Gestapo wanted. They were waiting for names and addresses. But those thin, mocking lips did not reveal them. Sibyl still remembers how, and in what grave and fe-ealing tones, Malu, long after the war, 
used to read out to her three children the last letter Jacques de Cour ever wrote to his family. Point 42 in Lacan's new neighborhood in Paris, literary life still went on. Adrienne Monnier, in her bookshop in the Rue de 10 Dion, saw the arrival of a new generation of young intellectuals. Above all they loved American music and literature, but they also admired the early books of such still relatively unknown writers as Sartre, Camus, and Malraux. In the winter of 1941-1942, in the Café de Flore, where collaborators rubbed shoulders with members of the resistance, Simone de Beauvoir, as yet unpublished, got into the habit of arriving as soon as the doors opened so as to get a seat near the stove. She was reading the phenomenology of mind in order to help Sartre with Vietri tie neant, being and nothingness. Before 1939 those who didn't read German had known Hegel's work only through the commentaries of Kojiv, Kohr, and Wall. But in 1939 volume 1 of the first French translation of Hegel's Phenomenology was published, F. Olode in 194 1 by volume 2. It was the work of Jean Hippolyte, a young philosopher who thereby opened up a new era of Hegelianism in France. By a strange quirk of historical logic, Hegel finished his phenomenology just as the French army was bringing a breath off our Edom to Jena, while Hippolyte finished his translation of the same work just as the Nazis were invading France to impose dictatorship and slavery. 43 On October 25, 1942, Giacometti introduced Sartre to Leary's. Simone de Beauvoir has painted a striking portrait of Leary's in La Force de L.H., The Prime Civ Life What with his shaven skull and formal clothes and stiff guest tours ifound Leary's a somewhat intimidating character, despite the calculatedly cordial smile he switched on. His particular blend of masochism, extremism, and idealism had led him into heaven knows how many painful and preposterous scrapes, all of which he related with an air of mildly astounded impartiality 44. As they started to mix with all the veterans of surrealism, Sartre, and Beauvoir, who had a very grand idea of that brilliant generation of writers, F.E.L.T. they were meeting men already the heroes of an intellectual adventure that they themselves dreamed of taking over. Simone embarked on intimate relationships first with Z, then with Leary's, but she never shared in the F.A. Mao's genealogical secret known only to the F.A. Millie circle linking Picasso, Masson, Baudelaire, and Lacan. Leary's never F.E.L.T. up to J.O. inning the Musée de Iom, Museum of Mankind, resistance network led by Anatole Lewitsky and Boris Vilda, but 166 war A and DPCE. He knew about their activities. When they were executed at Mont Valerian on February 23, 1942 it was a terrible blow to him, and F.O.R. months he was haunted by their memory. As his decision not to fight arose F.R.O.M. the realization that he lacked physical courage, he set out on a course of moral opposition, writing only F.O.R. reviews that supported the resistance. He produced only one book, Ode Mal, Epilepsy, literally, G. Reader Evil, Point four s at the beginning of the occupation he f.e.l.l. out for a while with his f.r.e.n. Georges Baudelaire, who had had the unfortunate idea of starting an apolitical review produced by the Young France Group and financed by the Vichy government under Georges Pullerson. Pullerson suggested the editor should be Maurice Blancot, a writer f.r.o.m. the Mauricean right who since 1936 had been writing anti-Semitic and anti-parliamentary articles against Bloom and the Popular Front in Combat and Ellen Surge. 46. The review never materialized, but Baudelaire did meet Blancot and gathered several members of the Young France group around him at 3, Rue de Lille. According to Michel Surya, B. A. Taya was responsible for Blancot's ideological turnaround during the occupation. Baudelaire did not contemplate J.O. inning in the anti-Nazi struggle, and between 194-1 and 1944, under a pseudonym, he published a number of books, including Madame Edwarda and L. Experience Interur, Inner Experience. His political attitude was different from that of Leary's, and the distinction between them had been evident ever since the days of the College de Sociologie. Leary's believed science was a much greater liberating FORCE than the holy and was skeptical about the FAR-fetched practices of the conspirators. 
he thought they lacked rigor and were out of place in a Western democracy. In short, Learys was not such a convinced nihilist as Baudelaire and didn't share his hostility to bourgeois parliamentarianism. Nor had he ever been at all attracted by fascism, not even in order to turn its efficiency back on itself. So the two men's attitudes to the war were bound to be different. Learys believed in heroism and in the fight for Edom, whereas Baudelaire, an ultra-leftist, rejected science so totally that he wanted to abolish all thinkers as representing Western reason itself. Thus Baudelaire saw the coming of war as an end of history, the latter embodied in the Hitler of the Blitzkrieg instead of in Kojiv Stalin. Hence the need to pay tribute to evil, not through any sort of collaboration but through an inner recourse to a dark kind of mysticism, in which Madame E. D. Warda, symbolizing an unclean, prostituted France, displayed her rags and wounds in a brothel in the Rue Saint Denis, while taking herself for God. When they met Louise and Michel Lyrie V, Sartre and Beauvoir, who were thoroughly hostile to Nazism and Patanism, were publishing articles not only in such organs of the resistance as Les Cayas du Sud and Les Lettres fr and Phases but also in more dubious places, such as the Revue Como Edia, which Marseilles, Vichy, Paris 167. In order to remain entirely cultural and apolitical refused to accept contributions from either Jews or the more committed anti-fascists. For Sartre and Beauvoir, Commitment went no f further than their activities in the group Socialisme et Liberté, Socialism and Freedom, with Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Dominique and Jean Toa Saint D. E. Santi, i.e., distributing leaflets, holding meetings, carrying out clandestine missions, and so on. There was also an interview with Jean Cavalils, which ended inconclusively, and a meeting with Malraux at Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. All Malraux believed in then was the firepower of Russian tanks and the American Air FORCE. 47 in June 1943, with the approval of the clandestine Lettres J. Ran phases, Sartre arranged FOR Charles Dolan to put on the flies, a play he had written at the same time as Being and Nothingness. In it he denounced very plainly the apologetics of the Vichy regime and came out in moral support of those who committed violent deeds in the name of a certain idea of freedom specifically, a conception that made the terrorist hero F.E.L. so responsible for his actions that he felt remorse and was tempted to denounce himself. Although the play had been censored by the Germans before it could be performed at the Theatre Sarah Bernhardt, renamed Theatre de la Cite to sound more Orion, the collaborationist press gave it a harsh reception. Nauseating, they called it, Cubist and Dadaist Brick a Brack. It soon closed. But when it was revived in December 1943, Michel Leary's wrote an excellent article on it in Les Lettres J. Ran Phases, Orestes, once the victim of FATE, has become the champion of FR Edom. If he kills, he does so no longer because he is impelled by obscure FORSes but in FULL knowledge of the FACTS and to ensure that justice is done. And through that deliberate decision he finally exists as a man. 48 So Sartre was not, as his detractors allege, an Arabist maneuvering under the Nazi heel. And if he did not have the heroism of Cavils, Cangillum, Decour, or Pulitzer, if he submitted to German censorship when publishing his books and having his play Perfor met in an Aryanized theater, he wrote nothing during this period that did not support the fight against oppression. It was at the dress rehearsal of the flies that Sartre met Albert Camus, AFEW months after he had written an article for Les Cayas du Sud on Camus et l'Etranger, The Stranger, published at the end of the summer of 1942. Before long Sartre, Leary's, Camus, and Beauvoir were seeing one another regularly, and Leary's introduced Sartre to Cano. These meetings took up a good deal of our time, wrote Beauvoir. We listened to the BBC, and passed on the news bulletins, and discussed them. We agreed to remain leagued together in perpetuity against the systems and men and ideas that we condemned. But their defeat was imminent, and our task would be to escape the FU tour that would then unfold before us. We were to provide the post-war era with its ideology 49. 168 War A N D P E A C E. When the Allied victory seemed near, Sartre, Camus, 
and Merleau-Ponty thought seriously of starting a review that would blossom in a frank set freefrom fascism. Georges Baudelaire was OFTN with them, and he became closer to Sartre after the latter wrote an article on L Experience Interur, Inner Experience, in which he described the author as a new mystic and someone H hallucinated by the world beyond so. Sartre's commentary was concise, severe, and ironical, but not devoid of admiration. Sartre made Baudelaire out to be sick, bereaved, and inconsolable but able to survive the death of God. Because of his mauvaise foi, bad faith, Sartre consigned him to the couch not of Freud or Adler or Jung but of someone who practiced the existentialist psychoanalysis Sartre advocated in being and nothingness. Still, Sartre did recognize Baudelaire as a genuine heir of Pascal and Nietzsche, though he reproached him for preferring brief pantheistic ecstasies to political and historical time. In short, Sartre's Baudelaire was a whole and corner Christian whom Sartre confronted with a new humanism off our Edom. The pleasures to which M. Baudelaire invites us, if they can only refer back to themselves, if they cannot enter into the framework of new ventures and help to FORM a new humanity that will surpass itself in search of new goals, are worth no more than the pleasure of drinking a glass of spirits or sunning oneself on a beach. S. L. Sartre and Baudelaire drank a few glasses of spirits together during the first three months of 1944, meeting either at Leary's or at Marcel Moore's place and talking sometimes about sin and sometimes about philosophy. One evening they danced FACE to FACE, vying with each other in absurdity. The third party was a figure made from a horse's skull and a huge mauve and yellow striped dressing gown. S2. In the spring of 1944 Lakin, now an established member of the circle around Leary's and Baudelaire, was invited to meet Sartre, Beauvoir, and Camus for the first time. The encounter took place on March 19 in Leary's apartment, when a public reading was given of a play Picasso had written in January 1941. L.E. Desir Atra P.E.P.A.R. Lock U, Desire Caught by the Tail, echoed the grand surrealist style of the 20s and revolved around the F.A. entities arising from the F.O.O.D. shortages of the occupation. Camus was master of ceremonies and banged on the floor with a stick to indicate scene changes. Leary's played the part of Gropide, Bigfoot, and Sartre was bout round, round end. Beauvoir was the cousin. Dora Mar, Picasso's partner, played Anguas Grasse, Fat Anguish, and Zany Campen, a young actress married to the publisher Jean Aubier, was the tart. The appreciative audience included Baudelaire, Armand Salacro, Georges Limber, Sylvia Baudelaire, Jean Louis Barault, Brock, and all Sartre's entourage. Two days later Brassel got all T. He main actors and members of the audience back together F.O.R.A. Photograph. S3 The F.R.E.N.S. kept the party going until the small hours. Marseilles, Vichy, Paris I-69. Moulaudji sang Les Petits Paves, The Cobblestones, Sartre sang J.A.I. Vendumont A. Modiable, I've Sold My Soul to the Devil. Paris was one big pre winner of, War Camp. Beauvoir wrote, de rinking and talking together in the dark was so furative a pleasure it felt illicit. It was a sort of clandestine happiness. She observed Lakin at some length that evening and was impressed by his energy and flow of ideas but too overawed to do more than utter an occasional platitude inspired by alcohol 54. Zany Campen, who had already seen Lakin in Louise Leary's art gallery and greatly admired Sylvia as an actress, thought the two made a comical couple. She didn't look her age and seemed more like his daughter than his partner. One sensed he had the mind of a mischievous inquisitor and a creative power that was going to bowl everyone over 55. Picasso gave everyone involved in the performance an original copy of the play printed on handmade paper. The next day, despite his nocturnal efforts, Leary's attended a memorial service in the Eglise St. Rock in honor of Max Jacob, who had been killed by the Nazis. While everyone in France was eagerly awaiting the Allied victory, many of those who had been deported to Germany were being exterminated. After the Picasso performance the various participants threw other P.A.R. ties or fiestas. Everyone was looking for a new way of living, a reason for hope, 
as they waited for the promised but ever postponed Allied landing. The festivities produced their own actors, playwrights, acrobats, and spectators. One evening Dora Mar mimed a bullfight while Sartre conducted an orchestra, Limber carved a ham, and Budali and Kano F.O. Ughite a duel with bottles. Lakin and J.O. yet himself with the rest, but Leary's, Budali and Kano, though they had known him a long time by now and went on seeing him all their lives, did not read what he wrote, or if they did they never mentioned it in their own writings. It was the same with Kojeev and Kaur, though F.O.R. Lakin their teaching remained an inexhaustible source of inspiration. In all the group he began to mix with at the end of the occupation, only Beauvoir and Merleau-Ponty were sometimes to read him with interest. In I-948, when she was working on the book about women that was to become the second sex, Beauvoir came across Lakin's paper on the family and studied it at length. She became so interested in the psychoanalytic movement's internal quarrels about F.E. male sexuality that she telephoned Lakin to ask his advice on how she should deal with the question. He was flattered and replied that they would need to talk for five or six months in order to sort out the problem. Beauvoir already had plenty of material for her book and didn't fel like spending all that time listening to Lakin, so she suggested they might make do with for interviews. He declined. 56 As for Merleau-Ponty, his important intellectual relationship with Lakin had a 170 W A R A N D P E A C E. F. Emily Aspect 2, Sylvia and Merlo Ponti's wife, Suzanne, became F. R. Eans, and Judith, and Marianne Merlo Ponti of T. and spent their vacations together. Even before the war, the F. A. C. T. that Lakin moved in intellectual circles had brought him a certain amount of notoriety and a small private clientele which included the singer Marianne Oswald, Dolly Paster, and her nephew Jean Frañoz, Dora Marr, and a number of others. He was also Pablo Picasso's P.E. Arsenal Dr. Y. but up till 1947 or so he was seldom asked to do training analyses. Not only was he not yet regarded in psychoanalytic circles as an authority, but among the second generation he was outshone by Sasha Nacht, who enjoyed a certain amount of prestige because he had met Freud and whose qualifications were more in keeping with the standards of the 1PA. But after 1948 to 1949 the situation altered in Lakin's favor as the third generation of French psychoanalysts became increasingly attracted by his teaching. After that he worked full-time as a private psychoanalyst. In October 1944 Georges Berny returned to Paris and went to stay at five, Rue de Lille. Sylvia and Judith were living there then. Bernie took part in some of the fiestas. Having lived in the English-speaking world, he had become a fervent advocate of parliamentary democracy, and one day he asked Lakin and his entourage if they ever by any chance voted. The result was general stupefaction, roars of laughter, and a chorus of no's. B. Irenier resumed his analysis for two years. Lakin's technique had nt altered, and the length of the sessions was still the same. He was very good at keeping friendship and treatment separate from one another, and I regard the analysis as successful. It taught me to stop believing the moon is made of green cheese and to manage my life better. But something had changed. Bernie was struck by the mannered style of speaking and dressing that had succeeded Lakin's for dandyism and was already verging on obsession. He had first-hand experience of it in 1946. One day, when he was outside a books hop in the Rue de Saints Paris, Bernie felt a tap on the shoulder, it was Lakin, out fora drive. Bernie got in beside his friend. Lakin was very worked up, he was hunting fora special kind of black doskin to have made into a pair of evening shoes to go with a particularly sumptuous suit. Buntings, the F.A. Mao's London shoemakers where Lakin had his shoes made to measure, had asked him to look in the leather shops in the Rue de la Montagne St. Genevieve F.O.R. the necessary material. We spent a couple of hours searching, Bernie remembers, before he F.O.U.N.D. what he wanted 58. 1.5. T.H.O.U.G.H.T.S.O. and Human Freedom. T.X. Lakin didn't publish a single line while the war lasted, and by the J time it ended he had become another man. His life, 
his habit s, his frenes, all had ch and yet there was a definite continuity between the ideas that preoccupied him during the College of Sociology period and those that presented themselves to him after the liberation. At both times they were concerned with the relationship between the individual and society. Like Budeli, Lakin had needed to find out how fascism managed to harness human aspiration in the service of evil. Unlike Budeli, he could never believe that the fantastic weapons fascism made use of could be turned in the opposite direction. But FROMI 936 onward he was always reflecting on the nature of the inner identifications governing the organization of human groups in general. In so doing he was not only asking the same questions as Budeli, he was also entering the same territory as Freud when he dealt with group psychology. Lakin's article on the F.A. Milley had already made many references to these questions, so it isn't surprising to find him still struggling in I-945 with problems concerning the essence of the social bond. But now, instead of seeing them in terms of the crucible of the family, he approached E.D. them F.R.O.M. the point of view of Freudian group psychology. And like Freud, Lakin, when he wanted to analyze a group, chose the army as his example. We know FROM his correspondence with Sylvain Blond in what Lakin thought about military psychiatry as practiced during his service in Val de Grace Hospital. For him it was a completely negative experience, and he couldn't find words harsh enough to castigate the self-appointed elites of the French psychiatric establishment, whom he blamed for making the debacle of the French army even worse than it might otherwise have been. In particular he criticized the inadequacy of their selection procedure s, which led them to recommend completely unsuitable men for service as 172-WARANDPEACE Officers at the front. But though Lakin was very clear sighted about such negligence and condemned it very severely, he never made any protest. He had been called up as an auxiliary doctor, and he simply obeyed orders. He supplied diagnoses and opinions and carried out examinations in accordance with the rules imposed by his superiors. I in that position he felt quite at home and was even pleased to be appreciated by the very mandarins he criticized so severely. One with Lakin things were never simple. He often disparaged people whose recognition he sought and mocked at values he secretly admired. He had been very pro-English in 1940 and became even more so when in September 1945 he spent five weeks in England visiting the Hartfield Rehabilitation Center FOR returned ex-prisoners of war and overseas veterans. Back in France, in the presence of some guests FROM London, he gave a lecture to the Evolution Psychiatrique, Developments in Psychiatry, group in which he praised England's heroism during the war the courage of her people rests on a true relationship with reality that is often misunderstood because of her utilitarian ideology. In particular, this relationship is completely misrepresented by the word adaptation, even the noble term realism is ruled out, because of its base misuse by the same tea-reacherous clerks whose profanation of the word has long deprived mankind of the values they insulted to. The reference to Julian Benda's 1927 book La Trahison de Dirks, The Tree Son of the Clerks, i.e., the betrayal of both themselves and society by writ ERS, artists and thinkers who abandoned their effort or independence in politics, allowed Lakin once again to criticize the French intellectual elite to which he always wanted to belong. But the eulogy of English utilitarianism revealed a theory about the social bond and the relationship of the individual to truth that was going to be the mainspring of Lakin's thinking in the early post-war years. It was also to be found in his article Logical Time and the Assertion of Anticipated Certainty and in the paper on psychological causality that he read at the colloquium held in Bonneville in 1946. Three in 1939 English P.S. psychiatrists had decided to make use of slowpokes, shirkers, dullards, and delinquents by assigning them to various tasks in the rear. Without actually segregating them, they separated M. Isfits F.R.O.M. ordinary fighting men so as to spare the latter the neurotic shock of contact with disturbing elements. The misfits themselves improved as a result of being regarded as Yosef U.L. and F. functioning as independent subgroups. Each subgroup chose and worked toward its own goal, 
supervised by a therapist who supported everyone without acting either as leader or authoritarian f either. Lakin, praising this utilitarian classification of the maladjusted, claimed that the ability to reshape human relationships in time of war was made possible by English psychiatry's general assimilation of Freudian ideas. The British Thoughts on Human Freedom 173 Experiment, he added, invalidated the doctrine of constitutions that he himself had criticized as early as 1932, as well as testifying to the decline of the paternal imago, noted by him in his article on the family. And indeed, if organizing people in small groups implies their identification with the ego ideal of the therapist, it leaves no room for the strong leader, recruiting sergeant, or rabble rouser. Lakin was referring here to the work of John Rickman and Wilf R. Ed Byan, which he had come across in articles in the British Medical Review The Lancet in 1943. Rickman and Byan had carried out a conclusive wartime experiment in the mental hospital at Northfield, near Birmingham. Byan, born in India in 1897, had become a Cleonian after a distinguished medical career. And it was with Rickman, who had been analyzed FLRST by Ferenczi and then by Melanie Klein, that he did his training analysis during the war. With this eulogy of Freudianism's conquest of English psychiatry, Lakin was approaching the London psychoanalytic movement via the school of Melanie Klein, though her advocates and those of Anna Freud were still locked in controversy. But at the same time he was suggesting a revision of the Freudian theory of group psychology that allowed him to combine his own conception of the family with an approach to human communities based on the idea of the group. When in 1921 Freud published Mass in Psychology und ich Analyse, g Rope Psychology and the Analysis of the EGO, he distinguished between groups with and groups without a ringleader. He took as examples two organized groups that have survived through time, the church and the army. According to him, both were structured around two axes, a vertical axis stemming from the relationship between the group and the leader and a horizontal axis involving the relationships among the individuals of which the group is composed. Point four in the first case, the individuals identify with an object, the leader, that replaces their own ego ideal, in the second case, they identify, at the level of the ego, with one another. Of course Freud thought of the POS ability that the place of the leader might be filled not by a real man but by an idea or an abstraction, God, for example. And he referred to the communist experiment to show that the socialist bond, replacing the religious one, might lead to the same intolerance of outsiders as in the days of the wars of religion. In Freud's theory of identification the vertical axis was the more important of the two, and the horizontal axis depended on it. Identification with the father, with the leader, or with an idea came before the relationship among members of the same group. The 1921 text represented a fun mental break with all previous sociological and psychological arguments, which were based on the idea that suggestion or hypnosis, not identification, was behind the fascination that existed between groups and their leaders. 174 WARANDPEACE during the 30s, Freud's new theory served to explain the political functioning of a schism. I and France, Bertoli made considerable use of it when, with Allende, Borel, Schiff, and others, he fo undade the Societe de Psychologie Collective, Group Psychology Society. F. Freud suggests a conceptual FRM work, says Michel Payon that makes it possible to begin thinking about questions on the F.O. formulation of which the century's sociology, history, and political philosophy, F.O. getting both Machiavelli and La Boetie, are still far from being able to embark. 5. Everyone who adopted the new hypothesis thought it provided an advance explanation of fascism. They did nt understand that in 1921 Freud himself was thinking of communism as the ideology likely to take the place left empty by religion. When Lakin began thinking about the vertical axis and shifted it in the direction of the F.A. Mali, he at first put F.O. Ruard the idea that modern Western society of the democratic type was organized around the inevitable decline of the paternal imago. And he was struck by the FACT that fascism combined a caricatured rehabilitation of that imago, in the FORM of idolization of the symbols of leadership, 
and a kind of martial egalitarianism among the MEM bears of the tribe, all F.A. natical worshippers of an idea in the service of the death wish. But seven years later Lakin's study trip to England showed him Freud's idea needed overhauling. If English wartime psychiatry had succeeded in integrating all the misfits, first through a method of detecting personality F.A.ters based exclusively on psychogenesis and then through the successful experiment of leaderless groups based on the theories of Bion, this meant Freud had paid too much attention to vertical and too little attention to horizontal identification. So it was necessary, not to reverse Freud's model, but to work out a social bond where the horizontal axis was no longer dictated by the vertical one. In other words, Lakin, on the basis of a field study, was showing implicitly that Freud had still relied to some extent on a conception of group psychology based on L.E. Bone, even though his whole theory of identification was constructed in opposition to the tradition that saw hypnosis or suggestion as the only factor creating the social bond between groups and their leaders. In particular, Freud had retained the principle of a dominant vertical axis, i.e. the effusion of the leader in the organization of the group. Because of this, his theory of power might apply only to closed and unchanging groups and not to the ordinary effunctioning of politics in modern democratic societies. Point six, like all the men of his generation, Lakin noticed that Freud's theory lent itself very well to the analysis of a schism. But he also saw that it was necessary to take into account the idea of the decline of the paternal imago in order to understand on the one hand the evolution of the F.A. Mali in industrial societies and on the other hand the omnipotence attributed to the Thou G.H.T.S. on Human Freedom 175. Leader in Nazism. And the English experiment had shown him retrospectively how right he had been. During his visit he had seen that a theory of the power of the group without a leader, based on the predominance of the horizontal axis, was better than a theory of the power of the leader over the group, based on the superiority of the vertical axis. Bion's thesis not only made it possible to integrate delinquents into society more satisfactorily, it also helped make them frer and more efficient than a doctrine based on disciplined obedience to a warrior chief. Thus in I-945 Lakin was praising the English democratic system for having incorporated Freudian theory into its way of thinking and then having used it as a weapon against fascism. Opting for Bayan over Freud but also for Freud as revised by Bayan, Lakin proposed to modify Freud's theory of identification by setting aside the old theories of suggestion and adducing a better analysis of modern democratic societies but it is worth noting in passing that this did not lead him to commit himself to any particular political system. Lakin's latest revision of Freudian doctrine succeeded his similar pre-war overhaul in the light of Hegelian philosophy. And it was not by chance that Lakin now reaffirmed the absolute necessity of ridding psychiatry once and for all of any kind of organicism, his modification of Freud's theory of the primacy of the vertical axis went hand in hand with the acceptance of an exclusively psychogenetic conception of human P.E. arsenality. For if any notions of constitutionalism, race, heredity, and instinct are retained, man is made so dependent on his biological heritage that he must be seen as subject from time immemorial to an inescapable alienation linked to the origins of the world itself. This is why, at the Bonneville Colloquium in I-946, Lakin was so critical of the organodynamism of his fr and Henry E.Y., though both men were engaged in the fight against constitutionalism. In Lakin's view, organodynamism was still too organicist an approach to mental illness to be retained within the FRM work of his new schema, which put F. O. Ruard's psychological causality as the one and only origin of human madness. Point seven. This attitude also led Lakin to observe F. O. R. the first time that Claire Ambled had been his only master in the observation of patients. He thus acknowledged retrospectively his debt to the great representative of constitutionalism whose teaching he had set aside in I 932 in F. A. Vore of the more dynamic doctrine of Claude. It was to the latter that Lakin owed his structural and psychogenetic conception of madness, which in Clarambled was obscured by the oft-proclaimed belief in the doctrine of constitutions. But the revision of I-945 also made Lakin abandon what still remained of Mora's in his own thinking. 
he now chose democratic utilitarianism in the English manner in preference to French-style positivist F. Emilialism, the community group made up of FREE individuals rather than the F. Ormative crucible based on links with the land. So, at the dawn of a new era, he saw 176 WARANDPEACE himself as the spokesperson of a unitary conception of both anthropology and a science of man. He was convinced that what was true would always be new, you have heard me speak with pleasure of the roles played by Descartes and Hegel in the search for truth. It is fashionable nowadays to go beyond the classical philosophers. I might just as aptly have started with the excellent dialogue with Parmenides. For neither Socrates nor Descartes, Marx, nor Freud can be e.g. one be beyond, insofar as they carried out their researches with the single-minded passion that aims at discovering the truth aid. In the same year as his visit to England, Lacan made use of a sophism to illustrate his revision of Freudian theory. A prison warden summons three convicts before him and suggests that whichever of them can pass a certain test shall be set fre. Here are five discs, he says, three white and two black. I shall fix one of these discs on each of your backs without telling you which color I select. Yo, you are not allowed to speak or to use a mirror, but you can look at one another. The first one to guess the color of the disc he is wearing can go fre providing he can explain how he arrived at his conclusion. The prisoners agree to take the test, and the governor puts a white disc on each of their backs. After looking briefly at one another, they all leave the prison yard together. Each one, by the same argument, has realized that he was wearing a white disc. Lakin had come across this sophism one evening in 1935 at Sylvain Blondin's apartment. It was there that he first met Andre Weiss, who told him about the puzzle without revealing the solution. Lakin lay awake trying to find the answer. At three in the morning he phoned Weiss, who told him the answer, though he was f furious at being woken up in the small hours. Point nine. There were three possible alternatives, I, if prisoner A sees two blacks, on B and C, he deduces that he is white and leaves immediately. 2. If A sees one black and one white, he argues, if I were C, who is white, and saw two blacks, A and B, I would leave. As C hasn't left, I deduce that I am white, and I leave. 3. If A sees two whites, he argues, I if I were black, B and C would both see a black and a white. Each of them says to himself, if I am black, the other who is white, B or C, sees two blacks. They would then deduce that they were white, and leave. But as they haven't done so, I deduce that I, A, am white. All three prisoners use this third argument simultaneously, and all give the same reasons for leaving. Lakin had tried out the puzzle of the disc several times on his FREs at the College of Sociology. At the Liberation, Christian Zervos, who had started Lakaya's D-Art, Art Notebooks, in 1926, decided to celebrate the victory of freedom over oppression by bringing out a special retrospective number covering the period of the war. He asked Lakin, whom he had met. Thoughts on Human Freedom 177 Through Andre Masson, FORA contribution, and so it was that Logical Time and the Assertion of Anticipated Certainty was published. In it Lakin announced that he was writing an essay on group logic which never saw the light of day and started by launching an attack on Sartre's conception of our Edom as he had J.U.S.T. expressed it in Hughes' Clause, variously translated as No Exit, in Camera and V.I.C.I.R.C.L.E., first performed at the Theatre du Vieux Colombier on May 27, 1944. We are not one of those recent philosophers, wrote Lakin, for whom confinement within F.O. or walls is but another expedient F.O. are attaining the ultimate in F.R. Edom. T.O. Yet the situation described in his sophism did resemble that in Sartre's play, which was originally called Les Autres, others. On the one hand there was the story of three men who all succeed in F.R.E.ing themselves through a correct process of reasoning, while on the other there were T.H. re-characters, three D.E.A.D. consciousnesses, imprisoned F.O. Rever between F.O. or walls because they had all condemned themselves never to break their chains. 
In Hughes Claus Sartre expressed the same theory of Fredom as in Bay NG and Nothingness and the series of novels generally entitled Les Cheminess de la Liberté, The Road to Freedom Freedom is the stake being played for in a dialectical battle between the opposing forces of alienation and existential intentionality. It does not therefore possess the simple certainty of something an individual can opt for on his own responsibility. But it is the finest manifestation of a philosophy of consciousness, though we must realize this consciousness is the site of mental processes concealed from the individual himself by the deceptive screen of bad faith. Sartre had invented this expression to replace the Freudian notion of the unconscious, which he regarded as too biological and mechanistic. Bad faith combines with consciousness to produce a pathology of ambivalence in which the sub-ject is forced to unite in one act an idea and its negation, transcendence, and artifice. In this context, Sartre rejected so-called empirical psychoanalysis, Freud's, in favor of existential psychoanalysis. He accused the FORM of repudiating dialectics and neglecting the essence of freedom in order to stress the individual's early effectivity dash the blank slate before the store why, he saw the latter as capable of abolishing the unconscious and asserting that nothing exists until the first stirrings of FREDOM. Lakin's objections to all this are plain. Not only is man not FRE to choose his own F eaters there are no first stirrings of FRE but in order to be FRE he is doomed to become part of the community of men, via a process of logical thought. In other words, only belonging, in terms of the horizontal axis described by Freud, can relate the individual subject to others, and only the power of logic can lead man to truth, i.e to acceptance of the other in a dialectic of recognition and non-recognition. A.F. Terhusurl there. 178-W-A-R-A-N-D-P-E-A-C-E. -E. F.O.R.E., and against Sartre, Lakin stood for a philosophy of concepts, into which he tried to incorporate a non subjective philosophy of the sub-J-E-C-T or, as he put it, an existential intermination of the I. 1-2 In so doing he made all human fredom dependent on a temporal event, to each individual comes a temps por comprendra, time for comprehending, in the light of which he can make a logical decision. Looking back on the three alternatives in the puzzle of the prisoners, it is clear that the first argument proceeds in terms of logical exclusion. The time for comprehending is reduced here to a simple observation, B and C are black. In the second alternative, a time for comprehending must come before the moment de conc lure, moment of concluding, A has to put himself in C's place and make a deduction. The third alternative is more tricky, because A has to make a deduction in two stages, as have B and C. To begin with he supposes he is black and puts himself in B's place, attributing a deduction to C and vice versa. As all three prisoners argue in the same way, they all help to hasten both their conclusion and their departure. The time for comprehending coincides with the moment of concluding, which merges into the I instant du regard, instant of the glance. Each of the pre-oneers realizes he is white not through seeing the others leave but through seeing them hesitating to leave. Lakin uses the phrase assertion de certitude anticipi, assertion of anticipated certainty, to describe the process of anticipation that characterizes the phenomenon of true decision and makes this phenomenon the condition of human fredom. By choosing, in contradistinction to Sartre's existentialism, a theory of human fredom based on a logic of truth that excluded subjective consciousness, Lakin, who hadn't been a member of the resistance and would never try to make the actions of his private life accord with his system of thought, was unwittingly paying tribute to the heroism of Jean Cavales. Cavales's mathematical philosophy, George's Cangillum wrote later, was not constructed with reference to a sub-JECT who might be briefly and precariously identified with Jean Cavales. It was a philosophy FROM which Jean Cavales was completely absent, and it produced a FORM of action that led him by the narrow paths of logic to the born FROM which no traveler returns. Jean Cavales embodies the logic of the resistance lived through unto death. Let the philosophers of existence and of the individual do as well next time, if they can one.
3. Double life. Malu had arranged for Lakin to renounce his parental authority, thinking in this way to punish him for having deserted her. But although it was she who had wanted the divorce, she decided to conceal the truth from her children. She thought she was acting for their own good. Until several years after the war they didn't know their father was living with Sylvia, nor that he had married her. They weren't aware, either, that they had a half-sister, Judith. And Lakin went along with this game of saying nothing and conforming to middle-class respectability. Malu used to say he was away on professional business and too busy with his intellectual work to spend much time at home. She didn't want to admit the failure of her marriage, says Celia B. E. Rutin, and after they separated she did everything she could to keep up appearances, even though it meant practicing deception. She went on unreservedly worshipping Lakin or rather the image of him that she wanted to cherish and pass on to the children. Every Thursday Lakin went to the Rue Jaden to have lunch at the modest apartment in the 16th arrondissement where Malu had gone to live with Caroline Thibault and Sibyl. He usually came and went in a hurry, stiff and apparently embarrassed at having to deal with such a situation. Point two, he paid Malu a not very huge allowance that didn't even cover the cost of the children's education. So she decided to work. She designed scarves and then did illustrations for children's books by the Contesse de Seger. Sylvain, seeing she was having difficulties, took her on as his anesthetist, three he had grown very close to her since the divorce. He regretted having no children of his own and was glad to take over the paternal role that Lakin had forfeited. At the end of the war Sylvain and Denise de Cudemont had separated, and he had started to live with Madeline Simon, who became his wifey in 1949. She was a practicing Catholic with a son, Bruno Roger, who was 16 when his mother married Sylvain. Bruno immediately grew F-O-N-D of his E-L-E. 180-W-A-R-A-N-D-P-E-A-C-E. Gant's stepfather, who adopted him as a son. Malu and Madeline, known as Lynette, became good F-R-E-N-S, and Caroline saw more and more of young Bruno, whom she married in 1958. Sylvain was doubly happy, he was marrying a niece he regarded as his daughter to a stepson who looked on him as a F.A. Their point four Caroline seemed to suffer less than her brother and sister as a result of her parents' situation. She was the only one whose early childhood had been happy, and she was her mother's favorite, the two were very alike. Caroline, haughty and elegant, was as sure as Malu herself of her own beauty and intelligence and the fact that she was one of the elite. She liked wealth, houses f u renished and run with good taste, and the values of economic liberalism. But she also liked strong family traditions, Catholic morals, and middle-class magnificence when it came to the major turning points in life. So her CEO and Bruno was dazzled by her. He and she shared the same culture, they both studied at the School of Political Science the famous sciences Po and went into finance. He became one of Paris's most famous financiers. Although Lakin loved Caroline and took her on trips to Venice and Austria, although he sought her financial advice and took a close interest in her professional successes, he didn't have a real intellectual relationship with her. She didn't read what he wrote, or enter into his world, or understand his work and teaching. And this situation was reinforced after 1945, Lakin's private life was now quite inseparable from his intellectual activity. Just as he had earlier chosen Sylvia's entourage as his real family, so now he presided over a family of disciples capable of reading his works and understanding him as a man. The split affected Thibaut and Sibyl more adversely than it did Caroline, not only because their early childhood had been overshadowed by their mother's distress and melancholy but also because it was more difficult for them to avoid being torn between the world of their F.A. there which they could imagine but which was concealed from them, and the concrete real ity of an everyday life all the more unsatisfactory because they sensed intuitively that it was based on pretense. As a result they both had great difficulty in finding their own identities and fitting in socially. In 1949 they had a very bad shock. One Thursday Thibaut and Sibyl spent the afternoon Thursday afternoon was then a school holiday in the Jardin d'Acclimatation, Zoo. 
On their way home they saw a car stop at a pedestrian crossing. They immediately recognized their F.A. there, seated behind the wheel. A woman was sitting beside him, and there was a little girl in the back seat. Thibaut and Sibyl ran toward Lakin calling out Dad. Dad. Lakin glanced at them in surprise, then looked away as if he hadn't seen them, started up the car, and vanished into the traffic. This was the Lakin. Double Life I-8I. Children's first meeting with Sylvia and Judith. When they told Malua Bout their misadventure she answered sharply that Lakin had obviously neither seen nor heard them. She was trying to excuse his behavior the behavior of A.F. Aether whom she wanted to go on living up to the image she had made of him. Sibyl F.O. got the incident, but the bot always remembered it vividly. Five through plentiful allusions to the other woman in grown-up conversation, the bot gathered that his F.A. Aether was leading a double life. But it was not until 1951, when he was 12, that he F.O.U.N.D. out about Judith found out that he had a half-sister. During the summer vacation his F.A. there picked him up and drove him over to a school in England where he was to spend a month. There he got to know a boy of his own age, the son of one of Jacques and Sylvia's F.R.E.N.s. One day in conversation the boy mentioned Judith's name. Thibaut said, I do N.T. know who you mean, though in F.A.C.T. he had understood very well who must have been meant point six, but he didn't say anything to anybody, and Sibyl didn't find out about her F.A. There's double life until much later. When Caroline was about to get married Jacques and Malu decided it was time F.O.R. pretense to come to an end. As far as Alfred Lakin's side of the family was concerned, no one knew anything about Jacques' new F.A. Mali circumstances. But in the summer of 1941 Mark Fran O.I.S. had had an idea things were getting worse, and to find out more he went to see Malu in the Pyrenees Orientals, where she was vacationing at the home of her F.R.E. Madeleine Guerlain. Seeing what a desperate state she was in, he realized the couple must have broken up. He was bitterly sorry his sister-in-law wasn't Christian enough to turn to the spiritual life, which he thought might have helped her emerge F.R.O.M. her unhappiness and brought her closer to God.7 He prayed F.O.R. her and F.O.R. his brother. But he didn't give Alfred and Emily a clear account of the change that had come about in Jacques' life. When he first met Sylvia, at a dinner party in the Rue de Lille during the occupation, he was obliged to work out F.O.R. himself that she was his brother's partner, neither she nor Jacques told him they were living together. Marc Fran O.I.S., who loved his brother very much but thought he hadn't been sufficiently Christian in his dealings with women, observed. Jacques wanted to own women. He'd always been possessive ever since he was a child. He didn't realize women weren't just nothing and that one didn't simply collect them. I deplore this aspect of him, it seems that being a genius doesn't mean you can understand a woman's otherness. Married life is an alliance that should find its model in God. It's a relationship that helps to form the individual. It makes it possible for both the male and the F.E. male concerned to live in a giving relationship and at the same time preserve their otherness. Jacques missed out on this. D.O.M. Lor should never have married him and Malu, neither are he nor she was a Christian. Point eight. 182 W.A.R.A.N.D.P.E.A.C.E. It had been a very long time since Lakin had shared the Christian spirituality to which Mark Fran O.I.S. had consecrated his life. But had he really been a Christian up to the age of 16? It's doubtful. In any case, by the end of the Second World War his atheism was so evident he no longer needed to identify himself with the Antichrist, as he had in the past. Even so, he still valued some of the conventions of the respectable bourgeoisie. Judith was sent to a church school nine and made her first communion, even though her mother was not only an atheist but against all religious practices. Emily Baudry Lakin, Lakin's mother, died unexpectedly on November 2, 1, 1948. Suffering FROM abdominal pains, she had been admitted as a matter of urgency to the Hartman Clinic, and Sylvain Blondin had performed a hysterocytomy. Everything seemed to be going well, and Emily wrote to Mark Fran OIS saying she was quite better. Then she died in her room from an embolism caused by a postoperative complication, 
the nurse doing her rounds f-o-u-n-d her lying there holding the bell switch she hadn't had time to press to summon help. Emily's daughter, Madeline, was the first to hear the news, and she phoned Jacques to ask him to remove their mother f-r-o-m the clinic as soon as possible, she thought Alfred wouldn't be able to bear the thought of his wife having died in such circumstances. Jacques did as his sister asked, and the body was taken back to the Rue Gambetta J.U.S.T. as if Emily had gone out somewhere and been taken ill. So officially she died at home, at the age of 72, in the arms of Alfred, her husband. Mark Fran O.I.S. was especially upset by his mother's sudden death, the news reached him just as he was reading the letter in which she said she felt very well. Oh on November 25th she was buried, with the usual religious rites, in the F.A. Mille vault in the cemetery at Chateau Thierry. Let me add, Lakin wrote to Ferdinand Alki, that I had the misfortune to lose my mother a month ago. He complained about having to deal with his grief-stricken F.A. there. Emily always remained unaware of Judith's existence, though finally she had vaguely come to know her son had another life. But she deliberately tried to ignore it, believing Jacques' marriage had been a genuinely ch Christian one and that Malu was properly devout. Two SOME time after Emily's death, however, Madeline decided to break the silence. She told Alfred about Judith, and he immediately wanted to see the little girl. Backslash. 3. Mark Fran OIS, who had recently met his niece in the Rue de Lille, approved. But when he said as much to Sylvain Blondin, Malu's brother was completely against it and made his opinion known in a furiously angry letter. Point one four Madeline paid no attention and took Judith Tosee her grandfather anyway. Soon afterward, Sylvia got to know Madeline and was very helpful to her when she had a serious road accident. Thus went the bot, at school in England, f-o-u-n-d out about his half-sister. Double life I-8-3. Judith had just been admitted into his F.A. There's family. B-U-T-H-E didn't know that. After the liberation, Sylvia and Jacques lived together in the apartment at 5, Rue de Lille, while Judith, Lawrence and their maternal grandmother lived at number 3. Then, as the years went by, the two places drew apart. The apartment at number 3 became Sylvia's special territory, where dinners and parties were held, and the apartment at number 5 became Lakin's. It was there he worked, received his mistresses, and carried out his analyses, though he had lunch at number 3. In March 1948 a young Spanish girl named Gloria Gonzalez entered his employment. She had been a maidservant since she was 13 and was used to hard work. At first she was very devoted to Sylvia, and then gradually she concentrated her loyalty on Lakin, whom she served with such enthusiasm and tact that she gradually became indispensable to both his intellectual life and his work as an analyst. Sylvia had exquisite taste, and she took charge of the decoration and fitting out of Jacques' consulting room. She helped him buy a few furniture for it, including a Napoleon III crapod, or teode, the squat armchair in which he was to sit and listen to his patients for the rest of his life. In 1948 she bought him a single bed just over 3 feet wide that for 33 years was to be his fa mouse couch, the silent witness of a long intellectual adventure. Both armchair and couch were covered with modest gray material that was replaced whenever it wore out. In 195 one Lakin bought a charming country house at Gatron Court, near Mantis La Jolie. It was called La Prevote, the provost's HOUs. As well as going to Gatron Court on Sundays to work, he also received patients and gave sumptuous parties there. He loved putting on an act for his frenes, wearing disguises or fancy dress, dancing and flaunting extravagant clothes. At La Prevote he started a collection of books that gradually became a huge library, bigger than the one in the Rue de Lille. A mere list of their titles gives an idea of the immense erudition behind the passion with which he sought out first and rare editions. A spacious outbuilding with a high bay window overlooking the garden was turned into a study, which he filled with valuable works of art. The finest item was a painting hung in the loggia that looked down on the single room, El Origine du Monde 
The Origin of the World, painted by Gustav Courbet in 1866 for Khalil Bey, a Turkish diplomat. It was a nude, offering a direct view of the private parts of a woman immediately after she had been making love. The picture had caused a scandal at the time it was painted. It amazed both the Goncourt brothers, who thought it as beautiful as the flesh in a Correggio, and Maxime Ducamp, who pronounced it filthy enough to illustrate the works of Sada. After Khalil Bey's death the picture disappeared into a series of private collections. The Second World War FOUND 184 WARANDPEACE It in Budapest, where it was confiscated by the Nazis. It later passed into the hands of the victorious Soviets and was then sold to other collectors. Lakin came across it in 1955. In order to conceal what was regarded as the terrifying eroticism of undisguised sex, the canvas itself had been covered with a wooden panel depicting a landscape, by now the panel had disappeared, but Sylvia still thought the picture so scandalous it ought to be kept hidden. The neighbors and the cleaning lady wouldn't understand, she said. So she asked Andre Masson to make another wooden cover. He came up with a superb panel reproducing in abstract FORM the erotic elements of the original. A secret mechanism made the panel slide back to reveal the CO orbit, but most of the time it remained hidden. I.S. Lakin had always loved traveling and seaside vacations. He had been to Morocco, Spain, and the Côte d'Azur with Marie Therese, to Brittany with Alicia, and to Italy with Malu. As soon as the war was over he followed the same P.A. turn with Sylvia. In particular there was a trip to Egypt, where he demonstrated all his old interest in seeing and understanding everything. He also got into the habit of going away for winter sports but was hopelessly clumsy at skiing and even at putting on his boots. He fr actured his leg twice, and the accident that affected his thigh left him with a slight limp which on occasion he used very skillfully to intimate that the master was exhausted by the stupidity of his pupils. He would drag his feet and say, with a kind of exasperated sigh, I am dead. They're killing me. They don't understand a word I say 16. In the summer he often spent F.A. Mali holidays with Sylvia, Judith, Lawrence and the Merleau-Pontys at L.E. Mulo, a little place near Arcaco N. M. Terlong days spent working, he would lead the others on hikes, during which he took photographs of the sunset. He also loved the beauty of southern Italy, he stayed at the Villa Simbrone in Ravello and liked going on boating expeditions around Capri from the coast near Amalfi. It was in the village of Le Tholinet, near Aix and Provence, that he mar ride Sylvia on July 1, 7, 1953. The wedding took place privately in the town hall in the presence of Rose and Andre Masson, who had a delightful house called Les Cigales, the Cicadas, on the route de Cézan, which links the places where the painter lived and worked. Jacques wore a quiet, light col ord suit, a bow tie, and a flower in his buttonhole, Sylvia wore a simple white blouse and ful skirt. She had divorced Georges Bodily on July 9, 1946. One seven at that time he was already living with Diane Kachubi, whom he married on January 1, 6, 1951, two years after she had presented him with a daughter, Julie, born on December I, 1948. So when Sylvia, aged F. Arudi 5, changed her name from Budali to Lakin, her daughter Judith became the legal stepdaughter of the man who was really her father, and the stepsister of Malu's children, though she was really their half-sister too. She Double Life 18.5 Went on being regarded as the FULL sister of Lawrence, though she was in FACT her half-sister, and as the half-sister of Julie, to whom she was in fact no blood relation at all. The situation was all the more confusing because the legal facts contrasted in every way with reality. Lakin was less of a father to the children of his first marriage than to his daughter Judith and his stepdaughter, Lawrence. Lawrence, as time went by, felt closer to him than to her own father, whom she admired but from whom she had been separated since she was f.o. or years old. Lakin really adored Judith. 
it was a bitter grief to him that he hadn't been able to give her his name, and he loved her with a passionate and exclusive love. He was lost in admiration as he watched her grow up, and her beauty, gifts, and talents duly blossomed. She was brought up among the intelligentsia with whom he himself mixed, even in her teens, she F.O. met part of the circle of his disciples and shared in the rapid evolution and rising influence of his thought. She went to school at the College 7 and came top of her year in the philosophy aggregation, the highest competitive examination for teachers. She was known as Judith Lakin, the name that should rightfully have been hers. Many of Lakin's colleagues and friends tried to make him love her more moderately, his passion for her was completely inconsistent with the Oedipal doctrine he taught. But Freud himself had shown Lakin the way. Had he not shown the same exclusive love for his daughter Anna? Judith returned her father's devotion. She could never see him except through the eyes of a filial piety that soon became hagiographical. For her he was a living god of unshakable character and flawless magnanimity, for ever being betrayed by unworthy disciples but always valiantly getting the better of those rash enough to oppose him. And Lakin encouraged a warship that satisfied his deepest desires. But such favoritism had its effects on the children of his first marriage, especially on Thibaut and Sibyl. They were unhappy at not being part of their father's life, and the only thing they could take pride in was bearing his name. Judith on the other hand, though she knew she was the favorite, Suf Effie read because she had not been made legitimate, and was afraid of being called a bastard. 18 All this gave rise to a growing rivalry between the two F.A. Millies. On April 1, 3, 1956 Lakin gave A.P. A. Rudy at Gatron Court to celebrate his birthday. The day before, he took Thibaut out to dinner in a restaurant and asked him if he wanted to come to the party. Thibaut was very pleased but said he had to ask his mother F.O.R. permission. Lakin spoke to Malu, who O.B.J. eated at first, reminding him of her own unhappiness, but gave way in the end. The next day Thibaut stepped into a wonderful new world, the world of his father. Maurice Merleau-Ponty was there, and so were Claude. 186 WARANDPEACE. Levi Strauss and many other brilliant people. Thibaut met Sylvia and Lawrence, who both gave him a warm welcome. That summer he J.O. and his F.A. there at the Masson's place at L.E. Tholinet. There he met Judith F.O.R. the first time and was dazzled by her charm and intelligence. Lakin hoped his son might take an interest in his world and above all in his work. Thibaut didn't want to, though, he F.E.L.T. out of place. So he got the impression his father was disappointed in him. But Sylvia went on inviting him. One day, with tears in his eyes, he spoke to her about the episode near the Jardin d'Acclimatation. She told him it had made her feel ill too. Thibaut always got on very well with Lawrence, and for several years he mixed in his father's circle, though without playing either a professional or an intellectual part in it. He studied science and eventually made a career in banking. In 1958 Thibaut visited the Massons again. On this occasion Jacques and he went to see old Alfred Lakin, who had gone to live with A.F. Ormetter Singer in the Hotel Negrecast on the Corps Mirabeau in aix en provence Thibaut observed the gulf that separated his father from his grandfather, Jacques' behavior was that of someone merely performing A.F. Emily duty. I. Caroline's marriage on June 26, 1958, conformed to all the traditions of the French Catholic bourgeoisie, white gown, church service, careful observance of ritual and convention. Mark Fran OIS came from Hotkum to bless the Union, which he hoped would prove genuinely Christian. Caroline was an agnostic, like her uncle Sylvain and her mother, but she felt she belonged to a Catholic culture. There was an elegant reception at Sylvain's apartment in the Avenue de la Grande Armée, where Jacques' two F.A. Milies met together officially for the first time. Point two oh, the period of pretense had been succeeded by one of hidden rivalry. Caroline's relationship with her F.A. there included both unspoken understanding and discussions about financial matters or the work that needed to be done at Gatron Court. She spent F.A. Millie holidays with him, which meant she saw Sylvia and Judith too. As F.O.R. her husband, Bruno Roger, 
he had adopted all the prejudices of his own circle on the sub-JECT of psychoanalysis, he thought it was dangerous, especially for his own family. Point 21. But this did NT stop him respecting Lakin the man, and Lakin, once he was rich, needed Bruno's advice on his investments. Sibyl, whose birth had been so dramatic, was an isolated figure amid the Blondin clan. She had inherited the rectitude and moral austerity of her mother, whom she adored, and was the only member of the F.A. Mali to rebel openly against leftist political opinions. She was interested in modern languages and studied literature at the university. Like the bot, but in a different F.A. she took to going to see her F.A. there, but often she went in order to plead her mother's cause, and she was clear-sighted about her father's faults and weaknesses. The Emotional Relationship Between Lakin and Double Life 187 Sibyl was complicated further by the rivalry that arose when she found out about Judith. At first she was delighted to learn she had an unknown half-sister. But things went sour when, on vacation first at St. Tropez and then in Italy, she saw and was deeply hurt by the passionate love that existed between Judith and Lakin. 2-2 Lawrence Bodily who was much the oldest of the girls, probably had quite a different relationship with Lakin. His affection for her was a reasonable one, and she was adored by her mother, who always remained very close to George's bodily. When she was 16 Lawrence became B. Althus's favorite model, and he painted some excellent portraits of her as well as helping her in her attempts to become an actress. In 1953 she played an important role in Hugo Betty's Goat Island, in which other parts were played by Sylvia Montfort, Alan Cuny, and Rosie Villarut. B. Althus had designed the sets and costumes for the play, and the plot, in which a widow bestows her door on her lover, had a good deal in common with the life led by him and his friends. Pierre Valls, the director, described it as Folos, t three lonely women deprived of love suddenly meet again, together with a man called Dionysus. An erotic frenzy follows, but Dionysus proves difficult and the women kill him. The strangest things become normal when people live in isolation. There are no more social constraints. 23. The following year Lawrence went on tour with the same company in Algeria, and when she came back she joined the French Communist Party. Lakin thought this a preposterous idea, he regarded the French Communist Party as a kind of church but he didn't press the matter and accepted his stepdaughter's decision. But when the communist deputies voted in favor of giving special powers to Guy Mollet's government, Lawrence handed in her party card. In the spring of 1958, she and her cousin Diego Masson joined a group, led by Robert Davizis, whose OBJECT was to help the FLN, Front de Liberation Nationale, i.e., Algerian freedom fighters. She worked at raising funds for the cause at the same time as she went on with her medical studies. On May 10, 1960 she was arrested and sent to the prison de la Roquette for six weeks. Lakin brought her the type script of his seminar The Ethics of Psychoanalysis. The text was very apt, it was a commentary on Antigone's rebellion against Crean. The lawyer Roland Dumas got Lawrence's case dismissed, making the acquaintance of Lakin in the process. He later became his fr and defender, in particular he helped him initiate the procedure for recognizing Judith as his daughter. In a letter to the English psychoanalyst and PE dietitian Donald W. Winnicott, written in August 1, 1960, Lakin talked of the pride he took in his stepdaughter's political commitment. As he's given us a lot of anxiety, we're proud of it, having got herself arrested because of her political connections. She's FRE now, but we're still worried, as the matter isn't yet closed. We also have a nephew. 188WARANDPEACE. Diego Masson, who lived in my house like a son when he was a student, and now he's just been sentenced to two years in prison for opposing the war in Algeria 24. Lawrence Bodily was a remarkable woman. She called to mind the tragic heroines in the films of D.W. Griffith though her radical views made her more like Antigone. She was generous, sensitive, intelligent, and sympathetic to all FORMS of human rebellion. 
and she became one of the best psychoanalysts of her generation, occupying a central place in the harem of the Lacanian movement. Meanwhile, by an extraordinary coincidence, a figure had reappeared from the past. After Lacan's mother died, at the end of 1948, the FATE of Marguerite Ancieu, the woman who had launched him on his career, intersected with that of his father, Alfred.25 After Saint Anne, Marguerite had been sent under her maiden name to the hospital at Villevrad, where she was CLAS sifted as constitutionally unbalanced by doctors unaware that her case had been the SUBJECT of a thesis opposing the doctrine of constitutions. In 1941 she decided she wanted to return to normal life and asked FOR her situation to be re-examined. A year or so later, after repeated requests, she got her way. On July 2, 1, 1943, Dr. Chans, who had read Lakin's thesis, agreed to give Marguerite back her fr Sven Svenfallen, who was Chans's assistant at the time, had occasion to examine her. As he was very quiet and spent her time sewing. She never spoke of the PAST and didn't mention that she had been the sub-JECT of the Amy case. She still believed in the persecutions. She was one of those people described in mental hospitals as our attired FROM madness. So that was what Marguerite had become in the eyes of psychiatry, a decade after her encounter with Lakin. When he came across the file in 1989, the psychiatrist Jacques Chazot added a comment of his own, I wonder what Amy's original interpreter, who invented the theory that the sub-JECT is symbolically rooted in the law, would have thought of what is recorded as the real remains of his patient several years later, scraps of writing and pure nonsense. Marguerite, whisked far away from the young Faust, became just an ordinary patient again. 26 Once Marguerite was FREE again she became another woman, unlike either Amy or the inmate of the hospitals at St. Anne and Villevrad. The people she worked for as cook housekeeper knew nothing of her past and never noticed the slightest sign of madness in her behavior. For them Marguerite was a frint, generous, cultivated, art-loving, intelligent, f-u-l-l of consideration for others, and an ardent Christian. 27 In 1947 Didier and married Annie Peghair. After thinking of becoming first an actor and then a writer, he went instead to the Akal Normata. Double Life 189. Superior to train ASA teacher and graduated with a degree in philosophy. But what he remembered about his mother made him take an interest in psychology, and in 1949 he started an analysis with Lakin, not knowing that Marguerite had been the sub-JECT of the Amy case. It was Didier's wife who helped him find his mother again. Annie had been trained as a psychologist and analyzed by Georges Favet, and she was eager to meet the woman whose madness had been hushed up by her family. She also thought Marguerite, living alone, must be unhappy at having lost contact with her son. The meeting took place very simply. One day Annie saw a woman outside the apartment block where she lived and thought it must be E. Marguerite. S.H.E. was right. Marguerite, without letting anyone know, had come to see her son. She soon became part of the F.A. Millie again. Point 28 by this time, Marguerite, already working in Boulogne sur Seine, had been taken on as cook by Alfred Lakin, and there she met her F.O. Remer psychiatrist and asked him yet again to give back her manuscripts and photographs. Meanwhile, Didier and CEO's analysis proceeded, it ended in July 1953 though Lakin didn't recognize his patient as the son of the F.O. Remetter inmate of St. Anne's. And C.A. learned the truth from his mother in the course of conversation. She told him not only about the thesis that had been written about her but that she hadn't read but also about what went on at Alfred Lakin's place, where she had been taken on just by chance. She'd noticed that when Jacques went to see his father, he see loaned around in order to fill in the silences. On hearing all this, Didier and C.A. rushed to the library to read the 193-2 thesis. Lakin, questioned about not having recognized the identity of his present patient, admitted that he had in FACT fitted the pieces of the story together in the course of the analysis. But he said he hadn't known Amy's surname, 
she'd been admitted to Saint Anne under her maiden name. We know now that in 1949 the name Ansia couldn't really have been unknown to Lakin. But he had repressed the knowledge and didn't want to admit as much to Marguerite's son. Later on, in a let er he wrote to me after the publication of L'Histoire de Fa Psychanalyse en France, the history of psychoanalysis in France, Didier Ansia observed, the most debatable idea, in my opinion, is your amplification and embellishment of the part the Amy case played not only in the intellectual but also in the psychoanalytic development of Lakin. She was neither his Flyus nor his Lowenstein. She was certainly a brilliant woman, too brilliant for her provincial environment, but she was also an unfortunate one, who fo ughite a losing battle with the fe ealing that she had made a mess of her life. But still, your idea is your idea, and it belongs to you. It's your own interpretation of the matter as a historian. 29. To Jean Alush he wrote, I don't know anything about Amy. Marguerite is the only one I knew 3 190 WARANDPEACE. This testimony shows clearly that no one will ever know who the true Marguerite was. First she was a tabloid heroine and then a case reconstructed by Lakin and celebrated by an upcoming generation of psychiatrists. Lastly she became a myth, sung by the surrealists. Like Charcot's Blanche Whitman, like Brewer and Freud's Bertha Pappenheim, and like Janet's Madeleine Le Book, she owed her notoriety not to her own talent or identity but to an acting out episode that precipitated her into the history of madness. When the case, the myth, and the madness all were over, her fate became the anonymous one of any mental hospital patient. She who had been observed, ransacked, fabricated, travestied, and made into a myth for the benefit of psychiatry had now just to survive and find a new identity. Her return to normal life was made even more strange than it would otherwise have been because chance threw her once again in the path of the hated Jacques Lacan. Christine and C.A.U., born in 1950, had an intense and warm relationship with her grandmother Marguerite. Like her parents, Christine knew about the past, and F.A.R.F.R.O.M. denying Marguerite's madness she saw traces of it in many of her attitudes. But she never felt she was face to face with such an organized paranoia as Lakin had described. She sensed the persecutio and, the passion, the mysticism, the desire to better herself, the violence, but what struck her most was an extraordinary capacity for love. And Margui Wright was interested in knowledge of all kinds, ranging from physics to Hinduism and including the Breton language. She wanted to learn everything, know everything, read everything. She helped the parish priest in many good works. She had a clear view of the power play and rivalries that were rife within the bourgeois families she had known. She was very severe about the avarice and hypocrisy to be found among the Lakins. She remembered with horror the time she had spent in hospital and blamed Lakin for never having done anything to get her out of the asylum, for never having helped her or listened to her properly. In her opinion, he had stolen her Livy story and turned it into a thesis. When he became F.A. Mouse she resented it, and F.E. Ealings of persecution again rose up strongly in her. She never for gave Lakin for not having given her back her manuscripts. 3-1 After Lakin's death I asked Jacques Alain Miller to look for them. I knew how much Marguerite's son wanted to have them back, though he didn't want to ask for them himself. But I never received any answer. 1-7. A-N unsatisfactory in O-U-N tur with. M-E la n-i-e-k l-i-n. L-N October 1942 the opening shot was fired in the series of controversial discussions that for four years, in the midst of war, were to rend the British Psychoanalytical Society. Glover put the evaluation of Melanie Klein's theories on the agenda, while Jones vanished into the country for the whole of 1943 to avoid having to choose between the supporters of Melanie Klein and the advocates of Anna Freud. Michael Bolling too, now living in Manchester, also escaped the crossfire. The main discussions were mostly among the women, partly because each party was led by a woman and partly because most of the male members of the BPS were absent 
having been called up to organize the F.A. Mao's wartime psychiatric service that Lakin so much admired. The controversial discussions created a situation completely new in the history of the international psychoanalytic movement. For the first time since Freud's death there was a split that led neither to a schism nor to a dissident movement but instead to a compromise based on the need for peaceful coexistence. Both the opposing parties could justly appeal to Freud himself, neither contested the F.O. on Daying F.A. There's teaching as such. On the contrary, each tried to outdo the other in Freudian legitimacy. But Melanie Klein saw herself as an innovator and regarded her rival's attitudes as uninterprising and the product of mere habit. Anna Freud, F.O. are her part, saw Kleinianism as a deviation to be eliminated in the same way as those of Jung and Adler. The dispute about legitimacy was the more acute because Freud hadn't officially condemned Klein's theories when he was alive. He had clung to an appearance of neutrality, while privately agreeing with his daughter. So the situation in 1942 was a strange one. Anna Freud, the legitimate heiress of the F.O. Undaying father, was being challenged because of her attachment to academic theories. Melanie Klein, who claimed no hereditary legit. 192-WARANDPEACE. I. Mackey, represented a version of Freudianism more innovative than that of her rival. So she was more Freudian than Anna Freud herself, in that she brought a breath of FRS theoretical air to a body of doctrine that but FOR her might have undergone a lethal process of sanctification. I. And the BPS the Kleinians had long been the real representatives of an English school of psychoanalysis but they knew very well there was no question of their expelling Freud's daughter and her supporters. Freud had chosen England as his last place of asylum, and Anna and the Viennese in general had been welcomed into the BPS as political refugees and victims of Nazism. In such circumstances, schism was impossible, and the two parties were bound, in the long term, to sign a non-aggression pact. The Kleinians tended to be recruited from among first-generation emigrants from Hungary or Berlin, whereas Anna Freud's advocates were chiefly Viennese who had been forced into exile. The first group, having left their own countries voluntarily, were better integrated into English society, while the SEC and group found it relatively difficult to adapt. For many years, despite H.A. being acquired British nationality, they were painfully homesick for their native city. They still thought of it as decked in the charms of Freud's own day, when Freudianism itself was influenced by the great artistic upheaval that colored the end of the 19th century. But in the course of all the controversies there grew up between the two opposing camps an independent group composed mostly of native English. In their view the current quarrels concerned individuals rather than ideas and were taking a religious turn unsuited to scientific debate and therefore harmful to the BPS as a whole. As early as 1940 James Strachey, one of the pioneers of the English school, pointed out the dangers inherent in a split in the society, and my own view is that Mrs. K has made some highly important contributions to N, U Greek initials for psychoanalysis but that it's absurd to make out, A that they cover the whole sub J E C T or, b, that their validity is axiomatic. On the other hand I think it's equally ludicrous for Miss E to maintain that N, U is a game reserve belonging to the E F A family and that Mrs. K S ideas are fatally subversive. These attitudes on both sides are of course purely religious and the very antithesis of science. In the same context, Winniot ended up violently denouncing both the tyranny of Melanie Klein and the despotism of Anna Freud. I consider it to be of absolutely vital importance to the FU tour of the society, he said in 1954, that both of yourselves shall break up the groupings in so far as they are official. No one can break them up except yourselves and you can only do this while you are alive. If it should happen that you should die, then the grouping which is officially recognized in the nomenclature will become absolutely rigid and it will be a generation or more before the society can. An unsatisfactory if actory encounter with Melanie Klein 19. 3. Recover from this disaster which will be a clumping based not on science but on personalities too. As for Edward Glover and Melita Schmidberg, who before the war had played such an important part in the opening of hostilities, 
they both left the BPS in order to take up other interests. Melita emigrated to the United States, where she worked with delinquents and drug abusers, and Glover pursued similar activities until in 1963 he became chairman of the Scientific Committee of the Institute of Criminology in London. T.O. begin with, the arguments were about the appraisal of Klein's Theo Rise, but soon, as Winnicott points out, debate centered on the training of analysts. Anna Freud's party saw the OBJECT of analysis as the undoing of the effects of repression and the reduction of defense mechanisms, in order to give the ego be eater control over the ID. Transference should not be analyzed until the defenses have been reduced. This training technique corresponded to the interpretation of the second topography put F. O. Ruard by ego psychology, whose main contributors were linked to Anna Freud. She, Chris, Hartman, Lowenstein, and the Viennese in general shared the same adaptative view of psychoanalysis, though it was not the view of Freud himself. As most of this group emigrated to the United States, anafreudianism became a leading trend in the 1PA. But for the Kleinian's treatment began with recognition of the primacy of the transferential bond and the necessity of analyzing it from the outset, regardless of any control the ego might have over the ID. These arguments rested on a reading of the second topography that was the opposite of the anafreudians's interpretation and close to the positions at which Lakin was to arrive. So Kleinianism contained no theory of adaptation, which explains why it was never able to establish itself in America. Kleinians compared treatment to a stage production in which the analyst was not a real character but instead represented the intro j e t o b j e c t s that had construct the superego. They believed the sub j e c t s anxiety situation was revived by the unfolding of the analysis and had to be reduced by dealing immediately with the phenomenon of transference. These two interpretations of Freudian doctrine were so incompatible that the BPS had to establish two different systems of training. But as it was also necessary to preserve the unity of the society, internal links were created between the two opposing methods. In June 1, 1946 the controversial discussions ended when the BPS was officially divided into three groups, Group A taught the theories of Melanie Klein, Group B taught those of Anna Freud, and the third group consisted of independents. The main committees of the society, and in particular the training committee, had to include representatives from each of the three groups. This compromise, though it I-94 W-A-R-A-N-D-P-E-A-C-E avoided schism, had a paralyzing E-F-F-E-C-T-O and the general functioning of the BPS. Hence Winnicott's denunciation of it in I-954. In his article on the F.A. Millie, Lakin had already noticed the parallels between his own approach and the theories of Melanie Klein. But it was not until after the war that he had a chance to meet Melanie Klein herself. In I-947 Henry E.Y. decided to start an international association to organize periodical world conferences on psychiatry. A first meeting, under the chairmanship of Jean Lermite, Maxime Lena Lavastine Jean Delay, and Pierre Janet, was held to define the plan, to which 25 societies later agreed. 3. The first conference was held in Paris in the autumn of I-950, by which time Henry E.Y. had managed to get together representatives from about a dozen countries and F. O. Rudy or so societies, the original 25 and 15 or so that joined subsequently, more than 1500 PA participants I and all, including the great names of the French psychoanalytic movement from the first to the third generation. To represent the American version of neo-Freudianism, EY had asked Franz Alexander, president of the American Psychiatric Association, to open the debate. Alexander then advised the organizers to invite Anna Freud, and she agreed to come. But EY want E.D. Melanie Klein to be there too, so he asked Juliette Favé Bautoni to write to her. Klein declined the invitation by return of post, offended by the FACT that Anna Freud was to be present. At this point Lakin intervened to help his old FRNDY. He got in touch with Melanie Klein and asked her to use her influence to get the people in London to vote for a discussion on the progress of psychoanalysis. 
He explained that he was fighting as hard as he could to get the subject tabled FOR discussion but was encountering great opposition FROM reactionary tendencies in the SPP. Representing himself to her as the most progressive member of his own society, he launched into an eloquent attack on Anna Freud as being too conservative to represent the field of child psychology at the conference. Point four, he managed to persuade his correspondent and wrote to EY saying, I'll be sending Melanie Klein to Bonneville FORU in 10 days' time. 5. In May I 948, in a paper on aggression presented to the 11th Conference of French speaking psychoanalysts, in Brussels, Lakin had repeated all the arguments contained in his previous texts on the subject and included a certain number of Klein's theories. He had put FORUARD an interpretation of the second topography that drew a distinction between the EGO, the imaginary site of all resistances, and the one, which indicated the position of the sub-JECT in reality. In borrowing Klein's idea of paranoid position, he turned the ego into an agent of mechanescence, misrecognition or misconstruction, organized into a paranoid structure. If such a structure exists, it must be taken into account in treatment. Hence the idea that analytic technique an unsatisfactory encounter with Melanie Klein 195 serves to bring into play a negative transference by inducing, as against the misrecognition of the ego, a directed paranoia. Thus Lakin agreed with Melanie Klein on the need for analytic training to accord a primary importance to transference and not to make the ego the site of an appropriation of the ID. But he retained an approach of his own to the question of the separation of the I and the EGO and to that of directed paranoia. 6. At the IPA Congress in Zurich in the summer of 1949, Lakin returned to the same theme in a paper entitled The Mirror Stage as Formative of the Function of the 1-7. He had chosen the sub-JECT to get his own back after the Marenbad meeting, where he hadn't been able to express himself fre but the theories he put F.O. Ruard in 1949 were no longer the same as those he had F.A. Board in 1936. Lakin now linked psychoanalysis to a non-Freudian philosophy of the subject, diametrically opposed to any philosophy based on the cogito, in which the I was differentiated F.R.O.M. the ego. The object of this profession of faith was not to criticize Descartes but to attack ego psychology and the Anafreudians, I. The assertion of the primacy of the ego over the ID. But this did not prevent Lakin FROM paying tribute to Anna Freud FOR her description of defense mechanisms, which in his view remained accurate provided the ego was made the site of the defense system. That 16th IPA Congress was an event. For the first time the Americans dominated the proceedings, the Europeans were divided among themselves. The most disgraced and humiliated country there was Germany represented by people who had collaborated with the Nazis. Compared with Germany, France seemed successful but misunderstood, unknown for the most part to the English and the Americans except through Marie Bonaparte, seen as the only representative of genuine Freudian legitimacy. The host country, Switzerland, was brilliantly represented by Oscar Pfister, Henry Flournoy, and Philippe Sarrazin. The Americans, who advocated an adaptative neo-Freudianism, were almost all of European origin, though this didn't stop those Europeans who hadn't emigrated FROM seeing them as HAB ing come out best in Freudianism's great shift to the West. Their triumph was complete, and the psychiatrist Leo Bartemeyer was elected president of the IPA in succession to Jones, who had held the office since 1932. T. O. Melanie Klein, whose ideas had won over the majority in the BPS, the triumph of North America seemed like a victory for the ideas of Anna Freud. A dissist her. But the Kleinians did find new support among the Latin Americans present who had gone to London for training. The French were represented in Zurich by the legitimists of the first generation Bonaparte and Luban by the second generation, including Lagache, Nacht, and Lakin. None of them belonged to any school of thought to be FOUND in the IPA, though each stood FOR a different tendency. 196 War ANDPCE In France, NACT embodied the authoritative, medical ideal of the SPP conservatives, Lagache the academic liberalism based on the merging of psychology and psychoanalysis, 
and Lake in a movement of continuity combined with revision comparable to though different from that of Melanie Klein. That year he was beginning to gather around him the most brilliant MEM bears of the third generation of French psychoanalysis. Among them were the musketeers of the future Troika, Serge Leclerc, Oladimir Granoff, and Fran O.I.S. Per Ye.8 Anna Freud didn't like Lacan, and her friendship with Marie Bonaparte could only encourage her to reject in its entirety a doctrine already thought to be paranoid and too obscure to be incorporated into legitimist Freudianism. As for Melanie Klein, she wasn't interested in what Lacan had to say, she found it difficult to understand, untranslatable, and of little use to her. She was very much aware, however, of the help Lacan could be to her in France, and she knew how much he was admired by the younger generation. So she was very pleased to see him there in Zurich. Lacan, for his part, was still determined to get her support in promoting the idea of the progress of psychoanalysis. So he offered to translate the German version of her book The Psychoanalysis of Children, which had been published simultaneously in Vienna and London in 1932. When he got back to Paris, however, he handed the work over to René Dietkine, who was then undergoing analysis with him. Some time later Dietkine finished translating the first half of the book and gave it to Lakin, without keeping a copy for himself. Meanwhile Frank, was Gerard, who was following Lakin's teaching, had also suggested to Melanie Klein that she herself might translate the English version of the book into French. Klein declined the offer, but didn't say that Lakin was already working on the translation. Instead she suggested that Gerard should translate her contributions to psychoanalysis, published in 1948. In March 1951 Frank, was Gerard married Jean-Baptiste Boulanger, a psychiatrist from Montreal who had come to France to be trained and shared her enthusiasm for Klein's ideas. In August Dietkind told Klein that half the translation of the psychoanalysis of children was finished but that it wasn't Lakin who had done it. In the autumn, during a control group, Lakin asked Frank, was Boulanger whether her husband spoke English. When she said he did, Lakin suggested the couple should both translate the second half of the psychoanalysis of children, saying he had already done the first half. Frank, was and Jean-Baptiste Boulanger set to work at once, and in December they asked Lakin to let them have the other half of the text so that they could compare the two translations and make sure the French translation of Klein's terminology was consistent throughout. Lakin looked for the manuscript in both his apartments in the Rue de Lille, and then at La. An unsatisfactory encounter with Melanie Klein 197. P.N. Vote, but couldn't find it. At the end of the month Frant, was Boulanger made an appointment to see Melanie Klein, and on January 27 she and her husband had lunch at Klein's house in London. They told her the hair rising story, so typical of Lakin's way of doing business, he never revealed or admitted officially, says John baptiste Boulanger, that he'd lost the translation diet Kine had done from the German. 9. Lakin lost all credibility with Melanie Klein and her supporters. Klein moved closer to Lagache and backed him up in the negotiations that began in 1953 with the object of getting the IPA to readmit the Société Frant, Eyes de Psychanalyse, SFP. The French version of her book was eventually published by PUF, Presses Universitaires de France, in 1959, in the series edited by Lagache. She was delighted and wrote him a number of letters, as well as thanking Jean-Baptiste Boulanger in the following terms, I very much wish that I could have put the work in your hands some years ago when Madame Boulanger first offered, after the Congress in Zurich, to translate it. It would have been a much better arrangement for you, and how much worry and trouble I should have saved myself. But, as you know, I could not take it away from Lakin too. P.A.R.T.V.I. Elements of a System of Thought 18. Theory of Treatment, Kinship Structures On June 1, 6, 1953, Daniel Lagache, Juliette Favé-Boutonier, Franoise du Wantu, and Blanche Reverchen Jauvé resigned from the SPP after a conflict that had lasted a year. 1. To begin with, 
the teachers belonging to the society had clashed over the founding of a new institute of psychoanalysis designed to establish training principles consistent with the standards of the IPA. The pupils entered the fray after Jenny Raudinesco, on March 15, 1953, wrote a letter to Sasha Nacht, her analyst, and to Jacques Lacan, her controller. To the Juniors' Rebellion, following on the discord among the masters themselves, opened a rift that would eventually become a split. The Freudian cause in France now had to weather the same kind of storm as had ravaged its English counterpart during the controversial discussions. But the SBP's position was quite unlike that of the BPS. In Britain there was a clear conflict between two opposing doctrines, and the advent of a third school had forced the adversaries to conclude a treaty of peaceful coexistence. Things were quite different in France. The opposing forces that of Nacht on the one hand and of Lagache on the other didn't he represent two contradictory readings of Freud's teaching, as the schools of Melanie Klein and Anna Freud had done on the other side of the channel. The French battle was about the training of analysts, and it opposed the authoritarianism of the medical profession to the liberalism of the Acade Mikes. Only Lakin had proposed revisions comparable in scope to those of Melanie Klein, but his position in the SPP between 1949 and 1953 was not yet analogous to hers during the controversial discussions. He wanted to avoid a split and did all he could to prevent one. In his opinion, the liberals' rejection of the medical model and their turning instead to psychology was disastrous, and the conservatives clinging to hidebound medical teaching no less so. As an Anglophile with no love of revolution, Lakin always tended to pre- 202 E L E M E N T S 0 F A S Y S T E M 0 F T O G T. First sound reform to insurrection. But though he was by nature a follower of T. Oquaville, his democratic principles were continually contradicted by his personality and the content of his teaching. And however strongly he might defend traditional institutions, his words, his image, and his manner all inspired a kind of Jacobin enthusiasm. And so, for the young French psychoanalysts of the 1950s, he became the spokesperson of a strong revolutionary trend. The conservatives, led by Nacht and Marie Bonaparte, accused him of using his influence to sow rebellion among the students. On June 16, 1953, he had no choice but to resign from the SPP and join Lagache and his friends, who had just started the SFP. And just like the others, Lakin failed to realize that in leaving the old group he was ceasing to be a M.E. member of the 1PA. For as long as the battle lasted he was challenged by his own peers not F.O.R. his teaching but F.O.R. his analytic practice. For some time it had been growing increasingly evident that Lakin did not obey the technical rules that had been in force in the 1PA since the 20s and 30s. According to these rules an analysis was supposed to last for at least four years and consist of four or five sessions a week, each session lasting at least 50 minutes. These requirements applied, in principle, to training analyses as well as to therapeutic ones, though in fact it was only for the former category that they were strictly insisted on. In the case of their apodic analyses, the clinician was regarded as free to contract with the patient as to the number of sessions on which the latter wished to spend his time and money. The rule governing the length of the sessions was designed to limit the analyst's theoretically unlimited power. He was not supposed to manipulate the time he devoted to a patient through arbitrary changes, and the patient had the right to speak for a length of time agreed in advance, even if he chose not to exercise that prerogative. These standards were accepted by all the members of all the societies affiliated to the 1PA, in FACT, the unity that prevailed during the 40s in the empire Freud had founded was due entirely to this codification, which acted with the force of a generally accepted law. So while different theories as to how treatments should be conducted were tolerated, any breach of the rules about time might always result in expulsion. Lakin did not obey the rule prescribing a fixed length of time for each session. Though he didn't yet go in for what were later to be known as short sessions, he did use a technique of variable ones, bringing sessions to an end arbitrarily when he himself saw fit. He reversed the rule protecting the patient's right to speak and put the all powerful analyst in the position of interpreter in the transference relationship. 
This refusal to obey the generally accepted rule was condemned by the other members of the SPP. Lakin's de facto introduction of variable length. Theory of treatment, kinship structures 203. Sessions meant that he could take on any number of applicants for analysis, while his colleagues, by keeping to the rules, doomed themselves not only to having two or three times fewer pupils than he but also to seeing their influence within the society considerably reduced. Since Lakin towered over all the members of his own generation in terms of personal charisma as well as clinical and theoretical genius, he naturally attracted the most brilliant future teachers of the younger, i.e., the third, generation, three all of them followed his teaching, and most of them chose to be analyzed on his couch. By temperament Lakin was incapable of limiting his own desires, and his analysis with Lowenstein had done nothing to improve matters. He had resented this inordinately long treatment as a curb on his ambition and nearly died of boredom throughout the fixed sessions. It was evident that Lakin's intelligence was crushingly superior to that of his analyst, who couldn't understand that his patient was not analyzable in terms of the standard criteria. Lakin knew he had a distinguished future in front of him, and for too long he had been misunderstood and rejected. And now, at the very moment when fame was at hand and long-awaited recognition imminent, a bunch of stuffed shirts wanted to impose a bunch of stuffed shirt rules on him in the name of some bureaucratic setup light years away from the glow Rius Viennese epoch he meant to revive. Three times he expounded his views on variable length sessions to the members of the SPP, first in December 1951, then in June 1952, and for the third time in February 1953. 4. He didn't publish these three lectures, and they remain unpublished to this day. But according to witnesses he justified his contravention of the rules by maintaining that shorter and less frequent SES science produced a sense of frustration and separation in the patient that was beneficial. The point was to turn the transference relationship into a dialectic by halting a session at certain significant words in order to reactivate unconscious desire. But after trying to justify the technique of variability on theoretical grounds and challenging the inflexible ritual of exactly timed sessions, Lakin was obliged to change tactics and disguise what he was really doing. The SFP had been embarrassed from its inception by the fact that its members no longer belonged to the 1PA. So, as they never for a moment really contemplated breaking with Freudian legitimacy, they immediately entered into negotiations designed to bring them swiftly back into the fold. But for this they needed to prove to a commission of inquiry that all the training Anna LYSTS in the SFP obeyed the standard rules about the length of sessions. In July 1953 Lakin already had a third of all the SFP's pupils on his couch, i.e., about 15 people. At the rate of four weekly sessions each lasting 50 minutes, these 15 training analyses would have represented 50 hours. 204 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 F THOUGT Work a week. In addition there were controls and private patients, amounting, say, to some 20 hours more. 70 hours a WEEK in all. This exerbiton figure couldn't be e-real, it was obvious that Lakin gained time by short ending his sessions. The average length was about 20 minutes, in other words, an actual session might last from 10 to 40 minutes. This being so, Lakin's practice stood firmly in the way of the SFPS ever being incorporated into the IPA.5 and as he was the first to want to be readmitted into Freudian legitimacy, he couldn't, after July 1953, try to justify variable length sessions. Thus he never published the famous lectures delivered to the SPP on this taboo subject, and he went on giving variable length sessions within the framework of the SFP, while at the same time P.U. Blickley declaring that he had normalized his practice. In a long letter to Michael Bolin written on August 6, 1953, he XPLA in ed that after having experimented with variable length sessions he had abandoned that technique and reverted to obeying the rules. He referred to the zeal with which his opponents tried to harm him by hinting that he gave short sessions and abbreviated analyses. He countered these alleged accusations with the assertion that his analyses ES lasted between three and four years, with the same number of sessions per week as was usual everywhere, 
or at least in the SFP. He recalled that he had given some lectures to the SPP on VA Reabli LENGTH sessions, but he had not used that technique since January 1953. The end he said how much importance he attached to the paper he was going to deliver on September 26 and I invited Balint to Rome to hear it. Finally he asked Balint to get him English editions of Freud's Studies on Hysteria, with the Anna Zero. Case by Brewer alone, and inhibitions, symptoms, and anxiety, originally published in the United States as the problem of anxiety. To cover the costs involved, Lakin enclosed a check sent to him by an English friend with the payee's name unspecified and then made out by Lakin to Balint. This detail points to a curious feature of Lakin's attitude to money, his habit of settling what he owed with checks, usually from his patients, on which the payee's name had deliberately been left blank so that Lakin might use them for this purpose. 6. It was in the Masson's house at L.E. Tholinet just after his marriage to Sylvia, that Lakin started to write the 500 pages of his Rome Discourse 7. He finished it hastily at the end of August. Then, conscious of the importance of his own teaching and anxious to occupy Fyr's tea place I and the new society founded by Lagache, he set about looking for support in what he, he took to be likely places, psychiatric circles, the Communist Party, and the CAT Holy See Church. At the beginning of September he sent Lucy and Bonner a copy of his text without asking for any comment. But Bonaf understood what he meant, Lakin was trying to attract the attention of the Theory Q Treatment, Kinship Structures 205 Pot Arti Le at ERS hip to his teaching. S. Lakin's approach to the church was much more explicit. At Easter 1953, in the midst of the internal conflict at the SPP, he wrote his brother a letter in which, between the lines, and not without some equivoc at ION, he claimed that HISTEACH in G belonged to the Christian tradition. He asserted that in the second half of the 20th century everything would depend on how men dealt with one another, and this per hey ps not only on the secular plane. P.S.E.K.H.O.L.O.G.Y., he added, O.C.C.U. Pida super eminent P.O.S.I.T.I.O.N., yet the one idea of all its P.R.A.C. Tit Ionas was to fall away from that Haida N.D. Jo in in S.O.M.E. Great and General Degraded T. Ion. He himself was almost alone, he concluded, in PR Po ending a doctrine th at my t at least enable the movement as a w ho le to preserve its roots in a great tradition, a tr of the theon in which man could not be reduced to the status of a mere object. Point nine Lakin w as n o t r e a l l y ren o on c i n g atheism. But he knew that his way of rea dng Freud in the light of philosophy and from a no n by o l o g i c a l point of view might attract a lot of Catholics who didn't accept t he materialistic aspect of t h e master's own t e a c h n g. When t h e y read Lakin they felt on familiar g r o on d that of a Christian evaluation of h m a n per so n l it y point one o moreover. The SFP looked more kin dealy than did THESPP on the SPIRATIONS of PRIESTS and other CREESTINS who wanted to be EC OMIA NALYSTS. Many of these had no medical studies behind them, and they felt more comfortable in LAGAC he's new more academic minded SOCIE tie than in that of NACT. Lakin was well aware of THIS which was why he tried to persuade his brother of the go-od Christian intentions reflected in his T-E-A-C-H-I-N-G. But he went even further. In September, just before LEA 6 ng for Rome, he wrote to Mark F-R-N-O-I-S-A-G-A-N, telling H I'm about high S-M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E-T-O-S-Y-L-6-A-N-D-R-E-S-T-A-T-I-N-G the impo R-T-A-N-C-E he attached to religion. Then he came to the real point, he was determined to have an audience with T.H.E. Pope, in order to talk to him about the future of P.S.E.K. Chona L.Y.S. is within T.H.E. Church. So H.E. asked Mark Fran O.I.S. to intercede with the relevant authorities. The letter was couched in suitably E.M.P.H.A.T.I.C. terms. Lakin stressed that T.H.E. heart of his teaching lay in Rome, where A.C. Coherty and G. to him the importance of speech and language T.O. the individual was demonstrated. 
so Lacan wanted to do ho mage to our common father in the Holy City. 11 Mark Fran OISW as much moved by this declaration, and THOUGH he did nt know anyone in Pope Pius XII's entourage to WHOM he might pass on Lacan's request, he sincerely believed H's brother had been reconverted to CHRISTI in doctrine. In his eyes, THO of Jacques was still LE adding a life of sin, he was saved now by his teaching, which showed at last a wonderful return to the values of CA Tholic SP Irat UA Lighting. But the SUMM at meeting never took P. Lackey. Lakin even invoked the aid of the French EMB as SY, but to no avail, the Pope didn't grant him a private interview. Despite this rebuff, Lakin. 206 elements OFA system OFTHO UGT. Together with Serge Leclerc and M. A. Riese Choisy, did attend a public audience at Castel Gandolfo. 1 2 in the autumn of 1953, Lakin was in a very odd situation. Professionally, he was concealing his variable length sessions and pretending to keep to the rules, in his private life, he was concealing his second marriage and new family from the children of his first marriage, and on the ideological plane, he was telling his brother he had become a Christian again while at the same time trying to forge links with the leadership of the Communist Party. And in the thick of this imbroglio he started work on a system of thought that was entirely inconsistent with all his own deviousness. For what was of supreme importance in Lakin's system was the elucidation of the individual's relation to the truth. As we know, Lakin had already, through his reading of Henry Delacroix, discovered the importance of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. Later on, under the influence of Pichon, he had gone into the subject further. But his real initiation into Saussure's system and the principles of structural linguistics dates from his encounter with the works of Claude Levi Strauss. For Lakin, as for a whole generation of philosophers who would come into prominence in and around the 50s, the appearance in 1949 of Levi Strauss as the elementary structures of kinship was a major event. 13 Freud thought the Oedipus complex lay at the very heart of human personality and that its triangular structure was to be found in the most varied kinds of culture. In its positive form it involved a death wish directed at the rival belonging to the same sex as the subject, and sexual desire for the person belonging to the opposite sex, in its negative form it manifested itself in the subject's love for the parent of the same sex, and jealousy of the parent of the opposite sex. The triangular structure of the complex derived its effectiveness from the incest taboo. In other words, Freud saw this prohibition as the necessary condition of all culture, incest was an antisocial act that the human race had had to renounce in order to be able to exist. T.O. give this theory more substance, Freud, in Totem and Taboo, published in 1912, made use of the Darwinian fable of the primitive horde and of James G. Fraser's and Robertson Smith's work on totemism. He showed that the origin of culture was based on an act of patricide, in the mythical tribe, the jealous and violent father was slain by his sons and eaten by them in the course of a totemic meal. Then, seized with remorse, the sons refused to have sexual relations with the women thus liberated and hastened to draw up laws forbidding incest. Thus was born the first principle of a social organization that has been handed down from generation to generation. The story of the totemic feast, which resembled some imaginary extrapolation, a product of fantasy, was challenged in the early 20s by British. Theory of Treatment, Kinship Structures 207 and American anthropologists thought they had given a favorable RECFT onto most of Freud's ideas about dreams and SYMB OLS, but they were taken aback by the WEACNS S of an argument based on Tehe notion that ever Y culture had a SIN GLE origin and IMPLIE NG that this ORIGIN was the same for every SOC ETI. And they accused Freud of making use of an EVOLUTIO NIST theory that had already been overtaken by an THR Pologi. It is true that Freud had C. omitted a double error in relying on Fraser, whose hypotheses were based on a deductive method independent of any practical work in the field. Th is meant not only that Freud was Conrad ICTing high s on a pproach, based on direct observation, 
but also that he was Venturan G into T he realm of pure speculat ion. For, like Fraser, he had never studied primitive societies in the Field, and Hayes claim to explain how they functioned was based merely on his knowledge of psychoanalysis. One for Bronis Law Malinowski was the first to enter into the co rsy that eventually led to the establishment of first a functional and then a cultural form of anthropology. Born in Krakow in 1884, he was influenced by the te aching of Ernst Mach, Wilhelm Wundt, and Emil Dior Kiem. But he was introduced to Freud's theories by S. Eli G. Emin and Rivers, both of whom had accepted Teheneu hypothesis sari sing out of the DSCOVE re of the unconscious. Earlier, in the autumn of 1917, Malinowski had gone to the South Pacific and shared the life of the Trobriand Islanders. There, all alone in a Canadian heart of darkness, he took the opportunity to observe his own F.E. Ealings, W.H.I.C.H. include not O.N.L.Y. erotic desire F.O.R. the N.A.T.I.V.E. women but also a sense that H.E. was C. unfronting instinctual forces common to all human I.T.Y. I.S. as a result, he came to reject T. Lucy and Levy B.R.U.H.L.'s the or I.E.S. on primit I.B. me and and the idea of a collective C. on sky O.U.S.N.E.S.S. E.M.B. racing instead a new humanism based on the analysis of people as they actually lived. Four years after Hayes returned from Tihi South Seas, Malinowski set out to overhaul Freud's teaching. Among the T. Rob Ryan Islanders he had observed a matrilineal type OF social structure in which ultimately the role of the F. Ather in PROC reation came to be ignored, a C. High LD was conceived by the mother and the spirit of an ant store, and the place usually occupied by the father remained empty. In consequence, Law was embodied in the form of the modern NAL uncle, and it was he that the child saw as a rival. The insist T taboo a PPLE to a C Hild's sister instead of to his mother. Malinowski did not to New York the existence of a nuclear C complex but maintained that it was variable, depending on the F family structure typical of the society in question. He thus undermined both Fruity's Oedipus T Hiori and his hip other CS of OUTT he original patricide. The first applied only to patrilinea L societies, and the second took no account of the diversity of cultures. This diversity was so great that no one or a GNAL transition from nature to culture could possibly account for it. 208 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 F THOUGT Reaction was swift. Although Malinowski had shown himself anxious to preserve as well as to update Freud's ideas, he was soon condemned out of hand by Ernest Jones, the chief representative of Freudian legitimacy. In 1924 Jones objected that the Trobriand and Islanders' refusal to recognize Pater Knighty was merely a tendentious denial of procreation by the F. Ather. The Oedipus complex remained universal, because the matrilinear system, with its avuncular complex, was merely the negative expression of an original Oedipal tendency that had been repressed. But as Jones was not an anthropologist and had never done any field work, his assertions didn't make Freud's arguments any more credible. As for Jones's interpretations of Malinowski, they were little more than an abstract inversion of the anthropologist's own theories. The controversy was revived in 1928, when Gazarahame decided to test Malinowski's hypotheses and set out on an expedition financed in part by Marie Bonaparte to New Guinea. Tihi inhabitants of Normanby Island lived in a society very similar to that of the Trobriand Islanders, and Rahame lived among them for some ten months. But he emerged with completely different conclusions from those of Malinowski. Not only did Rahame reveal the importance of anal eroticism, which Malinowski had preferred not to see, but he also showed that a man who makes love to his sister and lives in a relation of rivalry to his uncle is very similar to the Oedipal man of patrilinear societies. So Rahame proclaimed there could no longer be any doubt about the existence and universality of the Oedipus complex. 16 Thus the debate about anthropology ended in deadlock. The legitimist Freudian stood by the idea of a universal Oedipus complex, suggesting that the ban on incest derived fromafe healing of horrified aversion common to the whole human race. The culturalists believed in diversity, 
not seeing that the incest taboo really did arise from a principle universally recognized, even if only by denial. Once more the argument, after alternating between Vienna and London, burst forth more fully on the fertile soil of American anthropology. But nothing like that happened in France. The only member of the Parisian psychoanalytic movement who took a personal interest in these problems was Marie Bonaparte. And she helped both Malinowski and Raheim. As for the ethnologists, they didn't enter into the Freudian debate. Until 1950 the study of so-called primitive societies was divided among three schools of thought. One of these derived from the old tradition of physical anthropology inherited from Broca. Another, typified by the researches of Marcel Moss, linked society with symbolism. The third trend, which included Baudelaire, Leary's, Kale Lois, and Rivet, was anti-colonial and interested in the revival of the idea of the sacred. It was against this back. Theory of Treatment, Kinship Structures 209 Ground that, in post-war France, Claude Lévi-Strauss was to become the true founder of anthropology in the modern sense of the word. 17 Lévi-Strauss began in 1949 by throwing new light on the question of the incest ban. Instead of either trying to find the genesis of culture in man's hypothetical renunciation of the practice of incest, or P.O. inting to the vast variety of cultures, he avoided any such polarization, showing that the prohibition provided a transition from nature to culture. The prohibition of incest is in origin neither purely cultural nor purely natural, he wrote. Nor is it a composite mixture of elements from both nature and culture. It is the fundamental step because of which, by which, but above all in which, the transition from nature to culture is accomplished. In one sense, it belongs to nature, for it is a general condition of culture. Consequently, we should not be surprised that its formal characteristic, universality, has been taken from nature 1. 8. This new expression of the nature. Culture duality led to a revaluation of the study of societies. Moreover, to underline the novelty of his approach, Levi Strauss took over the old name anthropology, which had become obsolete in France, and gave it the same social and cultural content as had already been ascribed to it by British and American researchers. He included in it both ethnography, defined as the first phase of research in the field, and ethnology, described as the first phase of synthetic thought. To anthropology he gave a centralizing role, its point of departure lay in the analyses produced by ethnography and ethnology, from which it would draw theoretical conclusions valid for all human societies. The universalized incest taboo was par alleled by a system of marriage exchanges regulated by a structural organization independent of individual consciousness. In elementary structures, strict and narrow prohibition is accompanied by the imposition of a compulsory mate, the only marriages allowed are those that repeat the pattern of unions entered into by the spouse's ancestors. In complex structures those of present-day W. Eastern societies the ban is less narrow, permitting a free choice within the limits laid down by the prohibition. The universalization of the incest taboo could not be properly studied unless it was set in the context of a coherent system of kinship and brought under ample scientific scrutiny. Hence Levi Strauss's revival of the term anthropology to provide a model for a synthetic understanding of human institution s. 19. Jacques Lacan met Claude Levi Strauss in about 1949 at a dinner party organized by Alexander Gore. Lacan was silent that evening, looking very intently at the others present. 2-0 but the two men soon became frens, largely on the basis of their shared love for works of art. When Levi Strauss separated from his second wife and needed to raise money, he sold a collect. 210 Elements of a System of Thought Shin of Indian of J.E.C.T.S. Lakin bought half of them. We were very close for a number of years, Levi Strauss says. We used to go with the merlot Ponty's F.O.R. lunch at Gatron Court, where Lakin had a country house. Once, my wife and I wanted to find a hideaway in the country, and Lakin had just bought a new car he wanted to try out. 
the four of us took off together. It was a lot of fun. Yo, you should have seen Lakin descending upon a shabby provincial hotel, and in his most regal manner ordering them to run a bath. For him, we hardly ever talked about psychoanalysis or philosophy. Instead, it was usually art and literature. His knowledge was vast. He used to buy paintings and works of art, and this was often the subject of our conversations. Twenty-one. Claude Levi Strauss had known Merleau Ponty since 1930, when they had both done the preliminary part of the AG Regation course at the Lycée Janson de Sailly in the 16th arrondissement. When they met again 15 years later, in the winter of 1944-1945, they exchanged their impressions about intellectual life in Paris during the occupation. The ethnologist, who had spent several years in the United States, asked about the F.U. tour of existentialism, and the philosopher told how he intended to revive ancient metaphysics. 22 Merleau-Ponty knew Lacan already. They had both been present at several of Louise and Michel Leary's F.A. Mao's fiestas during the war, and the links between the two had grown closer still in 1944, when Suzanne, Merleau-Ponty's wife, began to work at helping deportees settle down into normal life again. She had studied medicine and specialized in pediatrics. Lakin offered to help her take a degree in psychiatry and suggest that she take as her thesis subject neurosis as it occurred in concentration camp S. T.O. introduced her to the relevant nosology he presented her with an inscribed copy of his own thesis. Point two three. All these relationships resulted in a close friendship between the two couples, Suzanne and Maurice, Sylvia and Jacques. At this time Lakin was still interested in the history of Nazism, and he had heard the story of Rudolf Hess from his fr in Jean D. E. Lay, who had served as an expert witness at the Nuremberg trials. This prompted Lakin to think of writing an article on the case for the review critique, though eventually he gave up on the idea. Point 24 Levi Strauss met Merleau-Ponty again in 1948, after spending another three years in the United States. He successfully defended his thesis on the elementary structures of kinship but failed twice in an attempt to be elected to the Collège de France, an ancient and eminent academic body independent of the university. Rivet appointed him assistant director of the Musée de l'Homme, Museum of Mankind, however, and then Levi Strauss met Michel Leary's, whose work he then read with great pleasure. It was at a dinner at Lakin's house that Levi Strauss met Monique Roman, who was to become his third wife. She was a friend of Sylvia's and Theory of Treatment, Kinship Structures 211. Saw a lot of the Lyrises. Before they actually married, she and Levi Strauss lived in the Rue Notre Dame de Lorette. One evening they were finishing dinner, which happened to consist of crabs, when Lakin arrived unexpectedly and to their astonishment devoured all the remains that were left on their plates. Such eccentricities did not prevent Lakin from becoming a member of Paris's post-war intelligentsia, in which he was respected for his talent, originality, and erudition. But though he was valued, he was still not understood. And it irked him that his writings continued to be thought obscure by the very people from whom they borrowed so many ideas. I would have needed to understand them, says Levi Strauss. But I always had the impression that, to his fervent admirers, understand meant something different from what it meant to me. I'd have had to read everything FLVE or six times. Merleau-Ponty and I used to talk about it and concluded that we did NT have the time to. 5. Nor did Levi Strauss's interpretation of Freud owe anything to Lakin's. Levi Strauss had first come across Freud when he was studying philosophy in high school. Marcel Nathan, the father of one of his schoolmates, had translated some of Freud's writings in collaboration with Marie Bonaparte. One day Monsieur Nathan gave his son's young friend the introduction a la psychanalyse, introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, to read. Later on, during his stay in the United States, Levi Strauss mixed in New York psychoanalytic circles. And it was in New York that he met Raymond de Saussure, when the latter became cultural counselor there. In the articles he wrote about Freud after 1949, Levi Strauss compared psychological treatment with shamanistic healing techniques. In the latter, he said in substance, 
the sorcerer speaks and causes an abreaction i.e., liberates the patient's repressed effects whereas in the former it is the patient who speaks while the doctor listens. In addition to this comparison, Levi Strauss showed that in Western societies there was a tendency for a psychoanalytic mythology to grow up and act as a system of collective interpretation a considerable danger thus arises the treatment, unbeknown to the therapist, naturally, far from leading to the resolution of a specific disturbance within its own context, is reduced to the reorganization of the patient's universe in terms of psychoanalytic interpretations 26. If a cure is arrived at through a collective adoption of a founding myth, with the myth acting as a system of structural reorganization, this means the system itself has a predominantly symbolic efficacy. Hence the idea put forward by Levi Strauss in his introduction I over de Marcel Moss, introduction to the work of Marcel Moss, that what is called the unconscious is merely an empty space in which the symbolic function achieves autonomy, symbols are more real than what they symbolize, the signifier precedes and determines the signified 27. 212 elements 0 fastem 0 fthought. It is easy to imagine what a shock it was to Lakin to read Levi Strauss's elementary structures of kinship and his various articles. If I wanted to describe how I've been helped and supported by Levi Strauss's thinking, I'd say it resides in the stress he has laid. I hope he won't reject this rather sweeping way of putting it. It's not meant to cover the whole extent of his sociological and ethnographic researches on what I shall call the effunction of the signifier, in the sense that the word has in linguistics, inasmuch as the signifier, I'd say, not only is distinguished by its own laws but also prevails over the signified on which it imposes them too. 8. Levi Strauss's theories not only shattered the notion of the family, offering instead the idea of kinship, but also made possible a rethinking of the Oedipal universalism postulated by Freud, so that instead of being based on the feeling that there is a natural far of incest, it derived from the existence of a symbolic function understood as a law governing the unconscious organization of human societies. Lakin's encounter with the thought of Levi Strauss meant he had at last found a theoretical solution to the problem of how to make a complete overhaul of Freudian doctrine. In the process, the unconscious was to a large extent FREED of the biological caste that Freud had lent it, in a direct line from Darwinism. Instead it was seen as a language-related structure. The lay. Lore ego escaped from all the psychological conceptions constructed by the neo-freudians and was split up into an ego and an i the first becoming the site of the illusions of the imagination and the second the vehicle of speech lastly the oedipus complex instead of being related to a natural universal was set in the context of a symbolic universal as lakin said there's absolutely no need for the symbolic universal to be spread over the entire surface of the world for it to be universal. Besides, as far as I know, there's nothing which entails the world unity of human beings. There's nothing which is concretely realized as universal. And yet, as soon as any symbolic system is for med, straight away it is, de jure, a universal as such. Levi Strauss is afraid that the autonomy of the symbolic register will give rise to a masked transcendentalism once again, for which, as regards his affinities, his personal sensibility, he feels only fear and aversion. In other words, he is afraid that after we have shown God out of one door, we will bring him back in by the other. 29. The first stage of Lakin's construction of a system of thought, which I have called an orthodox sublation of Freud's doctrine, 3 O began at the height of the crisis in the SPP with a talk he gave on March 4, 1953, at the College Philosophique. Its sub-JECT was T he individual myth of the neurotic, or poetry and truth in neurosis, and it was on this occasion that the expres Zion nom du pair, name of the ephether, was used for the first time. The process continued on July 8 in a lecture entitled The Symbolic, The Real, and D the Imaginary Orders in which, also for the first time, Lakin claimed. Theory OJ Treatment, Kinship Structures 2i3. That his aim was a return to Freud's own writings, 
a return that according to him had begun in 1951. The whole process of construction reached its climax in Rome on September 27, in the function and field of speech and language in psychoanalysis, which proposed a genuine structural theory of psychoanalytic treatment. Further development can be seen in the two seminars of 1953-1954 and 1954-1955, the F.O. Remetter entitled Freud's Papers on Technique, the latter the ego in Freud's theory and in the Technique OJ Psychoanalysis. The lecture Lakin delivered in Vienna on November 7, 1955, marked the end of this first phase in the construction of his system of thought. He made its current purpose explicit in the title, the Freudian thing, or, the meaning of the return to Freud in psychoanalysis 31. In T. He individual myth of the neurot I. C. Lakin compared Freud's account of the rat man case with Goethe's autobiography, Dick Tung U. N. D. Warit, Poetry and Truth. 32. In a ponderous and obscure commentary on the two texts, he harped obsessively on a theme that had been dear to him since 1936, the mirror stage and the deterioration in the role of the F.A. there. But at the same time he carried out a structural revision of the idea of the Oedipus complex, it ought to be seen as a myth, and the triangular system needed to be replaced by a quaternary one. The first element in this new system was the symbolic junction, which in the modern F.A. Mali, said Lakin, was identified with the role of the F.A. there a role played by a father who was humiliated, pathogenic, and discordant, torn between a name, the name of the F.A. there, and a biological reality. The second component of the new S.Y.S. Tem, the narcissistic relationship, itself divided into two P.O.L.A., the ego and the subject. What is the ego, if not something the subject experiences first as being alien to himself within himself? Thus the subject is always in a relationship that precedes his own complete development, which relegates him to a level of you and domental inadequacy and bears witness within him to a flaw, a split, and, to borrow a term from Heidegger, a dereliction. 33. Having thus defined three elements of the system the role of the F.A. there, the ego, and the subject Lakin introduced a F.O. Earth F.A. there in the F.O.R.M. of the experience of death, a component of all manifestations of the human condition but especially perceptible in the experience of the neurotic. Lakin's phrase, the experience of death, alluded simultaneously to Freud's death drive, to Hegel's and Kojiv's fight to the death, and to Heidegger's vision of being for death. But it was to Freud, the man of the Enlightenment and devoted reader of Goethe, that Lakin was really paying tribute as the one who had had the genius to proclaim the ultimate tragedy of the human condition. Three years later, in 1956, at a lecture by Levi Strauss on the relationship between mythology and ritual, Lakin explained how he had made use of the grid of kinship structures in 1953. I tried almost at once, and, I make bold to say, with complete success, to apply the grid to the symptoms of obsessional neurosis, and especially to Freud's admirable analysis of the case of the rat man. I was even able to set out the case strictly in accordance with a formula supplied by Claude Levi Strauss, by which an A who was first associated with a B, while a C was associated with a D, changed partners with the C in the second generation, but not without there being an irreducible residue left in the FORM of the negativation of one of the FOR terms, which acts as correlative to the transformation of the group, in which may be seen what I might call the sign of a kind of impossibility as to a total resolution of the problem of the myth.34. In his 1953 commentary on the Rat Man, however, Lakin made use without attribution of Levi Strauss's description of the Cro-Omaha systems, similar to those of contemporary W.E. Stern societies, according to which the offspring of a marriage between a member of clan A and a member of clan B cannot contract a similar marriage for a certain number of generations. This is an example of extended prohibition, a set of complex structures in which every marriage has to be different from those preceding it. Thus the marriages of previous generations specify negatively the marriages that are possible at any given time. On the other hand, in the case of narrow prohibition, 
elementary structures, there is a positive specification of permitted marriages, since previous unions must be repeated in an analogous manner. The two types of system, the elementary and the complex, can, however, be translated into one language. Inasmuch as the prohibitions of a complex SYS TEM are the negative images of positive prohibitions, the two types of SYS TEM are one, the structure is the same in both.35 All this being so, Lakin was particularly interested in two elements in the story of Ernst Lanzer, Freud's rat man, on the one hand a marriage choice and on the other the matter of a debt. Heinrich Lanzer, the patient's F.A. there, having one day contracted a gambling debt, was saved from dishonor by a loan from a friend. The money was probably never repaid. After he had left the army, wrote Freud, he had tried to find this friend in need so as to pay him back the money, but had not managed to trace him. The patient was uncertain whether he had ever succeeded. 36 Before his marriage Heinrich had been in love with a woman who was poor, but it was a rich woman named Rosa whom he had married and who was to be Ernst's mother. Five years after Heinrich's death, in 1899, the two elements the debt and the marriage played an important part in the organization of Ernst's obsessional neurosis. In 1905, aged 27 and in love with a poor woman named Gisela, he refused to let his mother marry him off to a wealthy wife. Two years later, in the summer of 1907, having lost his pants nez during Somi military maneuvers, he wired his optician in Vienna asking him to send a replacement by return post. TWO days later his captain. Theory of treatment, kinship structures 215. Handed over his new glasses, informing him that the postal charges had to be paid over to the lieutenant who looked after the mail. Ernst, faced with having to pay back some money, began behaving in an almost crazy manner, obsessed with the notion of repaying the debt. To make matters worse, the Pansnez episode had been preceded by another dramatic incident. In June I907 he had heard the captain telling a story about an oriental torture in which a prisoner, forced to undress and kneel down, had a chamber pot with a rat in it strapped to his buttocks underscore the rat, which had been starved beforehand, was prodded with a red-hot iron rod, introduced through a special hole in the pot, and in its efforts to escape being burned entered the victim's rectum and inflicted horrible wounds on him with its teeth. After half an hour the rat died of asphyxiation just as the victim himself expired. This was the man, obsessed by the rat torture, who came into Freud's consulting room on October I, 1907. He, together with Dora, the wolf man, Little Hans and President Schreber was to be one of the five most famous cases dealt with by Freud. Lakin, applying the grid of complex structures to the case, claimed to show how the impossibility of contracting unions analogous to previous marriages was handed down from one generation to another in the form of a negative specification. And there is indeed a repetition of the same signifying structure in the lives of the father and son. But the elements of that structure are organized differently in the two cases. The father marries a rich woman, the son marries a poor one. The F.A. there does not manage to repay his debt, the son does. And in the process of repetition with several differences, the transition from one generation is brought about at the cost of a neurosis. What Lakin calls the individual myth OJ the neurotic is thus none other than a complex structure by which each individual is affected according to a primal pattern whose different elements go through various combinations and permutations from generation to generation, as in a diagram depicting a family tree underscore the story is that of modern man, man in our modern civilization, marked by the ineluctable decline of the ideals of the paternalistic F.A. Milley. We see here how Lakin was reading Freud in the 50s. He began by interpreting Freud's theories in the light of a grid-derived from Levi Strauss and then added hypotheses of his own that were found in neither Freud nor Levi Strauss. In this way Lakin, starting from complex structures, invented a quaternary structure made up of notions worked out before the war but now revived in terms of new categories. Freud had realized there was an unconscious process by which non-analogous elements were repeated, handed down from one generation to another through identification, 
and he had located this process within the 216 ELEMENTSAFASYSTEMOFTHAUGHT Edible Organization of the FAMILY But, when attempting to give his EDPAL system a universal dimension, he had failed to solve the problem of the relation between this universal and the multiplicity of cultures. Hence the invention of the beautiful myth in Totem and Taboo, which instead of explaining the process simply illustrated the way in which every human society and Freud himself tries to recount its own history through a collective imagination. Back in 1938, in the light of Morris and Comte, Lakin was already explicitly criticizing the Oedipal emphasis in Freudian theory. He showed that it had arisen out of a crisis in W. Eastern society stemming from a new bipolarization of the categories of masculine and feminine. Fifteen years later, after having abandoned the idea of a family melting pot and gone through that of small groups, he was exploding the whole system of the Oedipus complex. Levi Strauss had succeeded in reducing the organization of kinship to a single principle from which he derived the infinite variety of particularisms. He thus avoided getting lost, like the culturalists, in a mass of different explanations. Lakin, acting on this reversal of perspective, gave the name of symbolic function to the single unconscious principle around which it was possible to organize the multiplicity of situations particular to every subject. And it will surprise no one to learn that he turned this structure into a myth, and this subject into a neurotic. What he wanted to do was promote a rational and scientific interpretation of Freud's teaching and to emphasize its subversiveness. According to Lakin, psychoanalysis can never be an agent in the adaptation of man to society. Having sprung from a crisis in Western society, of disorder in the world, it is doomed to live in the world and to see disorder in the world as a disorder of consciousness. And that is why, when Lakin was enunciating the principle that every subject is determined by his belonging to a symbolic order, he also put F. Ruard another theory, according to which the subject's recognition of this belonging is the source of an original rift and an inevitable neurosis. This introduction of a new structural system was paralleled by the establishment of a new topography consisting of three terms or orders the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. Lakin had borrowed the first two from Wallen. But in 1953, grouped for the first time with the real, they took on a different value. Lakin included in the category of the symbolic all the revisions he had derived from the system of Levi Strauss, the Freudian unconscious was reinterpreted as the site of a mediation comparable to that operated by the signifier in the realm of language. The category of the imaginary included all the phenomena connected with the construction of the ego, annexation, captation, anticipation, illusion. The order if the real consists of what Freud had called psychical reality, unconscious desire and its theory OJ treatment, kinship structures 21-7. Related FA entities. According to Freud, this reality presents a coherence comparable with material reality and indeed takes on the value of a reality as substantial as external reality, to such a degree as to act as a substitute for it. Lakin's conception of the real included not only Freud's definition of psychical reality but also an idea of morbidity, of rest, vestige, of part maudite, doomed or accursed part borrowed without attribution from the heterological science of Baudelaire. From this arises a tremendous change in meaning. Where Freud saw a subjective reality based on fantasy, Lakin thought of a desiring reality excluded from all symbolization and inaccessibly to all subjective thought, a black shadow or ghost be beyond the reach of reason. It was in his Rome discourse that Lakin incorporated a theory on treatment into his structural system. Unlike the two previous stages in the sublation process, which were ordinary lectures, the discourse was a care fully composed text written in a splendid Baroque style. Using the two terms from the sophism about the prisoners the time for comprehending and the moment of concluding Lacan indirectly justified the idea of variable length, or punctuated, sessions. In a treatment, he said in essence, the analyst is in the position of the prison warden. 
like the Sphinx addressing Oedipus, he promises his patient freedom in return for solving a riddle, the riddle of the human condition. But the prison warden is hoist with his own petard, having promised Fr Edom to only one prisoner, he must grant it to the other two as well. In other words, the analyst is indeed the master of the truth toward which the subject's discourse progresses, but his mastery has two limits. On the one hand he can never ever see how long any sub-ject will take to understand, and on the other he himself is the prisoner of a symbolic order. If a man spe acts be cause symbols have made him a man, the ana lyst is only a supposed master, acting as an amanuensis. He is a practitioner oj the symbolic jayunction, later on Lakin would call him a subject supposed to know. Whatever the case, the analyst deciphers what his patient says as a commentator glosses an original text. This is where haste comes in. In order to lead the analyst and along the path of truth without allowing the idea of a fixed duration to provide him with an escape route, the analyst must do something to fo restall this. In doing so he is acting like one of the prisoners in the sophism, enabling another prisoner to arrive at his own decision on the basis of what he supposes his neighbor's decision to be. Lakin was here giving a veiled reply to the accusations of his adversaries, it is better to conclude too soon than to leave the patient to conclude too late and get bogged down in empty words. The object of P. Unct U8 ION of ordering the patient's discourse as a scribe orders an original text is to get the subject to produce genuine and valid speech by reducing the time FOR. 218-E-L-E-M-E-N-T-S-O-F-A-S-Y-S-T-E-M-O-F-T-H-O-U-G-H-T. Comprehending to the moment of concluding, I would not have so much to say about it, said Lakin, if I had not been convinced that, in experimenting with what have been called my short sessions, at a stage in my experience that is now concluded, I was able to bring to light in a certain male sub-JECT fantasies of anal pregnancy as well as the dream of its resolution by Caesarean section, in a time frame where I would otherwise have had to go on listening to his speculations on the art. Of Dostoevsky 37. Observe that Lakin spoke of this technique in the past tense, as if to suggest to his audience that he was justifying it on a theoretical level but had already abandoned it in practice. But it was plain to everyone that whatever he said or seemed to say, he was carrying on as before. A resounding tribute to Martin H. E. Eiger. AFTER 1945 Heidegger's works, extolled in the 30s by French philosophers who had read them in the light of questions previously raised by Husserl, came to be regarded with suspicion. This was because Heidegger himself had been a supporter of Nazism, particularly in 1933-1934, during the period known as the Rect Orate. In May 1, 1945, three weeks after French troops entered Freiburg im Brisgau, Heidegger's house was blacklisted for having possibly had Nazi connections. And in July there began a long investigation that ended in January 1946 with the philosopher being forced to retire and abstain from teaching. Karl Jaspers played an important part in this train of events. Heidegger himself had asked for his frn's opinion to be taken into account. And Jaspers, though he would have preferred to remain silent, was obliged in December 1945 to write a report, in which he pointed out the complexity of Heidegger's stance toward Hitlerism, though he avoided the question of whether there was a relationship between Nazism and Heidegger's philosophy. As for the accusation of anti-Semitism, he recalled two in C. Dance. In 1931 Heidegger had caused Eduard Baumgarten, a Jewish teacher who had applied to be his assistant, to be expelled from the university. In his place he had brought about the appointment of Werner Brock, another Jewish teacher, whose ideas were acceptable to him. But in 1933 Heidegger had sent to the Society of Nazi Professors at Göttingen a copy of a report containing the following passage, Baumgarten was anything but a national socialist. In terms of family background and intellectual sympathies his roots lie in the Heidelberg circle of liberal democratic intellectuals around Max Weber. Having F.A. Eild to secure an appointment with me, he established close contact with the Jew Frankel, who used to work at Göttingen University and has now been dismissed from here. 
Yet Heidegger protected Werner Brock from the persecution he might have fa said. Jaspers Khan. 220 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 FTHOUGHT. Clud that Heidegger was probably not an anti Semite earlier but became one after 1933. T. His does not always rule out the possibility that in some cases, anti Semitism went against his conscience and his inclinations too. Then, while recommending that Heidegger be allowed a PE engine to enable him to pursue and publish his work, Jaspers also suggested he should be SUSPE ended FROM teaching for a few years, the situation should then be reviewed in the context of what he had published meanwhile. Jaspers ended with a PE receptive portrait. Heidegger is a significant figure, not only in terms of the content of his philosophical worldview, but also in his ability to handle the tools of speculative thought. He has a philosophical mind whose insights are undoubtedly interesting, although my own view is that he is uncommonly uncritical and a long way removed from science in any true sense. He sometimes comes across as a blend of the earnest nihilist and the mystagogue come sorcerer. In the FULL flow of his discourse he occasionally succeeds in hitting the nerve of the philosophical enterprise in a most mysterious and marvelous way. In this, as far as I can see, he is perhaps unique among contemporary German philosophers. It is imperative, therefore, that he be allowed to pursue his studies and writings without restrictions. Point 3. The debate about Heidegger's relations with Nazism had been opened in France even earlier, by Jean-Paul Sartre. In December 1, 944 he issued his F.A. Mao statement, Heidegger was a philosopher well before he was a Nazi. His adherence to Hitlerism is to be explained by F.E.A.R., perhaps ambition, and certainly conformism. Not pretty to look at, I agree, but enough to invalidate your neat reasoning. Heidegger, you say, is a member of the National Socialist Party, thus his philosophy must be Nazi. That is not it. Heidegger has no character, there is the truth of the matter. Are you going to have the nerve to conclude from this that his philosophy is an apology for cowardice? Don't you know that sometimes a man does not come up to the level of his works? 4. A year later, on October 28, 1945, Sartre delivered his F.A. Mao's lecture Existentialism is a kind of humanism, in which he gave a popular version of his Ph. philosophy of fr Edom, based on the theories set f-o-r-t-h in being and nothing genes, 1943. He then threw open the columns of Les Temps Modernes to the debate about H. E. Eiger's political commitment. Many articles on this sub-j-e-c-t were published between 1946 and 1947, including pieces by Maurice de Gandelic, Frederick Det O. Warnicke, Karl Lowit, Eric Weil, and Alphonse du Elhans. In 1946 Coyer also published a long piece on H. E. Eidger's philosophy in critique. Georges Friedman produced an article on the same sub J. E. C. T. in 1953. 5. All these commentators asked the same question, was Heidegger's P. O. Lit. Eichel stance due to a temporary mistake on the part of someone deceived or Tribute to Martin Heidegger 22 I. Self-deceived, or was it the product of a philosophical attitude that, by stressing man's rediscovery of the roots of his inner conflict and his being for death, had ended up finding a satisfactory doctrine of salvation in Nazi nihilism? All the post-war articles on the sub-JECT tried to answer this question. Some commentators maintained that Heidegger's support of Nazism was an incident, something incidental that did not detract from the valid ITY of his work. Others declared that Nazism and Heidegger's political commitment derived from one and the same source. Friedman rightly observed that Heidegger had never accepted racist theories based on biology. Let us note, said he, that in his teaching he never defended Nazi biologism, and as a result he soon fell from favor. But if we examine the FACTS impartially we see that, FARFROM proclaiming his resistance to the regime, a resistance that would have had a considerable moral and even political effect, his main concern, until the fall of Hitler, was to pass unnoticed. 6. 
In the midst of the argument a young philosopher made a new contribution to the debate. Jean Beaufret, born in 1907 in the department of the Cruz in the Massif Central, liked to reminisce about his childhood spent wearing clogs and to say it had made him grow up as a peasant with simple tastes. He was fond of good cooking and good wine and sympathetic to the kind of French virtues that derive from the land. He was admitted into the École Normale Supérieure in the Rue d'Ulm in 1928, the same year as Simone Weil, Maurice Bart Esch, Georges Pilerson, Thierry Molnir, and Robert Brazil Latch. But it was in 1930, during a visit to the French Institute in Berlin, that he first came up against traditional German philosophy. Till then he had been a firm Cartesian. Just before the war, impressed by the early writings of Sartre, Beaufret discovered the works of Husserl. When the fighting began, he was called up and soon taken prisoner, but managed to escape into the unoccupied zone by leaping from the train, taking him to Germany. In 1942, by which time he had become a member of the Pericles Resistance Network, he met Joseph Robin, a student of German who was also an expert at F. Origin F. A. L. S. E. Eiden Titty papers and a great admirer of Heidegger's philosophy. The two dot men became close frens and spent their evenings studying being and time, we used to pour together over the mysteries of Dossian, Ontics, and Ontology, wrote Robin. My ideas about philosophy were very rudimentary, but I knew more German than Beaufret. So we advanced happily into the mysteries of a philosophy couched in a language whose poetry and rigor still enchant me. We had heard about Heidegger's rectorate and his weaknesses. The imperfections of the man irritated us, but his work held us spellbound 7. 222 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 FTHOUGHT. At the liberation, B. E. O. Fret, increasingly impressed by a philosophy that threw so much light on individual destiny confronted with the violence of the world, wondered what had become of the author of Being and Time. On learning that Heidegger was still alive, both RET sent him a letter by an intermediary and was delighted to receive in reply one of the philosopher's books and an answer written in his own hand. This was the beginning of a real dialogue. The two men actually met in September 1, 946, when B. E. Ofret went to the chalet in Odnaberg in the Black Forest where Heidegger used to go for his vacations and to think. He had just come out of the Schloss Halls Baden, the sanatorium where he had been undergoing treatment for the psychosomatic disorders that followed his expulsion from the university. Heidegger's attitude toward the post-war purges was that of a victim. He admitted having wrongly believed in Hitler's historic mission and in National Socialism as a possible agent of spiritual revolution, but he tried to play down his former political attitude on the grounds that he had gone into a kind of inner exile, this absolved him from having to explain the darker aspects of his support of the Nazis. At the most he privately admitted that he had been very foolish. But he refused as he continued to do all his life to make the slightest reference to genocide. He expressed no remorse, no regret, no self-criticism. Instead of admitting his error, he seemed to blame it on a historical movement that had failed to live up to the metaphysical truth he had thought it contained. 8. Moreover, true to the ultra-conservatism of his pre-war attitude, he still showed much more hostility toward Western democracy and communism than toward Nazism. In the early 50s he was still speaking of Germany as a metaphysical nation caught as in a vice between Russia and America. This was the man whom Jean Beaufret was to hear a worship for 30 years. When the French philosopher, with his well-attested past as a member of the resistance, arrived on Heidegger's doorstep, the German soon saw how useful Beaufret's genuine frienship might be at a time when his own work was discredited in his native land and the subject of critical debate in France. The affection of his new disciple allowed Heidegger not merely to minimize his past political involvement but even to pretend it had never occurred. And it wasn't long before Beaufret, impressed by the master's genuine philosophical power, came to accept his version of the FACTS. He ended up both believing and saying that Heidegger had never sympathized with the Nazis. But at the same time, through his dialogues with Heidegger, 
Beaufret introduced into France a new interpretation of the German philosopher's work. Point nine in the context of Sartre's thinking, Heidegger's philosophy had been read as a kind of existential anthropology. Hence the idea that existence precedes essence and that human freedom derives from a humanism based on. Tribute to Martin Heidegger 223. The humanization of i.e. neant, nothingness, the void, man is king in the midst of i atent, what is, and in a lonely and empty fr edom. But in 1946 Heidegger himself refuted the existentialist interpretation of his work that had been largely accepted since the war. Beaufret had asked him to intervene in the debate that was going on in France and to comment on Sartre's attitude to humanism. Heidegger was glad to enter the FRI, and in his letter on humanism, which was to influence a whole new generation, he challenged the use of the word. 1-0 He maintained that humanism, in Sartre's sense of the term, was a new metaphysics that merely radicalized the power of reason over man. Like all metaphysics, it was based on a forgetting of being. Heidegger proposed to save being from oblivion by making it preeminent. To bring this about and to save man from the alienation imposed on him by the forgetting of being, he advocated a wholesale return to origins. If all history is merely the history of the forgetting of being, the only way to get close to being, which nevertheless is always veiled, is to attempt an unveiling. Heidegger said it was necessary to go back beyond Socrates and Plato, beyond Western reason, to the dazzling beginnings of Greek thought, in other words to the true word of the pre-Socratic philosophers, Parmenides and H. E. Rocklitus. Thus H. E. Eidger tried to strengthen and lend substance to modern man, mired in an existence conditioned by technology and in an ideal of progress that made him believe he acted freely. It is obvious how this new reading of Heidegger's thought allowed him to exonerate himself from his Nazi past and permitted B. E. Ofred to take up the cudgels against the interpretations of the existentialists and the Ph.E. nomenologists who followed Husser. The denazification process slackened off in Germany at the beginning of 1949 just before the founding of the Federal Republic. Now was the time for Heidegger to take advantage of the P.O. polarity of his philosophy in France to ask to be readmitted to the university. His supporters said how important it was to reinstate a philosopher in whose works the whole world was interested. His enemies expressed doubts about the intellectual stature of a man who was accused of being a charlatan and whose ideas were thought to threaten democracy. In the spring of 1950, while the Department of Philosophy in the University or City of Freiburg was deliberating on his fate, Heidegger gave some outstandingly good lectures, first on Nietzsche's Zarathustra and then on the principle of reason. The lectures were a great success, and the following summer H. E. Eidger made a real breakthrough at a meeting held in Munich on the sub-JECT of the thing. In the winter semester of 1950-1951 he was authorized to teach again, and he began to fel he had been rehabilitated. By the autumn of 1952 he thought the ring of mistrust and hatred surrounding the master and fr Eind had finally been broken. When? He gave. 224 elements 0 fasystem 0 fthought. A lecture, students crowded around to listen and applaud. The past could be fr got in. In Germany, criticism gradually faded, though it didn't entirely disappear. In France, Jean B. E. Offret, now the official spokesperson for Heidegger's philosophy, did his best to ensure that no fewer attacks were made on his beloved master. 1 1. It was in April 1st, 95 I, just after Heidegger had been readmitted to the university, that Jean Beaufret entered into analysis with Jacques Lacan. At that time it was unusual for a psychoanalyst to look on homosexual ity as merely one among many admissible forms of sexuality. In Freudian circles homosexuality was regarded not merely as a perversion but even as a kind of social deviance. So even when a psychoanalyst agreed to treat a homosexual, his attitude was likely to be negative. A homosexual who said he wanted to become a psychoanalyst himself was either refused altogether or taken on but guided back toward the straight and narrow path of heterosexuality. But Lakin refused to conform, 
he accepted homosexuals as ordinary patients and didn't try to make them normal. That was why so many of them came to him to be analyzed. When Jean Beaufret presented himself at the Rue de Lille he was in a very disturbed state. His male lover, who was also being treated by Lakin, had just left him. Beaufret had met the man a year ago at a dinner party where Lakin and Sylvia were among those present. There had been a brief liaison that had NDD when the other man, in the course of his analysis with Lakin, noticed that Lakin was showing rather too much interest in B.E. Beaufret. Beaufret's lover subsequently abandoned his analyst as well as his boyfriend. 12. Thus Beaufret B. began his treatment in the midst of a strange transferential imbroglio. Beaufret went to Lakin because Lakin was his lover's analyst, and Lakin was especially interested in Beaufret because of Beaufret's special relationship with Heidegger. Beaufret soon noticed Lakin's interest in Heidegger's work. He also realized it would be easy to use Lakin's desire to meet Heidegger to advance the German philosopher's interests. And he skillfully employed the transferential relationship as a trap, into which Lakin allowed himself to be lured. Not only did Beaufret keep talking about Heidegger throughout his treatment, but one day, exasperated by Lakin's frequent silences, he made a direct appeal to his narcissism by remarking, Heidegger spoke to me about you. Lakin started. What did he say? He asked. 13. The analysis ended in May 1st, 953, and the least one can say is that it did anti-cure Beaufret's blindness to Heidegger's political past. On the contrary, Beaufret seems to have emerged believing even more firmly in the innocence of his idol. As F.O.R. Lakin, he managed to make good use of the T-Rap his patient had set F.O.R. him. Tribute to Martin Heidegger 22.5 Still pursuing his recasting of Freud in the light of L.E.6.S. Strauss, he adopted a D.F.F. errant approach to Heidegger's writings F.R.O.M. that he had favored before the war. To all intents and purposes he accepted Beaufret's interpretation while rejecting Sartre's philosophy of F.R.E.D.M. The clearest evidence of Beaufret's influence is to be seen in the Rome Discourse, written two months after the end of the analysis. 1-4 Lakin, F.A. signated by Heidegger's style, recognized again the talent F.O.R. commentary that had once so impressed set him in K.O.J.E.V., and borrowed F.R.O.M. the German philosopher the notion of the Q. Just F.O.R. truth, which seemed to him compatible with Freud's unveiling of desire. Both theories involved a being there of truth, forever being forgotten and repressed, which made it possible F.O.R. desire to R. Evil itself. But above all, Lakin's new encounter with Heidegger led him back to the great tradition of German philosophy that his Anglophilia had caused him to neglect somewhat. He thus moved FROM a great admiration FOR English democracy and the theory of small groups to a diametrically opposed system of thought. Still, while rediscovering in the A anti-democratic, anti-progressive, and anti-humanist Heidegger of the 50s the ultra Nietzsche and vision of the world into which Bodley had initiated him before the war, Lakin never relinquished his scientific and rational ideals. Hence the astonishing mixture of darkness and light in the Rome Discu RSE, just as in the 1938 essay on the family. On the one hand Lakin's reworking of Freudian thought in the context provided by Levi Strauss helped him give new life to a universalist psychoanalysis based on the philosophy of the Enlightenment, on the other hand a doubt was introduced into the resulting edifice by the influence of Heidegger, who saw human existence as a beotomal's s pit where truth is expressed amid error, deceit, and ambiguity. On Easter 1955 Lakin went to Fribourg with Beaufret. There, as if by chance, the conversation among the three men turned on the question of transference. H. I. Together, writes Beaufret, seemed rather preoccupied about the question of transference as an effective relationship on the part of the patient toward the analyst, and through me he questioned Lakin about it. The following dialogue ensued, Heidegger, but what about transference? Lakin, it's not what it's usually said to be. It begins as soon as a patient decides to go to a psychoanalyst. I translated this into German for Heidegger's benefit. Transference is not an episode occurring within psychoanalysis but the a priori condition of it, in the same sense as the a priori conditions of experience in Kant's philosophy. 
ACH so slash said Heidegger. 1 5. In T he course OF the conversation, Lakin asked Heidegger for permission to translate an article of his called Logo S and to publish the French ver. 226 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 FTHOUGHT. Zion in the first issue of La Psychanalyse, Psychoanalysis, A.J. O. Ernal that was supposed to express the ideas of the SFP. The number FOR which Lakin was responsible dealt with speech and language. Several eminent contributors had already been lined up, including Emile Benveniste, J. E. Hippolyte, and Clemence Ramnu. Lakin included his own Rome discourse and his dialogue with Hippolyte. Heidegger gladly gave his permission, and Lakin set to work. One six three months after the meeting I in Freiburg a conference O and the works of Heidegger was held in Sarisi I.A. Saal, from August 27 to September 4. Among the 54 P.E. Opel present were the young Jill D. E. Luz, Jean Starobinsky, Gabriel Marcel, Paul Ricoeur, Costas Axelos, and Maurice de Gandilasi. Sartre and Merleau-Ponty demonstrated their hostility by staying away. Alexander Coyer refused to meet Heidegger in any circumstances. In the middle of the conference, Lucien Goldman read out extracts from texts Heidegger had written during the rectorate, much to the disapproval of the other participants, who accused him of breaking the consensus why Lakin had not signed on FOR the conference at Sarisi, but he invited Martin Heidegger, his wife, Elfrida J. E. B. E. Ofret, and Costas Axelos to stay with him for a few days at La Prevote. Sylvia, though shocked by Elfrida's anti-Semitism, went to great trouble to serve the Heideggers a German-style breakfast, including sausage, every morning. To her surprise, Heidegger didn't touch the sausage. But Lakin himself wasn't bothered about his guest's tastes in either FOOD or politics, what he wanted was to talk to him. As he himself didn't speak German and Heidegger didn't speak French, Lakin asked Costas Axelos to act as interpreter. Conversation could then flow fre-ely. Later, leaving Axelos and Beaufret behind at Gatron Court to work on a translation of Was ist die Philosophie, Lakin took Heidegger, Sylvia and Elfrida on a lightning visit to Chartres Cathedral, driving his car at the same breakneck speed as he conducted his sessions. Heidegger, sitting beside the driver, didn't blanch, but his wife kept up a stream of protest in the back. Sylvia called Lakin's attention to this, but to no avail. On the way back, Heidegger was as silent as before, despite Elfrida's renewed complaints. Lakin only drove the F.A. Stir. I.S. After the trip to Chartres, Lakin started on the Logos translation. Its title was the most important signifier in the history of Western philosophy, and its content F.O. remed part of a text called Moira, Aletheia, Logos, three commentaries on F.R. Agments F.R.O.M.H. Heraclitus and Parmenids. In this work, Heidegger sought to show that pre-Socratic truth i.e. the true or mythical origin of the being there of man had been obscured by 2,000 years of philosophy. Heidegger also maintained that the G. E. Roman language, being superior to all others, was the only one capable of rediscovering the tribute to Martin Heidegger 227. Original truth of the Greek tongue and thus providing the human race with a doctrine of salvation through which it could transform the world. It was in the second version of Logos, published in 1954, that Heidegger clearly expressed this doctrine, in an additional paragraph that hadn't appeared in the 1951 version. In other words, far from disowning his previous speculations about the superiority of the G.E. Roman people, he was transposing them into this commentary on a commentary, in which he maintained that only a belief in the superiority of the German language could cure the degradation of Western civilization and save both philosophy and humanity. 19 Fragment 50 of Heraclitus, one of those chosen by Heidegger, said leader ally, the secret is really to listen not to me but to reason, so as to be able to say together everything in one. That is, the individual must allow language to produce its effect, by listening properly, without limiting himself merely to the intention of the speaker. 
From this it may be concluded that discourse must invoke an authority that overrides it. As Jean Bollock points out, Heraclitus Logos does not refer to any ontological positivity, in no way does it denote any identity between related contraries or their combination in some original totality. So the Heracliton one is not a unique one in the sense of that which unites, on the contrary, it is one in the sense of that which separates or distinguishes itself. On the basis of this fr argument, Heidegger invented a Heraclitus made to measure to his own taste. By bracketing him with Parmenides he made him into a representative of an ontology in which the referent was no longer the structure of language but instead the being there of an original presence. With this ontologization of Heraclitus thought went a blurring of division in favor of a unitary conception of being. Moreover, by playing on the oral similarity between the Greek words logos and legain and the German verbs legen and lesen, he linked our eating, lying, meditating, pelacing, and meditation so as to show that the logos is stretching out and repose and also the harvesting of being and thought from the non-hidden, this process was to be understood as corresponding to unveiling. Thus Heidegger's Heraclitus heralded the true word of being, to be harvested by the individual in meditation and the embracing of excess. TWO things seem to have persuaded Lakin to translate H.E. Eidger's commentary on fragment 50, on the one hand Heraclitus' own conception of language and on the other the fascination of Heidegger's style. Heraclitus is a master who claims to speak on no other master's authority, there's no point in having listened to anyone else's teaching if that teaching hasn't enabled one to arrive at any meaning. But Heraclitus is also the philosopher who speaks of a logos, or LA language, that f overses the subject to efface himself before a truth that he expresses but which is beyond him. Let the logos or the 228 ELEMENTS 0 FASYSTEM 0 FTHOUGHT signifier act, such is Heraclitus' message as reproduced by Lakin in his Rome discourse. What is being discussed is a spoken word that speaks in man's stead and to which we must listen in order to reconstruct its meaning. And, needless to say, Lakin puts himself FORR2 as a master without a master, one who has broken with all academic establishments and is the only person capable of listening to the true word of Freud. Lakin was adopting a H.E. Rockleiton notion of language, but H.E. never alluded directly to Heraclitus' own text. Instead, he referred the reader to the German translations used by Heidegger and translated T. Hem himself into French. So in FACT he was using Heidegger's text to introduce his own preoccupations. This involved two kinds of nuance. On the one hand he fol load Heidegger as far as obscurantism and primitivism were concerned, sometimes even out Herod-ing Herod, as, for example, when he translated lesson as reading. Sometimes, on the other hand, instead of indulging in etymological variations, he chose to prune the German text of its black forest populist bad taste. In short, says Jean Bollock, Lakin's translating method is very fre and high-handed. He wrenches the text in the direction of science, art, and language and accords more importance to hearing than to speech. He adds a touch of malarme. 2o for example, where Heidegger played on the fact that the verbs legen, German, and legain, Greek, sounded alike, Lakin played on the similarity, in French, of the woe rds tegger, to bequeath, legs, legacy, and lays, poetic lays. This molar mean transposition was clearly one way of nullifying Heidegger's claim that the German language was philosophically superior. He also denegativized the text, wherever Heidegger used the term unverbogenheit, non-obscurity, unconcealment, to denote that which perceives being in Heraclitus, Lakin translated it as devoilment, unveiling, giving more importance to the act of exposure itself than to the idea of a quest carried out via an own occultation, de or uneclipsing, point two one but above all he committed sacrilege. Instead of translating the 1954 Versailles which he knew perfectly well, because he quoted it several times in his notes he used the 195 one text. In other words, without offering any explanation, 
he took the liberty of removing the last section of Heidegger's final text, I. E. The F. A. Mao's commentary on the commentary, in which the philosopher enunciated his view that a return to Thuy Sd's great beginnings could save modern man from the domination of science and technology. 22. It was pro B. A. Bly by mistake that Lakin T. ran slate D. T. He 1951 instead of T. He 1954 version. But given that, in the actual work of translating, he keeps referring to the second version in order to correct the first, we are obliged to interpret the amputation of the coda literally. It seems to show that Lakin preferred Heidegger the commentator on Heraclitus to Heidegger the preacher of salvation and German superiority. In other words, he gave tribute to Martin Heidegger 229. Prominence to the side of Heidegger's work that dealt with his conception of language, retaining, as F.A.R.S. style was concerned, only his technique as a commentator and stressing, as a method F.O.R. discovering the truth about desire, not ontology but structure, and unveiling rather than a quest via non-occultation. It is easy to see why Beaufret and the dogmatic supporters of Heidegger remain silent about this translation, it went against their own work of turning Heidegger's language into a kind of etymological code. And so thoroughly was Lakin's version ostracized that it wasn't mentioned either in André Prias later version or in commentaries on the logos by Heidegger's French disciples. This insidious murder by translation of a text indicates the general tenor of Lakin's activities in the ten years after the war. Between 1951 and 1956, he did produce an anti-Sartrean interpretation of Heidegger, largely inspired by his own transferential relationship with Beaufret. But as early as the Rome discourse and despite many ambiguities, he was departing from the main themes of Heidegger's philosophy, in particular from any apocalyptic vision of science and any ontology of quest, origin, or presence. Later, in his commentary on Plato's Symposium, he was to move even if you are there away from Heidegger's idea that the evolution of the modern world had obscured the origin of being. 23. If Lakin was able to use Heidegger's work in this way, that was because in post-war France it lent itself to such a process. Sartre was right when he said, if we encounter our own thought in someone else's, what does it matter what H. E. Eidger himself is like? Very true. H. E. Eidger's thought exercised an almost hypnotic fascination on a whole generation because it wasn't a system, because it placed itself from the outset in a complex situation between two languages, in a confusion of truth and untruth, an inextricable tangle of existence and appearance, running the twofold risk of being impossible to transmit, be cause of its manifold variations, and impossible to translate because everyone could find in it the echo of his or her own words. It was because of this paradoxical position that Heidegger's philosophy played such a crucial initiatory and pedagogical role in French thought in the second half of the 20th century. And Lakin, together with Sartre and later with Foucault and Derrida, was one of those who made Heidegger's writing readable. Unlike Beaufret and the German philosopher's most dogmatic followers, their J.E. did close fidelity to Heidegger's text in order to bring out more clearly the essence of his teaching, which concerned the ability to find in the other that which is in oneself. Thus Lakin, like a whole generation of his contemporaries, made a detour through Heidegger in order to discover, and to help, himself. This is borne out by the introduction to the first issue of 1A Psych Analyze, which 230-E-L-E-M-E-N-T-S-A-F-A-S-Y-S-T-E-M-O-F-T-H-A-U-G-H-T Contain the authorized translation of Logos. As F.O.R. the presence here of M.H.E. Eidger, he wrote, For those who know where the most lofty meditation in the world is to be F.O.U.N.D., it is enough in itself to guarantee that at least there is one way of reading Freud that does not exhibit so cheap a philosophy as is rehearsed by a certain official supporter of phenomenology. 24 But this resounding tribute to M. Heidegger was more like a ruse. Not content with censoring the text of someone whose lofty meditation he was eulogizing, Lakin also used his name against that of Sartre, the OFFI Chael supporter. He did so in order to boost his own strategy for taking over the French psychoanalytic movement, 
a strategy based on a non-phenomenological interpretation of Freud's work. But while there were frequent references in the Rome discourse to Heidegger's problematic of unveiling truth and letting the word act, it had disappeared f o or years later when Lakin gave a lecture at the Sorbonne called The Agency of the Letter in the Unconscious or Reason since Freud. 2.5. Here he put f o ruard a theory of the signifier no longer based on interpretations of Saussure or Levi Strauss but deduced logically f r o m Roman Jacobson's work on metaphor and metonymy. In this system, in which the unconscious was formalized on the model of linguistic structure and a claim was made for Freud to be admitted into the realm of science, Lakin abandoned ontology altogether. In other words, the way he made use of Heidegger's work varied in accordance with his two successive interpretations of structural linguistics. In the first, reflected in the Our Own Discourse, when he hadn't yet worked out his theory of the signifier, he retained Heidegger's thought on origin and unveiling. But in the second, in the agency of the letter, he differentiated himself from it by a determined effort to locate Freud's discoveries within the field of science, thanks to a reference to reason and to the Cartesian cogito. And it was just when he was departing the furthest from Heidegger's work that he paid emphatic tribute to the man himself. When I speak of Heidegger, he wrote in 1957, or rather when I translate him, I do my best to let his own words retain their supreme significance 26. A curious way of mixing truth and untruth in order to dismiss the person by whom you claim to be inspired. Heidegger is allowed to retain the supreme significance of his words, but this is something far removed from the science of the signy fear to which Lakin himself aspires. As for the business of translating logos, that operation served to illustrate Lakin's teaching rather than to convey Heidegger's text. But the FACT that Lakin wasn't a real disciple of Heidegger didn't prevent him from wanting passionately to be recognized by him, though Heidegger didn't understand Lakin's work at all. Point 27 As a result, while each in his own way was pondering the question of speech and language, a weird relation. Tribute to Martin Heidegger 2-3I Ship grew up between the two men, Based on silences, misunderstandings, and cross-purposes, Lakin was silent about the incomplete translation of Logo S, Heidegger was silent about the censorship involved therein, there were confusions, at Beaufret's expense, about transference, silence or absence of speech reigned in the unsuccessful dialogue at Gatron Court and on the way to an FROM Chartres, there was more silence, on the part of other translators of Heidegger, about Lakin's version. Of Logos, there was silence on the part of Lakin about Heidegger's Nazi past. And two other important phases of this erratic relationship produced silences of their own. In 1959, at a dinner at which Lakin and his daughter Judith were pre sent together with Maurice de Gandalic Jean Beaufret and Dina Dreyfus, Levi Strauss's second wife, a lively argument arose about Heidegger's past. Dina Dreyfus refused even to recognize his philosophy while B. E. Ofret argued that it had nothing to do with Nazism. Lakin said nothing, merely stroking Judith's hair and trying to change the sub J.E.C.T. Yet in 1958, when Les Temps Modernes had published an article by Jean Wall in which Lakin thought he was being attacked, he hadn't hesitated to write to Wall explaining as clearly as he could that he had always been on the side of the victims during the NAZ ordeal and that he wouldn't for a moment let it be doubted be e cause of any grudges against Heidegger. 2.8. Seven years later Lakin sent Heidegger an inscribed copy of his Akrits. In a letter to the psychiatrist Meted Boss, Heidegger wrote, You too have no doubt received Lakin's large tome, Akrits. Personally, I haven't so far been able to get anything at all out of this obviously udandish text. I am told that in Paris the book is creating as much of a stir as Sartre's El Etre Tie Neant once did. A F E W months later he added I enclose a letter from Lakin. It seems to me the psychiatrist needs a psychiatrist. 2-9 So that was what Heidegger thought about Lakin. Finally, hearing that Heidegger was ill, Lakin, accompanied by Catherine Millot, went to Freiburg and told the German philosopher about his theory of knots. Lakin held FORTH at length, Heidegger was silent. 30. 2 0. 
I intersecting F8 as JACQUE's Lakin and Franfois Dolto. AFTER Lakin, Franois Dolto was the second most important figure in the history of Freudian psychoanalysis in France, and the recent publication of her correspondence with her close relatives makes it possible to paint a more accurate picture of her life than I was able to provide in my Histoire de la Psychanalyse en France. One Franois Merit was born in November 1908 into a family of soldiers and polytechnicians of the conservative right, very religious people who shared the ideas of Charles Moraes. So she was raised in accordance with the educational principles of the great Parisian middle class who got their ideas from a daily perusal of L. Action J.R.N. Reyes. From earliest childhood Franois Merit was given works of piety to read and taught a lot of F.O. Olish nonsense about sex. For a long time she be believed babies came in boxes sent down to earth by the sacred heart of Jesus, that physical love was repulsive, and that women were doomed to pass from virginity to motherhood without ever tasting intellectual or any other kind of freedom. A letter from a maternal great uncle, an officer in the colonial army in T. Onkin, shows the kind of education that was thought suitable for little girls of her social class in 1921. I'm glad you are and Jo-Ying yourself and doing a lot of cycling. But while I agree it's a good thing that women should go in for sport, I disagree with the present fation of their doing so with the sale object of becoming cross-country champions. I far that in the process they may neglect more important matters and fail to cultivate the moral and intellectual qualities that should be their true prerogative and impart the virtues proper to a model wife and mother too. In September 1, 922 her mother, Suzanne Merritt, née Emir, expressed exactly the same views, chiding Franois severely after learning that she had had a sea conversation about sexual matters with a male cousin. Such things only arouse unwholesome curiosity and should be acknowledged. Intersecting Fates, Lakin and Dolto 23-3 Edged in the confessional. It is neither nice nor proper, and I want my daughter to be clean and proper, a real young lady who can be proud of her unblemished soul, and even J.E. a lose of it in the sense that she will allow no one to sully it. When I was in the convent and my schoolmates came to me with that kind of question, I used to box their ears and tell them they were disgusting, etc. 3. Such were the maxims that governed a childhood f you were there overshadowed by the horror of the Verdun Tres and although young Franoise was mischievous and lively, her native rebelliousness did not, even in Adelie's sense, take the FORM of open revolt. In any case, relations within the FAMILY, among parents, children, servants, and governesses, were so warm that no one would ever have suspected they reflected anything but perfect Christian love. In reality, though, the show of affection and charity concealed all kinds of hatred. Germanophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism were the earliest spiritual nourishment of one who was to become the F.O. under of child psychoanalysis in France. Point for the simultaneous existence of these two contradictory realities Shari table appearances on the one hand and various kinds of hatred on the other meant that in the Demler Merit F.A. Mali the conscious quest F.O. are an ideal supreme good concealed a pathological organization of their emotional relationships. And it was in the confusion between those two realities, between explicit standards and unconscious pathology, between repressed hatred and professions of love, and all against a background of militant patriotism erotism that the young Franoise's personality was f o remed. Between 1908 and 1920, as her letters and autobiography show, two men and three women were the main actors in a great neurotic drama that nearly set her on the path to profound melancholia. Point five. First, there was the F.A. there, Henry Merritt, an artillery captain who specialized in the making of shells and explosives. Then there was the maternal uncle, Pierre Demler, captain in the 62nd Battalion of the Chasseurs Alpins, or Mountain Infantry who was F.A. Tally wounded in the Vosges on July 6, 1916. The main F.E. male characters involved included Suzanne, Franoise's mother, nurse, and housewife, Mademoiselle, the governess, kind but N.A.R. row-minded, and Jacqueline, Franoise's elder sister, the mother's favorite and the O.B.J.E.C.T. of Franoise's jealousy. Jacqueline was good-looking and intelligent, 
she possessed every virtue and was always being held up as an example. She died on September 30, 1920, suddenly struck down by bone cancer. From the beginning of the war, when she was scarcely seven years old, Franoise saw herself as her uncle Pierre's fiancé, and they exchanged letters as if they were really sweethearts. Instead of keeping his distance, Pierre, egged on by Henry and Suzanne, encouraged Franoise and even promised to marry her when the war was over. Whereupon she began to follow the 234-E-L-E-M-E-N-T-S-0-F-A-S-Y-S-T-E-M-0-F-T-H-O-U-G-H-T Fighting, urging her F.A. there on with his work, you must work harder at macking shells, she wrote in September 1, 915, to kill the lousy crowds who hurt the poor French, who suffer because of the wicked crowds, who are cruel and kill babies only one or two years 0 ID 6. At St. Clotilde's, the school she started to attend that same year, anti-German propaganda was at its height, for homework, the pupils were asked to write an essay entitled A Bayonet Charge. Franoise reveled in it, you kill three or more soldiers, you stick the bayonet into a crowd's body, you pull it out in disgust, but you're pleased to and stick it in again seven. As well as being encouraged to express open hatred of the Germans, Franvoise was more subtly influenced toward racism in general. The F.A. Mali always spoke of the G.E. Romans as France's hereditary enemy, guilty of the most extreme barbarity. The position of Negroes was rather more ambiguous. On the one hand a black man might be seen as a well-behaved colonial soldier a Senegalese infantryman, for example neatly got up in his legendary uni form and happy to act as canon foder in France's crusade against the Teutonic foe. But at the same time he had something diabolical about him, a kind of primitive, animal sexuality that was a danger to civilized human beings. All this gave rise to a state of confused apprehension, in which poor Fran was found herself involved at the same time as she tried to wage her war against the Hun. Uncle Pierre, on hearing that his little fiancé had been kissed by a Senegalese infantryman he was a casualty being nursed by Suzanne, and Fran Voice reminded him of his own young daughter treated his niece to a J.E. a lose S.C.E.N.E. He told her to keep away from seductive black men, of course they are very good looking, but not as good looking as the chasseurs Alpins. Mademoiselle, for her part, scolded Franoise and made haste to give the contaminated cheek a thorough wash. Henry Merritt, to comfort his daughter, who was being made to think a kiss from a black man was some kind of sexual and bacterial contagion, sent her a postcard depicting for handsome black children in the style of the F.A. Mouse Banania Coco advertisement H.R. are some nice little frens you, he wrote. Franvoise was filled with terror and guilt. When she passed a Negro F.A. Mali in the street she wouldn't even glance at them, much as she longed to. She was so scared of looking at what she really wanted to see that her mother tried to calm her down by sending her a picture of a Negro dressed as a Senegalese infantryman. Are you F.R.I.I.T. end? She wrote on it point eight so Fran was, caught up in a discourse where hatred was expressed in words that seemed to be those of love, played a half deliberately, half involuntarily submissive part in a lethal comedy F.O.R.C.E.D. on her by the adult world. When her uncle died she acted as if she really was a war widow, and throughout her adolescence she was unable to get over the loss of that first. Intersecting Fates, Elican and Dolto 235. Love. How could she have, in a F.A. Mali where after the armistice the commemoration of war heroes, F.A.R.F.R.O.M. lessening the anti-German hatred rife in the days of the trenches, simply changed it into a new thirst for revenge. Pierre Merritt, Franois' elder brother, was a fierce embodiment of this spirit. A product of the military academy at St. Air, an ultranationalist and anti-republican, he took over the role of the dead uncle whose name he bore and whom he dreamed of avenging in another war. His hatred of the Germans was accompanied by a fervent anti-Semitism that intensified at the same rate as his activities in the action Fran Reyes. He had a classical career as an officer in the colonial army, dividing his time among garrison life, leave, and the pacification of the natives. The death of Jacqueline, the elder sister, 
help to prolong Franois's fe feelings of bereavement, sorrow, and guilt. Suzanne Merritt, their mother, never recovered from Jacqueline's death, despite the birth of her last child, a son, in September 1, 1922, brain fe ver, accompanied by attacks of delirium, was followed by depression, which revealed a chronic melancholia hitherto concealed by the round of domestic tasks and marital duties. After such an upbringing, spent in the company of a mother who, though loving and devoted, was nonetheless an unresisting victim of the ideals of her class, Franoise entered her twentieth year in a state of severe neurosis. Obsessed by being slightly overweight, haunted by a much disliked self-image, she was incapable of dealing with any kind of sexual life, of taking up any real pro fetion or of constructing an identity for herself. I am 20 years old, and I look 12, she wrote. I am afraid I may be unable to struggle anymore. And if that should happen I'd rather die there and then. 9. For exceptional women of that generation longing to see A.S.T. off the F.A. Millie straight jacket that still F.O.R.C.E.D. an outdated model of F.E. mini nighty on them even in the early 1930s, there were several ways of escape. They might become active in politics or go in F.O.R.F.E. minism or religion, or they could rebel individually and gain independence by acquiring a profession. Franoise Merritt chose the last of these alternatives when, Several years after her younger broth E.R. Philippe, she began to study medicine. Her OBJECT was to cure herself of her education and avoid becoming merely a wife and mother, repeating the mistakes of her parents. She wanted to be a doctor in education, and this brought her into contact with the pioneering stage of French Freudianism in the person of René Laforgue. Her analysis started in February 1934 and lasted three years. To it brought about an almost miraculous change in Franoise's life, a kind of revolution in consciousness. But it was a revolution carried out via the unconscious that transformed her into virtually another woman, one aware of herself and no longer alienated, able to fel she was a woman sexually instead of having a morbid and infantile self-image. 236 E L E M E N T S 0 F A S Y S T E M 0 F T H O U G H T the nature of this transformation can be seen in a letter she wrote to her F.A. there on June 1, 5, 1938. Henry Merritt had been complaining about how Franoise had changed, not understanding that she now rejected his ideals. So she explained to him very firmly the meaning of the change, making use of what she had learned from reading Freud, from her experience of analysis, and from her contacts with psychoanalytic circles in general. I instead of going over pointless grievances, she gave a clinical account of her mother's melancholic unhappiness, with which she herself had identified FOR several years. One one thus Franoise Merritt was awakened FROM her neurosis through the acquisition of clinical knowledge, and FREED from the pre judices of her class through access to a new culture. It is interesting to compare Jacques Lacan's family background with that of Franoise Dolto. He came from the commercial middle classes, which were Catholic, chauvinistic, and conformist. They were still attached to their old peasant roots, and the acquisition of a FAIR amount of money and material possessions was their ideal of social success. As we know, Albert Lakin, who cared nothing for art, culture, and knowledge, regarded trade and commerce as the most respectable fields of activity. As for Emily, his wife, Christian spirituality was the only kind of intellectual endeavor she could lay claim to. The mystical element in her character partly explains her younger son's decision to become a monk. She adored him from the moment he was born, and he always regarded her as a saint. The case of his brother Jacques was quite different. In him the desire to belong to an intellectual aristocracy was allied to a strong desire to rise up the social ladder. He therefore had to identify himself with values quite opposed to those of his origins. By making a definitive break with his family he became one of the upper middle classes and nobody's son. He frequent the most distinguished salons in Paris and was as manifestly an AES the nihilist and cosmopolitan as his parents were chauvinists and conformists. 
Franois's merit on the other hand belonged to a social class that saw itself as responsible for handing down the intellectual and moral traditions of patriotic, nationalist, and anti-republican France. And because she was raised in accordance with a set of educational principles that implied first an aphoromist a belief in a system of thought, her break with her family could be expressed in conflict and verbal exchanges, it could be spoken, admitted, explained, debated. This was quite different from the intellectual void, the absence of words, the impossibility of communication that marked Lakin's relations with his parents. Quite different therefore, and more radical, was Lakin's break with his family, where the son was unable to challenge his father because the latter was intellectually incapable of understanding. Inter CTING Fates, Lakin and Dolto 23 7. The younger man's aims. They didn't speak the same language, they had ceased to belong to the same world. Franoise rejected only the most pathological aspects of her action FRNI's type education the prejudices about sex, the humiliation of women, the excessive authority of parents over their children. But as her analysis with Laforg was not so much an intellectual initiation into a new culture as an emotional awakening caused by an introduction to clinical knowledge, she still, on the plane of thought, retained the values handed down to her by her background. Evidence of this may be seen in an episode to which she refers in a letter she wrote in June 1, 938. H.E.R. brother had accused her of being kept by the Jews, a reference to Freudianism as a Jewish business not at all unexpected in a supporter of action Franoise. One to Franoise, instead of rebuking him for anti-Semitism, simply obje did to the accusation itself and told her f either it wasn't true. I instead of calling into question the basis of the Morrissean philosophy that had affected her personality for so many years, she preferred to avoid the issue through a kind of amnesia and a refusal to intellectualize. 13 This was what made her adoption of Freudian thought so much like a religious conversion. What in Lakin's case was a rational adventure leading to a theoretical reworking of Freud's teaching, belonged, in Dolto's life, to the order of mystical revelation. Her analysis with Laforg and her introduction into psychoanalytic circles invested her with the grace of a new initiate, it altered even her physical image. From 1935 on she attended many SPP lectures, daily gently taking notes. At the same time, during the courses she followed as part of her medical studies at Maison Blanche, at Vaugirard under Huier, at the Necker Hospital for sick children, and at Britano, she gradually witnessed the awakening of what was to be her own special genius, a wonder ful ability to listen to children, to speak their language, and to talk to them as an equal. In this she resembled the gypsy Fordunteller Sandor Ferenci used to NJOY meeting in the suburbs of Budapest at the beginning of the century, when psychoanalytic practice still retained some of the simplicity of its origins. Franoise's gift for listening to children emerged when she met Edouard Pichon, who was to become her second mentor. Just as Laforg, himself imbued with religious spirituality, had avoided challenging his patients' Catholic beliefs, trying rather to broaden them into a more ecumenical Christianity, so Pichon refrained from urging her to reject or analyze the Morrissean mode of thinking that she had inherited. And as a result of the attitudes of these two masters, Franoise became part of the chauvinistic wing of the SPP, a position that later involved her in some serious problems with the IPA. Did she realize this? Certainly not, 14 her conversion to Freud deintellectualized or, as she liked to say, depolluted her. In other words, 